Audiobook title, When I Got Reincarnated as a Spider with My Goddess by Noel Alicia Volume 06. Prologue Today is finally the day when I regain my freedom, and cursed I would be if I fail to stop your oppression. The little boy lashed out and while yelling, pointed the curved wooden sword fit for his small 12-year delicate body characteristics. A swift wind continuously flew in between the twisted and curly gaps of the dense trees growing and tracing an almost complete circle around them, most probably this open area with little to no grass in contrast to the intense overgrowth as observed in the forest, was in no way an ordinary occurrence, consequently it used to be a magical hotspot where monsters could grow and easily absorb magical energy, but for now that had been quelled. It was merely a training ground for the girl, who too held a wooden straight sword with a thin lining and a blunt edge, while their blades pointed at each other with the intention to take down the another and in no way. They seemed to be related because the boy was an elf and the girl a human. Their relaxed gazes and excited expression on their faces only tend to reveal how closely they knew each other, oblivious to the time they spent together as brother and sisters. What are you talking about? You were the one who chose this method to decide who will play the role of the bait. The girl said, Elder sister don't tell me that you are scared, after I have improved myself so much. But even if you are backed into a corner now, I won't be showing mercy. But maybe this time if you want, I can give you a pass. The boy smirked as he pushed back his left leg along with the loose clay to tighten his body posture and affirm his grip on the ground. Every movement of his body only enhanced his dignified look and exuded a majestic aura. All in an attempt to intimidate his opponent, says the boy who has by far now lost 289 matches and not a single one. The girl this time tried to copy the boy's accent, as if reminding him of his place on the fighting field. You can't blame me, because every time you say we are going to play, you would indiscriminately hang me upside down on the tree and hunt down six the monsters that are attracted to this place. The boy complained with a rather undignified outburst ruining the entire effect of the display he had worked to conjure. Ear egg, weren't we enjoying ourselves a lot? The girl said as she straightened her back and tilting her head quizzically with a concerned look. She suddenly burst into laughter, even if it was just for an instant and then returned to the matter at hand. The boy who was mesmerized by his big sister's endearing appearance, soon realized what a fiendish laughter she could have at the same time and her ruthlessness be damned as how she would always dominate over everything with her charming looks and her innocent polished cajolery but he had finally seen through the visages and the true nature of his big sister and won't give in to the urges, at least not without a fight. Don't give me that, because the only one who was enjoying was you? Eric stopped speaking for a second as all the horrors he had suffered until now came rushing in like a reel of thoughts but as soon as he got back his willpower, while suffering such humiliation in the face of monsters and unable to do a single thing to protect myself. The boy continuously hurled complaints for a while, but then realizing it was useless he renewed his determination and continued, That's right I have gotten much stronger now. Get ready and I will force you to meet the same fate when I defeat you. The elf boy, Ira gazed at the sudden expressionless and calm composure of her sister, unlike he who was overcome with too many emotions. Doubts and strategies filled to the brim in his head, as he covered his face with his free hand, he realized just how unpleasantly creased they had become when it had been only a couple of seconds that had passed, his long curly ears twitched a little to confirm there were not any other sounds that could have interfered with the battle and at the same time it could be described as him taking the feel of his surroundings, here I come. The boy announced the start of the fight as his everyday calling and launched himself at his opponent while his sister stood there like a statue with an indifferent look on her face as ever. 7. Aiming for her fingers where they gripped the wooden sword, he swung upwards, accelerating his entire body, making sure that she could not respond or dodge it by moving her body. Eric's sword would have made an absolute contact with her fingers but somehow Caroline had managed to change the hold of the sword from her usual hand to another and parried her little brother's strike away with a swift simple swing like blowing away a fly. Even though Eric would not have been easily put off by just one unsuccessful attempt, 
rather he prepared himself to head for a second strike, lowering his stance and after feigning for a defensive posture he hurled back his sword and raced it against all the physical world barriers changing the direction at the same time he pushed it forth with all his might, in an attempt to throw off Caroline's timing, like thrusting a rapier straight into an opponent's abdomen but his sword this time only met with air as she completely disappeared from his sight. Ereg kept himself calm and instead of searching for his opponent with his eyes he totally shut them off and a cold energy seemed to have been playing inside his mind. From the right, Ereg spoke to himself so feebly that it could only just have been heard by him. Drawing his hands backward, he gripped the sword with both his hands, and holding it firmly along the ribs vertically, he prepared to block. Even if you can predict from where I come, it's useless if you cannot match to my strength. Caroline who responded to his monologue, swung the sword in the same way as Ereg predicted, but not having enough power to tackle the blow and disperse the blow's impact he was thrown several yards away. Ark. Ereg groaned from the pain of being treated like a sandbag. I am not done yet. Ereg screamed as he again stood firmly on his toes. The next moment, eight. Somehow, he felt the pain only temporarily as he realized that he luckily landed on the softer part of the ground and prepared himself for another attack. According to the probabilities he had calculated in his brain through his skill it was much more likely that Caroline would charge forward and then would jump to make a hit on his head. Visualizing everything in his head he decided to dodge the attack and when his sister would be unable to change her posture midair. He would claim complete victory by knocking over her head. Ereg, who painted a solemn expression over his grin was bursting with joy from within. As he had claimed, his sister rushed forward from up front. Fire from my palm, become a spear and burn all creation. Ereg chanted a magical spell in almost an instant and channeling magic he reinforced his sword at the same time to further execute the next plan of action. The conjured spear headed towards Caroline with perfect precision. But as Ereg had surmised it was insufficient to even halt her sister's charge. Caroline flashing her sword swung it so hard that the fire composition of the lance turned into a chunk of disoriented smoke. Using it as a cover Caroline jumped above and thought to surprise Ereg with an uppercut on his head. At least that's how it should have been. Until Ereg when thought to shift himself from the trajectory of the swing from the Caroline hanging in the air. He was unable to move. He looked down and saw that his legs were jammed inside the sand. Unfortunately for him, Caroline had already considered the skills of Ereg and planned one step ahead. No. Ereg screamed was the only sound that followed afterwards. And a bang. Next. Nine. While Caroline stood there enjoying her 290th victory, Ereg held both of his hands over his head rubbing it softly over the bump. The only thing that he had on his mind was now to formulate a run and escape plan. No matter how embarrassing and cowardly it might be for a prince, he knew that a few times more and he might get accustomed to that horrific experience. It would be just like breaking down from within and submitting to the whims of his big sister. Just like everyone else did. Somehow, he had to while his sister was still not watching. Quietly and hiding all intent and putting a damper over all the noises generated through his movements he started running at full speed, just when he thought he was able to get away, by almost reaching the perimeter of the circular clearing. He felt a stretch across his leg, until he fell headbutt and gained a second bruise over his head. Turning back he again saw a fine-looking and affectionate smile on his sister's face as if expressing remorse. But for him it spoke otherwise and would only spell his doom. Ereg, should I tie you or would you like to help yourself? Caroline said as she pulled one end of the rope, while the other attached to her little sibling, helpless and bounded by the mere caprices of his sister. At least let me see the doctor and get this bruise treated. Ereg bawled almost breaking into tears, but a loss is a loss. Don't worry I am sure we can find some medicinal herbs and I remember going through a magical herb blooming in this season last night in the library. Now hurry up, I don't want my training time to be compromised and you know it better than anybody. The smile on Caroline's face deepened but here I could see a looming shadow under it as he felt the grip of the rope tied across his legs tightened. The more he resisted he got pulled towards her sister, only leaving his crying and screams to echo in the midst of the wilderness of the dangerous forest. 10. Chapter 
one with concern in her heart, I never would have thought that the person I had been with for all this time, Regis, would turn out to be my very own cousin and that half of my name would belong to the elf royal family, and if that was difficult enough to digest, then at the same time I would also be the niece to the elf kingdom's king and queen, but while I am alone in this room with mother who has been fondling and trying to hug my reflection on the other side of the transmission screen for a long time, I felt vaguely unhappy at the same time, it wouldn't be a hassle for me to just teleport back into the labyrinth, but I did promise to mother and further that I would come back only when I have achieved what I have set out to do. Anything else and other than that was out of the question. Mother probably knew this and instead of making me feel homesick she was trying to cheer me up in her own weird, special way. Everyone is possibly weird in one way or another. Or am I the only one who thinks that way? Even back in my original world when my uncle and aunt became my guardians. They made it so obvious that they detested me at the first sight for who I was. For them I would be something similar to an unlucky charm to be kept shut in their house. It didn't matter whether I got rusted or withered away. I did not care for their reason and neither wanted to know any of that stuff. And because of that I learned to take care of myself on my own. But things were little different between me and my cousin. She was three years younger than me and, in the start, we used to play together all the time. At that time I had no memories of my past except that I was told that I lost both of my parents in the car accident and the only person I was close to then was my cousin. 11. She too was fond of me and we would spend most of our time together whether it was time for studying, playing, eating or even during sleep. I even considered us as a pair of inseparable sisters. I thought I didn't need anyone else and she was my whole world and the person who meant most to me. But things changed when she was coaxed by her parents into going to the city's best girls boarding school. When in between she came back home because of the vacations, I realized things between us could never be the same again. Slowly but surely everything fell apart like whatever we had gone through was a lie. Ever since then she always had a dejected and resigned look on her face. It was clear that my uncle and aunt were forcing and putting up a lot of pressure on her to improve in studies. And despite that she was struggling to improve, even as a cousin sister and a close individual I failed to lend her a helping hand. My uncle insisted on leaving her daughter alone and blamed on me that it was my fault that her grades were poor because I did not let her study. On the other side, I would see my cousin quietly sitting and hear all the complaints. She had no reaction and she wasn't even moved by an inch to either support or oppose them. Maybe I slightly understood her, that being left alone and not had to deal with these conflicting thoughts being forced upon us from time to time was the best possible escape. From then on, she would avoid meeting or talking to me. All I could do was tell myself that her sole motive to do this was to avoid her parents or to give them a chance to shout and put all the blame on me. At least that's what I got myself into thinking. But I could always have charmed myself with such a lie and never know. Alicia just for a formality should I ask how did you end up in the elf kingdom? Caroline asked with a bitter smile on her face. Well, I first followed a stick and coincidentally Regis was following me and I answered cheerfully and demonstrating the direction I took with my hands, because that was obviously an easy question for me to answer than the dilemma I was facing now. 12. Never mind I asked. I probably knew that already. Mother interrupted me. But of course, because she knew me the best and always stayed with me the whole time without getting bothered by the fact that I always got lost in the huge mansion we lived and it took quite some time for me to get acquainted with the layer to use teleportation magic easily. Alicia, do you think it was wrong of me to tell them about you? Are you angry with me? Mother asked. No, not all. I can never be angry with you. I insisted by raising my voice a bit louder than the usual. I really could never feel angry for whatever decision mother made for me. But I still felt uncertain with how they might react to this fact that I am a part of their family now. Would they accept me just like mother and father did when they found me? Or would they completely try to shun me? Even now I feel conflicted that whether telling them was the right thing or not. I never minded with what mother did and I could never come to hate her for who she was because in this new life they were my only parents. The moment I have been in this palace, 
It has been such a nice and welcoming place for me. Even when it was just for a day or whether at night, with how I was poisoned, I did not mind if the confusion was cleared at the end. But Regis, the king and the queen have been so good to me, and treated me nicely despite their stature. They would probably call it so because of the Great Spirit's proclamation but I could tell that it would have been the same even without it, but now that I was only an adopted family member so would they just start treating me like my uncle and aunt and try to avoid me, would their behavior towards me completely change, but all I just wanted was for the things to remain the same as they were, is it really that bad to wish just for that? Because even back then, at the end the one who was left isolated and alone in the house was me and making friends at school was not an optimistic prospect for me either. 13. Hugh. Mother took a deep sigh and continued, if you remain this quiet, then even I will get concerned, don't forget that I am your senior as well as master in adventuring and have much more valuable experience than you. If you find a place you want to stay then you don't really need to say it goodbye forever. It is people whom you can trust that are real and you should always share your heart with them and you will never be forgotten. Mother has often told me about our adventures and I always wished I could be a part of them or at least experience one of them myself. And now that I had got a taste of one, I longed for it but sharing things like that could really destroy the trust when not handled carefully. Sharing secrets I have hidden so many from Regis of about who I am and I would end up doing so probably more often, and because all secrets comes out eventually, I will lose Regis and her family's trust and the fact that she would ever call me her friend again would be lost forever. If Regis decided to come with me as she requested in the start, it would surely put her life in danger just when she was finally learned to conquer her fear and magic power, now she can stay with her family and do what she had wanted for a very long time, there was no need for her to come with me, I can just make do with directions and not get distracted from my path. And I would only be getting in the way of their family bonds at the end, I stared hesitantly in mother's eyes not knowing what to say, Alicia at least trust me on this, when I say that this world has many different people and many ways of thinking, you don't need to rush things and can take your time to see the world and broaden your horizons, that would really make me happy. I still do not know what to believe or what I should choose to do and because of that, I am only able to trust myself. I replied to mother's heartwarming perspective, I was still hesitating. I cannot make up my mind for things that haven't yet even happened or I have no control of. I am terrified to think that I would lose such an important place that I have found so new. The thought that I have to leave so soon, my wish and care for Regis as a friend feels so empty. 14. I could tell now that the feeling of being betrayed in my past life still lingered within me. Because I betrayed my own cousin's expectation and instead of trying to talk out things with her. I still chose the path of separating our ways, at that time it felt so right to do, that she would find happiness and support even without me, but I was just running and scared to think that what if she really hated me for doing this to her, that somewhere or the other, deep down she was waiting for me to turn up to her, at that time was I really waiting for some kind of calling or a sign when everything was so clear to me just like now, why is it so much difficult to put my trust in other people first? Than hoping for them to trust me, even though it feels so wrong at the same time. But thinking of Regis, who saved me back on the Dragon Island and did everything to the extent of using her magic which she hated the most just for me. Maybe I was the one who was being the most unaccepting. I am sure you can do that even if you just believe in whatever you do. Alicia do well to remember it, that there is a place for you and you are always bound to it. It's your home and we can take a bath any time together and have a hearty talk. Mother said gleefully and almost jumping out of the screen at the end. Though her motherly affection did reach me it wouldn't surprise me at all if she blurred those virtual boundaries and came to my rescue. Yes, I will. Maybe it was best for me to figure it all on my own and decide by myself after all. And what makes it so special are the people watching over me.
which I did not had last time, though it can be also because I am hesitant to the last offer mother made and I am not so sure that I should agree to such a glamorous offer because the theme can turn dark any time. But I can't wait to go back home soon and still continue to travel in this world, and this time of course with a guide. 15. Regis Escalon It was the first time the condition struck me, where my tongue cleaves under the dental roof, body freezes, my ears twitched and the blood vessels in my heart about to rupture and burst out. The fact that Alicia was my cousin was already startling enough, but to think that I was standing alone in front of my aunt. After Alicia came out of the transmission chamber and she seemed to be in her usual merry mood, did she think nothing of this or is it just not that big of a deal to her? I wouldn't be surprised or is she just faking it all? I cannot tell now. But just thinking that the legendary true hero is my actual aunt is making me sweat buckets. Isn't this supposed to be a top grade information of our country and much bigger secret than the Genesis tree? To think of possessing the knowledge that the history of our world is warped and a big fat lie. Possibly it should be graded as a world top secret. I would be dead even if I blurt out such a big secret by mistake. Isn't it too soon for me to die? or being pursued for withholding information about such complicated affairs. Wait. From when I have been fretting over things so easily, it's not like me at all. Is this what when people say of being influenced in bad company, I need to work on it because it's totally bad for my brain's health. To think that she would have such a deep effect on me when just over a day had passed. On second thought I might need to get used to it after all. Since we are cousins now, so maybe this time definitely I have a strong reason to journey alongside her. So I still I had a chance. Just maybe. I crunched my eyes and decided to look up at the transparent screen. But before I could focus and think of way to greet my aunt for the first time, my gazes were fixated on the screen depicting a portrait of a beautiful lady in long and puffy green hairs with vibrant purple eyes. I would have only taken it as a stunning picture of a dreamlike beauty, but the woman displayed too beautiful smile to be written off as unreal. On top of that with her brave features she flashed an overpowering and confident aura all around. She was the perfect embodiment of what I always wanted to be. 16. But just watching that simple and cheerful smile was putting my heart at such ease that if things went on a bit longer like this then even my heart would start fluttering. So, Regis. A sweet young voice called out to me, while her childlike large eyes made her appear younger than she really was. And to think that she was more than 200 years old, but then again being this young was a common trait for a high elf after all. I think I am kind of glad I was born an elf and a beautiful princess myself. Yes. I blurted out loudly without thinking. Even with how much at ease I was, there was still something daunting and a strong power behind her. Something I would feel from Alicia too from time to time trying to line up my thoughts with how I could convince others for letting me be with her. But I came empty and most of the reasons were bleak and arrogant on my part. And that's when I realized how powerless I was. I was just putting my curiosity and needs first without thinking about the difficulties and problems I was causing the others. Even on the Dragon Island I fainted and was not of much help. I am sure Alicia could have done all of that on her own. So what did I really have to offer and help her with? If it was just taking her to the human continent, sure there were much more capable pathfinders than me in this kingdom. But on the other hand I was just as much stranger to the outside just as she was. I have always hated to be on the taking side and not being grateful. Alicia made everything possible for me to help me get rid of my fear from this magic. And even after that fight, and I have jumped several levels now with my skill being evolved into a title, Ally of the Wind. I really don't know what I can do with it. At the end I failed to prove my capabilities and I could never hope to reach in power levels to Alicia even if I train for a millennia. I am not a fool to not realize that. There are so little things that I can do and only make things difficult for others because of my self-centered nature. But I was ready to change myself if only it is possible to. 17. I know Alicia would be difficult to handle when alone. Just look at yourself with all the new wrinkles on your forehead. My aunt exclaimed out as she burst out into laughter. No, that can't be. Saying that I hid my forehead with both of my hands and was played like a fool to see her make fun of me. 
It felt a bit annoying but it so much reminded me of my big sister, Edith whom I haven't seen for a month, I know, I know, you don't have to tell me, but isn't her openness refreshing? Aunt Caroline said wiping a tear off from her right eye, at first, I felt embarrassed but when the time came to face the truth, I knew I would be upset but being unable to hide it was not something I was prepared for. Yeah, she must have lived a great life surrounded by amazing people, she is really special. I said softly, unlike me who only made things difficult for myself as time passed by, she must have talent to keep on being herself. Oh, I wouldn't be so sure about that myself. If you think she chose to stay with you out of pity then I am disappointed if you fail to notice that she too could feel your pain of being separate and different from others. Don't you want to follow her on her journey? You know I can just look and tell for a girls that are ambitious like I am. The true hero looked at me intently and I swear that her eyes glittered as I couldn't help but feel that this person knew me better than myself. So, someone could have surely taken pity on me. But for Alicia that thought even for once never passed from my mind. She really never left me alone or gave me a moment to think that way. Why haven't I seen that before? The reason she is still here or been with me was so simple. But now that makes me even more greedy and happy, that I can no longer let it go. A clear smile cracked on my face. You are wrong. I do not want to follow her, but I will be her companion friend and an equal, someone she can rely upon just as much as she could on me for help. 18. That's right, I do not want to be taken as a person just for granted, or out of consideration or because we are now relatives. That's never been any of my thoughts. Just a friend in need and deed. Oh, is that so? I am glad to hear that, but as of now she still lacks the courage to believe in others. She must have told you about her mission to find someone and how absurd as it may sound. Are you still willing to stay with my daughter till you see it through? She said in a motherly tone but at the same time I could also feel an intimidating aura around her, she sure is Alicia's mother. I care for her, more than ever now. And the more I get to know her I want to look after her. So, please let me be her guide from now on. Because she always kinds of get lost. I felt a bit embarrassed saying these lines, and it's highly unlikely I would have said them in front of anyone else. But seeing her talk I felt like I could be more open for the first time myself with my feelings. Regis, people can't ignore the power that reside in them, you know it better than anyone. And I have learned it too in my own ways, for Alicia even if I hate to say it, but it is going to be the same no matter what I do about it. Even if she ends up finding that person, she hasn't decided what to do next. And that scares me whether her journey will end with happiness or will it bring sadness to her. The true hero flashed a look of maternal concern for her daughter, in all this time all I had been doing is saying mean things to her, at that time, I didn't even know what to do and no matter how much I tried I might have hurt her feelings. But I have decided to be a part of everything she faces from now on. I added stubbornly, it was a weird feeling but I came on strong. She might have never had a friend about her same age, so just try to help her so that you can laugh and feel sad together because from here on now her fights will not be that simple because they won't be just simple mindless monsters, but living and breathing people. That won't bother me, because being with her, it all felt like a dream. And no matter what I cannot give up on my dream, no matter what I will trust her, after all we are sisters now. I announced with full confidence. 19. Just look at you being all big sister type, it's so adorable. Caroline outburst. Fine. Fine. I knew it would be embarrassing to say all that. So please don't repeat it on my face and stop chiding me. She is a handful and not honest with whatever she says completely. And that irritates me and kinds of put me off but I can at most handle that much. At least I am preparing myself or so. I realized that the person in front of me was formidable and an expert of letting someone freely speak of their inner feelings out in the open. See you acting like a good old cousin again. I totally get you, but also then, I wouldn't be able to worry about her like this. She said with a maternal tone. Wow, I did it again. How could I? I stomped my feet in frustration. I wish if only Eric could be like that. She said with a clear-cut smile. I couldn't help but wonder how were she and father in their childhood as cousin brother and sister.
Obviously, she would have been more understanding of father and would have acted maturely and been good siblings, unlike someone who needs to learn and act properly. So go and tell the world what you really want and I hope that you never let the color in Alicia's eye fade and turn blue. My aunt finally passed me a thumbs up and wished me good luck. So, that was it. Maybe it was time and I have already talked long enough and after wishing her goodbye I slowly started walking outside. Father did always warn me of being wary of elder sister and another woman he would suddenly bring up. Was he speaking of her? It was really scary to talk to her but at the same time it was fun. But what did she mean by the thing she said in the last? Was that some kind of a warning? Even I don't know what we would do outside with ourselves. For now I was within the boundaries of my family and father's rule. But outside my comfort zone and things beyond this kingdom's borders can change much drastically. 20. But she did never explain me of how I was going to do all of this. Should I turn back and just ask? But it seems that further had been impatient to talk to her for a very long time and so I shouldn't take his precious reunion time. And she was right. I had seen Alicia fighting, even when it was just for a glimpse before I fainted. Her strength was limitless and she fought without any hesitation like a narrow launched out of a bow. She becomes a totally different person, so different and apart. So, then which was the real she? When a bow is tied too tight, it can easily snap in two. But is it really important for me to know? I am going to stay with her and believe in what I will do and find it out myself. I walked out of the final entrance gate and it opened into the vast radiance of the elven garden than the closed room packed from all sides. It rather felt refreshing. And there was Alicia waiting for me too, looking at her. I might have just wanted to go and tightly hug her for some reason or already start behaving like sisters. But I knew she really didn't want that kind of treatment from me. That's why I am going to accept what she had offered to me previously. As I straightforward marched to her and stood in front of her, my heart raced. As I still hesitated to say it, while directly trying to look into her eye and not faltering this time. Alicia. I want you to grant me my wish. I announced. Then I will make your wish come true and not let you hurt anyone because of your magic unless you want to. Smiled Alicia as she said it after a small pause, a glint of surprise surfaced on her face. Also I want you to fight me. I spoke making my intentions clear with my glare, and others too must have got it while they were also wondering what could have gotten into me to do this, as both mother and father were taken aback by my daunting proposal. 21. And why would I do that? I don't want to or have a reason to fight you. Alicia said innocently, like a saint who would never preach for violence. But didn't you say that for my wish you will protect anyone? So how would I know that you are up for the task and capable of doing it if you cannot prove it with a fight and those are not just words of fallacy? I rebuked her, and rejoiced thinking that I have backed her into a corner. I held my breath, while my shoulders might have just trembled for an instant. She stood there silently and without her mask and with that gorgeous composition she had the appearance of a doll. Don't worry I won't be taking much of your time. Three days from now I challenge you. I might as well confess that I would have a crazy smile on my face right now, because in this little time, as far as I remember it took me much longer than this to understand that I needed to hold the spoon from the thinner end to eat and not the other way around. I see. Let's have a fair and equal fight. I say yes to your challenge. Alicia replied betraying no hints of emotions, but even that tempting appearance of her failed to cover up that as I gulped looking at those pursed lips and thought that that smile, she had on her face was scrilly beautiful. Papara, papara, papara. The intolerable silence was finally dispersed by the unvigilant loud voices of trumpet and the explosive sound of drums that rumbled in complete harmony and progression with it. Someone from the front of the castle gates announced, as we could hear a force of horses galloping towards it. The eldest princess, Edith Escalon has returned to the Escalon capital palace. This announcement was made twice. As I was glad to hear that Big Sister had finally returned and how I couldn't wait to see her surprised with how things have been here. 22. Then again it might not prove to be that pleasant of a meeting because of her weird attics which I remembered from my childhood just now. For some reason she too had a talent of making people do things that they never would have dreamed of. Oh great spirit couldn't you just have delayed her arrival by four days and I would have been long gone from here.
I might have just made another wish which could be even beyond Alicia's capabilities and scope to handle. 23. Transmission chamber so that you get what you wanted. Ereg asked as he circled inside the chamber. His forehead apparently shrunk and his skin warped into thick wrinkled lines as he assessed everything that happened on the outside. He needed to make this quick because long conversations on such old transmission stones could be difficult and his eldest daughter has just now arrived after one month. Don't make me sound like I am running a devious plot here. If you are going to be like this then why don't you send me my dear niece back? At least we were of same mind. Well she has got a similar spirit like you. But it seems that all your weird habits ended up being a part of Edith. Ereg, the king of elves frowned. You don't say that too often. Caroline was surprised at such a response and an allergy being drawn out of her. So, tell me what it is that you contacted me for out of nowhere. Surely it is not limited to just that. You already know that her strength is comparable to you or would I be right to assuming that it's even beyond that? Ereg spoke skeptically. A thick silence filled the room and Caroline's face seemed frozen into a stricken expression. She was at a loss of words. She only came here to give a warning without revealing much and worrying others, but now that the cat was out of the box, she needed to renew her thinking, you don't have to be on edge. I am just asking, is the world really going to be pushed into another war or nearer, and if it is a possibility then why now? As such for now I can't see any of those warmongering humans take such drastic actions. Ereg remarked and seemed to be ruthless in his assessment, don't be so harsh in your judgment. You do know that I and Alicia are humans. Caroline sulked. It's not humans I am blaming. War is not affixed to some race. But I cannot forgive those barbarian minded human nations in North who always, 24, try to intimidate us with violence. Though the Middle Earth and the South human nations are pacifists and have shown trade interest with us. But after the true demon lord too has decided to live a life of peace. Thanks to a certain someone. Crazy ideas are being drilled into the sum of the recent hot blooded eight demon lords. There is no telling what can happen in this world and when. This piece will soon break like a mirage. I told you not to see probabilities too far in the future. Those long numbers will just screw up with your mind. But that is a possibility. Ereg said with a pained expression. That's what I am saying, they are just thoughts. It is you who are going to take action and keep it safe. Now act as a good king should and take care of everyone. The true hero replied lacking the dignity of a hero but it also seemed to work like a charm. As those simple words were more than enough to put the mind of the elf king and her little brother at peace. I understand. I am sorry. Just as I said before I won't be interfering with this world any longer. This world is too narrow for a hero and peace to exist together. Ereg realized the weight of the words and the things she had to sacrifice as a part of bringing peace and saving everyone and ending the war. She did it all and it was she who sacrificed all. The more he hated it. At the same time he came to admire and respect that decision more as he ruled over his kingdom without being a part of any subsequent bloodshed. No matter what if he remained sad or tied to the past, then everything would have been meaningless. And so he had decided to prosper this kingdom and live every day of his life with utmost joy. You say that and yet you unleashed her on this world. Don't blame me. It was always supposed to be like that. And her natural strength is because of her own hard work, which she honed on her own. All I did was tune it up for a bit. Let's just say that it's in her blood. Caroline said brushing her bangs as she felt being complimented for her kids. So you do know of her origins. 25. Ereg stop right there it would be foolish and futile to put your nose in unnecessary matters. It's not worth investigating. I hear you, big sister. Ereg back down the moment he sensed her sister's disapproval over the matter. So, you finally called me that. I am glad to hear that. And don't forget that she is my precious daughter and I am happy to see that I also got to meet my loving niece. Don't worry I will be looking after her and she seems to be much diligent and charming than you could ever be. What did you say? Well I cannot refute that statement. But you saying it, doesn't suit you. Caroline said out of frustration. You are one to talk, after you did not fulfill the bet yourself. Ereg suddenly went in hyper mode, as if someone had finally touched and revoked a feeling in him that shouldn't have been fiddled around with. 
Are you still upset with that? It's not my fault that you fainted so I just passed the bet. You passed, those dark days and hell I was put through, surely would have done a number on my lifespan, but don't forget that I was the one who won in the final match on the day you left. Ereg opposed. Well, you took me by surprise with your cheap trick so let's just say I went easy on you. Caroline said in haste as she wanted to now quickly wrap things up and leave. You are the one with folly here. Don't turn around and start humming while I am talking to you. Just accept that you lost. Ereg shouted as every word of his was dipped in remorse and painful memories of those scarred times. Well, then why don't we make another bet to see who is the real winner? And what would that be? 26. Let's bet on who would win between Alicia and Regis. Surely it would be Alicia my daughter but if you want, I can just take the bet back and close the discussion. You really don't get it at all. What do you mean? Caroline was surprised at the sudden remark of Ereg. Regis is going to win, because she is fighting for the same reason as I once did. She is going to do everything in her power to win, and I am going to fully support her in doing this. Ereg said as if he was just about to awaken something within him, something he had lost for quite some time. He was becoming more animated by the second, as he burst into a wild laughter. The competitive nature of his to come out at the top from his childish nature had yet again taken roots in him. If that's the case then I dare you. I am not going to back down either as the one who hold the title of true hero of this world. Caroline said firing up his little brother even more as she gave him the final push, he needed to accept the bet. While in her mind she was relaxed to think that her little brother was gullible as always to take his mind off from the previous bet and avert the calamity, she knew somewhere or other he needed to invest his mind into because if Regis had decided to follow Alicia, then she would also have to wish goodbye to her family too at the same time and part with them and she was happy that she could do something about it in the end. 27. Chapter, 2. My reasons and further I have returned and subjugated all the monsters in the southern part of the empire. Edith, the first princess said kneeling down in front of the king of the elven kingdom. Everyone, including the king, queen, regis, Alicia, prime minister and some close royal guards had by now assembled in the king's office. Most of the official decisions regarding the kingdom were taken here, and unlike the humans who liked to show their grandeur by sitting on ornamental throne with a diamond crown on their head and surrounded by a multitude of dauntless men working under his reign in a giant hall, elves preferred secluded lives and peaceful discussions rather than going over ambunctious debate and protests. You did well Edith. I am glad that you have secured the borders and even took care of all the monsters that were attacking the farms and the villages in the area. The king announced. What I just did was for the benefit of the Escalon kingdom and was needed to be done in order to keep my homeland safe. Said the young lady, who was around five years older than her little sister. Her long, bright golden hair color and striking features amplified the impression of her being an energetic and lively person though one could observe subtle similarity in Regis and her face, but they vastly differed because Edith possessed eyes that were more courageous and ambitious, her attitude had been stately but also fresh and modest to make her a perfect and idle princess and a ruling queen in the near future, but seeing her clad in a military armor from neck to toe, not only spoke of her being an attractive woman, but one who also excelled in military campaigns as she led a small battalion of the army and did a meticulous job of a general too. 28. The other subordinates working under her and other ministers submitted over their report regarding the restoration of the kingdom after the Dragon Island problem had been taken care of and the productiveness of the land was slowly being restored everywhere. The citizens were happy and the economy had started flourishing with the production of goods accelerated by the resources harvested from the monster corpses. Everyone in the army seemed to be happy by the fact that the expedition ended three weeks earlier than expected and they were able to return home with laurels. I thank you with great joy. You may go now and rest. The rewards for your achievements and hard work would be granted to you on a later specified date. The king said with a smile on his face as he rose up from his seat and so did the soldiers who were on their one knee including the first princess. Yes, your highness. Saying that everyone left, leaving Edith, Regis, the elf king Ereg, 
and the elven queen Alva and one more individual who seemed to be trying to do her best in hiding behind Regis all this time. Unfortunately for her, every time she tried to move, she was caught up by the fear of being embarrassedly found in the act and left shaken. Edith for a long time hid her eye on her as she was the only one wearing a half mask, only revealing a small mouth and her glossy skin underneath it. For some reason she found her actions funny but could not understand that why she was still waiting there with her family, and it did seem that she would have left on the king's order if Regis had not eminently held her hands and forced her to stop. And that's when Edith stopped understanding everything. That was because she had never seen her younger sister in any of the kingly proceedings before. And what about her condition or did she just saw things and was tired after all? As she silently stood there and her father and mother tried to approach her, she was lost too deep in thoughts to notice that. Edith, I want to introduce you to someone. The king called out to her. 29. But before he could continue. He found Edith already rushed close to the two small girls who were standing in the corner of the room all this time like obedient little kids waiting for their turn on the merry-go-round or down the slide, and even though he would have rubbed his eyes twice he still couldn't shake off the feeling that the two girls looked like being bullied by a senior who refused to renounce his turn to leave the play because they were having fun, and somehow, he knew what was coming or maybe it reminded him of his own past and unexpectedly felt sorry for himself for not being able to do anything. And who is this little one here? Edith said flashing a motherly smile. Her hands moved as if on its own and grabbed onto something that shouldn't have been touched or no one had dared to do so before. Alicia who was shocked with a sudden question posted to her, said in a broken voice, My name is Alicia A.A. and... There came an unexpected self-introduction which even Regis did not guess. So, Alicia's broken voice turned into flushed cheeks when the mask on her face was plucked off from her face in an instant. This had never happened before to her and neither did anyone gamble to do so. She could have easily teleported herself or moved away if she would have found herself in a tough spot, but because she was the younger cousin now, she wanted to have proper introductions and not come out as rude by disappearing. But now she was just overwhelmed by her frankness and with how Edith came out so strong on her. Instantly she found her face pulled between Edith's palm and her chin resting on it, like a flower beautifully held between the two hands. Even when the touch was soft and gentle, she found the act pretty violating, as her fingers jiggly movements were prompt and executed much similar to someone else's technique which she was most familiar to. Oh, Regis you never told me you had such an adorable friend. Edith indulged further into the act which she found so intoxicating. 30. Big sister, stop with that. Maybe you should first listen to her. Alicia say something don't just stand there feeling guilty. Regis who was disgusted by her sister's impulsive behavior felt unsettling chills. Even though she was glad that she was not in Alicia's spot, she vocalized her protest to put some sense into her about the disconnect between their effect and reaction. She had realized that she really shouldn't be ignoring this if she would have to be the next victim. It's useless Regis. It seems that Alicia had already developed a tolerance for it. She would stand strong and not lose her ground. Regis's further tried to explain Regis of how their efforts would be for naught as he brandished a strong fist at her, declaring that they needed to be determined and united. I see. If that's the case, then we should come after some time and maybe then talk properly. Regis passed a tensed smile followed by a chuckle as she was now on the same boat as her father. Instead of just standing there you two and giggle, why don't you just do something? Alicia is about to pass out from overdoing it. Edith how many time have I told you to be considerate of people around you? For the first time Alicia found a savior in her life and it was not Regis her friend and cousin or the highest authority of king but her quintessential empathetic and understanding aunt. 31. Alicia was Scallon Ashbourne I thought my life would have been sucked out of me this time. But I can finally take a breath of relief after being saved by my brave aunt in the final moments. I will always be thankful to Aunt Alva for saving my life. Then my uncle explained to big sister Edith, trying his best to state to us as much as possible with the events about my visit to this kingdom. 
Haomi and Regis ran off to the Dragon Island to which he already knew about and had already guessed it. Coming to the present duel Regis proposed between me and how I was related to the family as such. I see. A lot has happened in my absence and there is so much to catch up to. Edith now took a quick glance at her two younger sisters, so, I am going to start at it just about. Now. Edith said without getting surprised or emotional seizures after all that unbelievable history that went down. She appeared to be a level-headed person, after she had a nearful from Aunt Alva. But I was so foolish to just assume things that lustful people could ever have their thirst quenched so easily. Again big sister Edith latched out from her berated state and without learning anything pulled herself close to us and hugged me and Regis tight. I was not customarily hostile to the act. It's just that I was still not used to being around so many people like this and share their thoughts openly, or, rather there was just one person in the room who needed to exercise such etiquettes and manners, I was so busy in mushing those soft cheeks. I didn't even notice that beautiful white shade of your hair, and now I have such a cute younger sister, Edith said excitedly as my spidery senses went ringing, big sister stop with your weird antics. Regis protested with a detestable tinge in her voice. Ah. It's just your big sister fulfilling her curiosity. Edith replied fearlessly. You just have to win in an argument. Regis said frustrated. As she stared at me still struggling around with the pampering. Alicia. Don't tell me you. 32. Are enjoying this. Regis's face color was blown apart as she became emotionally sterile. Being a witness and an untouched target herself. No, it's not like that. I said loudly, trying to make things clear. I tried to make out my hand to grab to her for help but Edith successfully snuggled those in between her tight hug to Regis, by any chance are you jealous, because Alicia is getting special attention from me, or, is it because she is just more adorable than you are? Edith said in a teasing voice. Till now I was just hesitant around her, but somehow, I could feel terrific vibes emanating from my elder cousin, this was bad, that was the only message my brain tried to relay to me again and again, Alicia, I am sure Regis wouldn't be so nice to show you to the capital city, but don't worry your elder cousin here is kind enough to give you a tour to the elf kingdom since it's your first visit, Edith said whispering in my ears, but still I couldn't understand the point if she was going to be loud enough to be audible to everyone in the room. Yes, yes, I want to. With a quick response I showed my urgency to the proposal. And I might have responded even more excited than she had expected me to be that for a moment even she was taken by surprise. Nothing mattered to me now anymore. I didn't have time to think but all I wanted to do now was to take a look at the city and the market area, the things they sold here their specialties in eatery and not to forget their indigenous magical tools, and just when I was lost in thought I heard a hateful voice, you traitor, Regis passed me an evil eye and continued in the same tone, if you are that desperate to go and would rather have a tour from her, then be my guest, don't complain to me when you get lost in the middle of the capital, I am leaving because I have things to do for now, saying that Regis hurriedly left with huge and heavy strides. At least she should have tried hard enough to not raise flags for me. I was out of words and felt sad for her, not knowing myself what to do. 33. Big sister Edith, shouldn't we invite her too? I appealed to her, it's alright, you don't need to worry about her and if she still decides to remain angry from you then I will take care of it. Though her words sounded just a make-believe to me it had a special kind of affection attached to it that I never understood, it was not a skill she had been using or a magic that I could not comprehend with my knowledge, they were simply words that could really set one free, and just when I was rounding up my thoughts Edith pulled my hand as she waved to Aunt Alva and took me out of the room. Mother, we are going to take a trip to the city. Take good care of her Edith, and be mindful of your actions. Aunt Alva said adding a voice of consequence, will do. Edith replied from the still remaining small opening as she closed the door from the other side, and I am afraid her promise sounded hollow to me, Alicia, let's first get you a change of clothes. I am sure we have a variety of them available here in the castle and you can choose any number of them. She said as she rushed like a little child pulling my hand to catch up to her pace, 
we entered a new room, which more or less looked like a huge supermart of clothes, hanging on the walls from pipe-like hangers and put on display dash well ironed and all them smelled so fresh and scented with rose water. That's how royalty lives, was the only next thought in my mind, but fortunately for this kingdom I have never seen Regis and her family wishing for a golden hand and they were already satisfied with the wealth they had but most of these dresses were too flashy for me. At least that's what I could conclude just from one look. Is it really necessary for me to change to visit outside? My usual attire should just do. I liked my clothes very much because I designed them myself from my webs. Also they were lighter than any fiber and stronger than any material I have still to find to cut it in half. They are easy to move in. No, 34 matter what I am doing and I can keep them fresh and clean by adding new layer of threads and discarding the old ones. Ah, you might be right. But, Edith kept on smiling, until it took me a while to realize her real intention of just playing around with me like a doll. Listen everyone, you have got a new visitor here, and she wants to try something new. I didn't quite catch to whom she was talking to, until then I could hear a rush from the other side of the room. Dozens of elves in maid uniform headed in our direction and their eyes were fixated on me, or rather they were trying to look through me, measuring me from every direction and way their eyeballs could probably roll. I wanted to run, but Edith had already devoured my hands deep in her chest. Alicia why don't you start picking with your favorite color, do you like red or pink? Neither. I whispered trying to pull myself away without being forceful. Well I usually preferred blue, but I think white too suits me after my hair color changed. Back in my previous life I had always dreamed of meeting elves, the obsession was too high that I had started dreaming about being surrounded by them everywhere and even living among them in a dreamlike world. Sure, this world was supposed to be the place where I could fulfill my every desire, but now that I was living in it. The things that I was pushed through was absolutely indescribable that I wouldn't be able to say with my limited knowledge of vocabulary. Being manhandled and roughed around by a train of maids and their hands that worked in undressing and dressing me in an assembly line had achieved transcendental skills, not to forget the fact that every time I was displayed in front of Edith in all types of clothes and she just had to refuse them all as if intentionally, after praising my appearance, to go for an even better one. Not to forget the dedicated maids who kept on passing compliments like the sales manager of the month who would do anything to coax his customers to hit his pitch, and every time Edith refused, they vowed to come with a 35 strong comeback and with a totally new design, some even processed and cut into a dress to fit my size on the spot. The whole procedure just became so spontaneous that I had already given up on resisting and just went along with it like opening a totally new door in my life. At some point a new maid entered from the direction from which we came and after taking a quick look at me, she conjured a huge empty copy and a fountain pen and started scribbling on it. Stop it. I said with a stuffed voice, when I realized that the dresses I was wearing became ostentatious and deprecated in logic and common sense. I am sorry to interrupt, princess but I think that choosing any cloth from here would be detrimental to your identity leak in the public. It was the maid who had just been taking notes till now suddenly spoke, you are right, it seems Alicia we will have to stick with the usual, but if you want, we can visit here again. I refuse. I said imminently, I was thankful to the maid who tried to drill some sense but never understood why did she take so long to do it. After that Edith pulled out two cloaks from a cupboard one of my size and one that would perfectly fit her. Putting on the hood I realized that it was the same kind of cloak that Regis wore when we first met. We were offered a carriage at the castle gate and Edith promptly refused. She wanted to go on foot and I seconded her vote. If it was from inside the carriage, I wouldn't have been able to enjoy much either way, but walking through an elf city was something that was pumping me up and made me forget the tiredness of the treatment I was put through. I was just glad I had to not meander in those showbiz of clothes in the marketplace when I was at least visiting for the first time. Those flashy garments are surely not to my taste. At first while walking around Edith, 
There were only huge castle walls and nothing else special to speak of except for an endless plain of plain grass and a wide grey gravel footpath we have been walking on. 36. Slowly things were taking shape and after few check posts and high towers that we were able to easily pass through, only to get salutes whenever they saw Big Sister. She was surely valued and held in high regards everywhere. Slowly the scenery changed and from the castle in the hills, down to the bottom, the path that became of cobblestone and small stone and wood building in clusters started appearing from time to time. Unfortunately for me, when I asked about living on trees, she told me how it was an outdated practice now, and people did it only on the outskirt villages to live in small tree houses to avoid monsters, but since it was safe in the kingdom, there was no longer any need of those houses, now that I put much thought into it, the idea of living in tree house is enticing, but in longer terms the wood gets easily rotten when seasons can drastically change in these parts. Also there is always the fear of trees decaying and falling or outgrowing into other tree houses. That would surely be a mess. Even with preservation magic it would be difficult to find people with acquitted skill to sustain these houses and would not gain much in strategic advantage and can easily catch fire and spread to other places. Somehow, I am grateful I realized the foolishness of my idea pretty soon, but that didn't change the fact that the town square that we had reached so soon would be so bustling with elves around everywhere. Sometimes I would spot some beast men or demons and out of the blue even humans. But Edith seems to have already planned where we were heading to, but before that she wanted to show me the specialties, the capital market had to offer. It would mostly seem that for a single commodity there were specific market where we would find all the sellers selling the same thing. There was the furniture market, that took pride in its handily thrifted manufactured products. The curvilinear design they made and achieved by using wind magic to move the cutting tools and finished with bold, beautiful curves, surpassed the technology in my previous world. They were quick in their work and the tall, strong elves were so swift in loading and unloading trucks with the huge logs, though that shouldn't have come as a surprise with their muscular body, and just by seeing their vigor and rigorous actions and 37 synergy they brought would have put anyone who called himself a hard worker to shame. Then there were medicine shops along the same line. Medications were produced from all types of herbs collected by the army and the adventurers guild, where they were then distributed to the whole world. But according to Edith they were very secretive with their recipes. Not that I was interested it when my healing magic could fix anything unless I wasn't dead. Then we went through shops that sold anything available to them, much more like a versatile market where I could just enter and ask for anything. There were even people outside selling things through auction and that day the item of the day was a bag of magical beans that could do a bunch of things. But none of them happens until a bean is planted in the ground, watered, and then allowed to sit for a minute. Then fruits. Mushrooms may sprout instantaneously from where the bean was planted, or a giant 60-foot tall tree might bud into existence. The concept seemed quite familiar to me, not that there was any mention of someone curious trying to climb up and go beyond the clouds. Now there wouldn't just happen to be a floating island of giant saw would there? Then were several special magical tools being sold like the staff of birds that could attract birds to a place I wanted just for once, and a magical fishing rod with an endless string attached to it. Well it would seem that they were not that dedicated to this department after I was finally able to stop Edith making me wear an amulet that could make her listen to my inner thoughts or the bow. She was trying to purchase to use on Regis that would put her under a spell to only make out animal sounds whenever she would try talking. For, starters how does the government even manage to handle the flow of such useless devices in the first place? There were several other places we went through like the place where they sell clothes and it would seem that green was not their only favorite color. Usually their art pieces would depict the impression of the divine tree and the spirits they worshipped and believed in. 38. Edith flawlessly talked to the shopkeepers who were more than willing to tell us about the products and they had a unique air of arrogance and pride of the things they made. 
Usually in my previous life I would dig information about a product or a human being on the internet but listening to them in details with added stories and signs from the seller was surely a new practice for me. I had never been thorough with any market before, because I would usually get tired or land at the wrong place, but in this new magical body I never get that feeling unless I really overdo it. And with this hood no one even bothers to look what we are doing. Finally, I sighed, is there something that matter? Edith asked, as we headed towards another lane, nothing, it's all right. Are you talking about the guards that have been keeping an eye on us? I wonder where they suddenly disappeared. Edith seemed to be worried so I thought it was best to come clean. I am sorry. I found it uncomfortable so I used a magic spell, perception blocking, to vanish out of their sight. Is it wrong? Really? Don't worry about it. I too used to be bothered by them but father would never be willing to leave me alone since they were more skilled than me, so I couldn't even run away from them. He is such a worry art, so I thought let it be since they wouldn't interfere until the situation becomes threatening. It would be so nice if I could do something like that. Edith smiled back at me and I felt relieved. But she did say about doing something similar. But why is that? A princess who has got the looks and smarts to do everything in her life would need such a wicked spell, that is nothing but escapism. If I could use such a magic in my previous life and hide my existence from everyone, I would have gladly done so for my entire life. There would have been no one who would make me feel sad, or blame me for things I could not. 39. Do. Heck. I could have probably traveled around the world and no one would have noticed me. But. To be honest even then I would have holed up myself inside a room and did nothing. So, what was different this time? I could have easily avoided the Dragon Island situation if I could have casted this spell and just left in the start, but I didn't do that. In the labyrinth there were mother and father and Lily with me, but here outside I have my own expectations, but till now I have no confidence whether I can do it alone or not. Alicia don't be dazed. I have taken you to all of the best places I knew in the market till now. I am already disappointed with me that I couldn't buy you anything. Edith's voice broke me out of the loop of my self-inflicted pain I was putting myself through. Well, that cannot be helped. I did not find those things useful to me, so it would be a waste. I replied. Since I would be traveling, I think keeping my inventory low would be for the best. Then again, my spatial magic could have handled anything, it would seem that old habits don't go away easily. I would ask for something if I will really need it. I assured her just in case. Ask right away. Edith stopped her then continued, this is one of the place I wanted to visit. Saying that Edith pushed one of the doors in the lane in which we entered and I followed her without any hesitation in mind. Also I lowered the intensity of the magic spell I had casted just in case. It turned out to be a restaurant, more inclined to the old style with a long wooden table at the counter and small round tables where people gathered sitting over stools, and I could smell pot roast being cooked in the air. It did not have the magnificence for a royalty to visit here, and looked like a simple dine in tavern that I used to read in books. There were already people occupying some of the seats, and they stared at Edith. She did not flinch and silently stood there when from inside another elf women that looked similar to her age walked to her, while others watched patiently including me. Well, they did seem to understand what was going on, and it made me feel annoyed that I was the only one in the not know. 40. Look who finally decided to show up. The elf women dressed in a black and white dress wearing an apron on the top, holding two huge jars of purple juice in her hand said in a cheeky way. And this place hasn't changed a bit except for becoming more noisy and a nagging friend who has gotten a bit older. Edith replied trying to copy down the tone, and the two suddenly burst into a hearty laugh. The lady beckoned to Edith to take a seat in the corner and that she would be taking our order. I followed Edith and after taking a look around, everyone was busy talking among themselves and they all looked lively. I was sure the food here would be the absolute best from the mood in the restaurant. Does this place bother you? Edith asked. Not at all, but it is a first time for me. I never remembered ever visiting a restaurant with my family or my guardians to eat together even on a festive day, 
and I was uncertain of going there alone. So backing myself up with saying that it was a waste of money I always stuck to the homemade food or the packed ones in case I didn't have the time to cook. After coming from the campaign, I just could not wait coming here, and so I had to drag you along. Edith sounded diffident for the first time, I would really like to eat something special. I replied in kind, this place must have meant a lot to her, and I was just happy with the fact that she brought me along. Suddenly, someone pulled her face down from behind me, and who is this small girl, Edith, don't tell me you have started snuggling kids from around this place again. It was the elven girl from back then and she had already taken off her apron, she had been wearing then. But what did she mean by again? Has Edith tried six hot pick up little girls before me? And I am not the only first. Leah, now don't scare my little sister. Her name is Alicia. 41. Wait, why isn't big sister trying to deny just now what she said? And she is smiling again. Hello, there. It seems that Edith has already had her share of fun with you. My name is Leah and I am her childhood friend. Leah said to me with a big grin on her face. Leah. Alicia wants to eat the special here. And then Edith leapt forward and whispered something in her ear. And all I could hear her was asking for the secret menu items. With my heightened sensory skills, I just couldn't wait. Thinking that there are restaurants with a secret menu for special customers and they are not just myths or urban legends of a food enthusiast. But then Leah passed me a familiar smile as if taking pity on me at the same time and I started feeling uneasy. Five minutes later, Leah returned with three plates and took a seat beside Edith. I call this creation Bugs Burrito. Dig in, Leah said passionately introducing us to the dish, and that was more than enough to put me in an odd state, where the two of them kept on staring at me and wouldn't let it slide unless I had taken a bite. Please tell me how this dish is, Leah asked with an endearing appearance on her face. This is the secret menu's special dish Alicia. Try it. Edith flashed an appealing devilish smile. I gulped and looked below. Don't they have to add specifics to the dish? I mean the name is quite ambiguous. Should I just ask? I can't even inspect the dish for the ingredients with the chef in front of me. Even I wouldn't like someone trying to destroy my dish in a suspicious manner. But it sounds so ridiculous to ask whether the dish has really bugs in it or not. Is it a joke or are they for real? But with big sister Edith around I can't be less careful. 42. It is in another world with magic in it. So it could be that eating monster and bug dishes is a norm here. I have eaten monsters before, but isn't it raising the bar just too high this time? MMM. Chomp. And the next moment Edith had taken it upon herself to shove her burrito bite in my mouth and I forcibly had to chow it down. At first, I thought I could avoid the taste if it contained bugs by gulping it down in one bite, but in my mouth the flavors magically burst open and it really tasted delicious. I looked at Leah when she explained to me that actually the main spice used in it is difficult to find, and the only way to identify it is the special brown bug that thrives around it, and hence its name. After all, I was the one who came up with the name, though it might be slightly misleading. Edith declared proudly. Well, her idea of slightly is at a scam level, but this dish is really tasty, as all of us continued eating and enjoyed talking. On most part it was Edith and Leah. This dish is what I am still working on. So do you have anything to add? There are not many humans that visit this place, so I would love to hear it from you. Leah asked me. It's the best. But some rice would surely pair perfect with the beans in it. I recommended. But I don't think I have seen rice anywhere in this kingdom. Yes, I do have a small lot of them. I purchased it from a peddler but apparently the shipments have stopped from the human continent due to problems in sea trade route, and I don't even know how to use them. Maybe they will just go to waste. Leah said sadly. Can I have them? I asked, almost jumping from my seat. Sure. But in return you will have to tell me how it's used. I sure scored a point with you. Leah said promptly, 43, 
that it was an easy deal. To find rice in a place where it was imported from outside would surely cost more but just telling them how they are used will be much easier. After that Edith and Leah told me about how they met and have been friends since childhood. Somehow their exchange of stories turned into a booze drinking competition. And Edith won without any extra effort, though I might be the only one who settled on juice. Things escalated when it turned into a bet and slowly a gambling ground for other regular customers, ending up with more than ten rounds in a row, and with all the wins handed down to Edith, which surely surprised me with how well she could hold down her liquor. But it was fun, I think I will be taking my leave and I can't neglect my work for so long. Leah was actually the owner of this place and it was also the place where their friendship took root. Hearing them share their stories, made me want to do the same. But unfortunately, I had nothing special in mind at that time to tell, when Regis was already set on a duel with me and I had no clue to where Athena was except for what the Great Spirit had told me. But someday I am sure I too can sit on table and enjoy food with lots of family and friends. Leah, I think you should take a rest for a while. Edith looked at Leah who was already dangling and unable to stand on two feet. There's no way I could get drunk on my job but next time I will be taking the win and score a point against you. Saying that Leah almost rolled over when Edith caught her and had to go and put her on bed inside in one of the cabins and inform the other co-workers. That was our exit and we took off from that place. I had already got a bag full of rice and stored it in my dimensional storage and was happy about it. I wanted to try even more of their secret menu now. Alicia, I want you to visit one more place with me but it's going to be a long walk. 44. I am coming too. I affirmed. We kept on walking a straight road and ascending heights, until we were out of the shopping area and it appeared to be just a small cluster of blocks. We continued walking in silence as we were too busy enjoying the greenery. A vast garden with beautiful flowers of all colors and sizes decorated the piece of land and the evening sun was slowly dropping in the background without even realizing it. Almost an entire day had passed so quickly. Edith took a seat on a rocky ledge of the wall. Patting on the wall she asked, come and join me here. Really? I asked awkwardly making sure it was not again another of her pranks. I am inviting you aren't I? She cheered. Yes, I will. And I rushed to her side, and the two of us were sitting next to each other and the view form there was enchanting. I could see the palace all the way from here while the rays of the setting sun shone like a gem in the evening sky. Tintinabulation of wind chimes blowing in the cool breeze made me feel so light and fresh after the meal. This is one of my favorite spot that I often visit. Edith started speaking but lost her energy before she could tell me why so, and that makes two of us now. I added, this place was really a wonder and since I was never going to forget it, I could come here anytime with my teleportation magic. Alicia. As the first princess of a Scalon kingdom I want to thank you for securing the Dragon Island and reviving the Genesis tree. Suddenly the expression on her face changed and became more fragile, and also as a sister for helping Regis. I am glad I was just able to do something, since I am also the part of the family now aren't I? 45. Yes, you are, and I will be relying on your help. She cackled as she tried to choke back on her own tears. Rubbing her eyes Edith took a deep breath in the fresh breeze that continuously flow and looking at me she said, I never thought this much would happen in such short time while I was away. Maybe even a high elf's life might be too short to witness everything that's why I do not want Regis to give up. The outside world is full of beautiful things and I want Regis to see it for herself. She had been inside that big palace all alone and caged in that place. And no matter what I did I knew I didn't have the key to set her free. But now she has completely changed and she is no more the same sister I once knew. And I want to thank you for it from the bottom of my heart. Maybe this is what mother used to call sharing their heart as I could see a fresh drop of tear leak from her eyes but was instantaneously wiped off. But then why? Does she wish to fight me? I don't want to. I asked eagerly. Just maybe she knew the answer and could tell me. Was fighting with her the only solution? And I knew what she wanted was not just a simple training drill but a fight to decide who is better than the two of us. But I never considered fighting strength 
as one of the most important factor to make friends. Alicia do you really think she wants to fight to prove who is the strong one? Well, that might be just her trying to be competitive as ever. Well, I think I have already seen that side of Regis a lot, and I realized it would not be that easy to get a straight answer for someone as fastidious as Big Sister Edith. Then shouldn't you be spending more time with Regis than me? I asked. I am her big sister you know and I can just see and tell that she is happy with whatever she has chosen to do, and I am yours too. She said gently patting my head. From there it became hard for me to make out words. I always felt uneasy in the previous world to go for shopping, while surrounded by so many people and walking alone there not knowing what to do when everything moved so fast. 46. So, why someone like me could have been at so ease in that kind of environment. Then again with my usual problem of confusing with the directions and wasting rest of the time puzzling which one is the way back to home. But that didn't happen this time even when Regis had raised a flag for me. I looked below and there was the living proof. A comforting warmth had already enwrapped my hand. During this entire trip, big sister Edith had held my hand and never left me out of her sight even for once. I always wondered how it feels to have a big sister in my past life. But now that I have won, I think I know how it would have really been like. Alicia, I think we should go home soon, otherwise. Mother is going to scold us for being late after we had hoaxed all the soldiers keeping an eye on us. Edith had already started bowling as I could imagine the final warning of Aunt Alva. I wonder is she the only one from whom Edith is afraid of? Yeah. We should. I admitted the same. After all I did not want it to get her a scolding on my accord. Edith put her hands around my shoulders and looked me directly into the eyes. Alicia I already know from the story that you can use flying magic and I am too tired to walk to home. Please use it on me too. I want to know how it feels to fly. Edith confessed with a desperate plea on her account, while her eyes sparkled like a child. Even I would have been like that if I knew someone could fly using magic in my previous world. They could have even charged ticket prices for each fare and would have been rich in no time. How about we directly teleport there? I suggested. Hugh. Edith blubbered. But before her voice could reach her own ears, we had changed spaces and landed in Regis's room. 47. 48. So, this is teleportation magic. Edith said amazed as she checked that all her body parts were intact and it made me laugh as it might have been her first time doing this. Edith saw me giggling and pouted, but suddenly flipped to her usual smile. But next time, we will be taking a flight route, for sure. She said confidently, wait, there is going to be a next time too. I won't mind but if more and more people learn about this then I might get into trouble. So, no more flying till then in front of a crowd. Then I asked Edith for the wait at kitchen. Now that I had rice with me, I wanted to cook something delicious in return for Regis, since she did it for me the last time. Edith showed me the way but decided to stick around the whole process. I had already decided to go for fried rice since I wanted to make something quick and warming. I carried the plates and the pot inside my dimensional storage to Regis's room and Edith insisted on joining us. Not only that but she had called for Aunt Alva to join in who in turn had called Regis's father. All of us now were sitting on the table in Regis's room, but ironically, Regis was the only one who was absent. Aunt Rice the white seeds that is a staple food in the human continent. The Elven King said, you know about it father. Edith and Aunt Alva inquired, yeah, every time Caroline tried to cook. They turn black and rock hard. But according to how this food has the special effect of making you feel strong and would make me finish the whole dish and it was grotesque. It smelled horrible. But then she would argue that good medicines are always bitter in nature. But I quite never got the feel that it actually ever worked on me. My uncle complained. 49. While Edith and Alva tried blaming him for his incompetence to understand the ideas and ways of my hero mother to help him out and that he should be more grateful to her for thinking about him, 
but on the other hand here I was standing with my head down and lips sealed, because I was the only one who had by now realized what had really went down inside mother's head. She duped her own little brother into making him eat her own failed cooking. But I do like her sentiment of not wasting the food. Something tells me that Further and Uncle would get along pretty well. Should I tell him that he had been conned by his own sister? You, don't have to worry with my skills, I have turned that dish into something edible. Saying that I lifted off the lid from the pot, as the fogginess of the steam drifted off from the view. Everyone saw the puffed up soft white rice mixed with finely cut vegetable I used from the royal kitchen. It's no use. There's no way I could have told him the truth. But at least he could finally taste real rice. They gawked at the dish like it could have been one of the wonders of the elf kingdom. It smells so good. Saying that Edith had already pulled out a scoop from the pot and had helped herself to a plate, followed by the king who wanted to fulfill his curiosity and Aunt Alva who definitely did not want it to be left behind in the race. Everyone had already started eating and forced me into doing the same as they told me how the food was delicious. I was already used to the praises now for mother and father but someone trying out my food for the first time and liking it made me feel even better. I think we could add this in our diet every day from now on and I wouldn't be bored. My aunt ordered the king even if it was a suggestion. And that's when the knob of the room turned and Regis entered. She looked awfully tired and covered in dust all over her clothes. I wondered. Fifty. What she had been doing when she rushed to the table to see what we were actually eating. I looked at the container and to my horror it was empty to the last grain in it. With a push I turned away my head not knowing what to do. Ah. It's such a shame you could not try Alicia's handmade food when it was so yummy. Edith teased Regis again with a lamenting voice. Suddenly the king and the queen rose up from their seat. Thank you for cooking for us. We will be taking our leave now. And sleep early you three. In a blink of an eye the two vanished and left everything to settle between us siblings. Regis seemed to be angry as obvious. She looked awfully hungry and exhausted. And then we went and dined in her room leaving nothing for her. Well that would be something that would upset me too. I looked at Regis and the hate she had displayed the last time had intensified even more. Good night Alicia. Would you like to accompany me to Leah's dine again? Just where you two have been wandering after without me. I want to go too. Regis chimed in, as she was the only one being left out of the loop. Oh. But wasn't there someone who had something important to do and refused to come along? Edith smirked, and in return all Regis could do was sneer. Well, I am sure Alicia would like to try all of their secret menu bug series dishes. Amu, um, they were really delicious. I affirmed to her proposal. And that's what I really wanted to do after eating that new secret menu dish item. Edith then left the room leaving me and Regis alone. 51. Now I and she were in an intense eye lockdown match and for some reason none of us wanted to bat an eyelash first. Her competitiveness was crystal clear as the vibe of the room had changed. But it was more like the one who lost would have been declared to take the blame. I was trying to come up with an excuse or a better deal for her. Alicia had finally broken down because of big sister's influence, and I am glad that I was not there but I also feel guilty for not being able to prevent it. Just wait for me Alicia and I will get stronger. Then again there is little I can do in her case. Regis thought to herself. She walked towards me and putting her hands on my shoulder she looked at me with such passionate eyes and blinked to accept her defeat. But I wanted to make it even and say that it's all right and I should have been more careful. I am sorry Alicia. It's not your fault, it might be tough and even if you would end up developing weird habits, I won't dislike you for it, just make sure that next time you cook you leave something for me too. Saying that Regis left to tidy herself up, and just like that I was forgiven. 52. Interlude. Your distance. I was born as the first princess to the Escalon kingdom, Edith Escalon. At the time I did not have any siblings, and people around me either helped me or stopped me from doing things on my own, even if I wanted to. I never had to work too hard to get anything in my life for myself and with whatever I did people were always amazed around me. Then one day, my parents brought me my little sister Regis, telling me to take good care of her. I wanted to act responsibly as her big sister from the bottom of my heart. 
and so I decided to spend most of my time around her. Whether I would be foolish enough to try talking to her the whole day even if she responded only in us and you use. I was so happy that I actually got something to do on my own for the first time and I was very fond of her. After one year, it was around that time that my skill manifested and it was much similar to my father's foresight skill but even more powerful than his. Just by looking at a glance I could take an estimation of things, whether it was possible to achieve a sad state of existence and would manifest itself in the future or not. At the start I was so happy on being praised for such an amazing ability and did my best in studies and learning magic arts to improve my skills. I wanted to become a sister of which Regis could be proud of and look up to. Unfortunately for Regis, the only magic she could use was wind magic, and I was glad for her because it was unlike my skill. I helped her in studies and we practiced magic spells together. Turns out, her spells were always more powerful than mine so I had to put much effort on improving my own status. Even then it was a pursuit that made me the happiest out of all things. 53. But then the day that horrible accident happened in the forest and after Regis lost control over her magic powers and father was badly injured, just a single touch and his hand was amputated, though fixed by the healers immediately on the spot, but it left everyone devastated. News around the palace spread of how frightful her magic nature was and they couldn't be so sure around her when it could go berserk at any time. But no one considered Regis's feeling. The whole world was too busy to put the blame on her, but everyone in my family tried to do their best to come up with different solutions to improve the situation and come up with methods that can help her contain her magic, but it was the first of the case and no means or treatment helped to control her destructive magic power. Consequently it was decided that she won't use magic anymore unless they had found another way for it to be possible. Even though Regis was able to settle with that, we always worried about how her powers might get too heavy on her. But whenever Regis had strong feelings, the magic still spilled out and she had to be away from everyone making sure not to harm others. Regis didn't want to hurt anyone again, so she never complained and always stayed inside the room, shut and left behind. That made me feel very lonely. It was always supposed to be just me and her. But since that day my probability foresight skill always relayed to me that things would never get the same between us. Dot knock knock. Regis do you want to play with me? I know you are there. Please come out of the door it's like you have gone away. Every day I would try to reach out to her, with the best smile I could deliver. I always wish I could know how she felt but I can't. I wanted to directly ask it to her, if I could. I wanted to break through the door hug her tight and show that she could never hurt someone from her family. 54. Go away. I don't want to. A sound would come shooting from the other side of the door. I could not see her face, whether she was filled with sorrow or rage, or, was she just crying from inside and not show how down she was? I knew how stubborn she could be in such delicate matters and still be stiff and undecisive at the same time. They say I've got everything and here even when I am trying to, I am unable to do anything. I would wait for hours outside the gate hoping that this time it would flip open and she would welcome me inside. I thought I could have helped her or at least talk things out with her, but my skill, even before I tried knocking on the door, I already knew that it would never open over itself. Just the thought of me forcibly opening the door tells me that the possibility that things will get worse is high and equal to one. It's not that, I do not feel sad. On the contrary, my heart was breaking. I am terrified what if I end up hurting her even more and she starts hating me or she already does it because I could not become a person who can really help her when she needs me the most. And because of my skill now I could not try any harder and detested myself for having it. That day something took over me and I decided that if I cannot find anything inside the palace that could help then I should look for something in the city. Without informing my parents or any of my attendants or guards I escaped from the palace. With my skills I already knew where there would be least surveillance of guards and I could move incognito at that time. But the city was huge. Much bigger than it appeared from inside the carriage I would usually travel forth. I was overwhelmed by so many people around me and not knowing where to go, I had already strayed too far from the palace. Stop, stop, stop. 55. Someone. Everyone. Move away. Move, move. 
screams roared on the road and as the crowd shifted in the direction of that voice, a cart came rolling downhill at full speed, with a small girl trying to stop it with her legs rubbing all along the street, but as obvious it was to the naked eyes. She was too small to stop the heavily loaded wagon's advance. I panicked as I realized that I had been too inconsiderate and the only one standing in the middle of the road while others were warning me to move from the way to. Having no choice and not wanting to get hurt or my clothes dirty, I conjured a strong barrier over myself and placed it in front of me like an upward slope. Lo and behold, the cart came rumbling and with its unstoppable speed. It neatly took off into the skies as I felt the weight of the cart over me shift away. I removed the barrier and looked at the bottom wheels of the cart produced lightning sparks, as it carried the girl and the loaded things along with it and rammed itself onto the wall. Thump, as the clouds of dust dispersed, I came running along to the crashing site because I felt sorry for the girl. Don't tell me that I finally went and did it. It's not that easy to get someone killed in a road accident this ridiculous. I looked at the mess as different furniture items, steel vessels and vegetables were scattered at the vicious crime scene caused by me, and there lay the girl motionless, don't just lie like an idiot there, I know you are conscious, I said in a passive voice, so, after all this at least my skill works pretty decently when it comes to guessing whether a person is alive or not. The girl leapt as she came out with a flying jump pose from the dump and landed steady on her feet. 56. Are you the one who sent me soaring high? She said fiercely but adding the whoosh sound effect to her voice totally damaged the veracity of her situation. Yes, that was me, but are you all right? I worriedly asked. I see. Then girl, you owe me an apology. She yelped. I am sorry. What? Why am I on the apologizing end? Aren't you the one who couldn't control your cut? You should be apologizing to me. Don't you have any manners? I protested and flashed my etiquettes of a princess. You sure have got lot of grace. The girl took a quick look and scrutinized me from top to bottom. Of course, I am well mannered. Maybe you would have sounded more convincing without that shoe junk hanging on your head. I screamed at her for mocking me like that. She pushed her eyeballs up and scrapped the shoe enshrined on her head, featuring unshorn and unclipped long hairs by rubbing at it harshly. She slowly jumped from the top of the dump and after climbing down and walking to me, stood at my eye level. Yeah, never mind that, I'm Leah, now that's clear to you, you owe me one and are going to help me with this mess because I can always score a point. She posed a victory sign as she gave her flashy introduction to me. Hugh, did you even hear what I just said? I stuttered. 57. An old house dash, in the back street, somehow, Leah was easily able to coax Edith into joining her, they successfully collected all the scattered items on the ground and after loading them back onto the cart, the two were easily able to push it to the place Leah wanted to go, Edith looked at the empty house and the huge front hall, that was uniquely fit into the small place and she was intrigued by the ingenuity of the builders who might have built it ages ago, because the building itself seemed to be ancient in its every aspect, good, now, that's over. I am leaving. Edith realized that she did not have any other reason to stick around anymore. She needed to continue with the search for which she was here for. Now, now, don't be so hasty. We just got to know each other. I don't even know your name. Leah caught Edith's hand before she could take off. I am Edith. Edith introduced herself, because being hesitant would have made her look suspicious and might have revealed her identity. Somehow, she found Leah's grip too tight as if she did not want her to leave. At least she didn't want to be left alone with T for how the strained creases on her cheeks, or, either Edith was reading too much into things. So, Edith will you not help me with my dream? I really, really need your help. Leah winked with sparkly eyes at her and she had to finally give in. The two of them entered the house which already had a half-broken door, and from inside, it was in even worse condition, the whole place was in shambles as if all the calamities that had been recorded in the kingdom's history might just have originated from there, hey, hey, is this place even habitable, it looks more like a haunted house, Edith scorned as she thoroughly checked the rooftop, 
which might have come crashing down on them at any moment. The little rays of sunlight that poured in from the rooftop holes were the only source of light that illuminated the whole place. 58. Leah turned to me with bright eyes lit with passion and zeal to do something and by not sure what I listened to her attentively, this is going to become the place where I will fulfill my dreams, a place where people can enjoy their meals together and I can serve them the best food I can cook. Let's get started and make this place more livable. A place where people can enjoy their meals, together. Edith repeated after her, in a hushed voice, is there something wrong with that, and also I am going to live here too. But Leah's long ears were too sharp as she asked incessantly forget about living, there are already centipedes and caterpillars looking like things living in there, the floor is broken and the rest can split and fall any moment. Leah tell me the truth this is not some sight of an accident. Edith looked frightened. Yeah, I did score a point by buying it at a very cheap price. But, no, nothing sort of calling that an accident, probably not. Leah said turning her head sideways. You are lying. If Leah was going to say it that suspiciously, then she wouldn't even need her foresight skill to detect it. Anyways, this is all to make a perfect dine-in where people can eat and enjoy themselves. Leah cheered on, don't tell me you just wanted to get free labor out of me. Edith mulled as she said in an exasperated tone, well two are always better than one. Don't you agree? Edith looked at the amount of luggage they had to unload. Chairs, tables curtains, utensils, boxes which only the spirit of darkness might have known the content of. I would feel bad if I left you alone in doing all of this after coming all this way. But I do expect reward in return. Edith said whipping her hair in the air and for a moment Leah found herself mesmerized by it. Then let's get started. Don't leave a single speck of dust and be thorough with your work. Leah trumpeted with a broomstick as she hardly struck it on. 59. The floor penetrating the very floor she was standing on and left a wide hole agape, creating just more of a mess for them to clean up for later. First, they began with moving in the little items and the cleaning accessories from the cart. I never would have thought, even for once that my first work in the city would be cleaning. Edith thought to herself, it took them more than two hours just to clean the front but by then they had got the hang of it and the back side rooms were cleaned in half of that time. Edith certainly did use magic secretly. Since she already knew that people of her age cannot use magic that efficiently, so it would be wise if she had it kept it a secret. Perfect. Edith looked at the walls, the floors and the wooden sills which were now shining with the special washing material Leah had produced from her hometown. Edith was quite proud of herself for such an impressive work but already knew that she could pull it off from the very start. You did a great job. So, why don't you take a rest from here and get these things from the market? Leah said passing a list to Edith. Edith after looking at the long list was quite annoyed by the illegible text putting a strain on her eye and how she was set on working her through the bones, but became embarrassed by the realization that she did not have any money on herself. Whenever she needed anything, she had to inform the attendants and they would bring it for her. Excuse me, it's just that I don't have any money. Edith quaked. What? I thought you would be rich. Leah whispered under her breath but failed to control her voice. Did you just try to make assumptions about me? Edith jeered. 60. Leah continued without realizing that her taunt was heard. Maybe I was wrong in my assessment. But for now all I have is this much. Leah passed a small bag of coins to Edith. Edith loosened up the tied string and counted the money. Isn't the money less than the things would actually cost? The best thing about a bazaar is you can haggle as much. You have got this. I just know it. Leah said with an optimistic aura brimming out of her. Yeah. She will just be fine, with her beautiful looks and polite manners she can surely get a good deal on each item. Good day to me, didn't I just score a streak of points in a row? Maybe I will add another later if she do succeed. Leah thought to herself as she got back to the cleaning duty. It had practically been an hour and Leah was becoming worried as every minute passed by on the clock. She just hung on the front wall as it kept on ticking. It's getting late, did she run away? No that won't be like her. In this little time Leah had learned so much about Edith that she knew she was not someone who would not just run away from things, it was as a sign of trust that she handed her the money. 
otherwise she would have never asked for help. But what if she could not get all the items and don't know what to do about it? Maybe I will play with her for a little while. But I am already more than indebted to her for helping me out. I will be sure to cook my first dish for her. Leah hummed to herself as she walked to the door to throw the garbage she had collected by now. She looks up and four rough and husky men in suspicious robes had gathered outside her place. While two of them started walking in, Leah took a step back inside her place sensing trouble. Are you the owner of this place? One of the men yelled from the outside. Yes. But who might you be? Leah replied with hesitation. The men smiled and laughed to each other until one of them came forward and blew up the chair in tatters with a single sweep of an iron rod in his hand. 61. What are you doing? Leah protested but still kept her distance from the men. You get what we mean? We protect your place from dangerous people and in return we want five gold coin each month. So just hand over the advance payment. The men sneered at her as they started walking further inside the place. Stop it. Just stop. I don't have that money. It's way more than I could ever hope to earn. But I will start paying you once this place opens up, little by little. Leah knew there was no way out. If she had to survive, she needed to do what others says, unless she could stand on her own two feet. You think we really care? How can we trust kids like you? Said one of the wicked men. What if you run away? And besides we don't work for free. You live when you pay, or you will leave if you don't. Just leave every belonging of yours here for even troubling us with your crap. The four men laughed in unison as they started attracting attention from the outside. Leah without thinking jumped in between them before they could try touching anything inside the hall. Maybe kids these days don't listen to their elders anymore. Did your parents not teach you, brat? Are you one of those village kids who think they can make big in the city? Children like you always end up hungry and beg on the street. It's for your good we are saying that no one would come to a tavern run by a kid alone. So be a good girl and scram back to whatever filthy backwater place you came from. The biggest of the man croaked. We would make sure that no one would visit this nasty place ever again or get poisoned by whatever village merc you will be trying to feed us. Leave now. I am begging you. I will think of something to give to you. I can't leave not just yet. Leah screamed as the men took offensive. She was scared. Her legs trembled as she saw the men enter her places of dream with rods in their hand to smash whatever things she had worked hard. 62. To realize she did not move. She was ready to be hurt if it meant as long as she could keep this place safe. Leah knew it was the truth that she might have been a mere village girl who came to make big in the city. But it was a dream which she shared with her family too. Giving up so easily after all those things she had sacrificed. She couldn't just sit back and see everything snatched from her again. What did you just say? A voice bombed from the front gate. Leah heard a familiar voice. About which she had all forgotten about until then. Wah! Screamed one of the men from behind as everyone turned in that direction. But something about her disposition made her look different. Leah looked at her and even though it was invisible on her face, she could feel both anger and resentment in those words. Edith stay out of this. Don't get involved yourself, or you can get hurt too. Leah warned Edith. Who are you? You do not seem of here? It's better if you stay away young lady. Said the big guy, who appeared to be their leader, as he carefully examined one of his unconscious men and sniggered at her. Seize her screamed one of the men excitedly and without thinking as two of them further rushed. Thinking of crushing her, one from the front and the other on the back came running in a pincer attack formation. But what worried Leah more was the eerie calmness Edith possessed and it kept her on edge. You can decide whether the food is nasty or not after you have eaten it. Edith did not seem to care of what Leah said. A translucent shield manifested in her front and the other on her back. The magic shield twisted itself and the shape becoming irregular formed two protruded gigantic hands which punched the man in the front while slapped the other's fully body to the right. 63. Both of them fell out in a single hit. Damn, kid. You can use magic shield. But if you will not take me seriously then I am going to cut you down. Shouted the big guy as he transferred a sword to his other hand out of nowhere. His sword enveloped in blazing fire that the light bleached the surface of the Leah's eyes for a moment. The leader of the thugs charged towards Edith and in no way, 
he seemed to be a novice with the sword, his sword tightly held in his hand, Leah was now scared for Edith's life more than of her own. Edith again summoned a magic shield much thicker than the previous one in front of her and completely covered herself. I got you kid. The man's lips curled from one end of the bottom of his earlobe to the other. Instead of using his sword he pulled in the massive rod and hitting the magic shield it got crushed and broken half into pieces. He now flailed his magic sword from the right, his expression clearly telling that he had got the situation under control. And what makes you think that I can only wield a simple magic shield spell? Sparko, flash of lightning and lash out. Edith brandished her left hand and conjuring a purple electric whip. She struck the sword hard and it shattered into crumbling pieces. The whip further lashed like a thread in complete control of Edith's hand movement and curling round the big man's body. The lightning raged. With a huge thump sound the big leader of the thugs collapsed to the ground and a thick smell of burnt ash filled the room. Edith. Leah came running to her and held her hands and tightened her grip. Edith did not reply, but instead, she freed herself and moved to the back of Leah in a flash. 64. Leah felt her hair being pulled away and then she felt even lighter than before. You should take more care of yourself. Edith spoke after a long time Leah put her hands back and trying to feel she found a ribbon tied at the back of her head and rounded up all the strands of her hair that were meddling with her during her work. But why? Leah's lips tightened, her voice lowered in embarrassment. Didn't you say it was your dream? Edith said peacefully and an unfound sadness was tightly withheld in those words, but it was impossible for Leah or even anyone else to understand that dream was a rare and an exotic word to Edith. From the day she manifested her skill, she stopped dreaming. Her sleeps were blank and all her ambitions instead of a living pursuit either became a choice of yes or no. She could perceive everything in probabilities and those with less were a no-go even if it was a tough choice that she could not protect Regis anymore. Her skills psychologically stopped her from doing things that were less probable. Her existence always flashed in numbers and probabilities and she hated that her life, joy, time, love was all quantified and presented to her beforehand. That is no reason for putting yourself in danger. Leah cried, we have worked so hard. I just cannot let it go to waste. Also it just turns out that the shopkeepers are no match for me when it comes to a good bargain and I was able to save up some money and buy it for you. And also I got something pretty interesting to hear. Edith tried to change the topic to uplift Leah's mood and stop worrying unnecessarily. Edith walked towards the four people and chanting a quick heal spell. The men became conscious but they were too lethargic or weakened to even stand up properly. Get out of here now, or do you want me to expose of your collusion with the restaurant in the next street? It just turned out that Edith was able to 65. Ascertain the probability from the way the restaurants and eateries were scattered in the city. When one of the shopkeepers inquired of the shop, he explained the situation about how there was just a single shop that sold inadequate food for a very high price and discriminating. Edith found it strange because this area even with lot of traffic in both trade and people would have only one huge business that provided food. It came clear to her that some other force was at play and her assumptions were correct that they hired thugs to cut out any root before it sprouted and would give them competition in future. Leah found the present Edith scary and promised to exercise caution with her. The enemy ran away as soon as they heard that their plans had been unveiled and people might start treating them as liars if they overheard of it. Edith you are so strong and all I am good for is a little water magic I can do. Leah said pouting and feeling inferior to Edith. Don't worry then I will just have to teach you to use it more skillfully and then people like those won't be able to bother you anymore. Then, I will work hard for that and even I would be able to pull off something like you. Or maybe even more electrifying than that. Leah jumped trying to move like Edith in excitement. Now, now don't go putting weird ideas inside your head. We have still a lot of ways to go. Edith said pointing at the broken chair pieces and those disobedient and unmannered people who walked in with mud from the outside. Don't worry. I will do that on my own. Why don't I get to cooking and make something for us? You will like it. Leo again posed with her victory sign. 
I was not acquainted to cooking nor had any previous experience. So I helped Leah in at least cutting the vegetable with her directions. Within half an hour we had a multitude of dishes laid out on table. 66. My secret special dish. Leah said garnishing the dish by squeezing a lemon over it. It's really tasty. And I am going to call it Humburger. Edith came up with the name as soon as she took the first bite. Have seconds fourths as much as you like. Leah watched Edith mindfully taking small yet quick bites like the rabbits she used to play with back in the village. After that the two said goodbye to each other. They never promised to each other that they would meet again after this, but just maybe for the first time her skill would be able to predict a miraculous meeting again. Leah looked up high in the sky and at the setting sun as it was one of the things that might have reminded her of her village. Father just as I promised I think I will be finally able to fulfill my dream. Meeting new people and making new friends along the way, my life will become more colorful just as I will add more flavors of taste to my dishes, and when I return, I have a wonderful person I can talk to you about, mother. Leah watched at the setting sun as she squinted in the sunshine streaming in through the window. She stretched, feeling more relaxed than she had since. She brought her hand back to get a feel of the gift she had received from Edith. It was a silky ribbon with a beautiful red coating and brilliantly tied to put all her messy hairs together, but suddenly she found herself in confusion of whether to call it a gift or not since it was bought for her own money, and also with how she was duped into thinking so on purpose, and realized how formidable Edith herself was. Edith on the other hand walked back to the palace and was awfully tired. She had found a place where she could enjoy meals with everyone. 67. 68. And for the first time she could have been a part of a dream, just because someone out there wanted to share it with her. Even if she couldn't do anything for Regis now, it wouldn't mean that she can't do it in the future. She just needed to be ready for the day when the future just might change and she can visit with everyone to Leah's dine in to enjoy their meals together. But then the thoughts of being chased around the whole palace by her mother for running away from the palace, clouded her virtuous thoughts and was a prospect she wanted to avoid no matter the cost. Edith moved her legs faster than ever before. Well, that is a story for later. 69. Elven King's Office, Present Day. Are you sure that you want this? Regis's father asked with a stern face. Regis stood in front of her king father and with a request. She had decided to win and now she knew better than anyone that she could not do that alone. She needed to get help for herself. So after Edith and Alicia left, she decided to ask from her father and came to ask for help in the king's office. Yes, because I want to win. Regis replied, leaving her further and the attendant prime minister in order to see her passion and a hint of impatience in her words. Strong winds blew in through the open window as the pages of the thick register kept on table flipped open through several pages and might had ruined the budget's calculation of the kingdom and the long hours of hard work the two might had put in it. For the first time, Regis had asked something so considerately after she had shut herself inside the palace. But now she was more like an explorer who wanted to fight against the odds even if they were astronomical. 70. Chapter 3. As long as you like it. I walked through the palace's corridor and was on my way to the king's office. It was quite odd, after I was summoned out of the blue just after returning from the patrols in the border. As promised, we had already been handed our monetary awards for our achievements in the monster subjugation campaign led by the first princess. Therefore, I did not fully comprehend the nature of work for which I had been summoned for. I was pretty sure the royal guards did not make a mistake while spelling out my name Will Valen, one of the youngest commander, in the history of Escalon's army and the leader of the battalion Nif. Well, it was an achievement my family was most proud of, which comes from a noble line in the Escalon kingdom, though joining the army has always been my calling as a family's inherent duty. But the reason I was able to climb to such great ranks was because I have always loved this kingdom and always willed to protect it from any harm. Even though the Escalon kingdom mostly remains peaceful with its moderate policies and freedom, which might not be true for other nations in the demon continent, an army is always required to maintain peace from foreign intrusion, monster outbreaks. With the recent drought and monster stampeded problems that have cropped up, 
the army has been continuously on a move to relieve people of their problems and deal with the monsters and magical beasts, but this has only served to bring the common people and the army closer, while improving our understanding and agreeing on each other problems. With how the recent excursion helped in improving the standard of living for the elven people in the boonies and reach out to those who live too far away from the capital. 71 and after the calamity was somehow miraculously solved, but the contents of how it was done is still being kept classified and I am not high ranking enough to obtain that knowledge, but as long as I can serve the Ascalon royal family and work to maintain peace in the kingdom, I was ready to accept such terms, though there have been several instances where I have been underestimated and made fun of for withholding such high position in the army as an inexperienced young lad, that so may as be true but I have always proved them wrong with my actions and dedication towards my work, and today even these people consider me a comrade, and age do not have any precedent importance for me. With haste and pride I rushed, as the royal guards at the door to the king's office responded to my summon by spontaneously opening the door for me. King Ereg was seated on his office chair and the prime minister stood beside him. If it was a mission involving the army, I would have expected other military officials to be in attendance but that did not seem to be the case anymore. Your Highness, I, Will Valen am here to answer to your directive. I said bending down on a knee. Raise your head. The king ordered. I respectfully stood up and in the accustomed delved military salute of my right hand fist positioned on mid chest and the left hand on the back in horizontal. Though for the royal guards, it might go a bit different since they have to place their left hands on the hilt of their sword. Will, I have a special favor to ask of you. The king hinted, I was pretty sure by now that the contents of further discussion would need to be kept confidential and it was up to me to continue listening in or not, but if I do then I had to swore secrecy. Yes, your highness. I said with a stern face that expressed not a slightest hint of doubt. No matter what answering to every calling of the royal family is one of my duties and conviction, as strict and obsolete it may sound in their 72, peaceful times after the historic great wars, obedience and discipline has been drilled into me by my family from childhood that have served the royal family freeans. The king nodded to the prime minister and continued, Will. I would be direct as to the nature of task I am assigning you to, it would seem that my younger daughter Regis, has asked me to assign you as her tutor to teach her to control her magic powers. The king reserved his crossed arms in front of the table folded, the temperature dropped slightly in the room as the cool breeze broke through the strange silence that suddenly fell, I was not obtuse to the difficult situation the second princess, Regis Ascalon was in. It was one of the most dark famed gossip, filled with scary accounts and anecdotes, including the accident in the forest. Though it was a completely different matter altogether when it came to the authenticity of these talks only then to be considered as mere storytelling skills of a talkative nitpicker or to be true to the baseline incident, though I have never thought much of it, except for describing it as a magical accident where the victim was not able to control their magic powers and ended up with a disaster spell. Except for this case being extreme, unfortunate and rarest of all. And with how the second princess barricaded herself from everyone, the rumors intensified of her being possessed by evil spirits or of being born a monster out of control or angering the great spirits. But I knew that was not the entire truth, because I have been watching her for a long time, her continuous efforts to control her magic to improve her skills and grow in every way possible. When I was assigned the post of a commander and leader of the NIF platoon, two years ago, the training grounds we were assigned to was at the back of the palace, as it was always left empty and neglected. Since I was young and my platoon was rather small, we were not considered important enough to allot us a perfect standard military grounds to hold our training exercise by the top military officials. 73, but that did not matter to me and my troops were to a collection of young soldiers from different parts of the kingdom with similar motivations that only favored to strengthen the synergy among us. Little did I know that this backyard abandoned ground was connected to one of the back rooms of the palace where the second princess lived. Most of the times I would see her hiding and peeking at us from the window when our initial drills began and while I was educating the soldiers on their duties, 
fighting tactics, magic spells and mock fights using weaponry of their choice. I myself excelled as a magic swordsman and I had the highest affinity for sound magic, deliberately but surely. I could see the princess observing us carefully from her room's window situated on the palace's top floor. Though it was a bit distracting even for me, when her fine appearance would counteract with the treacherous fables woven around her. After a while after completing our drills I returned back to the place to pick up my bag and belongings. Coincidentally I saw the princess who was now there doing the same training drills as we performed that day and practicing the same weapon training plan. So, instead of emerging from behind I decided to watch her for a while and leave. Things continued like this and I soon started seeing faults with her practice and how she was hesitant to use magic even when she was alone. So the next day I made my soldiers to correct themselves which was similar to those mistake and explain them where they were going wrong to the best of my ability. Turns out that even the soldiers were having trouble and this correction uptake doubled our efficiency and combat power. And I would also find the princess improving and already excelling in all the combat abilities just by taking a look at our training after we had all left. It goes without saying that she had knack for combat and sometimes I would see that zeal in her eyes and her conviction to prove something. I was a bit ashamed for being just a noble, who was trying to do his best to keep things in place instead of making a big deal out of it and turning it into an upheaval. All I could do was make sure no one disturbed the princess or made her feel anxious during her training including me and if there was 74. Anything I could do to help I would include it in the next day's training routine of my platoon. But at the moment I was drawn back into the present when the king called me out. Will. Do you think there is a special reason that Regis would have chosen you as her trainer? He asked a bit taken back by his own words, maybe. But I am not entirely sure. I stammered as I was unable to lay bare the truth of what I had been trying to do. I see. The king asserted as if he already knew about what has been transpiring putting me in a bind. The king then rose up from his seat and holding his two hands interlocked at the back he issued my orders, then will. I leave it to your discretion to accept the task or not. The king dictated, Your Highness, I would like to take up the job and of the honor to tutor the princess. I articulated my clear intentions. Maybe I was already going for a yes, because I did not want it to believe in those rumors and see it for myself, than hiding behind any more for these years. Then your further directions will be delivered to you by the princess herself. You may take your leave now. The king beamed a bright smile on hearing my response and I felt content with my answer and the privilege of being given such an important responsibility. Keeping that in mind I again made a firm salute and left the room with a bow, but I felt a bit restless not knowing the sudden reason for the princess's demand and why of all people me when she could have any of the great royal tutors at her calling. Not to forget that I felt a bit embarrassed after realizing that the king really knew of everything that has been happening. Since he didn't consider it necessary to divulge me the information of where I was to meet for the training with the princess. 75. Maybe instead of being cryptic I should have been more open then. I regret now the fact that I could have been of more help if I had come forward previously to help her and how she wouldn't have to feel so singular, rather than being so registered and only keeping to myself. On various military drills and campaign I have met the first princess, a graceful lady of great insight and is a wonderful leader. But somehow, I too was left in or as to what type of person was the second princess and could not wait for us to meet. 76. The king's office after Will left, the king slumped back into his chair like a lazy bug as he felt exhausted and satisfied that he was able to fulfill her daughter's unexpected demand. You must be pretty exhausted. The Prime Minister said pouring a glass of fresh water to the King. While the King drank the glass with a great appreciation and relief, the Prime Minister chimed in. It would seem that no matter what Princess Regis has already made up her mind to do things as she wants to now, and she is more than set on and determined to do it in her own way. The minister's hair was grey and the wrinkles on his forehead and side cheeks forecasted of him already hitting his old age. The king knew better than anyone with what he meant. It was not so easy to just let their loved ones go on a journey without a news. He has already felt that pain before when his big sister Caroline set out on her own journey. 
It was sad and lonely. This time it was her own daughter. She never made her intentions clear, but it was evident seeing her and know what was on her mind. But he didn't want to snatch away the opportunity from Regis to grow when she had such a long life ahead of her. No matter what, such a day was inevitable, and when that day would come, him being ready for it entirely lied in his hands. Whether he would take the news with a blow and a heart-crushing jab or end it with a pompous and cheery goodbye, only waiting for the day when they could meet again and exchange their amazing stories. While all he would have to tell about would be his simple ruling days, but he could have gone on and on for weeks without getting bored, while listening to her daughter's daring journeys across the globe and the wonderful places she visited which might be a little too uncommon a luxury for elves, except for those eccentric ones or rather the adventure-spirited ones. 77. I did promise her that I was willing to go to any length to help her out but to think that she would make such a demand. King Eric sighed. We already have all the details about Will and he is one of those favored by the princess herself and was willing enough to ask for. He specializes in sound magic and also has affinity for fire and wind magic. That can be considered a great plus point for him to direct the princess, while also being of around the same age. The old prime minister explained as if he was satisfied with the pace of things. I know. I know, no matter what I am going to make sure that Regis gives her best and I can finally win against. Before the king could complete his statement in his fired up mode, the prime minister tilted down his face towards him and surprisingly, it was one of the scariest thing he had seen in his long elven life. Your highness might I know, did you make a bet again? The old man's voice has a chilled flair attached to it. What are you talking about? The king stuttered as he whispered. His eyes shut open and close quicker than his heart beat. You do know well that you have an entirely worst and a very bad history with bets. Isn't that being too hard on me? And you are wrong I did win one time, though I can't say it was a total absolute win with how things played out, but. So you do not deny that you did make a bet. Now may I inquire into the details of the bet so that I can already prepare for the compensations and the consequences that you have to face to make sure that corrective measures are ensued for His Majesty to not further indulge in frugality. The Prime Minister's words were filled with obedience though it was clear to the King that those were at the moment, not in his personal favour anymore. The King's bad memories again rewind in his mind frame where he was subjected to a low budget for an entire month sanctioned by the Prime Minister himself for his personal use, only because he lost a bet. 78. Your face is making me scared. No. 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 I promise I won't do it again. So spare me. At least let me have enough to purchase a goodbye gift. The King submitted to his faults and to the mercy of the Prime Minister hoping that the cut might not exceed this time the four-month mark. 79. Regis Ascalon I waited in the palace's backyard for the person, who I chose to be my tutor to help me in refining my control over magic powers, I did not want it to ask for any help from Alicia, because then it won't be a fair match as she promised it to be, I did not know his name but the Prime Minister was quickly able to tell Will. So. That's what his name was for all this time. I always used to try and copy him while learning whenever he would practice magic or do training with his team members here. The passion in which he trained with other soldiers, always drew me in and it became much easier to grasp and improve over my own training. To be honest, that was never really my intention, but sitting in that place and seeing all other trying to do something out there, it initially felt all pointless to me, day after day. The soldiers who can't even perform the easiest magic spells, were suddenly able to get a hold of themselves and were improving at the same time, it felt like I was the only one being left behind, doing nothing, the world and other people might had wanted me to just stay shut inside that locked room, and even if my family did everything in their power to help me, I really didn't knew what to do, did I really have a choice with what I can do with myself, I was a princess. For that matter my security was above all else, it was always required for me to act in a certain way in public, to uphold the dignity of the royal family, but now I was even scared to show my face anywhere, no one knew about this power or how dangerous it could be if not used properly by me, and so people were even more scared of me because I was just a kid, 
it had left me with no choice to try doing something on my own. For practice I once channeled some of my magic on one of the dolls I was holding tight which was given to me as a gift and it was ripped apart in shreds. I thought if it was a thing precious to me then I would be able to 80. Control my feelings as I tried putting the crumbles and parts together, but could not fix it. I had realized maybe it was really true that I could have destroyed everything I touched. Even a monster wouldn't have been able to conjure such a grotesque sight. I had not given up. Still I really didn't knew where to start, it was in this confusing times when I picked up something he said to his battalion while training if you really crave for something and make the kind of choices you would love to, then believe that you can and believe that what you have is needed and necessary. There was an explosion in my brain. Hundreds of doubts in my mind there in that buzz of words. I had already tears in my eyes when it all began and the challenge was big enough. How can this power be necessary for what I might have wanted to achieve, and the least expected answer that came from my side? I laced my boots and took a step, that might have been the first choice I made by myself. Not because I had found the answer, but because I wanted to find one, or create it with my own power. I already knew basics of magic and fighting techniques because big sister Edith used to help me a lot with my studies to the extent of calling it as intensely unreasonable and overboard. But I was glad she did, because now I was able to understand what they were doing on the training ground just by watching them and later practice them on my own after they had left already, and today if there was a way to defeat Alicia then I was going to need this power. All I wanted was to be in command of myself and make use of this power to prove my worth. Also. I was quite uptight and annoyed by how big sister Edith got hold of Alicia first and took her to visit the city. Even when I wanted to be the first one to show it to her. Doesn't matter, because when I win, I will definitely. Princess Regis. A firm voice came seeking my attention. 81. I looked behind and there was Will and for the first time I was seeing him this close. Brownish black hair and brown eyes looked even more lively than they appeared from the long distance of my room. Since both of us knew each other names, maybe we were not that strange to each other anymore. He wore the usual military uniform of the Escalon Kingdom but maybe the armor was not necessary so he abandoned it for the session. This was the first time I realized he was someone close to my age, but looked much more mature than me. I am Will Valen and, on your request. I am here to help you in controlling your magic power. His face had a calm expression as he bowed down in front of me. I couldn't even sense a hint of hostility from him against me rather he was bubbling with enthusiasm as if he was looking forward to this meeting. I wondered just what kind of person was I am in his mind. Just call me Regis. I emphasized. I had no time to waste on flippant thoughts. I had only three days and every second passed made me anxious. How would I do that? Princess Regis. He asked nodding his head. Because I am not used to getting called a princess, everyone I know calls me by my name. I said frustratedly without thinking of a proper reason. I understand, this would surely make things faster. I am honored to help you with your training Regis. His frankness though threw me off a bit, but I was glad that there were no further useless questioning or bringing in royalty and status. I was least interested and indifferent to those things anyway. So, how do you think I should go on telling you about magic control? Will asked as he scurried around the training ground making sure everything was in perfect condition. I don't have a clue. But whenever I use my power, I feel a heavy pressure on my hands and if I don't stop channeling magic, my hands too would get ripped apart. I clenched my fingers again and again as I pondered over the nature of my magic power. According to the doctors and alchemists my 82 magic veins were too thin to stop the overflow of this magic which seems to be in constant motion and so due to its tendency it tries to attack whatever it comes in contact with regardless of my mind. Will looked suddenly worried when he heard with what I had to say. It was obvious because we wouldn't have the luxury to use my power directly for practice when I could suffer from self-inflicted damage. If I was ever to release my magic power then it has to be in a perfect controlled condition. Have you ever succeeded doing it before? Of course I would. Have. I responded in haste thinking that I was being looked down upon but seeing that Will was genuinely concerned with the facts, I explained only the part where I used my magic. 
to take out the relic weapon which the Ouroboros dragon was using. He was intrigued by the story and for the first time I was talking to someone I met for the first time without reservation. If that's the case, then first I would like to explain to you about how I originally use my sound magic. Isn't sound magic just a derivative of wind magic specialization over controlling the pressure of air? I remembered what big sister Edith taught me. Yes, that might be close. But that is not all there is to this magic. When I use sound magic, I try to channel my magic from my body directly into the air surrounding me, manipulating its flow and generating wind currents that rapidly oscillates along the line of projection in which my hand is directed. Will explained to me with various hand gestures and flow of magic and I was able to get the gist of it. I see. What you mean is that you want me to channel my magic not as an entirety and instead of concentrating it at one point of my hand to disperse it thoroughly in the air. I wondered whether it would work in the first place. Surely it was something I might have tried and failed but never gave much thought to it. I highly doubt whether this style would suit your magic but if you release your magic in small compositions and at regular intervals, you just might 83 be able to even if it is a temporary solution. Will looked determined with his solution and I wanted to believe in him, just as I believed in Alicia when I was able to draw out my power for the first time, how about I try doing it first? Maybe you should use these arrows. Will suddenly took out few arrows from his spatial magic box. Is there anything special about them? I asked wondering about their different design and shape than the normal ones I use. Yes. I want you to use these enchanted arrows as a medium. If you channel too much energy into them then they would crumble and fall apart. With this you would be able to know just the right amount to at least get by with a simple launch spell. Okay. I took the arrow from him but still wondered how did he know that I used a bow as a weapon and he was already ready with a method to help me out. Did further tell him. Without thinking twice I was eager to put this method into action. Loading the arrow which was a bit longer than the usual one I was used to that were made of a material derived from a magic insulator, this one was slowly tingling in my hands, now try to slowly channel magic in the arrow and then release it into the surrounding along with the arrow to create a forceful blowing effect. Will said excitedly. Yeah. I said in awe, as I started pouring magic energy into it. My hands shook but I still went with that strange feeling. Boom. It was not even two seconds when the arrow turned red and our surrounding was blow away with a huge explosive blast. Somehow, I was safe and I searched for Will after the dust clouds cleared, and in some way, he had managed to conjure a magic shield and save himself just in the nick of time, as he lay flat on the ground. 84. Are you alright? I said as I offered my hand to him. I am glad it didn't kill me. Will smiled at me. I pulled back my hand and stood back at my position while Will, was left in a confusing trance not knowing what to do with himself when he could be such open-minded and too painfully optimistic sometimes. If you can say that, then you are more than fine enough. I murmured. I am sorry princess. I am sorry again, Regis. Why don't we try again? Such kind of things are not exactly common but I don't think the same should apply in your case. Will said in a hurry trying to explain himself for his thoughtless comment, but I was surprised he didn't scold me for sending him flying away or breaking the magic arrow he gave to me, Will, I need to learn to learn to control my powers in three days. Do you really think it is possible for someone like me? I said in a deep voice, feeling down as I shifted my face away making sure not to let him know that despite his efforts, I was still not hopeful and lacked confidence in myself. I should have asked this before. But it is still not late. Can you tell me the reason of why do you want to learn to control your power? I have to defeat someone to show them that I am strong and they do not need to worry and look after me all the time. I didn't knew how Will would respond to this when he has now learned the real reason. He must be thinking I am a fool just for trying. Are they strong? Will hit the same serious look in his eyes which I would see in him during the training hours when I watched him from my room window, much stronger than me, you or anyone else I have ever known. Strong enough to rip apart the whole palace with a snap of her finger. I said turning at him this time. That's where at present I would rate Alicia's power level since I needed to defeat her but, 
Will might take me as over-exaggerating things. 85. Then again, I was the only one who had seen her power firsthand and I knew how devastatingly strong magic spells she could use and without uttering a single chant. In my experience if I have to fight a strong enemy that I could not hope to defeat at that time, then I will put my everything on the line and aim for the best I can do. I too have known people that can just pick up a sword and master all the techniques scaling new heights where one can never hope to reach. But at the same time I have met people again who work hard to the bone and achieve results. So, you wouldn't know unless you make an effort? Wait isn't that saying that you are putting your life in danger? I said worriedly, but you are here training yourself and has decided not to quit. I am a soldier of the Escalon Kingdom. It is because of my duty to protect you and the royal family even if I have to risk my own life. Will said with his formal oath salute. I was speechless and taken aback. Maybe a bit embarrassed. No one has ever told me in person that they would risk their life for me, even if it was as his part of his duties. I gulped and for some reason could not look directly into his eyes for some time. Will too grasped that our tutoring session was deviating from our primary objective and now that he knew the deadline, he was even more dead serious about it. Princess Regis. Why don't I show you one of my own spells so that you can adopt how much magic power is required? Will pointed for me towards a bunch of aiming targets placed far away. He brandished his hand and started chanting a spell. Air eat to my calling and pierce through like the wind, howling bolt. A bright white light was drawn out from the arrow, a sudden gale slashes through the surrounding as Will pitches the arrow from the palm of his hands. 86. The force was so powerful that I was barely able to keep my eyes open, and when I finally did my eyelids apart, a massive crater lay waste and the target blown to smithereens. That was more than impressive. Though I am still sure I was more amazing with what I pulled at the Dragon Island, but that might just have been a fluke on my part. I am sure if I can do something similar then at least I can hold my ground against Alicia. I think I could for a minute or two. Probably. Or am I still underestimating her? I was still astounded by the spell, and after a long time I got to see something overwhelming in the context of being normal. Nonetheless I still found myself in dust not knowing whether I will succeed in this pursuit or not. Should I give up and forget? It's your turn to try shooting at those targets. Will might have noticed my hesitation as he walked to the target layout himself, and shout at me. Just don't forget why you started doing all of this. He had the most generous and sincere expression on his face. He was attentive and thoughtful enough to get me these special enchanted arrows. Even when I am meeting him for the first time, I glanced at him, and the unique seriousness and power was reflected in his soft atmosphere. At some point I did not want it to do anything, and the previous me might not have wanted it at this point of time. I was able to hug my family have a casual talk with my sister and now I had someone devoting himself towards improving me, it all became possible once Alicia came here, everything came true, the moment she said she would grant my wish, if she really has the power of granting others wishes, then why does it still annoys me when she said that I was afraid of using my own power? 87. I have used this power before to help her even for a little. I only need to remember. This power is all mine, for me and me alone, to use at will. Studying my hands, I drew my bow to its limit. Channeling magic just as Will showed me, quickly transferring from my hands into the arrow. The air swelled and twisted around my arrow. I finally released it before I could tell it would go exploding again and it did not only contain my magic power but I knew I was able to let go of all of my pent-up sadness, and doubts in me, the shock wave from the shot was strong enough to nearly blow me away, the arrow advanced at lightning speed, a brutal tornado in its wake, dot it were, will, look out, I screamed the last of my words barely able to keep my eyes open and look through the dusty smoke, shwoom, though the targets were unharmed, I was still not able to spot the will anywhere. Where is he? Why? I can't see him. Someone dot will. Where are you? My eyes were about to tear up. As I sunk to the ground, both in my miserable state as I ran out of energy because I tried to release and suppress a lot of my magic powers at the same time. Where did he disappear to? Regis you did well. 
A cheerful voice came from behind me as a shadow flashed. I saw Will there standing, with his fine uniform all covered in dust. It would seem that with this method you can only turn the enchanted arrows into bombs that can explode any time. But it's a good start. Hugh, how? I asked in panic. 88. Will. Explained me how he was able to measure the trajectory of my arrow and it going berserk before it could even hit the target right. He was able to run using his supersonic freefall spell and get behind me making sure that I was safe too. Though the holes in his uniform tell me that he was barely able to escape the explosion. But I still missed the target and ended up hurting you. I don't know should I continue with it. I had started having second thoughts. Maybe Alicia can help me suppress my powers as she had already done before, and then I can practice, but that would be accepting it outright that I was again scared of using my powers on my own. I looked at Will, trying to know what he was thinking, he grinned at me as a new friend and maybe as an old friend whom I just might had known for a very long time, as if he knows the answer even before I ask him. He has been helping me, without complaining and at least he has not given up on me. I will help you with everything, as long as you like it. Princess, Regis. I was not turned away this time. This time, I will carry it on without losing myself. It might be embarrassing, but I really know now what should I be doing. Will, let's try it one more time and this time I will hit it for sure. I said with a warm smile, that's the spirit, I like to see in the soldiers I train but knowing that you won't run out of magic so I have prepared dozens of enchanted arrow for you to keep practicing shooting unless you are able to hit your targets. Will had a miraculous outburst of energy as he pulled out several arrows from his magical storage box skill. At that moment I realized that Will was a pushover and a bit scary when it came to training. Seeing his perfect smile as he filled the ground under my feet with enchanted arrows, pulling them out of his storage box. That was also the moment I remembered a word hearing from the trainees calling him the mad trainer or the tormentor. 89. I was flummoxed and at the same time, felt I was the weird one if I asked for a break to have my meals or some time for rest. Go forward and help yourself with. I know you can hit it this time. He reissued his statement. Maybe you would sound more convincing, if you can help me here than cheering me from the sidelines. I screamed at will who was now like a scaredy cat hiding behind the trees to the extreme corner of the training ground, the moment I loaded my bow with one of the enchanted arrow. Ha <laughs> ha. It would seem that the training would literally end leaving me with holes. Will carried a suppressed smile, but his openness in thoughts was too refreshing for my choice and I wanted to give him my peace of mind in return. <laughs> but I carried his smile even more vigorously and filled with kindness. Will. I think I can improve more in my training if I try shooting at moving live targets. I was sure I was smiling at Will, when I pointed my arrow at his head, though my eyes may not have the same charms of a princess right now. Well, later that day the training ground did literally was filled with screams of the boy who did his best to help a girl with all his honesty. I am sorry princess, Regis. If you don't stay still, then I won't be able to fix my aim. But I don't want to get hurt anymore. I said, stay still, or my arrows might hit you in the wrong place and you might get even more hurt. That would be worse. Get ready, princess. Please stop. Maybe we should try other methods first which I have thought of. I am sure. There are other ways too. 90. Will. Yes, princess. Just believe. 91. Chapter. 4. As the princess wishes. It was the second day for my training and I was out of bed early, making sure not to wake Alicia up. Honestly, did she really had to sleep in the same room with me? I know the room is more than big enough to accommodate the two of us, but she would never learn like this. But then again, maybe this is good for a little while, if I am not the only one using this room. After doing all my morning chores and exactly when I was about to leave for the practice ground. It would be a pleasant start if everything went well, Regis. Alicia silently stood there at the door, and I don't know how. I thought I had given her the slip, but she was too sensitive and perceptive for that to happen. Alicia. I most hesitantly called out her name, good morning, I never saw you up. Being caught red-handed, I had left nothing to do but search for fictional flies. 
that might have been floating inside the room at any moment. Good morning to you too. Regis will you? Okay, bye, there's some place I need to be. Neglecting her, I tried to move out as quickly as possible. I did not want her to know what I had been doing behind her back. I was guilty, and hiding something from her felt bad, but I had no choice and could not help doing it in any other way. Facing her right now as I was, would be impossible for me. Regis, here take this with you. Alicia gave off a down smile, not at its brightest setting. What's this? I asked in reflex. A small box wrapped in a cloth, was already tucked between my fingers grip. 92. I am sorry, for yesterday. Sign there was no more left for you. Alicia said in an apologizing manner. Thank you. We will talk later. Reassuring her I rushed out. I was beaming with energy because I knew I had made a phenomenal progress yesterday. And maybe today I can have a breakthrough, where I can actually properly conduct magic according to my will. After my level raised and my skill turned into a title. Controlling my magic power has been more comfortable and easier for me than ever before. Besides already having this lunchbox, when yesterday I had to go hungry because of Will's harsh training. I was sure yesterday's tragedy would not repeat itself all over again. I met Will at the training ground, and he was right on time. Neither a second late nor a second early. Sorry for not being the first. I condoned my own words. It's all right. So, let's start off right from where we left at yesterday. So, are we going to repeat the same training method? Not at all. We only have two days left and your growth has been extraordinary. So, instead of repeating yesterday's drill. I think we should try new things so that you can explore which kind of tactical ability and magic suits you. Will explain to me as usual, he was dexterous in giving briefings and elucidating his teachings and training techniques. So, what do you think I should do this time? I asked quite eagerly, I did earn his praise, so it wouldn't be too bad if I overworked a little, we are going to raise the difficulty of our training. Will looked smug with his answer, as if it's not difficult enough already. A plain thought crossed my mind, not like he would listen to what I have to say, when he has already with decided today's routine. He was really a good teacher, and patient with me, though I would have been glad if he would be not that open and free-minded. 93 When his over-optimistic personality could be thrashingly painful, but for better or worse I was handling all of this pretty well by keeping him in check in the best ways I could think of. I am sure by the end of our training he too would realize that, or maybe it would be just that late and by that time he might lose a body part or two, with countless holes in his body. But there is nothing to worry, since Alicia will surely patch him up for me, on my request and I can have several other get-goes until I make sure of it that he improves too along with me. Regis. Are you listening? From today on you are prohibited to use those enchanted arrows. Will, synchronized with the most positive vibes of today's appealing weather, called out to me without having a clue or inkling to any of my future plans and ideas. What? I protested against the sudden decision he made on spot without consulting with me. I was sure if it were those arrows, I could definitely aim perfectly after yesterday's live action practice. How will I shoot and aim at the same time, then? I was sure I made the second question sound pretty reasonable. Will, knew that just either controlling the flow of magic and taking aim simultaneously was still a far cry for me. Exactly, I will not really call it the best of times but an exceptional opportunity, when you are neither too familiar nor a stranger to controlling the movement of magic in your surroundings. So I think with little hit and trial, you can figure out the right amount of magical energy to be used to complete a magic arrow formation. Saying that Will, threw a quiver at me, filled with arrows and it was like someone too careful made sure of it that not a single space was left for these poor arrows to take breathe inside. They were completely stacked and heavy, all right. If it's a challenge, I am ready to take it on. I was pumped up for sure and after receiving that lunchbox from Alicia I felt like I could do anything. Even if I was a princess, I won't be going hungry today. Unlike the last time, Will, then seeing my eagerness, coincidentally had a profound idea and traced out how the sets of quivers filled up to the brim, with arrows of different, 94, sizes and shape, 
with its bullet point ranging from pointed to different forms I never knew of before. I knew Will, was making sure I gave my best and working hard, but he was way over pushing this above limit, I might have hit him hard on the head for still not learning with his yesterday's lesson on my account. But I was not in the position right now of complaining and taking it slow, I had decided on a fight myself, and it was already troublesome to make Alicia accept the terms. Taking a deep breath. I drew out an arrow and perfectly placing the knock on the string. I pulled it to its maximum, just making sure that the elasticity of the string was put to test to its utmost elasticity. I started channeling magic in it, just as I practiced doing yesterday and only hoped to not mess up this time. Boom! The arrow was shattered and twisted into a scrunch from the middle with a strong gust of wind that dented the ground. Will. I called out to him dejected at my miserably failed attempt, looking for his venerable and diligent guidance, don't you worry and keep trying. Just as I said, there can be hundreds of wrong shots that you might pull, but a single correct shot just might tell you where you were going wrong in those hundred. You really think that way, but do we actually have that much time? I inquired, now leaving everything to my master's farsightedness. But this time it was just a doubt and I could not let myself feel insecure and self-doubting anymore. Just as I have always said, I will stay here with you unless you are able to achieve your goal and as long as you like me to. Will did not change his stance or expression, even for once. Maybe people don't really change that quickly, and so I cannot expect from myself the same. I cannot expect a miracle to happen in these remaining two days. All I can do is give my best and accept whatever the result may come. But I had to win this time no matter what, and until I think I had put 95 effort enough to make that effort enough to make that happen, I shouldn't stop. When Alicia uses magic, she shines really bright, the kind whom I would be most jealous of. But from the moment I met her, with whatever she says or do, it pulls my heart in. But I doubt I will ever have any of that, I sometimes talk edgy and I still cannot properly use magic at that level, but if I want to be with her, I will have to train more and more and reach to the point where I and she can talk at an equal level, never in my life I have ever felt this competitive before, to be strong and able to reach someone and catch up to them, disheartening myself even before the match would be like betraying my own words with what I said to my aunt. Alicia's mother. I kept on practicing as Will instructed me to, not sure how many hours passed, when a small group of people in training uniform, the same as Will, showed up at the training field. Around seven people, while two of them were girls, the rest were men. Commander Will, I knew we will find you here. We just couldn't rest, knowing that you will be alone training here. A soldier jeered, as he waved his hand at Will. I see someone is already there to accompany you but who is that? One of the soldiers tried to stare at me, giving off the feeling that they just might had seen me somewhere before. Maybe not sure where, but they were no stranger. Never seen her before. You sure? Maybe Commander found a new teammate for us. A new recruit? One of the female soldiers suggested. I am not so sure about that, but isn't she really beautiful? She really looks pretty and refined for a soldier class recruit, I guess. Don't tell me the kingdom is low on manpower, and has to hire such an angelic lovely young lady. 96. Don't be rude. Shouted another of the female soldier at the other three who just then had shared the short exchange of comments in their circle. I was sure that I had dismissed all of you from training for a week and to have absolute rest after the southern campaign. Why are all of you here then? Will asked passing a worried expression at me, since I was a princess, he had absolutely no idea how would I respond to this as such, on the contrary I was the clueless and much more in distress, for someone who had never talked casually to the soldiers of my country before, what a failure of a princess have I been. I am sorry father and mother, for causing any trouble to you. Wait, what if I compare myself to Alicia, she surely falls short too in such situations. But then again, it feels rather meaningless. And winning from her in such a field doesn't really excite me that much. Right, maybe because it's already a given. I am sorry commander. But we just couldn't have a proper rest without tiring ourselves with training each day. Excitedly one of the soldiers explained. I think you are exactly right. 
confirmed one of the soldiers, but he didn't seem much happy about it with his own affirmation and lethargic tone. But isn't it the truth that if we get slow on our official training day then commander might overextend our workout time? Complained one of the dejected looking soldier as he supported his other two comrades at the same time, and that's something we do not want to happen, commander. Continued another in haste and pride, we do not want to get rusted, commander. That's pretty much it, complimented the other women soldier, reporting to commander Will, we are here to train. Sir, so, if you would allow us, please. Together said all the soldiers in unison while also giving the sanctioned salute to the higher official will. 97. I somehow felt proud, that he was respected so highly among so many soldiers this much, but now he was lost in thought and would sometime look in my direction. Not being able to decide what to do or say to them anything. Seeing him in a quandary, I knew it was my time to shine, but what should I really do? because when it comes down to it, I haven't got a clue. The other soldiers stared at me as they too figured out Will's hesitation. Regardless both of the group were new arrivals to each other and the only link was Will himself, who was quiet now. Just say something. I cleared my throat, making sure to exactly copy my father. As I saw him doing the same sometimes, Will, I think it's okay if they can train and practice with us together. Can you please introduce ourselves to each other? For some reason, I would have been fine introducing myself, but I let Will do it. Since, I don't know how they would react when they would really come to know who I was. <coughs> Will rapidly nodded his head in affirmation as he continued. You are right. I think the more people train with you then you can get more ideas with how others use magic and have different viewpoints about it. So he never would change and was more worried about my training, but that's kind of good too, and I could already feel the future problems I might had been accidentally imposing on these soldiers, because of my sudden request to Will, the others were in bewilderment, since they didn't realize my position, to be able to give their commander, Will orders, even though I have never done any princess-like thing before, except for living inside the palace, good for you trainees. I present to you the second princess of Ascalon Kingdom, Princess Regis Ascalon, and from today we are going to train together. Will made an impressive introduction out of my name, though it was a little beyond what I actually was. At first those young soldiers were taken aback after hearing my lofty position, later then, they were hit by a certain ignorance trying to figure out, 98, who I was really and did I really match to the description? Seeing their blank faces I could at least tell that much, from there I was sure that the next thing I could expect were their harsh stares, as other people have done to me on a constant basis, I wouldn't be surprised if they suddenly ran away, but I felt bad for tarnishing Will's reputation by this. What? All of them blared out together and in the next moment were on their knees as if begging for their lives. I was expecting a much ruthless reaction, but they were actually prostrating in front of me, and what's with the indescribable expression on their faces. Princess, please forgive us for our disregards. Don't feed us to the monsters for our crime of ignorance. I swear to the spirits. We were oblivious of our own place. Please forgive us for our insolence. I was sure by now, that if I wouldn't have done anything, then they would surely leap on me in their desperation. Even when they were making me look the bad person, I was scared of their mob reaction. Just what kind of tyrannical figure did they imagine me in their heads? Will, did I say something wrong? Or was I not clear enough? I imperatively seeked Will's help, which I needed more than ever to clear out the confusion. Everyone quiet down, the princess, says that you can actually train along with her. Will ordered his battalion with a much louder and stronger voice than he ever did before. The battalion broke into tears realizing that their lives were spared, but I really never intended to do such atrocities, never in my lifetime. They stood up again in the formal salute and in a proper formation for the first time. Yes, commander, we look forward to our training. They shouted together in unison again, 99, and approximately that's how it went down. They were more than happy to help with my training, which had already come a far way along. The other soldiers cheered at me while I tried to use quick implementation magic spells for simple attacks. And besides they also showed me their own specialty, Myra, 
One of the female soldiers had an excellent control over water magic, or how unexpectedly one of the most bulky and muscular soldier was good at healing magic, then using the giant knuckles to knock down his opponent. They all had different intake about using magic and perceiving it in their own ways. That made me think of how Alicia would perceive her magic. It was unlike anything that I have seen before. She does not use magic words or chants, or even magic circles. Her casting speed is almost spontaneous and I won't be able to predict the kind of magic she would be using. Fighting with her without knowing how she could counteract me in any impossible way, was going to make it even harder. But I did not let any of these concerns bother me anymore. Because my brain was now more focused on learning, and the fight came afterwards. Also practicing with these soldiers I was more than thrilled, when there could be more competitors. After that one of the soldiers reminded us to take our lunch break on the pretext that eating food was also a necessary part of the training. Good job there. Not sure whether Will shared the same sentiment. But after all the votes balloted against him, he would for sure try to reconsider his thoughts on the matter. Or I might just have to drill it inside him, before our training period expired. In between that process, I happily opened my lunchbox, hoping to see something good since father and mother highly regarded the food Alicia made. Not sure why, but after I had lifted the top lid, a multitude of people collected around me in a circle. 100. Wah. I have never seen what does the royal family eats. One of them expressed his thought with a shameful eagerness, seeing that he was already drooling from his mouth. What kind of special luxurious food is that? It's all white. Asked Amar one of the female soldier and followed most of the other soldiers whose names I had learned by now. Do you really think you can understand the cuisine of the royals? I am sure it's not really that special. I butted in, rebuking all of their statements. It's just what I eat, and eat every day. But all of them had eyes ogling on me and my food as if it was some kind of historic treasure. I looked below and gave a serious thought as to how Alicia had prepared more than enough and sharing won't be that big of a problem. I raised my tiffin and holding it like a cup. Its perfect smell and the still magically hot food inside lured out seekers from all around. Would all you like to have a bite? I muttered innocently, making a hasty decision so as to not to be the cause of a riot. Yes. Sure. Thank you so much. Words of gratitude let my mind wander far off, only to later realize that the top of my palm now held empty air. Somehow the lunchbox was gone. Did the earth eat it? Or the sky swallowed it? And before I could even look around who might have picked it up, the box almost reappeared immediately, without me even knowing who put it back. I know, it's highly doubtful. But don't tell me that one of them knows teleportation magic just like Alicia. Everyone had satisfied expression on their faces. I told you this food is totally out of this world. Cried one of the soldier in joy. Do they grow this kind of special and exquisite ingredients inside the palace only? 101. I am not going to wash this hand from now. I am sure the taste has perfectly dissolved in it. If only I could get one more bite. Just a small. Wailed one of them. I was now in a dilemma as to whether it was the right thing that I did or maybe not. I just might have escalated their opinion about the royal food menu. When one of the soldiers who participated said he could see God's handwork behind the making of this food. Without stressing much over the unknown, I pulled the box down, with great prospects. Even if I would be the last to taste the food made by Alicia's hand, I can be the only one to rightly appreciate it, because I am the one who has to put up with all her thoughtless and strange demands. Wa-a-dot-t? Just a single ball. I cried while jumping and screamed in a hush. To my utter dismay I found just a single rolled ball of that white rice left inside. I am sure it was something, that yesterday they called it a rice ball. I gulped, knowing that I had no choice but to fill my tummy with just one. Princess, I am glad to see that you are able to re-energize and have a lot of fun at the same time. Will came after a long walk and fixing the damaged training ground. Keeping my lunchbox on the side, he joined us. His dress had gotten a bit untidy and from what I had noticed he had went back to calling me a princess after the soldiers showed up. But I really wouldn't have mind if he would stick to my name only. But is this what they really call fun, hanging out with these soldiers, training and playing with them at the same time? Yes, it is fun. 
I eminently replied, thanking him for all his hard work. I wondered can I have fun doing the same thing with Alicia? In my work ethic doing a lot of productive work is a great way to keep yourself healthy and lively. Wool replied without holding back his emotions and faith he religiously followed. So, that's what he really meant. SHH. After all of this, but that might be just he saying. I am just glad that the whole army is not like him. 102. Otherwise they would have surely abolished all the Sundays and holidays in the name of increasing the efficiency and working hours in the kingdom. Now, the lunch break is over let's get back to training. Will prompted to the others including me. I am stuffed. That was some really some insane food than the usual boiled green veggies which the commander recommends. I think I can do double. No maybe thrice times the usual training just after taking a bite from that dish. If princess joins us in training, then maybe we can actually be fed such delicacies every day. Another soldier, Nirim opinionated his thoughts gladly. Just as I said before, don't be rude, to the princess. Myra screamed giving a severe blow to Nirim on his nape almost knocking him unconscious, but I had no time to worry for him since I hadn't had my chance at it till yet. Even with this less of a time I was sure, I could gulp it down and savor it in one mouthful. The anticipation of this heavenly taste had broken all the time barriers for me. I turned to my lunchbox, nicely kept over a piece of cloth laid on the ground. Meep, but my eyes narrowed on a single red ant trying to pull a small single grain from the box and from there followed a long train of ants strongly holding to a single piece of grain one at a time in a marching procession, you got to be kidding me, not the ants too. I fell on four on the grounds, just to observe how extraordinarily stretched the line of ants carrying the food was. Everyone to the training ground, quick! Will gave us the final call. Almost everyone had packed their stuff and had gone back to the training grounds. With tearful eyes, held back in my eyes, I sniffled, while closing my lunch box. For me it was no longer fun anymore. How does that paragon? 103. Trainer expects me to work on an empty stomach. There was no choice for me, and once again I had to go on empty stomach for training. I arrived back in my room late at night, hoping to find Alicia and ask her to make something for me again. But for the first time she was absent from my room. It was quite strange, because I would always find here if not anywhere else. She couldn't have just gone to some place on her own. She is still too childish to know her way around the palace. I quickly inquired the maids, and was relieved to know that she was forcibly dragged and was today going to spend the night in Big Sister Edith's room. I felt bad for her upcoming fate and the tolling death bells I could hear for her, but I was in even much worse condition starving and tired. It felt quite long for the first time silent again in my room. But I think I was already too tired to hear any noise, or go to Big Sister and fight back for Alicia's safety. All I could do was wish for her safe return tomorrow morning. The third and final day, did not go with things as planned. According to Will now it was time for me to stop trying for new methods and repeat all that I had learned by now and find the best possible way for myself to cast magic and repeat it as many times as I could. Though there were only simple basic spells I could wield when I controlled my magic but because of my magic nature they were largely of destructive nature. At least it was better than having nothing in my arsenal and it was also Will who said that I should focus on things and ideas that were available to me instead of complaining for not having the necessary power, but aiming for a target in the dark under a time constraint might have been really a fool's errand for me. Without doubting for a second, I did as Will suggested me to. The soldiers and the new comrades I had made here too showed up and they were more than happy to further test my limits. I won in races, sometimes failed to dodge an attack and got hurt, fell prey to one of the trap magic laid by a veteran soldier, and could go toe to toe with 104, will in hand to hand fight. And not to forget seeing how will won in all the unofficial hand wrestling matches we held in our breaks as we cheered for every competitor. But my goal still hadn't changed. It had deepened even further, it's all because I have been trying new things here and there, doesn't matter whether I lose at it in the first try or not, or fall too short in skills to follow those who are ahead of me. I tomorrow had a big day and the jump I had to make was bigger than any of them I made in these days, 
but the basics were already drilled into my body and I was already in the spirits of one etching for a fight. I think we should temporarily stop training here. Temporarily. I whispered, words barely able to come out of my mouth. Yes, tomorrow is an important day for you. I think you should take some rest before that happens. Will calmly looked at me. At least he could have helped me to get up. Will. I stared at him softly in return. You, say that. But can't you see all the soldiers have already fainted because of exhaustion while those who are still barely able to stand had to carry them back to the infirmary? It has already been more than five hours from when the sun went down, and I am hungry too. I complained, screamed and cried at the same time. I might have acted like a little kid there. Now Regis, stop complaining. After a long time he called me by my name and it caught my attention. I wish you best of luck for tomorrow and I am sure that you will find all your hard work that you had put in your training helpful to overcome those challenges. Will's polite words really helped me feel better. I think I feel a bit more relieved now. I applauded myself for recovering from that dramatic and devastated temperament of mine a while ago. Really? Will excitedly looked at me, ignoring my beaten and torn down looks, which he should be blamed for. 105. Stop. That doesn't mean I am going to train more. At least not for today. I stopped Will before he could go any further with his bestial and demonic cultivation tutelage. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Will giggled, trying to pretend that it was all just part of his big joke, but he was just that good at not hiding it. Ah. I took a deep breath and stood straight and tall. Will if you really understand then, I want you to come and see me in my tomorrow's fight. I said it in a serious tone, but then started laughing, maybe I started having second thoughts that it might not have been a good idea and whether Alicia would permit it, she had been set on hiding her presence, saying that it was something she was asked to do generally. Yes, I would definitely like to be a witness of your duel, as long as you like me to. Will stood on one knee under the growing shade of the last remaining tree in the backyard of the palace in the official work code. A paragon of the finest soldier in the kingdom and also a bastion of training. Wait, don't tell me he really expects me to pass on an official statement about the completion of the status of his duties. Why isn't he moving an inch? What if I am unable to do it properly and we might have to spend the rest of the night like this? But I want to go home and take rest. Having no choice, I stood like my father and big sister and mother would always do in the official king's court and observing Will. I paused for a second. Will, I am grateful for your service and for what you have taught me until now in these three days and for those years. I hope that I can keep on learning from you even in the future. Yes, Princess Regis. The knight smiled proudly at the kind words of appreciation from the lovely princess for whom he had been duty bound to. I don't even remember how I got to the palace. My body is the only thing I am sure of. 106. Thankfully, I was able to at least make it back to my door, but it was so late at night that even the maids had gone to sleep. I was the only one burning the midnight toil. My eyelids were feeling heavy and I would be most thankful to the person who could have just arranged for a bed even in the hallway for me to lie down. Alicia too now spends most of her time with my mother and big sister Edith, but I was the one keeping my distance from her. I haven't even apologized to her for yesterday's morning, when I left her alone and without an answer. I was too dry and drained to turn the knob by myself. It's not like anyone would be waiting for me. Just then I magically saw the doorknob rotating by itself and as the gate flipped open, my hands caught in a grip and I was briskly pulled into my room. Don't touch me. I could have hurt you. I jerked off my hand in reflex as I pushed back the person a little, but found myself too weak to even pull that off. When surprisingly the person who stood in front of me was with such a slender and thin body. I thought I might have really hurt her if I tried to. Alicia, what are you saying? It's me, Alicia. I took a sigh of relief and felt the environment around the room as the type of being a twisted noontime evening. My eyes were drawn to Alicia as she stared back. She was still shining in that beautiful background of her white hair, but something was different, and I wanted to laugh, but also knew that it was my fault that she felt like this. I saw Alicia pouting, showing her rebellious side because I was not paying attention to her. 
but honestly, she was still failing to do such a simple task, I am sure I can give her proper lessons to be able to do so, after I myself have been coached by Will, but most part of me actually liked it the way it was, it was too hilarious and broken. 107. Alicia, I am so. But if my actions at the end was bringing pain to her then I am not sure of its worth. Regis. Before I could apologize, Alicia stopped me from speaking, she pressed my hands between her own, a perfect size fit for each other, as if she was reassuring herself, that I was there. I am so relieved. Her words sounded warm to me, relieved? I asked, since it is beyond anyone's capabilities to figure out her intention, it was better to directly ask her. You looked down earlier, so I was wondering if you were okay. Alicia scrunched her hands and releasing me as such, her eyes lit open, that's what was actually worrying her. Just her touch made my body feel lighter and revitalized, I can't be sure whether she might have been casting one of her magic spells at me, but her feelings were refreshing. Don't talk foolish, do I really look like someone who would feel down on small stuff? I said making sure that she doesn't have to worry about anything else. Not at all. Alicia said clearing her eyes and her smile as if made my heart skip a beat twice consecutively. I'm not a big bundle of cheers like you. I have my own worries which I want to solve on my own. I lashed out at her, pointing out her faults. Obviously, it was intentional and made up. Alicia bent lower and stared at my face directly bringing it closer by every instant and winked at my eyes. Don't tell me she was figured out that I was just pretending and was actually worried before. WH what? I asked as I gulped. Yeah, this is how you should be. Alicia said with one of her brightest smile. It was finally back and I love it. 108. If she stared even for a second more, I might have given in. So I pushed my neck away at an uncomfortably difficult angle, even when it was hurting a bit after training. But Alicia did not pause her ascent, and before I could fall, I took her by shoulders and pushed her a bit back, making her directly land safely on bed. It's not like she would get a bit offended if I created a bit personal space for myself. She should be more careful with whom she does that kind of things. If it were for my big sister, I bet she would have become food by now and had been gobbled up. I should really be appreciated and commended for my gentleman attitude. Let's go to sleep. I am very tired. I said impatiently, rubbing my shoulders. Amu. Alicia responded childishly as she scrolled inside the bedsheet in her usual spot which she had marked as of her own. Later I joined her too after changing into my night clothes. Tuck tuck. Now what? I asked forcibly, not being able to hold back myself anymore. We were already on bed, but Alicia was holding on to my back for some reason and her grip was getting loose and tight rapidly alternating every second. I just couldn't sleep like this, nothing, she replied, making herself heard loud and clear that something was surely not sitting right with her, it was better for me to hear her worries, I wouldn't have minded if she went and destroyed the world in her fury, but I couldn't give up on my precious sleep and needed to resolve her problems somehow, do you want to talk a bit before sleeping? I recommended to her, painful as it was, I had to take the roundabout way but it was a sure fall method for someone like Alicia. Sure. 109. 110. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne I cheerfully replied to Regis's proposal and I think it was one of the best ways to sort out my thoughts that were concerning me. On the second day I had spent most of the time with my aunt Alva in the Genesis Tree residence dome. We drank tea and ate confectionery cookies all day basking under the cool and calm shadow of the lush green environment. Though I was continuously being pestered by her about the spirits. My mother and I could describe her as one of the die-hard fans of the true hero. The third day I visited Leah's dine-in together with big sister Edith and I showed her the recipes and different ways of using rice in a dish. She was astounded by the flavors and its versatility to go along and accentuate the amount and taste of any dish. I even got a job offer from her, 
but I had to refuse the application letter because I had my fight with Regis the next day and then I had to continue with my journey and search for Athena. Settling somewhere now was a far off thought for me. Today too Regis had left early in the morning without talking to me in a hurry. Though I am glad that I was able to cook a new batch of breakfast for her early in the morning and give it to her on time. I thought I would be able to spend much time with her, but she hasn't been around me lately ever since we came back. The third day was the same. It's her home. I know there might be things more important to her than me. Is it possible that I am trying to gain her attention? But it won't be good for any of us. Now would it? Mother wanted me to be decisive and this matters and so do I. Otherwise it would leave me sad and that would also hurt Regis and everyone else around me. Saying goodbye to them, mother and further was way more easier. Maybe they were always prepared for that day or they were making sure that I was prepared that I won't be too hurt when I leave home. But Regis has got her own life and even if she might be willing to help me out, I can't be sure that she would enjoy a journey with me, and partake in my troubles. 111. If I had anything to speak to her right now, it would be you know I have never known so many people at the same time and spend so much time with them. I said, not knowing why. But these were really my inner thoughts, and just as mother told me, I wanted to share my heart with someone. But for that someone, I wanted it to be Regis for now. What's that about? Regis turned to me in surprise, putting me in doubts whether it was really that strange to say something like this. But that too would also have been my first reaction if someone told something as chummy to me like this. Well, I tried to think harder hoping to come up with something in response and turn the direction of the conversation from becoming awkward. Your mother hasn't left my side since I came here and is always around me. I thought of telling her what I had done in these past three days, obviously, it was bound to happen because you are now like an idol to her. My mother is the tree maiden and a staunch spirit worshipper, for someone like you whom even the great spirit bowed to. You might be akin to a status of deity for her. Regis explained to me. Is that so? I replied to her realizing that I really needed to do these kind of things around as less as people I could and only whom I could really trust, or, if I was just going to get rid of them later. There was suddenly a long pause as I ran out of words to speak and I could already feel Regis drowsing. I might have been really bad at these topic conversations after all, thinking that she was awake. I wanted to say something that I had been holding back. Regis about tomorrow. Is it really necessary to? Before I could complete, Regis woke up as if she just now dived out of a bad dream in which she fell from the cliff. Quite a scary experience and I too sometimes have those nightmare visions. Most of the time it's a small cute wolf puppy who would run to the side of cliff and to the dangerous broken bridge which cannot hold us two together. And just when I was about to 112 rescue him, he runs to the other side and tears off the ropes with his canines and I fall into the ravine. I for one have come to despise wolves, Alicia if it's about tomorrow. Then let's have that talk tomorrow only. Regis framed those words stiffly. But I questioned apologizingly, but struggled against Regis who was trying to physically shut me up. Regis when was about to protest with her hands and trying to push me to the side of the bed, as if she found her hands heavy. She looked below and found her hands were intertwined around mine. Some way in her half sleep, she had snuggled close to me. I smiled at her. I actually didn't mind her doing that. It might have been strange in the start but I think I owe her that much. Also it was better this way on colder nights. Regis face again went red in shame as she pulled them back with a funny reaction. You have gotten a bit mischievous with spending your time with big sister Edith. Regis said in an embarrassed state. Wait I can explain. My hands went around here and there in there but I still couldn't come out with a reasonable excuse for myself. Don't be dumb. And good night. Regis stomped the pleasantry on my face and pulling all of the bedsheet to her side I was left bare. Realizing I was just now scolded for a being a bad girl, I needed to reassess my thoughts of spending my time around so many people when I can get in trouble for being in bad company. I was again hit over by the truth that living with so many people can be a bit bothersome at times. I pulled out a new blanket from my dimensional storage with how I was refused to get a share in the one which Regis was using. So, she finally decided to not talk about it. 
Is she really that stressed on fighting with me? And what will happen after I win? All I wanted was just to spend more time with her before I decided to leave. 113. I may have also fallen asleep shortly after. Chapter 5. We're the same. The early morning of our duel had finally come. Looking at the top of the windowsill I wondered whether the Tiyu Tiyu Bozu, handmade white paper rain dolls, could have really made a difference to this bright morning glory which I hung the previous night. Well, there had been several instances in the past where the sports matches got cancelled because of the rain, but I highly doubt that even a thunderstorm would have kept Regis at bay now. I had awoken up earlier than Regis, who by then had starkly refused all the maids, showing no sign of waking up any time sooner and decided to bury herself deep into the bed. I, on the other hand felt it was in best of my interest to partake bathing in a palace's gigantic bathtub since I cannot be sure of succeeding in finding one on my travels. Unwittingly, on returning I found Regis already gone. I inquired from the maids in my attendance which were forced upon me by my aunt even on my strong opposition for due reasons and my privacy. Well that's a story for later. According to them Regis had already gone to sea for the preparations of the duel and I was now supposed to meet her directly over there. Late Edith came to our doorstep and joined me in my breakfast which consisted of pancakes and yogurt tart seasoned with fruits. After having a quick chat with her, I could possibly try to shift my mind away from things, though not entirely. Also she did not bring up the topic of the duel at all. It 114 was no surprise that she did not wanted to trouble me with the same repeated questions I was tormenting myself with. She told me that she was later supposed to escort me to the duel ground and how my uncle King himself went to great trouble of constructing the match ground under his own supervision for this specific duel. A special ground with fixed booby traps hidden under the camouflaged leaves would surely be something to look forward to or could there be a special elven match ritual where we had to first swear and take oaths in front of the forest deities for their approval on the match decisions. The games I usually played back in my world had these kinds of customized arenas, but seeing one for myself, kept me at the edge of my seat on the wagon in which I and Edith were riding now. However being a part of it and seeing it happen from the sides was altogether a completely different thing. There in the coach Edith informed me of how Regis wanted to invite one of her friends to see the duel and I allowed it. I think including Regis's whole family Edith who was accompanying me now. The king who himself decided to help in the construction of the arena, the queen who had already shown her interest to me of her looking forward to the match in her meetings with me. And then there was the prime minister to look after any immediate needs or in case of an emergency. And this new guest of Regis was also going to join and observe my duel with her. They were all trustworthy people in their regards and I absolutely had no issues. Because by then I had already decided to end the match as quickly as possible and exactly as, how I promised Regis it to be, there was nothing that would have changed my mind. We moved deeper and deeper into the woods. Even though the birds merrily chirped and I could see some strange squirrels leaping from tree to tree and sometimes a pack of small raccoon-like animals would start following us until the wagon would catch speed and leave them behind. Contrary to Edith who remarked as to how fine the weather was as she kept on staring at the serene landscape outside the window. 115. Honestly. It was really a mystery to me too as to how the weather could be so super, ultra, great, delicious, wonderfully, cool and perfectly fine. It was raining. But only in my heart, I was getting gradually tense. A feeling I had not felt for a while, one akin to just before appearing in a class test. I thought I could have a magical fight any time and no matter what the conditions were. But this was my first fight with a person outside the labyrinth and I absolutely had no clue about the rules. At these times I remember the characters in a fantasy novel usually speaks highly of their master who had previously told them to remember their training whenever they would find themselves in a pinch. But mother never told me such a thing. I am sure her advice was much along the lines of if someone gives you a hard time just crush them in one blow. Well. This placatory notion worked perfectly fine with monsters and positively delivered the message of, rest in, peace to them. But I could never fight Regis in such a strong way, 
What should I do? I kept on pounding myself with the same question. Regis already knows of my healing powers so pretending to have a knee cut is no option. And if I pretend to have a headache, I know Aunt Alva is going to choke me with those bitter and amaroidal medicinal herbs of her for which she so much takes pride in. Alicia, we have finally reached our destination. Saying that the wagon halted and Edith stepped down on the ground leaving me no room to think further. To be frank, I already knew about it. I could feel Regis's presence from far away, closing in on the distance as we approached. Yes. I hurriedly muttered and hopped on the ground. Edith then gave the coachman the order to go back to the palace. Is your condition fine? Yes. I repeated myself. 116. All right, I and the others will be waiting at the top of that cliff not far from here from where we would be observing your match. You will be able to find Regis already waiting for you at the center of the ground. Edith said pointing in the west at the high rising hill and assured me before leaving me alone. Big sister Edith, if you had a fight with Regis, then what would you do? I asked cautiously almost catching her by surprise. Edith for a moment there stared at me. I thought, since she was my big sister now, I could have asked anything from her. But Regis was her own sister first. It was selfish of me to ask about their personal past experiences. I am sorry, that was a strange thing to ask. I supplemented to my own question and was about to proceed to my next place. Don't worry. To be honest I am quite jealous that I never once had a fight with Regis. Otherwise I would have surely shown her why I am the older sibling. Edith said with a beaming smile. I think that's how it would have actually ended. I nodded showing my share of enthusiasm over the discussion. So Alicia, you should not lose this chance and come to a hasty conclusion. Go and give Regis what she asked for and don't hold back. Show her who the in charge is here. Edith smirked at me with a blissful smile on her innocent regal face. As a matter of fact, it felt like being at home again. Not only because of the familiar vibes from big sister Edith, but it was the space around me. The arena was nothing of the special game-like design, but a simple construction which I used to have back in the labyrinth home. And it was much more refreshing because it reminded me of the fun training practices I had with mother or trying out new magic spells or artifacts with father. In the years I spent in the labyrinth, after Edith sent me off and went to the spectator's post on the hill lying in a straight line a little far and high from here. 117. I slowly started walking to the center of the stage, and in this short amount of time I had successfully developed an eagerness but some uneasiness was still firmly held inside me which kept on rising like a phoenix. On further reaching a place where the ground was few inches higher than its surroundings appeared in my field of vision, only short grass grew on the side in a widened circle, while the whole center stage was bare soft soil. One could say that it might have been the centrum of the forest, finding the spacious place all to myself. From here I could again see Edith and others as foretold, sitting on a clean shaved wooden logs piled up like a small staircase, far away on a cliff. It was certainly the best spectating position one could ask for, not to forget about the spectator's safety because of some misdirected spells flying afield. Edith had told me on the cart that how the Prime Minister possessed a special visualization magic and it was at a level that he could perceive magic movements and reproduce them into visual information and share it with several people at the same time. So, they were going to know and watch as much about the match as we would know down here. They might have what I call the special bird's eye view advantage like and rebounds per game player. But my concerns did not rest on those who were observing us from some miles far away but the individual in front of me and the very person who proposed this duel. The broad grin on Regis's face. I could feel that how more refined and lovely it had become from the first time we met. By mere coincidence we were standing at an equal distance and at the periphery of the ring platform surrounded by a culmination of giant trees with massive and thick trunks. I felt pretty happy for them because these ancient trees might have been ripped apart on the first day of our combat training practice in the labyrinth with my mother, Regis. I called out thankfully, don't be too happy, you do know we are going to have a match against each other right now. Regis flaunted. But I can't see a referee? I asked looking around for a scorekeeper whether a living referee or an animated scoreboard. Surely. To announce who? 118. 
was the winner, one would be needed or is he one among the spectators and for safety reasons. Alicia, you still think that way? Regis' throat soared before she could complete the statement. Huh. I was still unable to understand what she really meant. It's all right. Once I win this fight, there will be no doubts. Regis exclaimed with a fiery look and burning eyes narrowed on my face. Wait. But, listen to me. I pressed over my own hesitation. There's nothing left to talk. We begin right here. For a moment a brief silence filled the air. The wind kicked up the fallen leaves into the air, and brought along with itself the fragrant sandalwood scent of the forest. Regis's red hairs gently floated in the way the wind wanted it to, but the mask on my face barely let me feel the wind, nor my perfectly set camouflaged black hairs seemed to get along with the mood of it. The next moment I knew, a bow manifested in Regis's hand, which glinted red in the sunlight, her fingers reaching the quiver tucked along her back horizontally placed near her waist and hastily knocking an arrow, she launched it directly at me, going straight for my left eye under the mask, I had decided to wear the mask thinking that it was the best way to not let my thoughts get in the way and also keep my magic level in check so as to not hurt Regis and get done with the fight, I can't let you have destroying this precious gift of mine, saying that I activated a small gravy fusion sphere at my hand, which completely sucked away the first arrow, the second, and the third arrow before they could have even gotten close to me, I see now what really big sister meant when she said it, it won't be any fun if I decide to fight like this, I whispered to myself, I don't know what you mean but if you don't fight, you are going to get hurt, Regis said catching a quick breath, 119, in that moment where Regis might have appeared to pull a single arrow and while my concentration had been fixed to that one, she almost instantly and skillfully managed to pull out two more arrows. But in front of my analyzed skill these kinds of cheap tricks held no value, no matter how methodically they were executed. Regis, for your wish and just as I promised to have a fair and equal match with you, I too will be only using wind magic and no other skills I possess would be activated to fight you. I declared my own terms of fighting with her, don't come complaining to me when you lose. Regis gripped her bow tight as if trying to hide away something in secret, this time it was not something strange, but an instinct I was most familiar to was welling up inside me, it was no different than any other time. The only thing was that it got heightened to the extent that I was myself realizing about it just about now. 120. Regis Escalonite took a deep breath and calming myself after my first failure, I already knew I had screwed up with my golden chance. That was one of my best attacks which I could pull off without using magic and she instead of dodging it, played it like a kid. Alicia shouldn't your question had been what I wanted? This fight which I proposed. I wanted to prove something, not that I was better than her and my abilities surpassed her in some manner or desperately chase after her, but a new option was available after Aunt Caroline hinted it to me. All I needed to do was prove myself and make her understand that she could trust me. But still what made me the most hung up to it? Even I didn't knew so much as that I went through a grueling training regime to find that answer. Coming out of my comfort zone where I could have spent my easy life in the palace. Now that I am able to control my magic to some extent. Spend time with my family, be a rightful princess train with Will and others and might even go adventuring with them on excursions just like Big Sister does on her campaigns, and yet, I have found that answer or not is entirely a different matter, because I had no brains to spare when I could feel that irrepressible magical energy leaking out from Alicia. Didn't she herself say just now that she was going to only use wind magic? Shouldn't she just hold back a little considering that I am still new to all of this? But I was talking about Alicia here and her holding back, might apply to this level alone or she might have been just that unfamiliar to the term. I was surprised to see Alicia's face which didn't so much as blink after my sneak attack. Rather she didn't even flinch at the arrows flying at their maximum speed. Now what? I asked myself. Witnessing that Alicia had plugged off her mask now in the most fashionable ways and parted with it into oblivion. Soon a small fickle of air. 121. Around her sent shivers down my spine no matter how mesmerizing her appearance was with or without that mask. What kind of freakish advice did you give to her? 
big sister, I will make you pay for it. I couldn't stop myself from cursing her from within but I could only do that if I survived this match, that is, she stayed motionless and I knew making the first move would have been the correct choice when her single spell could have destroyed the entire dwelling to even have a little chance at winning. I could not afford to let her dominate the ground, but something told me that this wasn't going to be her plan at all. Then with sudden briskness, the ground shook, without any visible movements, and without any further warning, the nearby trees lowered down their branches on their own as much as possible. From their mightiest of heights a single tall and stubborn branch wilted down. Surrounded by a garland of flowers a new bent branch appeared in front of Alicia and she grabbed it, as if all forces of nature had bent their heads and put it down just to showcase their respect to the authority she possessed. Not so surprising when she could have even the great spirits at her command. Holding that irregular thin wooden stick folded and curved a bit at its edge, bulging out in the middle almost forming an imperfect arc, I wondered what it was for, comparing and realizing something in those extraordinary nexuses of happenings. A premonition hit me hard. I gritted my teeth setting my foot tight and rubbing it against the ground as hard as possible. Feeling that irreparable sensation again, I leapt to my right. A severing blow of wind crashed at my very original spot and left a wide shattered crack on the ground. Alicia had a scrilly upset look on her face as she saw me dodging her magically manifested arrow shot. 122. The irregular shaped stick was actually her bow and it was news to me. It had to be cheating or an unfair game to play with new cards, but I felt I had no right to complain when I furtively attacked the first time and didn't think through the rules of the match thoroughly, actually I might have an aversion to those academic and paper filing works. So you can even use a bow and launch invisible arrows round with it? I commented, was it a bad joke Alicia was playing in the name of fairness of the match and bringing it to an equal level, there couldn't have been a more bizarre idea promising to use only wind magic and the same weapon as me. Is this really what she considers being an equal? It was not like I could feel the magic she launched, when it rushed at me. It was pure instinct because I myself was well versed in projectiles. By looking at her eyeball movements, the direction in which her feet were directed, her grip, the movement of her arms and even the undertaking force drive of the wind at the time of launch, I was observing it all. I had to. Otherwise that shot would have really injured me badly, or likely killed me, if I had not learned to protect myself by surrounding with a thin sheet of magic, as Will taught me. As for the level I was at, it's still too flimsy that all it could do good for me was cushion my landing, but for Alicia it's not a big deal when she thinks she can heal anyone, no matter the amount of injury or even when they could be taking their last breath. Her vanity was extreme and she was not afraid of showing her true colors right off the bat in a fight. Is she trying to take my life now because I made an attempt on hers? On second thought it was a great idea of unmasking her, and I needed to step up my game too. Perhaps a bit of an extra good luck would be more than welcome on my side. Then again, I could have engaged in some conversation in the start, but I doubt from her looks and demeanor she would even move her lips anymore. 123. It was a deadly silent stalemate, as if Alicia was analyzing all of her surroundings in a quick glance. I too prepared my arrow on the tight stretched string and waited for a comeback. No one could have said who was in a much more advantageous position when I was a veteran archer and my opponent a self-proclaimed magical genius posing an archer and at an equal expertise level at that in archery. At least I could tell that much from a glance and with her invisible wind magic arrows it's more than sufficient to skewer me if I did not pay attention even for a second. Alicia's pitches were peerless. Nonetheless as an archer myself it was to an extent where I could read the path of an invisible ghost arrow just with my bare eyes and raw instinct. The following scene couldn't have been much more predictable, because the next instant I had realized by then, that my physical arrows were no match against her invisible wind arrows. Alicia again gripped her wooden bow tight and a fiery pulse raised through her body left, cleaving through the air itself, headed straight in my direction. It came much faster than I expected and packed even more pressure. Clang. I barely managed to veer it off course in the last moment by my own arrow shot just a second before it could have made a second attempt for my life. Boom. 
Our arrows clashed right in front of my eyes, and the pointer of my arrow along with its shaft was blown to million pieces. It was a spectacular clash, but the marvelous repercussive force it created knocked me back on the ground. The equal distance ground we shared until now. I was slowly losing it and the gap between us further tended to increase. 124. With no rest and Alicia's simple one-way made up mind set, in a breath give or take. She had started firing powerful magic arrows without end, never missing. Having but no choice I made an all-out run. I kept on trying to predict the trajectory of these arrows and save myself with a hair's breadth gap every time. Whether I was running zigzag or in a manipulated way I had no idea and my legs were the only thing keeping me alive. I was slowly closing in on the distance between me and her again. Also it would seem that she was not against the idea. When I could read in her devious mind that the closer, I got it would be easier to increase her accuracy and aim at me. And that's what I really wanted, when a compressed hair arrow strayed from its path intentionally and aiming for my vitals. Me realizing that I could not dodge it when it was this near, I stretched my empty hand and took the hit on the arm. It pierced right through the protective gear I had on me, leaving a big incision and the arrow half passed through my flesh. Whoa. With a big scream I took the pain of the brunt I intended to. The wound was deep and it had already started to bleed, but the pain did not made me withdrew from executing my next attack. I got you. I hissed at Alicia. I knew I was now close enough that I could use an enchanted arrow myself and without losing my target. With no intention of wasting even a single precious second, I launched three of them at her at the same time. Alicia in a predicament too aimed back for those three and completely annihilated my decoys. I had already learned my lesson that all these arrows could have been good for was work as a blocking screen, but this was the time for which I prepared for so long, to be able to use the same magic missile attack I pulled on there. 125 Dragon Island at point blank range and put in everything I had learnt in these days. Come forth wind, howling storm. I gasped for air as I muttered the chant. The pain had started to take a numb effect on my hands. The space in front of my arrow appeared to distort as I successfully invoked a tempest. Mine and her eyes met, but she seemed so expressionless and impassive to me. Untouched by my fighting spirit and the danger she was involved in. Until her lips curled into a bewitching smile. An unsaid word reaching me far. I was still so far from her to be not able to realize where she stands in this world and how her infinite powers could affect people around her, as if I wouldn't know that myself, trying to clear my head again, I released the full might of my attack, Alicia brandished her hand, a ripping force of a single streamlined wind of incalculable mass thrust forward destroying the very magical formation itself which I had worked so hard to prepare and it got neutralized by her magic spell. Grah, why you? I clamored. Seeing my very own enchanted arrow go out in blazes and I was pushed back further again. Hurrying up to close in the distance as soon as possible, I got on my feet again. Only to find Alicia had taken to skies. She was using wind magic to singularly float in the air. A paramount sight, like an eagle with its white wings spread out, ready to pounce on me from the skies. 126. The hill the anticipation and excitement of the match was on its way and just then both parties Alicia and Regis had taken their places inside the arena and stood face to face with each other. Will Valen one of the guests to the duel, gave his regards to the royal family and took his seat along the sidelines to spectate the match. The Prime Minister started sharing his visual senses with the present attendees on permission from King Ereg. Everyone was expecting of a long chat between the two individuals, though it was a completely different matter that they couldn't hear with what they had to say to each other. But the match as soon as kicked off with Regis taking a strong stance and brilliantly carrying out a quick successive three arrow pulls from her bow. That's the way. Regis's father ended up exulting loudly, while others took it as a sign of a further being excessively proud, but it could have only been the Prime Minister who knew that the next three months of his personal expenses rested on his bets placed on the ongoing match. Failure for him was not an option, everyone could eminently see how far Regis had come in her training in just a span of three days. But it could only have been her continuous efforts bearing fruits, 
she had made it possible by working hard on cultivating her skills in these years. Regis's father and mother couldn't be more proud than they felt today as was evident from their heartwarming expression. Though the king had successfully hidden his temptation to reveal of what was about to come, it was clear from Edith's face that what probabilities she had perceived through her probability foresight were completely unfathomable. Will, was the only one who had helped Regis prepare this move and even the most skilled archers in the army would face utmost difficulties to pull such a feat at the get-go. He already knew about the duel, but the other contestant was never described to him. Seeing her under a mask he couldn't help but have an eagerness to know what was beneath it. 127 128 in the next moment the thing that made them all bite their lips was when how Alicia had gently brushed off the three arrows with just her palm and threw them off like a kid's toys. As if that wasn't shocking enough, things took an even more unbelievable turn for everyone and when Will's desires were ultimately fulfilled and it was also the time. He regretted it the most for even merely wishing for it on a whim. Everyone gulped their last bite of vegetative root snacks in bewilderment as they saw Alicia removing her mask and revealing her face under the restless sun and the thrill of action. It was not a first for the king and queen but the looks on the faces of others made them feel embarrassed and overwhelmed at the same time. It contained such an expression but like a Pandora box it always packed with it a new anticipation and uncertainties that one could never get bored of it. With how Alicia without a chant or spell. As if the nature was under her command the tree bent down and the made an exclusive bow by the blessed hands of the great forest spirit herself. Will quickly learned from mother's dynamic discussion that her name was Alicia. He questioned himself, even knowing that what he had been seeing up till now made it more than meaningless. Is it even possible to do damage to her when she is floating in the air in a defenseless state? and the lasting words made it sound even more unbelievable for him. Even from the seat in the audience he felt helpless to do anything to help his trainee, whose complexion was visibly paled because of the fatal injury she was enduring. Alicia had red crimson eyes, a red shade similar to Regis's hair which he admired so much but it also possessed a sinister glow in it. They felt it even from this far and when she was not looking, that the light exuded could pierce through him a testament to her deadly combat techniques and prowess. 129. Her adorable face radiated a ghastliness which would have made the top officials of military shiver back even with the whole army backing them up. On her small lips there was a hint of pleasure while the rest of her face had a built of a mystical doll and with her pure white hair, which recently changed from a dark black hue. He could not deny saying that she was a peerless beauty nonetheless. He held his breath clenching his fist tight and in a panic state for Regis's safety he did not even realize when his fingers had gripped and sunken tight into his skin. Regis was true to every word with how she described her human friend as an undefeatable opponent in the fight. Will thought and now he himself couldn't deny it. Will had achieved such proficiency in sound magic that through the vibrations of magic particles around someone he could perceive their strength. But what could he say when he was already overwhelmed and his ear drummed here asunder whenever he tried to perceive the magical state around Alicia, the cold shivers running down his backbone, every time he tried was the only thing that prevented him from getting knocked unconscious in his scaling attempts. The density of the magic particles was solid packed and instead of possessing certain fixed vibrations of a normal being the only thing left for him to believe was that the innate magic of the nature itself danced at her fingertips. It was silent and deadly at the same time. The only expectation Will had in mind for Regis was I have full confidence that her training will reveal its true worth to her and help her out of that tight spot. I know you aren't there yet. But in these three days I know how much this match must have meant to you. I can't even begin to imagine to what extent you might have gone to do this. Yes princess, you are right you have taught me again and again that you can do anything and can overcome any obstacle. Even when you might have been suffering, you always try to get by those challenges and always come through. Will said to himself. 130. Just then everyone had a glint of hope in their eyes for Regis when they breathed signs of admiration after seeing her use magic arrows for the first time in the match, but the fiercely radially pulsating magical storm materializing in midair, 
got shattered into a spectacle of magical blasts when Alicia struck her arm at Regis, casting her own magic spell without any chant needed, proving that she was the most stormproof. This mind-boggling sight had captivated everyone's interest leaving them with an intense desire to know how did she do it. But the point of curiosity of this small audience was a sign of collapse and failed attempts of the opposing combatant. No one knew what was about to come next, or what merciless scheme Alicia might have cooked up for the innocent clueless girl facing her in a one-on-one -on -one match. 131 The duel there was no time to think, and so Regis leapt up. She decided she had to get close to her again if she wanted to defeat her. Though her previous days had been one of only training and battles, Regis was barely able to keep Alicia in her sight. And even so, being able to see her and being able to respond to her invisible magic arrows were two different things. Alicia kept on firing her compressed magic arrows at Regis almost incessantly, raining them over the ground like small swift shooting stars zapping through the skies. Regis couldn't help but feel like a wooden training post. Technique be damned. She was being dominated no matter what kind of dodging maneuver she used on her body. After a few seconds only, she wished Will would have given a much more definite advice, than just telling her to believe in your training. What she might have needed the most now was an impeccable strategy. Wait for it and figure it out. She definitely should have a weakness. Regis planned. She looked back at Alicia making sure not to lose her pace or fall down. And another arrow went past her cheeks, scrapping a part of her skin and ruining her hairs. Not possible. She has none. She killed that heavenly dragon in a blink of an eye. I just might be joking around with myself. Regis skulked around with those very fancies. She decided it was best to stick with running than to wait and think for a plan bound to fail. Maybe a final impression of go and slaughter them would have been more of my suit and would give me more confidence. Regis screeched while running, as her voice got muffled with the sound of interminable blasts and her yelps. 132. That's no good. One of the attendees in audience prompted to himself, but was inadvertently heard by everyone, before the whole world could look at him for ruining their attention and focus. The footwork of Regis lifted up from the ground and with a giant air blast she was thrown away several meter far, leaving a sunken deep hole in the ground. What happened just now? The elven queen Alva couldn't hide her astonishment and was left unsettled not knowing what actually hit Regis, her daughter, but no answer came. She looked left and right, her voice and face both completely confused. Regis stepped somewhere else escaping to another side and again boom. The land under her, split into two while another arrow ended up grazing through her back. I already had my doubts, but it seems the whole place has been now rigged with traps. The voice involuntarily continued, but when and how? Alva asked still disconcerted. While this small conversation of theirs had gained others attention too. King Ereg clearing his throat with a groan. He firmly assessed the situation based on his former knowledge and experience. If I am not wrong, I already knew Alicia would be exceptional in using any weapon from what she might have learnt from her mother. Even if she was terrifying with her combat techniques, I wouldn't say she would resort to such type of gameplay. Then who would that be? Edith joined in the conversation. Even if Caroline was not the head-butting fighter type but such kind of battle sense aiming for the future consequences was always something far from her mind. But I do know someone close to her. Who liked to be thorough with his strategies and ascertain his dominance over everyone. 133 King Ereg revealed every little information he knew about, indirectly telling them that it was none other than the former true demon Lord Dash Ashborn's influence. But only if such knowledge was available to Regis Prehand, she might not be suffering and having a hard time being bounced around the ground. It was only thanks to her training she had learned to place a magic shield around her body and cushion her landing on the ground by surrounding herself with that flimsical magic of hers. It was happening all in a matter of seconds and if she did not want it to get slaughtered, she had to run and end up being a victim to a strong explosion. There were traps everywhere and she knew Alicia might not have been leaving a single chance to skewer her, but she wasn't finishing her at the same time. It was the work of arrows which Regis evaded but never knew they were placing a special trap magic on ground all this time, 
which activated the moment she stepped on it. At this point of time she really could accept that she just might have been a genius. To not let go a single action of her to waste. For Alicia it might have been just setting up a common old-fashioned minesweeper game as she gazed from above mirthfully to see her traps doing the bidding for her. But for Regis it was way scary like a soldier passing through an intense war zone in a landmine area. Regis knew one wrong step and it could turn into a grotesque sight if she is not careful as she gulped at the intensity of sound and smoke dust exploding on the ground. Is Alicia trying to wear me down and make me accept defeat? Taunting her won't get her riled up. She is too calm and absorbed in her fight. I doubt she can even hear me like this. Then I will just close in on her. Regis thought. She knew she had one last trump card in her hand. He destructible power was going to be the key though she didn't knew herself how to use it properly. 134. She didn't have to if she just had to clear all those traps in her way. Regis could once too find herself diabolically zested by the very thought and found out why it felt ecstatic so much. Then again, it should not be a problem for a problem child like her who was good at destroying things. All she knew was that she didn't want it to lose to her. No matter the cost, Regis finding a spot free from traps and the managing to shoot a number of arrows back at Alicia, she freed her hands from the special glove that possessed a non-conductive magical nature. She puts her hands on the floor and frenziedly started channeling all of her magic inside it. Dot on the hill the tension was palpable. The Prime Minister exclaimed that there were so much disturbance and density of magic particles being released that there was an overload problem in his skill. The visual imagery from the Prime Minister kept getting blurred, leaving him only to complain that his skill was encumbered with the magical blasts and it had never happened before. A sudden gale slashed through the audience this far, so powerful that they couldn't keep their eyes open, and when they did finally pry their eyelid apart. The whole ground was turned into a junkyard. What? What in the world was that? Everyone exclaimed overawed by the storm of madly dancing dust clouds and magic in the air. A new and unfamiliar landscape was present before them covered in a mystical ground dust. Later there were several other explosions and when the visibility did show signs of improving for a little, all they could see was a hazy figure tactically approaching another standing figure. 135. Yet they were still uncertain as to what had happened in the few seconds between then and now. While hearing the explosion Zeka far away from the hill, their pupils moving rapidly, as they were going to sear the fight between Alicia and Regis into their memory. 136. Regis Escalon There is always some part of me that fears that I would fail. It screams and tears away my consciousness every time I try to lift up the bow. But reaching to her was my only option and so I needed to do it for myself first. There were really no referees or rules. Not because they could get hurt, but to begin with victory or defeat was not significant. At least not for me. When the fight itself was my goal, I wasn't going to stop until I had tried everything out, for which I had worked hard to prepare in these days. My powers were the main weapon against her and I was going to use it. Just placing my hands on the ground and channeling magic directly, the air from inside up turned the ground and a massive storm took the skies into a hysterical obligation to run wild and painted it brown black with soil particles. I could feel my hands rip apart with pain as my overlying skin was wearing off and trails of blood got mixed with it, but nonetheless the technique was working and several magical traps got activated because of my interference and participated in the terrific show of annihilation. That shock, together with the earth shaking, cleared the ground from a radial center, great trees that were said to be several thousand years old, and the gigantic stones that were buried under them, flew over several hundred meters up into the sky and disappeared into the thin air, contributing to the debris. Though it would cause a second disaster when they fell, I did not worry about the consequences. The intense sounds stopped. The vibration of the earth and the atmosphere fell silent. I knew I had already done more than enough damage to take care of the ground almost turning it upside down. But I had to stop, also because if I used it any further my hands would have been injured to the extent I would have to concede the match. In this forest and the newborn space, the two us were facing each other again, 
and I wanted to hear her thoughts as to how I had dismantled her wicked plan. 137. Raising up my chin and searching somewhere in the sky, I spotted her. She silently floated as usual, but then a golden warm light unwrapped around my hand and it got healed the next moment. Realizing I had seen this phenomena before, I was not expecting this and wanted to know why. Regis fight to your heart content, don't worry I will heal you as many times as you get hurt. Alicia explained as expressionless and indifferently as ever. I was speechless. Just as I told you before, I will fulfill your wish and not let you hurt anyone with your skill including yourself, unless you want to. Alicia continued, it sounded crazy, at least to me, as we exchanged glances. She genuinely seemed to feel that way. If that's the case then you are going to have a very hard time defeating me. I said with a painted on grin on my face, but Alicia seemed to have gone back to her fighting stance and in longer the mood to talk again. And the cheap smile on my face might had not been enough to cover my ache and fragileness. I looked back at my hands and the wound I received from her arrow attack was still there. I chuckled at the very thought. How far away was the existence that spoke to me like all of it was natural. I finally understood the true meaning. So that's what she calls fair play. Her sense of justice and fairness is really twisted. Healing only the wounds I received from my skill and leaving those of the match. She is scary and far from the good kind girl she seemed to be the previous night. 138 don't go easy on me Alicia, and I am not one to stay beaten. I said out loudly as my voice seemed to echo in the pandemic I have created a few moments ago. I was not hoping for a reply from her and I was fine with it being that way. I wasn't going to hold a grudge towards her from any of this. Naturally, I have no intention of losing also. A reply did came and it was more than gratifying for me. I wasn't dreaming and I thought for the first time I had a real chat with her, no matter where she was in the skies, my voice did reach to her. Even if we could have been just companions and this fight, that wasn't how it was meant to be, why couldn't I have been able to see it until now, Alicia was just like me, she too was searching for a friend. And the prime reason she might had entered this kingdom accidentally, that's why you came looking for me always, even when I denied you in the start, and before I knew it I wanted to see the outside world with you, if she think this match is about who is the stronger among both of us, if it's just the way that she feels then it doesn't mean it's the same way I do, unless I really show it to her that I can be one too, I needed to leap through the sky or so I thought to catch up to her, but I might have been insane too, because I think it would be much easier to just force her back onto the ground. Let's end this game of hide and seek, Alicia. I said excitedly to myself, I wouldn't mind if she eavesdropped and got mad. This was a fight after all. I knelt down and putting both of my hands together again on the ground and with much more zeal and spirit, and without holding anything back or doubting myself, I dynamically charged the earth with my magic spontaneously. The charged energy did not offset my constitution this time. I was more focused than to care about my health loss. Instead, it condensed where it 139 gathered, and that magical energy was released in all directions in the next moment. The scattering wind force was transformed into a shock wave, and spread the destruction out to the surroundings. 140. Alicia was Scalon Ashborn. I planned to fight Regis using a bow and since I cannot use just any weapon because of my dual swords, either I had to make them on my own or either the swords accept it as part of themselves, but it was almost an impossibility, the fact that I could use my mother's gift the wind fan was already more than I could ask for, and my swords were the best fit for me and I did not need anything, hence I decided to use my titles power dash the celestial queen of spirits and make a bow for myself. After I had healed Regis's wounds and she seemed to be once again indulged in the fight, my thoughts turned to what kind of trap I could lay next, as I prepared myself. If she just kept ruining the ground, the trap magic explosions would not hold. Just then I suddenly felt the power from Regis slashing out as she invoked her special magic again. A torrent hit me hard and was much stronger than before. The dust clouded the sky and made the arena almost impenetrable, to the point where I could not see further than a meter. I thought it might have been best to release my own, wind cutter, spell, 
but I needed to make sure that Regis II was alright after launching such a fierce straightforward attack, not making things too complicated. I landed on the ground, searching for her in that blurred brown haziness. I felt a bit nauseated from the dusty air and because all my other skills were off, as I asked Hal to do so. Though it might seem to be disadvantageous for the short distance type, the dense storm that obstructed the view made it easy to dish out a surprise attack. As for the long distance type, though the distance was reduced, that meant it was harder to make a line of fire at almost zero visibility. I was unable to navigate and pinpoint Regis's true location. Moving my head felt tedious and I once again realized why magic is best in the most convenient energy. 141 When Regis suddenly flashed behind me out of nowhere, preparing to do a horizontal sweep of my legs. I put all my strength into my legs and leapt backward. My bow held out and pointing at her head. In this lag of few seconds, she got close to me and had now started wielding her own bow as a stick, and it already proved long and effective enough to reach my body. It was a crude way to use a bow and knock me down. But I was the daughter of the true hero and cannot let myself be overpowered by something this obvious. Do you really think something like this could defeat me? I let out my thoughts. I've been waiting, for this time. Regis replied in kind. The only difference was that she accelerated at the same time as her bow moved forward, to land a robust hit on me. It would seem that aiming at our target when nothing was clear to our eyes, turned out to be a relatable problem. With no choice left I put my own bow on the line and wielded it just like hers. I was glad because of mother's training I had all weapon movements and combat arts memorized. A close quarter stick fight was no problem for me. Though I felt kind of sad for the bow not being used in its most upright and righteous ways. Regis and me were competing to hit each other with our bow's rigid ends, the two of us only inches apart. A close combat star fight involved staying out of the opponent's line of strike, dodging, or using our own arms to knock aside the arms or staff of the opponent. Thud, thud, thud. The forays launched from Regis were clear and immature and I could not understand her reasoning to get so close to me and put herself in danger. Either way most of her hits were amiss or easily parried by me. Her frustration of it was clear on surface of her face and the impatient movements of her hands. 142 That's as far you go, Alicia. Regis spoke while in a fired up mood and close the distance while feeling the heat on her skin from the magic repercussions she used. I saw her hands and bow come stick move to two fingers length higher and over my head. I was about to parry it with a swift glide of my own bow rushing in upwards direction. Suddenly Regis's weapon spun in her hands and a sharp blade, like a butterfly knife opened up from inside the bow, nicely concealed inside the wooden framework. Its blade looked red and glinted to reflect the sun's light in my eyes. Inopportunely my eyes blinked, and in the matter of heat I swiftly sped up my bow to cross against the blade. Kick. A complete clean cut cleaved my bow in two fragments, as if my own ingenuity suffered over losing my bow weapon. I drew back my fist, while maintained top speed, with a power incomparable to what my thin body would foretell. My fist approaching had one long straight beam of light behind it, or so it appeared because of the gathering momentum of wind pressure. I punched in Regis's abdomen as she let out a scream of utmost displeasure and suffering. Oops! I gasped under my breath, realizing I went too far. Seeing Regis blown away dozens of meters, while some of the large trees behind her vanished due to the force of the blow. Thankfully Regis had brilliantly crossed her arms and prepared herself to receive the blow, not exposing herself fully to the attack. Regis in her pain state tried to lift up herself again. Though it wasn't a direct hit, it was clear that damage had penetrated into her body. Regis took up her bow again and launched a first arrow at me. Quickly comprehending I was weaponless I ran in her direction. 143 Without wasting a moment's notice, Regis back to back launched her second enchanted arrow. Snap! And with it her bow broke too. Grasping that this was my chance to finish the match. I put on a spurt. I threw one end of my bow to the first arrow and the other corresponding to the second, perfectly making up the numbers as they collided and opened up the way for me. A look of unmistakable discomposure crossed Regis's face, 
I was so close to her, but my lips bit themselves indecisively as my legs hesitated to move forward with my body, exclamation mark breathing heavily and unsure of what anomaly occurred the height of my eye level descended gradually as the effect of gravity took over my body and I was slammed on the ground. I tried grabbing onto something only to find air and narrowly saved my head to sustain from a heavy injury. Cannot have a comical memory loss hit right at the start of the story. It was suspenseful and tragic for me, even when I did not see life flashing before my eyes. I turned back and found a knot tied in a tuft of grass, with the sole intent to make me trip. Somehow a guilt came back to me, that I was doing quite a similar prank with Regis, and when I looked back. Unable to lift myself up because of a strong wind force holding me down. I found Regis bearing the pointed end of an arrow at me. Both of us had lost our weapons. I was flat on ground, while Regis's condition was just barely allowing her to stand under her impromptu impulses. I give up. I said calmly acknowledging my defeat. I had lost all intentions of fighting any further since I was pinned down. If Regis really wanted to hurt me. She would have already done in a real fight, and with no 144 physical time left and the restrictions over me there was no possible way to react just then. Wow. Regis took a sigh of relief, and as if her personality totally flipped, she dropped down her arrow and an arrogant look evolved on her face. I won, I won, she asked to herself followed up by professing and declaring her own win. I knew I always had it in me if I gave it a try. I smiled at her, thinking it was just the wind going into her head, and she had all rights to be happy. When I turned around again seeing the bigger picture of how the forest, except for the place where we were, had a folding fan shape scattered for miles away, testifying to the ferocity of the match we just now survived through. Even if you can use all kinds of magic, you never saw the trap coming, did you? Ha ha ha. Regis did not stop laughing for a while at my pitiful state, well that was ingenious of her to take the advantage of smoke and chaos while fighting me and secretly use wind magic to make such a small foot grass trap and lure me in, I say I can have a fight any time and I can make you fall in defeat again and again, huh. You see that, Alicia, I already knew you were not that big of a deal, I think I can beat you right here and now again as many times as you ask. My forehead strained, and I felt that she was kind of being mean to me right now. Seeing that she was not looking at my hands, I held tight to her leg and made a complete roll over, to which Regis's body followed into another short crash landing. Thump. Both of lay around across each other. So, Regis how about we have a second round? I asked placidly. 145. No dot no dot no dot no. Regis replied as if she was just now tranced by a trauma. I don't want to take a chance at my life and die for something so meaningless. Regis bowled, as her whole body rattled on the ground, all the pain and cramps from before were coming back to her, and when Regis looked at me with loving eyes as if hoping for a miraculous heal, I mischievously beamed back at her. Well, you reap what you sow, and that's how I exacted my vengeance. Now I too was in a thoughtful discussion with myself of what was about to come. When I had accepted my defeat, did I break the promise which I made with Regis back then? Did I fail to prove myself strong enough to make her wish completely true? I fought with a friend for the first time and lost. It feels so different from the labyrinth because it also hurts too while fighting with them, even when it's a planned match like this. Hurting others with my power without a reason. It was not something I wanted to use it for. Maybe big sister Edith was right and the fight had nothing to do with who we are. Maybe I wanted to win, but I am glad it ended this way too. Staring at the floating clouds who had started flirting among themselves by clashing into each other for a while, Regis suddenly spoke up. Say, Alicia. Whenever things are rough it's okay for you to complain, and if you are sad, it's okay to cry. To get angry. I mean, I want. You understand right, because we're family too. I felt like Regis wanted to send across a message but ended up with a gibberish cached memo. Hey Regis do you want to come with me and accompany me on my journey? I still wanted to give a shot at asking now, even when I failed to keep my promise and prove myself to her. 
I wouldn't know an answer until I ask for it. What are you talking about? I have always planned to come with you. Regis replied unperturbedly. 146. Phew. I felt like being ambushed out of nowhere. I never heard of this piece of information before it was news to me. Don't be so stupid. I don't know what you will do without me. It might be possible that even after twenty years I find you roaming lost in this forest or in some kind of dump. Can't have a trespasser for that long in our kingdom? Her language might have been dismissive for a princess's dignity or offensive against me, but I could not hide my surprise or joy, but still having a doubt inside me, I decided to be thorough, but what about the conditions of the fight? I lost and failed to prove myself to be able to keep you safe. Do you have a weak memory? I clearly mentioned you have to prove your strength by fighting me in a match. I never mentioned winning was a necessity. Regis said rubbing her temples in a very cute and alluring way. As I tried to revisit my memory, I clearly remember that's what she actually said to me. Did she plan this from the start? If I could, I wanted to scream in amazement that I had finally made a best friend for my life. I might have been struggling with my feelings for some time, but with now how things are, I am just relieved to finally open up about it, and I think you are already strong enough to protect me. Regis said embarrassedly as her cheeks turned red and maybe so did mine because we were unable to look in each other's eyes right now, she continued, and also because I am your sister, I don't want you to end up in a wrong place. We need to find that person for you quickly, she is important to you right? Amu. Um, I nodded compassionately, dot Regis out staring at me, good grief. Why do you suddenly sound like a kid? 147. Interlude 2 Backpackers After the match was over, the results were never brought out in the public or any of the spectators for that. They alleged of how the interference in the magic of the arena and the chaos from the dust storm made them unable to see anything, especially the ending of it, since Regis herself declared to everyone about how she wanted to accompany me. It was met with everyone's approval in her family, though, the king might have been acting suspiciously gloomy as I could identify him as one of those who had comically lost a winning lottery ticket of theirs, from back in my previous world. Since there was no carriage or coachman, I used teleportation magic to take all of us back to the castle and everyone seemed to be flummoxed by such a strange transition in place, except for Regis who had already went through that phase. It would seem that teleportation was one of the rarest magic in this world, and no one in the Elf Kingdom could use it. Later, I myself retreated back to my room, Regis's room. Regis expressed how she wanted to meet others before leaving so she had already left to do so and had asked me to put all her bags in my storage. I was speechless when I heard that she had already packed all her necessary belongings without anyone else knowing. And all I had to simply do was put them in my dimensional storage. And I too needed to pack my bag or at least arrange all the items in my dimensional storage. From all kinds of gifts, I received from Big Sister Edith including those special clothes she specifically selected for me or the magical items she went out of her way to purchase for me in the market. Not sure I would ever wear those or don't even know how exactly to use any of those bizarre things for that matter. 148, but since they were gifts and dresses it was good to have some on a journey, than having none. I too needed to blend in on our travels, knowing that I was now traveling with a princess. It was better to keep low and move quickly. It was a long trip from here to the port town, from where we had to specifically board a ship to the human continent and had some stops in between. Well, it was Regis, who was well aware with our travel plans and I had left everything of that on her shoulders. After few hours when Regis came, accompanied by big sister Edith and she invited me and Regis to Leo's dine-in. And I was more than happy to. In these few days, I had got to know Edith's friend Leah too well and also bagged a job offer from her. I think I am now doing pretty well in this world, things I always wanted to do and be part of. Regis too seemed to be more motivated than usual for something which big sister Edith came up with, but at the end, I think it was something she would bring to curse herself for doing so, but that's a story for later. 149. Regis Escalon after the match concluded, I had no real interest in claiming that victory for granted. I was totally aware of how Alicia held back on me during the entire match. Otherwise, I had no real chance of defeating her. 
but one day I would be strong enough to go toe to toe with her, and after this match I was sure of, that I could keep improving myself if I stay along with Alicia, and one day I could be proud of myself and everyone will be able to depend on me, as father and mother had promised me. I was now given the permission to leave, though father was strangely at odds with the results, and desperately asked for the name of the victor, which both I and Alicia had refused to do so. In the end, I heard from Alicia what I had wanted to hear for a very long time. I also realized from this fight, I needed to focus on what I had to do the most. More specifically it was something that her mother, my aunt Caroline might had asked of me, to do. I was not sure but maybe she did not want it for Alicia to fight unless she had to, especially when they were not monsters, and if there was ever the case, I wanted to be the one to stop her from doing so, even if it meant to continue that fight myself and take responsibility accordingly. That would have been my reason alone. All that was left now was to finally say goodbye to everyone. So, why I am standing here again in the training ground? I asked myself as I looked around only to find the rolled up ground and scattered cracks left due to my training practice here, the backyard of the castle where I had been training continuously for three days, I stood affixed to my place and I started remembering all the training practices I had in this time span, it goes without saying of how it was one of the most exciting and memorable part of my life now and it was also embarrassing with how close I had gotten to Will. 150. Maybe I only came here thinking that I would find him here by chance. It's not like I wanted to desperately meet him, but I did wanted to say him thank you for placing his trust in me and teaching me with everything. Although I am pretty sure, he would just rub it off by saying that it was part of his nightly duties. Nevertheless, he is one of the few people I now knew well, and also, because I wanted to see him for the last time before leaving and say goodbye. Would we meet again, and will he have new things to teach me after this? I bet not say this in front of him, otherwise I would be invited to another training session today, and I think I had already spent all my chances at life during the fight with Alicia. Knowing that there was nothing to gain by staying any longer here, I decided to leave. Princess Regis. I heard someone calling out to me, as I turned in circle to look back. Will. What are you doing here? I surprisingly said the name of the man I wished to see, suddenly appear before me. I think I came here because I did not want it to be left behind. Will replied as his eyes narrowed lower. Not realizing that he was being too vague and out of order, maybe because he came running. What do you mean? I asked not able to understand what exactly he meant by that, also because it was not like him to look so down, it's exactly what I said. After seeing you and Miss Alicia fight, I realized that there is a lot left for me to learn, it was simply evident to me that I wouldn't have been able to survive if I was to fight against such a force myself, that's why princess you have done a very commendable job and your fight was most laudable, yeah, I know, that already. I stated rather crudely, and did you forget calling me by my name was not something that was limited only to those three days, it would be better if you still call me by my name, it's more comfortable that way. I continued in a most uneasy underlying tone, as if I 151 lost all of my confidence I had until now, but it was pretty relaxing to see Will worried for some time, after he had himself seen Alicia's power but it would have been more mind-boggling for him if he met her, and realized she is just a kid at heart. I understand, Princess Regis. So, what brings you here? Will dropped another bombshell question one me. Why is he making it so difficult to answer every question? I wanted to say thanks to you, because I will be leaving the Escalon Kingdom tomorrow and set on a journey. I said holding together both of my hands in front. It was an honor to be your teacher even if it was only for a few days and you had been a wonderful trainee of mine. Will spoke as he made a small bow in my respect, did I really deserve it, especially coming from him? Our conversation was drawing to an end and I had even more or less to speak, or rather I did not want it to, for not drawing out things any longer. So, this was it. I wondered, would all of my journeys will be like this from now on? Princess Regis, if you ever get worried or are in danger, just call me and I will come to your help. Will continued with his effective speech. Really, just for me? 
I flinched as my eyes widened. Was he really worried about me, just now? Yes, me and the whole battalion will be there to help you out, no matter what. Never mind. I replied crossly. For some reason the conversation was going nowhere and I couldn't actually say what I wanted to. I see you two are having an interesting conversation here. A third person's voice came in as they approached me at the same time, and I could only find myself in a trance state. Finding big sister Edith as she emerged from my back, it blew away all of my expression. 152. What is the meaning of that smirk on her face? Did she hear all of my conversation up till now? What should she be thinking right now? Out of all people it had to be her alone. It's not like anything scandalous was going on or about to happen. Greetings, first princess. Will said bowing properly. Come on Will, aren't these the times you are meant to protect me? What are you doing? Why are you here, big sister? I said in a disdainful way. Regis didn't you promise me that you will get me so many gifts when you finally come back? Hugh, when did that happen? I first gave a little thought, but thinking that it came from her, it was high chances. No I am sure of it that I never made such a promise even in my sleep. You have forgotten already. Edith said in a saddened tone, bringing her fingers on her lips. Don't make me look like I am the bad person, by making imaginary stuff up. She is especially particular when she is nettlesome. Gifts from outside the elf kingdom, I would like to myself find something good if I ever set out. A keen voice bumped in, I was pretty amazed to think that Will would be so desirous of something. Fine then, I will get you a present, Will, but you will just have to make do with whatever I choose. I avowed. You really don't have to. Please don't bother with my simple opinions. Will said while rubbing the back of his head jauntily. But I was the one to first offer. I forcibly contended. I simply couldn't say that I did wanted to give him a gift per se. Will, I think you should generously accept my sister's kindness. It's not every day she is so willing to do these kind of things purposefully. Big. 153. Sister Edith spoke in her princessly aura which was rare for me to see, and what did she really meant by it? After Will gave it a small thought, he said, then Princess Regis the first would humbly accept with whatever you will have to offer me. Exactly. I am going to get gifts for everyone in the battalion too. So you don't need to worry. Amused by my own declaration, I gave a boisterous laugh mainly to hide my own sheepish state. That would surely make all of us happy. And again I wish you and your comrade a happy journey. I glanced to look at Big Sister, seeing her desperately pointing a finger at her own face beaming with hopes of getting her own way too. Fine I will get you one too. So what exactly are you here for? I surrendered myself to my sister's tenacity in getting what she wanted. Regis why don't you accompany me to the place where I had been wanting you to come with me? Big Sister Edith spoke with a satisfied look, since she had a promised gift now but it goes without saying that it would be the first gift she would receive from me, so I too could be a little excited about it, as for the invitation no. It was an undeniable and rigid decision on my behalf, Alicia will be joining us too. So where do we have to go? I instantly agreed, but I also regretted that I sounded a bit impatient. It goes without saying that I too wanted to know what those two had been up to in these days when I hadn't been watching. Both I and Big Sister started walking away. As I grabbed and pulled her away, it could be dangerous to leave Will and her alone, and what utterly rubbish thoughts she could spill at my back, even I wouldn't know. Regis aren't you forgetting something? Edith abruptly freed herself from my grip. 154. I without wasting a second as if lightning struck me and not wanting to come to regret it later. I turned back to Will. Will, goodbye, I will meet you soon. And also Alicia is not my comrade, but a friend, my best friend. I shouted, as I found Will, waving his hand at me with a gentle smile. I wish you best of luck on your journey, princess. I immediately heard a recurring shout as it came in response to my own. Foo -fa foo Edith crowed. What are you laughing at? I grumpily asked Big Sister, who burst into laughter. Nothing, now let's go to get Alicia too. Saying that Big Sister, came to hold my hand and took the lead in walking. The invisible wall we had between us until a few days ago had now vanished, and there was no holding back anymore. I properly understood it, 
in that unspoken happiness I felt exploding from inside of her. I remember we used to walk the whole palace like this when we were little and things were not that chaotic with me. After all she is the one who helped me in packing all of my stuff for this journey, since I was so busy, but now, I had all the free time I could spend with people around me before I left, and also because she kept Alicia's schedule busy, I was able to train with a free mind before the match. To be honest, I really didn't knew what specific things to carry on a journey, seeing that both I and Alicia were novices, but Big Sister took care of those things decently, maybe she is not that bad after all and can be pretty reliable sometime. You are the worst Big Sister ever. I shouted as we were returning back from Leah's dine-in, now, now, don't act like a spoiled kid Regis, Edith said carefree, 155, well, I have much better things to do, than killing my appetite by eating a special screwed up menu made of bug dishes, I scorned at her as I walked away quickly into the palace before the two could catch up to me, after that I had decided to go to father, who had called in for me, where I also found mother waiting for me at the same time, Regis, here is your expenditure sum for your travels, further said passing me a small storage ring, which I had given back for repairing after my bow broke in the match, oh, I took a quick look and relatively finding that money too few, I complained, now, now, you see I have been pretty low with funds recently, further coughed as if trying to hide something, but didn't you say that you were going to support me with everything you have got? Father panicked and made a quick comeback, we don't want to spoil you, so you need to be really cautious about money. Don't worry Regis, I have already taken care of that thing, but there is something even much better I have for you. Mother spoke in between as she came forward and tightly hugging me, she whispered. I will miss you a lot, we all realized that you have been maturing fast, even beyond our expectation, but no matter, you will always remain my adorable girl, so, come back home occasionally, I'll be waiting for you, yes, mother, I was breathless to feel so alive, but when we parted I realized there was something in the grip of my hands, a long red bow much lighter but sturdier than the previous one in my possession, it had such a unique design that I took an instant liking to it the moment I saw it, I made it specially for you, and it has got a unique feature and can to a great extent handle your large magic upsurges. Mother revealed to me its origins enthusiastically. I really like it. 156. She then explained to me what kind of special feature it was enchanted with. I had heard before that mother was a great magic engineer and craftsman back in her time, but after becoming the queen she had to leave that work behind but she went out of her way and made this bow especially for me and I was going to make sure that I never lose it. After that I went to have a long cheery chat with my parents, which continued for very long. Well that's what the clock showed to me, but at the end it all felt ephemeral. The same time, when I came out of the father's office, the prime minister suddenly approached me and handed me out a very large sum of money for my expenses on my travel, under the dispatch title of me being a princess. It was almost equivalent to father's three months salary, is this what mother had been talking about, of being taken care of, just what had been going on behind my back, when I was training out there, but I was thankful to her for arranging everything for me, even before I could have asked for, they were really the best parents for me in this world, until then it was almost night and I went back to my room to make sure that we could set off as early as possible. Since we wanted to reach the nearest town in the southeast direction before nightfall and it was possible that even then we won't make it that far, I was quite opposed to the idea of staying the night out in the middle of forest. The last time I tried doing it I was almost chased out by monsters and couldn't sleep, and finally I was back in my room, only to find myself arguing with big sister who was already there. Now that I was back in my daily life, I needed to claim my turf and set the boundaries for her. Don't tell me you are envious of me Regis, but you see I have been doing this for Alicia for a long time. So I think I should stay here, even for the night. You better leave if, if it's something that simple I can handle it. I looked at Alicia embarrassedly not knowing myself how I was going to do it. 157. Alicia your morals keeps on improving in a very wrong way.
I shunned at Alicia who was the center of this fiasco's and she had quite the satisfied expression on her face. You shouldn't blame Alicia if she is bad with hot food. Alicia is so small she might hurt her tongue if I don't cool her food for her. I'm not. Bad with. Alicia tried to speak in between. You stay quiet over there. I forced her to stay out of this squabble between sisters, when it was necessary to draw the line, before it becomes too late to save her from big sister's corrupt influence. I will perfectly blow on her food and feed her with my own hands. Big sister Edith acted out how she wanted to feed Alicia with her own hands and it made me even more mad. Was this one of those things they had been doing without telling me? Alicia could have just asked me. If she really wanted something like that, I will do a much perfect job. So, thank you for nothing and you can leave. It's getting late and we have to leave early morning tomorrow if you are not dumb enough to remember that. Is that so? Then I will help you my little sister instead. There was an unexpected feral expression on big sister's face as she was about to drool on me. I thought I needed to run for my purity in case if things went out of hands. Unexpectedly. A pained expression surfaced on her face. Ouch. Ouch. Dot, ouch. Mother. Please leave it or it will break. Big sister was practically about to tear up. As I saw mother twist her ears upside down from behind. Don't you have anything else to say, Edith? I never saw such a scary expression on mother's face. This was the first time that I remembered about how father and Edith would keep on advising me to never annoy mother or they would had to bear the wrath worse than that of even the great spirits. And now I exactly knew what they meant by it. Seeing is believing. 158. Fine, we will have equal turns while blowing at our food. Now please leave me. I am not able to feel my ears anymore. But Big Sister's confession was only followed by more of her screams which mortified both me and Alicia and seemed to have chilled our nerves. Then how about you join us mother in dinner and then we can take turns. That's a good proposal, but I hate to say that it's already too late. You need to go back in your room and sleep on time, then goofing around in the castle. Mother reprimanded Edith with the most cold and desolate voice. It was evident that her fate had been doomed. The moment she came up on her bother detector, Regis helped me. Edith bawled and it was my first time seeing her in such an apathetic state. Rather I was quite enjoying the very imagery. If only I knew some good painter. Then maybe I could get a perfect portrait alive in the mood in my room. For a good change. Of course, Sister Edith I think it's good for you to receive some pain, now and then. I genuinely responded with a genuine smile on my face. Alicia. I know at least you would. Edith called out in her suffering almost brought down to her knees with the pain. Bye, bye big sister. Now and then. Alicia remarked as she too now was petrified to see our mother's dark side. It was the kind of remark from Alicia where I might have to take pity on big sister, if no one else could. Alicia, Regis. Edith gave out a final cry before she was dragged out of the room by mother. For a second, I thought that she would have cursed our names, but we wouldn't have known until we had set out tomorrow. So, my days here have finally ended. I made a new friend, fought against a dragon, saved the kingdom, trained under my teacher, survived a death match, took care of my wacko sister. And now I could finally rest side by side with her. Was there anything else left to do? 159. Regis. I was so worried seeing you always returned so worn out until yesterday. So, I have cooked something delicious for you. Would you mind trying it out? Alicia mumbled nervously. I took a suspicious look at her. Don't worry it's nothing crazy like the Leah's secret menu dishes. Just simple home cooked food. Heck yeah. I am all up for it. I said excitedly as both of us then sat down for dinner. My appetite was back, and I could at most hold it until the plates were set on the table inside the very room. I hope you like the food. Alicia said teeming with pleasure. I thought I was about to cry just then. The matter of food in the recent few days had been a touch and go moment for me, but now I couldn't hold back my tears, as I saw a great number of dishes laid in front of me cooked by Alicia's own hands. Regis are you alright? You look like you are crying. No this food is just that tasty. I want to stuff all of it at once. I am glad to hear it. Foo you u dot foo u dot foo. Say r. 
I said pointing my spoon at Alicia. Ha, huh, do I? Alicia looked around as if no one was watching and she silently took a bite from it. Whoa. So. Cute. Now I knew why Edith was so much into this. If anyone else saw it happening, they would be tempted to do the same and it's even worse because she isn't aware of what she is doing. But I needed to control my emotions and not end up an addict like my big sister and I would have more than enough chances to get used to this feeling. This is the best. 160. Alicia on the other hand was worried for Regis's health for seeing her smiling to herself without any reason or rather she could not comprehend what caused it in the first place. It's probably for the best if we eat our own food and don't do that. Alicia requested, and I felt a little upset for not able to continue to do so. Okay fine then, I want to try all of your dishes today. Then be ready to be amazed. Alicia was too fired up. Maybe she really did enjoy cooking herself and I was all ready to try all of them, while seeing her cook for me. That entire night we spent eating and cooking while I helped along the kitchen too. Even trying experimenting with new dishes of our very own, as we worked together hand in hand. Do you want to still keep going? Alicia asked in her ever perfect mood. Confound it. I lost. I am full and it's morning already and I could not sleep. Maybe it's best. We start to get leaving before everyone shows up. I slouched on the chopping board itself unable to move a single limb. We quickly cleaned up the room more, rather it was Alicia doing all of it with her magic while I watched in awe. The feeling of being half awake and half asleep was torturous but I could feel pretty relaxed after taking a bath and putting on my traveling attire. And so did Alicia, rather she wore her multi-purpose white long dress which suited her the best in my opinion regardless of what she did. It was about time we set out. 161. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne it was no problem for me staying up the night. It was something I would typically pull out, without a second thought. Either pass it by reading books in my previous world and now it was while learning intricacies of magic back at home in the labyrinth. But Regis looked pretty worn out. I inquired about her condition and recommended to take a break or delay our departure time, but she insisted on moving. After we had taken care of the daily chores and completely cleaned our room, we were now standing outside the gates of the Elven Kingdom borders. Both the king and queen and big sister Edith had come this far to bid us goodbye. Alicia we don't have anything special to give to you for solving our kingdom's problems and saving us. Even if we wanted to celebrate your arrival, your existence is meant to be kept a secret and it will be proper for you too. King Eireg spoke in a serious tone a bit of uncertainty lingered in his voice. I understand, and I am grateful I got to know I had a loving family out here too. Otherwise. I would had been too. But I was cut off before I could complete, that's why, our most precious, our daughter is now in your care, you two together look so adorable. The queen stuttered while making her way through her own words, as the time of saying goodbye closed in, don't say such embarrassing things, now. Edith spoke in a submissive bashed manner, which made all of us shake with laughter. Don't laugh. Am I probably the only mature on here? Alicia I won't let you do all of your things on your own from now on. Regis dictated to me, without a hint of compromise available in discussing over it. Well, I didn't think things would be this simple from now on anyway. The world always turns out to be a much bigger place every time I learned more about it, after all. 162. Even though from now you both will be traveling on your own, you have got a long way until you are both full grown up people. I want you to understand that there will be people who will be always ready to help and you should be able to sympathize with others who are in a difficult situation, and when you understand those simple things, you will quickly know what is the right decision to make when you really have to. Uncle Eireg passed down his elderly advice onto us, a culmination of his wise ideas and inspirations from two generations. We both fell silent, for a moment after hearing this. We really were not grown up people, and I would have never wanted to make my family worry whether it was back in my previous life or in this new world, but how could I be so sure of it, that I wasn't doing it at the same time, don't worry you two are still young, so, no holding back and have lots of fun you two. Edith pounced on the two of us as she hugged me and Regis together, 
It's fine you got a lot of time to grow until you become an exceptional and wonderful adult like me. Edith knocked a flattened punch over her chest in self-admiration. We really don't have that on our mind. Regis retorted in a listless voice. But then I heard an exasperated voice near my ears, as Edith this time totally ignored Regis's pun and came closer to me. What I really want to do more than anything now is to get my own bag and go adventuring with you two, but I already had my own share of adventures and I don't want to intrude my needs on your fun. So, keep going before I change my mind. Huh. I looked in disbelief. Goodbye you two. Now keep going waving hands to each other and of course as everyone smiled, I started my journey again in hopes of finding Athena, of course, as last time mother, father, then Lucia was smiling, and this time too, so, I smiled back, 163, except for Regis whom I found hiding her face with her hands especially her eyes which were apparently draped red and was surely evident to all of us seeing and still oblivious to her own unspilled tears as they rested on her delicate lashes. 164 King's Office Eregus Calon, the current king of the Escalon Elven Kingdom remained seated on his regal chair while in attendance was the first princess. Edith Ascal on his elder daughter standing in front of him with a long report, no matter how long they could have delayed this conversation until now but avoiding it would have never solved the problem, though they knew there would not have been really much they could have done about it even after knowing the truth, and after Regis and Alicia had left the kingdom and the Dragon Island problem taken care of while the Genesis tree was once again safe and under the care of the Queen Alva Ascalon, there couldn't have been much better time to speak of this. So, what does your intuition has to say about the current situation? I was expecting you could tell me since your probability foresight level is higher than mine. King Ereg asked, to what he actually referred to was not only the expedition the first princess had been sent to but also an undercover mission to uncover the intentions and national affairs of the neighboring kingdoms in both the demon continent and human continent. As it stands now, confrontation is be eminent, the premonitions of war lingers on us, since all the eight demon lords under the absence of the true one, have gone insane and now want to move around independent, more like they are stray dogs on loose now, as for the human nations they remain the same warmongering cult, the invasion about four years ago from the north almost destroyed the little hope we could have for them, and without a second notice they vanished afterward destroying and rampaging over every little village they came across. Though Edith's face was neutral when she read through her report, but a hint of rage was still present in her voice. The king focused, not knowing what to say as a much bigger issue had cropped up, the tension between demons, humans and other races had been on the rise, the difference between cultures and strength on the demon continent while the supremest personality of the humors pose the biggest of all threat. 165, and what are the chances that either faction would try to involve the elves into their future conflicts? If we speculate one to happen soon enough, then King narrowed his thoughts to a mere single significant point. The most they could do is to force us to join them by threatening to launch an offensive otherwise. That goes same for the demons and humans, but this is most practical of all situations since the elf kingdom has been isolated and neutral to all international affairs thanks to a certain someone. And now they are afraid of us for joining on either side, increasing the strength of one faction, while comparatively decreasing that of the other. In other words, Edith meant to say that a Scalon kingdom might have been now lying on a double-edged sword, where cooperation could be advantageous and damaging at the same time, they can do what they want, follow the impossible dream until they achieve total control whether it's by making peace or declaring war, I have seen it countless times and it ended with the same results, King Eric dictated his own ideas over Edith's assumptions, but I wouldn't be so sure of that. This report may all turn meaningless because I never factored her in the equation of my skill. I guess, even your skill overloaded and failed to assess her. She is a luxury for people like us after all. I think you are right it wouldn't hurt when you actually don't know the possibilities of the future around you. King Eric scoffed, 
The small conversation entailed a very important feeling which only those two shared in the entire world. Probability foresight, a skill that allows them to have access to possibly calculate all the existing routes and result to future development. Though they needed to be potentially aware of all the factors to process out the correct future. But since their skill overloaded every time they tried to take Alicia's power into account, they failed to dish out a proper answer. Instead of being sad to not know, they were more than happy for the first time to witness a course of action they could have never thought of, and be 166, finally excited about something. When it comes down to it the fact of having known a possible future and still unable to change it for the better. It can be the most painful experience one could ever ask for. People who usually possessed this skill either ended up in despair or couldn't move further in their life because it began to feel almost meaningless to them. Pulling down the number of individuals who could effectively use this skill at its maximum, zeroing it to the royal family of the Elf Kingdom alone, it is a child's right to dream and until I have tried everything in my power to change the reality and make sure that everyone is safe in the elf kingdom, it's the king's job to take care of things and see it to the end of making sure it happens. I have a duty to protect my family and this kingdom and in no way can I allow us to join the madness of the war once again. I have seen enough of that horror and gore 200 years back. I won't let that ever happen again. The king avowed. Edith who hadn't seen such compassion and vigor in her father, who usually was laid back, couldn't help but see him in a new light. Was this also a future that she possibly failed to perceive with her skill, she thought to herself. She couldn't help but properly address her father even when they were alone and instinctively agree to his decision. Yes, your highness. 167. Chapter 6 On a Bright Shining Day Dear Mother and Father, I had no idea the world is so big and full of stunning mysteries. I am feeling alive and hopefully adventurous. Deep in the forest filled with great trees, absorbed in a beautiful bird's song, under the fading golden light of the setting sun, wait for me. Alicia, between the cheers of friend, adventure yet again grins at me as a new friend, as if it already knew the answer is yes, even before I could ask. Lost on our way yet again. Respectfully yours, loving daughter Alicia. It's finally done. What is done? An exasperated voice followed my merry advance, as I went deeper into the thick cluster of trees. Nothing special. Let's just keep walking until we find a road. I said. Why did this have to happen to us? When I was so sure of it. Regis, my only adventuring companion mulled as she followed me. 168. Life is so adventurous and exciting because we can never know where we will be in the next minute or so. How crazy is that? I tried to persuade Regis to view the whole situation optimistically. That's quite close to the definition of getting lost and that's what has happened to us now. I am so tired and we have been walking all day. I just want to sleep in a warm bed. Regis complained and yelped as the chilling breeze tactfully made her quiver, letting her end up in a bashful moan. Her elven ears exposing a tinge of red at its pointy tips. What are you talking about? We are deep in forest. We don't have any beds here. I contradicted Regis, as one who has a wide range of experience when dealing with such difficult circumstances. It's all your fault, that we even got into this mess. Regis now pointing her finger at me gradually stopped walking as she bent on her knees to catch a breath. You are so selfish putting all the blame on me. I tried to shun down her complaint. Do I really need to make you remember with what you exactly did to us? Now, now Regis, there is no need to be so on edge. I tried to console her by titillating on her back, but she could have been right. If it is my fault but just by a slight, I promise. I just wanted to have some fun. I might have been a little more than two, too happy traveling together. Six hours ago, Regis, I have something that can get us to our destination way easier than walking. And what is that? Regis asked, and I was glad she did not seem to be the type who hated to try out new things. We hadn't ventured too far from the Elven Kingdom borders and all around us was nothing but a vast patch of green. It would be much easier if I show you. With a twist of my finger. A heavy machine fell down from a black portal connected to my dimensional storage. 169. It was a large, 
old style long motorbike with a white body and its streamlined black lines at its curves. Unlike motorcycles back in my previous world, it didn't burn on fuel, but it used wind magic to aerodynamically power its wheel. While Magitai Tours had been drawn into spikes to channel earth magic and gravity magic from surrounding to keep it stable, most probably, it was the need for a quiet engine, that I used magic cores as a way to conduit magic into the circuit of the vehicle, next connected to the two heavy wheels. One could easily get the bike moving by adjusting the wind magic they channeled across the handles. How does this even work? Regis asked as she looked in awe at its beautiful construct and was soon attached to it. She just couldn't help herself without asking me about it. You are going to ride it together with me. I simply explained. Huh, why me, aren't you the one who made it? Regis seemed a little surprised. Though I had never seen such a strange magical device before, but I had already made up with the fact that I was going to accept everything of Alicia including the unfathomable uncanny stunts she could pull off. Regis thought to herself and felt it was pointless to confirm its origins. I can't because I don't have a driving license. I sounded adamant over there. There's no way I wanted a case file reported against me for breaking laws. But since Regis was an elf, I am sure I did not find any laws regarding age limit imposed on driving motorbikes in Elf Kingdom. So, it's fine, if it's her. If you are not willing to ride it yourself, it sounds even more sketchier, but it is one of the things that primarily work on wind magic, so I want to give it a try. Regis was up for the job and ready to take control of the handles, she stylishly mounted the motorcycle, which I actually did not expect from a first-timer, much less someone from another world. I made this vehicle back in the labyrinth during my free time, so that I and my little sister Lily could ride together in it and explore all of the labyrinth. It 170 was supposed to be a surprise for her and even father was jealous to be not a part of making of such an amazing project. But Lily left for her studies before I could finish on the machine, and now seemed to be one of those times, when it was destined to be used and brought into the light, serving its real purpose. I hopped on behind her and gave a brief explanation to her of its working, and Regis caught on to the details as a natural. She could have been an inborn rider. Regis was puffed up in excitement as she quickly started pouring magic into the device. The wheels grazed over the land and the bike started moving forward. Slowly but surely, she was overcoming her fear of using magic. Thanks to the wheels affixed with magic cores and gravity magic enchantment layered with several other earth spell casts, specifically designed by me. Even a novice could manage to keep balance on the two wheels in their first dry. All Regis needed to do was manage the handles and take note of the directions. Regis had an animated look on her face as she couldn't help but feel that the machine was alive to move on its own and even so at an unbelievable speed. We were riding through the wind, basking in the morning light of the sun, and inhaling the fresh glucose smell of amber leaking from the barks of the young trees. I took care of all the monsters as I magically casted webs around the compound area where I could sense their presence. Either they were caught or slashed through the webs or the poison spread over them took the last of their lives. I was 100% sure I got all of them, and no one could intrude on our pleasant time we were spending together right now. Regis could drive in peace without worrying about anything. Feels nice to ride like this, it's fast, comfy and we might get to our destination before afternoon? Regis said a bit louder as her voice felt chased by the wind, but she seemed to be enjoying this new experience a lot. 171, and so did I when it specially meant getting one step closer to reaching Athena. I could prefer nothing more than that. Regis, why not try to channel more of your magic and we can go even faster? I dictated a well thought out suggestion. I am not sure, what if I can't handle my magic power and lost control? Regis sounded worried, and like an adult, as if she was trying to look out for me. It's fine. This vehicle's body is purely made of magitite tours so even a catastrophe cannot leave a dent on it. I justified and guaranteed the safety of the ride, but still, shouldn't we be more careful? Regis was suddenly cut short in words as if she forgot to take a breath. I had happily leaned in closer and rested my head against her back. By now, patting her stomach lightly with my arms extended further, 
I wrapped them around Regis's waist. In return, she let out a small squeal and in a voice that did not seem to belong to her and slight broken she said, all right, if this is what you want, I will show you exactly what speed is, so, please hold me tighter. And so, I did, and at the same time the motorbike roared as it went past the speed of wind, breaking through the air pressure flowing in our exact opposite direction. We crossed an entire forest as the elevation of ground grew higher and higher, but it did not affect our speed, as I tightened my grip around Regis and got closer to her making sure not to be left behind in the speed. This was my first time sitting behind someone on a bike, but I trusted her, except the fact that somehow the vehicle had broken past the speed limit and it seemed to be moving stiff in Regis's hand. Why isn't she slowing down? I wondered not thinking too much of it. Alicia. How does this thing slows down? Regis asked in a casual hurry, hoping that she might had not latched onto some of the particulars properly. 172. Yeah, that's simple. Just apply the brakes. It was a blunt explanation for the excitement we felt, but now it was slowly turning into something a little more than unnerving. Brakes. Where's that supposed to be? Regis asked with a little uncertainty and a bit cautioned by now. Meep. Screams of two ordinary girls skyrocketed in the vast plains of the northern deserted part of the demon continent, and their screaming suddenly vanished, with the same intensity they took rise. Clearing a path through the long grass, mowing down everything that came in front of the bike, Regis did her best not to lose balance. There was only to an extent the wheels could have maintained that safe stable equilibrium after a threshold had been crossed in magic supply, and with Regis's chaotic wind magic, it came sooner than expected, and now even a slight breeze could have blown us away from the straight path, we were heading in, as we still kept on ascending height, almost reaching a vertical, but how quickly one discovers the forbidden, and what seems to be having fun turns out to be a grim dark ride. Unexpectedly a cliff appeared as Regis tried out several ways to maneuver the bike and stop it before drifting off into the sky. She still hadn't given up, and it was something that she would do regardless to keep us safe. It was a praiseworthy gesture from a friend and I always knew I could depend on her. I am out of here. But it was simply not one of those times and I decided for myself without a second thought or question. We were screwed, the moment I realized I never understood the importance of having brakes on a vehicle. I was blameless and had still plenty of years before I could have tried for an actual driving test so I had little to no knowledge of an actual one. Maybe the racing games I used to play in my previous world, should have put more thought into making the players use brakes from time to time than 173, just accelerating on nitro to win. And to be honest the bike's design was just based on one of the car toy figurines I used to play with in my childhood. Maybe I should have taken some of father's insight in this after all, or even as a sacrificial goat for test drive. Mother would have surely consented for it. I understood the importance of having adults supervision while doing such dangerous practices. I will make sure of letting Regis know about it. She ought to be more careful with her life as the motorbike took off like a projectile mercilessly sent flying from the top edge of the cliff. One couldn't have missed comparing it to a bird's first flight, as I left Regis's protection and rather trusted on my instinct to use flight magic. With a deep cry from Regis later turned into a muted cry and followed by another long scream and rustling of tree branches. Finally, ending with a thump, the bike ran from the top into the clustered trees dozens of meter below while I unscathed landed on the ground. Seeing Regis knocked out on one of the branches hanging out like a wet cloth left under the sun to dry. The bike was stuck in between the nodes of the same tree, as the wheels slowly came to a halt. Now I remember, why I didn't integrate the brakes in the bike. I could have simply cut off the magic supply to slow down the vehicle. I felt proud of myself who might not have been that scatterbrained but an ingenious. I applied healing magic on Regis and woke her up, making sure not to tell her about this, and secretly put the bike back in my dimensional storage, before she could try to pulverize it with a stone in her outrage. Get it together Regis. I called out to her, as she woke up from a sleeping nightmare, 
but it's still all in the good since I got to know the bike was absolutely strong, a few manual parts missing, an amateur's mistake. After all I couldn't let my small sister ride alone on such a dangerous vehicle. So, this was a worth it learning experience. 174. I and Regis were now back on our trip, as we had lost our only mode of transportation with that accident. At least I labeled it as one. Walking was the only option. In between we took a rest at a small pond we found on the way and ate what big sister Edith had packed for us. It was a delightful treat, another of her talents she hid from all others. Soon night fell and we were still crossing the same forest. The map was of no use, since we couldn't find any landmarks pointed out for us on it close by and had lost all sense of direction after the sun would have set. Subsequent hours of walking and not able to find where exactly we landed after hitting rock bottom from cliff, kept us on edge. It was best if we found a dry place to rest and in an open place where we could keep guard from monsters sprawling in these parts of the forest. Let's camp here, if you want to have dinner. I suggested, as I lit up a fire with a soft snap of my fingers, I took out a large canvas, from my dimensional storage and started putting it in place. What are you looking for? Regis asked as I looked around in between the tools for something specific. I am unable to find the locks to put on the door of the tent? I asked worriedly. What? There's no such thing as that. That's so unsafe and unreasonable. I said in a panicked state. The only unreasonable thing is you trying to put a lock on a tent. How were you even able to survive for this long outside? Regis hollered at me. Maybe I am just that good. I said pompously, realizing I might had a hidden potential to overcome these types of challenges. A good friend can really point out their friend's good qualities. I am not complimenting you. Regis sneered at me. 175. Then we will just have to spend the night without a tent. I declared. Since, I too wanted to learn how exactly it feels at a camp out, I was prepared to go to any length to have that satisfaction. The burning flickers of the wood fire grew weaker and weaker, as we had turned all the dry wood we had collected into ash. We were more than too tired, to go in search for collecting a new batch in the dark. I hate this. It's rough and it's dark and the noises keeps on creeping me out. And I can't sleep outside like this. Regis, who was sitting quietly until now, enjoying the warmth of the bonfire, maybe not as much as me. In her unforeseen mental explosion, attracting all the nocturnal animals to our side, I know. Even Regis could not deny the feeling that we were missing on some chewy marshmallows we could have baked over the bonfire. She was just a little more emotional about it with her outburst. Regis next grabbed me by my shoulders and giving me a heavy jolt and pleaded, just make that magic house already, or shove it out from your dimensional storage. Her voice was frantic, no. I denied the request harshly in her face, but why? Regis said in an agitated state. This is an authentic camping trip, so we cannot have those luxuries here. You will just have to sleep by putting your head on the log. So, why do you have that feathered pillow on your back? Her brow knit further in frustration as she pointed at the mushy white feathery cushion, on which I rested. It's a gift from big sister Edith. She would be sad if I don't use it. It has a fruity fragrance that keeps away all the insects from coming close to me. Why didn't big sister pack for me one too? Regis bit her tooth hard, inflicting the pain of that anger on herself. If you want we can share in this one. I suggested, as I parted with half of the pillow, which I slid across me, and made room for her to join me. 176. Regis had now a keen look on her face, as if she realized that it was better for her to share than have one for each. Don't mind me. Regis happily chimed in. Just about when she was to put her head on the pillow and lie near me. Ouch. She breathed as her falling head hit hard on the ground. What now? Her cry followed. Regis, we are leaving. It seems that a large group of monster is approaching our way. Did they find us out? If so, then we can just ambush them here. I am going to wipe their existences from this planet. Regis was determined to take them out with the charges of them being a doomed species on this planet for denying her sleep beside me. No, on the contrary we just might be able to get out of this forest with their help. 
I declared with utmost confidence. Yes, at least that's what I planned, because such large number of monsters moving at the same time in an irregular stride was uncommon. Regis knocked an arrow to her bow, as she stayed on her toes, ready to shoot on the sight of a hostile enemy. The heavy footsteps quickened, as the ground rumbled. Regis who possessed a good eyesight, was now clearly able to see, Despite the darkness and the trailing dust the monsters raised in fury, Alicia, don't they seem to be like running from something? And there are so many of wolf monsters. Regis' mouth left agape, as she couldn't bring herself to finish the words. The next second the whole forest was in the effect of black haziness that lit darker than the night sky. Black flames wrapped the whole land, but something still extraordinary was happening as the wolves burnt with agonized howls not even leaving their ashes behind, the grass and the trees were unharmed at the same time. 177 Such a brilliant manipulation of magic on a vast scale and the ability to disintegrate dozens of monster in a blink of an eye, the sight was so ludicrous that Regis could not put a finger on what she was looking or even describe it without calling it the wrath of the nature but she exactly knew who could have attained such a feat. I coyly smiled back at Regis, who was looking at me with wide open eyes, except for my indifferent impassive eyes glowing. My hands brandished and aimed at the huge pack of wolf monsters, which were wiped out by now and nothing left to report. Regis couldn't explore the fact whether it was an expression of hate or for her I was just simply emotionless and self-contained. Alicia, how were you planning to get us out of here? Regis asked trying to move her mind away from those obscure thoughts. I who had drifted too far, while taking out my enmity from one of my past nemesis and grudges. I had made it a rule and a motto to wipe out every evil wolf that came in my sight and then maybe try to find out what they were actually trying to do. Talking about animals or monsters when they are afraid of anything wouldn't that mean they would always run to safety? I replied to Regis's question in a plain tone as if losing the listless disposition, I had a moment before. I see. That's brilliant. Regis responded. Even though she took a while to understand my plan, she too knew the ways of the forest, the instincts of elves I guess. In this case, the monsters appeared to be running haphazardly and if they were trying to escape from something dangerous, they would surely want to get to their shelter, where it was safer. That would have to be the center of the forest and where it got deeper and easy to hide. If we just reverse the situation for us, then traveling in the opposite direction of their march would lead us to the less denser part of the forest. 178 Which should mostly point us to getting outside, probably a road or a settlement nearby. Then are we going to proceed further with that? Regis asked for a final confirmation go on my end. Since, I had vanquished the threat. There was no need to move so quick now. I think we have a chance now. We shouldn't let go of the possibility that someone else could be nearby. I thoughtfully spoke, okay, then let's be careful and proceed. Regis said with caution, but I felt it was unneeded. We walked for a couple of minutes and instead of going in circles previously, we were surely getting to somewhere, as we spotted a clear patch of land and what appeared to be a temporary road. But Regis and I waited behind the bushes and under the darkness bestowed on us by the trees. Watching all of the scene unfold in front of us, a cart of just the sort that might show up in an rebounds per game, lay resting behind a huge boulder. Two men kept on peeking from the safety of a thin curtain from the back of the cart, holding tightly onto the curtain as if their life rested on it. But I ever doubted those flimsy piece of clothes could have shielded them from the sharp canines of the wolf monsters that could tear down almost anything they placed in their broadened mouth. But what actually protected them for real, appeared to be a silhouette, of not one but two as they kept running in circles making convoluted movements to confuse the wolves and not leaving any blind spot for them to attack even in groups. While one of them wearing a small hoodie cloak, made of jute. She might not have been the best of runners, but making sure that they were on higher ground, an advantageous position. They continuously threw rocks on the wolves to agitate them and keep them at bay from attacking at the same time. Both I and Regis noticed, the silence lurking in the presence of another cape bearer. She ran so fast, almost camouflaged by her own shadow, 
Hahud, 179, came off with a final turn, only to put on display a pair of Doberman ears on her head. Her short brown hairs unkempt and frilly. A female demi-human, in her mid-teens. The next moment a pair of two small daggers got picked up in her hands from the pocket of the tight short jeans that wrapped around her legs. A brief expression of anger surfaced on her face with a growl. The hairs at her back and round her cheeks grew several times. The layer of muscles around her arms and legs appeared to be puffed up. The grip of her soul on the ground, further tensed up. And in the next moment like a gale of wind she moved and vanished. And every wolf who had been focused on the other person in question, had their necks flying off. The girl contended with daggers ran at an unbelievable swiftness. As Regis wondered, could her arrows even catch up to that speed? Usually. To me humans did possess strong physical abilities, but the strength and swiftness the person showed in her transformation went beyond any of those standards, even saying it was more than extraordinary. The common logic of people from this world would have denied it as a simple illusion spell at work, but what was happening in front of us was real as the bloodstains that had littered the earth red and monsters had several meters apart from their actual bodies left a scared and defended mark on the other wolves as they ran away. I could surmise it into some kind of beast transformation skill and a very advanced one at that too. The demi-human seemed to be awfully cautious about the safety of the other person in hood. As it made sure no monster got close to that specific person and the next came the safety of the individuals in the cart. It was clearly evident that the other person might not have been too strong to protect themselves. But even then putting themselves in danger and helping out each other pointed out to only one thing that they were together and deeply trusted each other. All this and I concluded it all with my detective temperament. I 180 still can't believe when the school detective club decided to rejected my joining application back at school, just because I wrote my field of interest as uncovering the identity of an international kid spy that could have been hiding inside our school. One in a million chance, I know it, but it was a worthy challenge for a visionary astute detective. By the flow of things and how it all went down, there was no need for me or Regis to help and the two seemed capable enough to take care of themselves in the situation. But then what really made this act unbelievable for me was the fluence at which they were getting this job done. A simple yet difficult plan to follow if even one could have messed up, putting the other's life in danger and had to face the lot of monsters alone. But the fact they dispatched every one of them within few minutes, just went to show how good they could work together. Regis too was shocked to see their efficient way of doing this job with almost no special strength. The demi-human transformation reversed back and she went to normal. Bringing us back to the realization that she was the same young demi-human girl. She seemed to be awfully tired after that transformation given that she might had now ran out of magic power as well. The demi-human followed to the place where the other person was standing in waiting and we kept our eyes on her. Suddenly a tensed expression welled up on her face as she hastily retreated to the side of that person in hood and whispered in her ears and using some hand signs as well. I was right. They were more than acquaintances. The person in the hood took the news with surprise and calmed down. Soon we found her walking to our secret spot while the demi human remained at her side all time in guard. From near the bushes, she called in another girl's voice. I know you are there. Show yourself. Regis seemed to hesitate, as she was unable to understand how we were found out, or why she called out only for one when we were two. That was pretty simple. Most probably that demi-human in her transformed state was able to smell Regis with her heightened senses. While, I was 181, wearing my mask which cloaked and protected me from such kind of search spells. Had the great spirit of forest not found me out, then I would have gone unnoticed even in the elf kingdom. But for now, the person under the short cloak, pushed back her hood a little, to reveal herself as another black-haired girl. Probably the same age as us but had more mature looks and vibe attached to her persona. She again called out in her shrill voice even more clear to us than previous. It's totally safe. So, you can come out now. Her hardened voice had flexed into a kind gesture. Regis walked out as she pushed me back with her hand for me to stay back as she thought herself to measure the safety of the situation. 
for all we could have known that the people here could be highway robbers as we had been warned back in the Elf Kingdom. I am sorry for hiding. You see, we are lost and want to get to the port town. The moment I interrupted and came out of the bushes as well, unannounced taking everyone by surprise, for one I did not follow Regis's precautionary measures and because I was out of the expectations of the other two girls, but how? The demi-human murmured under her breath, if you two are alone, why don't you join us on the wagon to get to the nearest town and if you want to get to the sea as you said then you can find a carriage taking you there from the town itself. Slickly hiding her amused face and putting on a calm expression the human girl in hood described to us our only option. Regis why don't we take on their offer? You didn't want to sleep in the middle of nowhere did you? I swiftly seeked for Regis's approval. I too was worried for her comfort, and if we had a better alternative we could surely aim for an inn in the town. It was not like I only wanted to try out how a hotel in another world looks like for the first time, but we can stay in the same room if you want. I added, 182. Okay fine, it's not like we can do anything by staying in the forest in the dead at night. Regis agreed as she fell for the Alicia's temptation, but surely you can't be riding on without paying for the fare. I take it that you two are traveling together? The person under the hood sounded serious after adding in our confirmation. Well, that just meant they were open for business. Understood. Just tell us the cost and we will pay. Regis said, as one who was also the in charge of keeping tabs on the money spent on our journey. It was best in my interest, since I didn't know the exact denomination and value of money in this world. And I might have lost sense of it after living without the need of currency in the labyrinth for about four years. But surely one day, I could make big in business like I was told my father was a business giant in my previous world. As the four of us approached the cart, with the girl in hood leading the charge, her back protected by the careful gazes of the demi-human, who was still doubtful of us. Though those careful glances only made her look a bit childish in her tender age and added to her charms with those special ears. I and Regis were right behind with them. Turns out, we were close to one of the settlements on the map which also luckily fell on our way to the port town from where we would board the ship and reach the human continent. The two men, who were hiding inside the cart were a merchant and the other was the owner and driver of the cart himself. Regis climbed onto the cart, while out of nowhere a hand reached out to me to help me board on it. It was from the girl with the hood as she passed a generous smile to me from underneath. I happily grasped it and climbed onto. While two gazes saw us with shaken expression on their faces, belonging to Regis and the demi-human as if they were unacceptable of this sudden blossoming relationship. hi -o. The cart drive moved to the front and yelled, inflicting a weak clash to the back of the horses. They neighed and trooped forward. The horses in this world were much stronger and bigger, compared to my previous world. While some of the rare ones could have possessed skills that 183 made them relatively faster than an average horse and special at the same time, we wouldn't have been alive if it weren't for you two to be here, said the other man with facial hair and a beer belly, sitting opposite to us, surrounded by huge wooden barrels with rations, making the little cart a bit more than cramped after we came on board. By description and all means he might be a merchant traveling to the next city for selling goods. It certainly would have helped a lot if the cheap guards you hired, wouldn't turn their back on us and ran away like scaredy cats. The demi-human girl said in a hardened tone, I would keep that in mind. But you know hiring adventurers for such jobs are pretty expensive. So, this time I wanted to try out with some volunteers. It's shameless to accept that a merchant went for the fallen fruit just to save some chump change. The merchant laughed worriedly wiping the little trail of sweat from his brow. After he just escaped a life-threatening situation he was still struck with fear but I think he was probably more worried about losing his goods. The four of us kept on listening quietly to the babbling of the merchant, until he posed a question which got both me and Regis interested. I would surely like to know the name of my saviors, not if you would mind sharing with me. My name is Cage. The girl in hood introduced herself and then beckoned to her friend, and my name is Maya. 
The beast human Riley said she did not think much highly of the merchant or might not have given out her name even on asking if her friend wouldn't have done the same. The merchant then glanced, a moment's hesitation as if he was going to make an unreasonable request. Would you like to work for me in keeping my items safe? You see, I am a peddler and frequent traveling is a given. You have already given a wonderful demonstration of your power and I am more than willing to pay you well. The merchant stared at the beast girl, Cage. Maya the demi-human whispered to her partner. 184. Unfortunately, I don't think your friend would be too helpful in this job. But a demi-human like you still young, would surely need a stable paying job. The man's evil eyes creepily grazed over her from top to bottom. I felt warped by his statement. He was clearly offering an incentive to one member and denying the other. Even well knowing that how they worked well together and he would be dumber if he still hadn't realized that. The merchant's eyes were only scrutinizing the power the demure human girl possessed. But the elegant beauty which the other girl in hood possessed of handling jobs which such simplicity was simply ignored. Aha ah ha. It seems so mister that you haven't learned your lesson. Did you just now forget what happened because of what you did? Cage said as if trying to carry the conversation in a specific direction and by the glares of the merchants he wanted to avoid it happening at all costs. Little girl mind your own business. I am only interested in this demi human here. So will you work for me? The merchant aggressively forced the conversation by ogling at the prize he was so after. I am not going to work for a cheapskate like you. Maya shunned her with a harsh reply on her face. Before the merchant could try to persuade her any further, Cage head bent and moved forward, her demeanor exuding a pressure of something close to overconfidence. But the calmness around her raised shoulders only made it look like she was going for total victory and complete eradication. Aren't you here trying to repeat the same mistake again? That's why I hate humans who simply refuse to learn and only welcome things that go their way. Did you forget the two imprudent guards you hired, who so brazenly teased the wolves and attracted a whole pack of them only to abandon you on the pretext that they weren't willing to risk their lives for the little chump change you threw at them? Cage explained to the situation of what had actually transpired and what brought those wolves attacking in large numbers on them. 185. Most probably the other two guards in mention were already eaten by some of the scattered wolves since I could not feel any other presence nearby before leaving, but like a contest had already began between Cage and the merchant as I watched not knowing what might happen next. While, Regis seemed to be annoyed by the fuss they were making altogether, or rather she might have shot someone if they would have started a fight to quieten things down while she rested after her long travel. Their expression contrasted sharply. The black-haired girl still under the hood was unconcerned, with a dead, expressionless mien. Meanwhile, the fat merchant was an open source of seriousness, perhaps from tension. Suddenly the cart that was until now moving at a steady pace came to a brisk halt. The forest forks from here into two pathways. Would you two girls happen to know which is the right way? Since you told me that you are natives there, I thought it's about time for making our collection. The girl chimed in as she pushed back her hood willfully. Her black hairs dangled low to her waist, sharpening her gazes almost seeing through everything a cold expression surfaced on her face. So, she was a human after all. But then why did she say before that she hated all humans and still gave me a hand? I wonder. Girl you there? tell him the way. We need to reach to the town quick, or my eatery items will get spoiled otherwise. The merchant passed a disgusting stare at Cage. On the other hand, she just smiled wanly, and none of us knew at that time, maybe except for Maya, that a dirty game was already set in motion. 186. The card why the hold up? The merchant strained his face and asked. One of them is the shortest way to the town while the other is the longer one. Which one would you like to know? Cage offered. Of course, the shortest one. Then the shorter one it is. Cage said that she was about to point out the direction to the coachman, but she was then caught hold by an unexpected hand. The hand belonged to the girl she had rescued back then, as Cage looked back in a hurry. She appeared to be someone a year or two younger than her, a human and the other an elf. Would you mind telling us? about the specifics of the direction you are about to point at? 
Alicia asked in an irresistible sweet voice. Innocence leaking from her facial expression. The kind who might had never seen the brutality of the outside world. To Kate she only appeared to be another human, a mask that covered the top of her face and black hairs falling to her back, but glossier and more maintained than her own. While the elf had a well-trained body with the irregular marks on her hands, which she noticed beforehand, the kind left while holding a pointed weapon for too long, the other who might not had even hurt a fly in her life. She could have easily told that the two strangers were of high breeding and from the upper parts of society from their outfit, manners and accoutrement. No matter how hard the traveler tried to hide their identity but sometimes the rich quality of clothes which they could not do without could reveal a lot about them. Until now for Cage, the two were only a means of making money for her and that's why she offered them a place in the cart after she herself went and talked with the master at the cart. That's right. There was a specific purpose both Cage and Maya had teamed up and to achieve that purpose they were willing to go to any length, there was no way Cage could have ever let go of that purpose, because that's alone what gave meaning to her existence. 187, but now, somehow, or rather it was for the first time she felt such dominance, nonetheless from someone who looked so meek. She absolutely had to answer that question and could not decline Alicia's advances even when they had met only a while ago. The shorter path has got a lot of caves and high points from where there are high chances for the wolf monsters that reside in this forest to attack us. As for the longer route it is a clear path and preferred by travelers for avoiding monsters. Cage said, breaking in between the merchants shouted, then we should definitely choose the other route. But that's why the longer route has become bandit's territory, which only a resident of that town, someone like me might know of. Cage's voice ended with a hush as the cart fell in utter silence. What, you fool, are you trying to get us killed? If I am correct aren't those the infamous bandits that is said to be in control of even the town's administration? They may as well number hundreds in members count. The merchant kept on babbling about how great the bandits were, while others listened with a dramatic shush. Some were already aware of the danger, and those like Regis were warned. Except for one in the cart who by now had developed a keenness to see the bandits at work. Alicia a self-proclaimed magical genius and who had just now started traveling in this new fantasy world, where she was reborn saw this only as a means of her entertainment rather than a threat. So, we should be going with the longer route. Cage reaffirmed with a devilish smile. Hold up, it's not fixed yet. Take the shorter route, the demi-human girl will be able to protect us from the monsters. The merchant stood like an obstruction, I guess not. I am tired from the previous fight and this time I only might be able to run. Why should I risk my life to protect you? Ma rebuked the merchant's claim and pretended to fall on her back and closed her eyes trying to sleep, but it was so casual, that none could deny it as simply being an act. 188 Surely you had enough rest already, so do what you barbaric beasts are good at. Ma sneered at him, and he fell silent. So, would you like to value your life more or the goods you have? Cage asked the merchant to make an inconceivable decision. The merchant was now stuck in a bind. In the means to get the demi-human girl, he had revealed too much about himself. Like the expensive perishable goods, he carried and how urgent it was for him to reach to the town before the sunrise to sell them immediately. He had already subscribed to a huge loan and the previous debts had been cropping up on him. Even if he wanted, he could not just recommend to camp here for the night, leading him to incur a huge loss from which he won't be able to recover. That hooded girl had figured him all out and now he was playing right into her hands. At the end he was only hoping to use the demi human for his own advantage but failed. Now his life rested on the palms of this child who looked so mirthful now. At the end he had no choice but to teach those brats the hard way, about how the adults discipline children. The merchant thought to himself, if he goes through the longer route then probably his goods will be confiscated by the bandits and if he resisted while saving them, he would be killed. The bandits were famous for their brutality and would easily kill anyone who went against them. If he chooses the shorter path, then he can just force the demi-human to fight the wolves and while they acted as meat shields, 
He could take one of the new passengers as hostage and then would force the driver to run away, leaving the girl and Demi human as bait while he takes off. A brazen smile reappeared on his face. Let's decide this in the most fairest way. How about we vote which way we go? The merchant proposed. 189. Everyone accepted his proposal since everyone got a fair say to speak and make their own choice. So, the majority wins and the minor has to go with the majority's decision. Since I know the directions I might decide to wave. So, what exactly happens if I decided to wave? Cage asked. It's simple you have to just accept whatever the outcome might be. The merchant replied. Okay, I got it. So, Maya what do you think we should do? I will choose the longer way then. Maya as if taking Cage's question as a cue which it was. Voted and went back to rest. I think the longer way. The coachman replied, the shorter way. Alicia voted, the shortest path. Regis said, while Alicia had her own motivation going she could also see that Regis was tired and she would be a bad friend if she couldn't keep her in good health. Regis on the other hand, just wanted to get to an inn as quickly as possible and have a hearty sleep with Alicia. And also, because she found the car too cramped for herself and wanted to breath in fresh air again. Longer way. Two votes short away, three votes then it's decided. We are heading in the shortest path. The merchant jovially declared, hang on, what do you mean by it's decided? I haven't voted yet? What are you playing at little girl, didn't you just say about waving? The merchant grumpily asked, Cage who suddenly questioned the results of the vote. Ah, if I remember correctly then I just said that I might and asked in case about this wave thing. I never actually acknowledged I am going to wave. Don't tell me you are going to take my right to vote and still call it fair. 190 SHH. Then hurry up and speak what you have to. The merchant scorned at her. I choose the longer path. Cage declared with the brightest smile she had yet made. But her cunning eyes said otherwise which targeted the spiteful eyes of those of the merchants. Making the number of votes equal and the situation a stalemate. Blasphemous. Why you? The merchant turning towards the coachman. Hey old man are you a fool? Why do you want to even chose the longer path if we can just go past quick the shorter one and might even avoid the monsters? Young man. Humans can be merciful at times if you give them what they want, but monsters would tear you apart at the first sight they smell you. So, I am going to play it safe, if the risk is too big. The old man stated with his slow-moving mouth, almost blowing out all the patience the merchant had. The cartman was right, all bandits needed, were their stuff. The only one who would be at a loss would be the merchant who had got valuable items on him, while others could pass making him a scapegoat and selling him off. It was his fault to begin with that they got held up in the previous monster attack and the journey turned into late night traveling. The merchant looked at everyone's faces and realized no one cared about him after he had shown such a sour character of his up front. Gah, if that's how you are gonna do it, I am ready to pay you twenty silver coin to everyone who vote in my favor. The merchant offered, of course. If he was able to reach the town and other cities then he can make big and that sum would be trifling for him. So, you are going to resort to bribery now? Cage frolickingly asked, as if she had already seen this coming. Don't give me your justice moral now, brat. This offer is open to all. But I might just need one more vote so think carefully who catches onto this golden deal first. It's an offer which even a town's garbage. Homeless and penniless kids like you of the slums cannot resist. The merchant disgruntledly looked at her. 191. Those words suddenly alarmed Cage and Maya as they felt offended. But Cage was able to maintain her calm, while Maya woke up, ready to punch and take action if the merchant once again passed such derogatory comments on them. That's surely a generous offer for me in my old age. The master of the cart started having second thoughts. With that amount he could finally dream of opening a permanent shop back in his hometown and set on a journey of a happy retirement. And he just might risk his life in his final days of this foreboding job. He already knew he couldn't have saved this much even if he worked for six months round the clock continuously. Even Regis, started thinking, of saving money on her traveling and also if she could make some money while at it. Savings is after all important. 
From the moment she heard that her father was short on money and could not offer her daughter a traveling sum, despite being a king, Regis had promised to herself that she would earn a huge sum and gift it back to her father who so wholeheartedly had supported her. Maybe traveling for a bit longer on cart wouldn't hurt much, and an encounter with a bandit or monsters was still just a probability. Either way she could have taken care of them, if she knows where the enemy is. Her arrows would surely shoot them down. Regis grinned, thinking to herself. Alicia found this conversation interesting as it involved money and she wanted to see how transactions and business were carried in real life in this world, as she waited and watched further before reaching to her very own conclusion. Yes, that's right. Once you make back to town you can have good life with this money. Just think it of as an insurance for risking your life. The merchant tried to further motivate others to fall under his greed spell. Humans are really stupid creatures, who can't even make correct decisions for themselves. Cage taunted, are you that afraid that you are going to lose now? Resorting to meaningless remarks, let's start the voting again. The merchant announced in his loud voice as if declaring that victory was already in his bag. Just by parting with few silver coin, he can turn the tables in his favor since there 192 votes were equal previously all he needed to was add another vote to his account i already know i don't have that kind of money to make others vote for me but i do know a way to still steal the votes in my favor cage's charisma was in full bloom as if she was emotionally accepting the truth of her present cage continued my i would need your vote this time master of the cart and you elf girl yes Regis muttered in hurry on being called out of nowhere, while the coachman nodded. Everyone eagerly listened to Cage in waiting. You have my vote, Cage. Maya responded simultaneously. I have already got Myas and my vote. So, if you two want to earn more money as I can already see you being called out to it, I offer you 40 silver coins each, for each vote you make in my favor. Cage put forth her proposal, which blanked everyone's brain. What's the meaning of this? You only have two votes right now while others have not voted. You are going to lose either way. Stop making false promises. The merchant was really a verbose as he kept on bearing his fangs towards Gage. I call it a strategy. For someone like me as you say who grew up in slums. I am not like other greedy humans who cheat to make an extra penny. Nothing too great. We will be continuing our fair game, but in my style now. Cage's eye lit up with an evil grin rivaling that of the merchant now, who felt cornered. That's right. This battle for Cage wasn't simply for one to choose the better option of the two paths. On either way, whether it was bandits she could hand it over the merchant, or on the longer path they would have to break their way through the wolf monsters. In truth, the first question was irrelevant for her when her final motivation was for her to earn big. For Cage. The only battle in her life was for the pursuit of earning more and more money. For her it was something synonymous to power something close to life itself. 193. She was not born with strong instincts or physical capabilities like Maya. She was one of those unfortunate outcasts who could not even use magic power or had even a skill in her possession. By the time she took hold of her consciousness and realized what was happening around her, abandoned by her parents traded as a slave and finally making a run and landing in the dumps of a slum. She had already learned by now that if she was not born with anything then it was not her fault, but if she died with nothing she was surely to be blamed. From there her conquest of becoming the richest person began as she used her intelligence to claim everything she wanted, the greediest and wisest of all, or so she calls herself. If you can really do it young girl, then my vote is for you. The coachman said with a puzzled face, still unsure of Cage's plan of how it would work. I think I will then vote for the longer way too. It would be more than enough to cover the traveling cost and staying at the inn. Right Alicia. I abstain from voting. Alicia declared. Though no one paid much heed to Alicia's declaration, everyone felt weirded out by her irrational decision. But Alicia who really wanted to find out the result, knew that she could stop further voting only by making the total number of counting votes odd. So, she took on that role. Longer way, one vote shorter way, four votes don't mess with me. How are you going to even pay that sum? The merchant jumped in frustration shaking the cart. 
It's simple you are going to pay for each of us by buying my votes from me at a much higher price than you previously did. The result will be still in your favor, but now you surely realize what happens when someone messes around with us. TSK Unbelievable, you treacherous wench. 194 Call me what you want, but do you actually see now, good sir? Someone who according to you lives a cheap life can actually make it big by ripping off from people like you who think they can do whatever they want with money. So, how about you pay each of us the sum I promised, and they will vote in your favor. Let's see how far can you go with your fair fight, if you weren't just bluffing about paying us or try to run away with the money. Everyone's eyes were now focused on the merchant who was on his fall, unable to think his way out of this. Fairness is really a nice thing but only in books and fairy tales. So, why don't you flaunt that money of yours that you are so proud of and spend a little more than you promised? Cage stomped angrily on seeing the merchant prostrate and staying quiet, her own grudges seemingly leaking out. I can't. A flat voice came from below. Huh. Everyone squeaked. I can't. Paying one person twenty coins was a burden already but paying every one of you 40 silver coins is impossible. I don't have that much money. What? So, you were only pretending up till now. And here I thought I could make big with today's catch. Mao it seems that today we have got the shorter end of the stick. We might as well head through the longer way. Since that's what was decided. Cage responded mercilessly. Since everyone is canvassing, how about I give you one gold coin to every negative voter for going through the shortest path? It was none other than Alicia who spoke, as she continued in her carefree voice, surely one gold coin is more valuable than a silver coin. Wait, Alicia what you are doing? Regis asked worriedly, as if she could already see how things would be going from here on. Nothing much, but aren't you tired and I don't want to wait here any longer. Also, I wouldn't like the food and other commodities to turn bad because of a little conflict. 195. I know but do you even have that kind of money? Yes. I sure do. Here dot I got you all covered. Saying that Alicia took out a gold coin from her dimensional storage. While to other it appeared as if she pulled it out of thin air. Alicia. Regis stuttered. While Alicia felt confused for her perplexed looks. That's not a gold coin. But a gold crown coin. It's hundred times value of a gold coin and ten thousand times a silver coin. Regis explained. Is that so? Before Alicia could finish, Cage pushed aside Regis and holding hands of Alicia she said, We have a deal. Maya you are in charge of the safety of the cart. As usual. I am on it Maya replied with a stoic face as she moved to the front of the cart. Watching in between the crack of the drawn in curtains. All right. Regis, I got everyone covered for you. The stunned expression on everyone's faces and the tension inside turned from being palpable to that of exhilaration. Hang on tight girls and gentlemen, my horses are going to take their final ride before I get to enjoy my freedom with my daughter back at home and retire to live our happy life. Start talking to the wind my boys. Saying that the coachman whipped the horses twice with the rope in his hand on the back, without actually hurting them. The coachman sounded young again and with his promised credit, was looking to a bright future with his only family member left. At least that's what appeared from the afterward congratulatory talk between Cage and him. Regis, who kept on protesting and asking for questions was shut down by Cage and her domineering personality, who quickly started working on with Alicia for the details. While Maya who was happy with the earned amount, saw Alicia with a sour face for getting so close to Cage and so did Regis earing at Maya's friend. 196. Hey they're right to need some money. If I change my vote now, surely. The merchant vouched in, sounding as smug as he could, but since Alicia had said that only negative voters would be getting one big gold coin, he thought to butter up with his words and get his way again. Maybe in your dreams, deadbeat. Alicia said in a defiant tone. Lacking all her generosity. Why? Work and earn money on your own. He who does not work, neither will he eat. Alicia's words sent flying everyone in the cart with laughter, as they continued their way across the plains, bound for the flat horizon and finally reaching their destination town. 197. 
Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne the cart was moving at a steady pace and we were about to cross through another forest before entering into the plum village, which Cage described to me and Regis as our last stop. This village fell in the free territory of the demon continent. After the true demon lord, further vanished. Other demon lords stopped annexing territories in his respect and to avoid further conflicts after the Great War ended. And so, local feudal lords took control. But it only led to the underdevelopment of the towns and native people. Slowly, the number of hobo people increased. The economy dwindled because of less trade, and common people took arms and revolted. Bandit groups plagued the forest and whatever region they could claim for themselves and grew up in numbers. Especially the one in control were indiscriminately killing and looting on a whim. Alicia from where did you even get that big money? Regis lumping to my side asked in secret. Oh. It's something I got for my expenses on traveling. What? Isn't that close to spoiling you rich? And how many of those you have? We don't know how long our journey would be after all and we might get caught up in some kind of financial emergency. Undoubtedly Regis was thinking for our future travels, she was already deep into this and I too commended her for her unwavering passion. Well, father has not much use of it, and I only have this kind of coins on me to offer. Don't worry I have enough to fill dozens of room with them. That's right, I had already raided a gold digger dragon in the labyrinth and claimed all its riches for myself and father added extra to me. I should have put much thought before asking it, since it's coming from you, but next time be careful because this can attract some unwanted attention. Regis reminded me of the hateful glares of the merchant directed towards me. 198 I have only given the big gold coins to Cage, Maya and the coachman who put on a negative vote. Also, they were people who helped me and Regis out, by accepting us on the ride. As for Regis, she was traveling with me. So, our sentiments were more aligned to that which belongs to you, belongs to me as well. On the other hand, the merchant with green jealous eyes kept cursing everyone throughout the journey. Even after winning the votes in his favor, he just couldn't be happy and content. And most of all, I was more than pleased to turn all the wolf monsters in the forest into quiet little peaceful bodies. My web magic was more than versatile for our safe travels. After traveling on cart for around three hours, and in between Cage kept us entertained with her ideas and description of her town, for better or worse. She was living alone and Cage was a part of an orphanage, and what the merchant said about them was not far from the truth, but they looked happy with whatever they were doing, not to forget the amazing stunt Cage put in front of everyone and clobbered the merchant in the game of wits, finally earning a life-changing sum, but now I knew an idea as to how money was important to people again or how I was always tight on the only little pocket money I got from my guardians to spend on all my daily necessities. We have arrived at the plum town. The coachman said, bringing the horse to a stop next to a solitary tree. He dismounted and tied the reins to the tree. Cage then opened the curtains wide and fresh air came in, like a spring's morning drizzle. Faintly, in the distance, I could see mountains, deeply embedded inside a packed sheet of dense forests. If nothing else, there was the town gates feebly built with minimum defenses and no barrier in place to detect or repel monsters, the town appeared to be more noiseless than necessary, as it was completely covered in the darkness of the night, one could have called it a peaceful view with little less to do as small brick houses randomly dotted themselves along the main road. 199 but the number of eyes that I could sense keeping a watch on us said, otherwise, do, you want to help me find the best inn for you both to stay for the night, I am well acquainted with this place, and I could get you a discount, not that I think you would need it, Cage confronted me and Regis, not deciding to move from our way, and with that smile on her face, I could tell she was not going to take a no for an answer, all right, we are ready to go along with you, I said and Regis nodded, Finding zero faults with the offer, we reached the inn pretty quick, or in other words there were not that many great buildings in the town. For one part, I and Regis could easily tell the poverty in the place hiding behind the decorated front walls, the receptionist at the inn seemed to be a little susceptible with taking two girl travelers in the middle of the night as her customers. But when Regis advocated for us with some magical words of her one, 
She instantly agreed and offered us the biggest room in the house. Though Regis did point out that the set price was almost equal to Openly Highway robbing us, but the receptionist was adamant about the price and constantly rebuked Regis by saying that it was impossible for us to get a better room with safety in the middle of night. Both of us finally agreed. Since in the morning we had to look for another transportation method to get us to the port town. After seeing off Cage and Maya, we went back to relax in our room, where Regis almost fell asleep after feeling the bed. 200. Chapter 7 Dissociated Cage Was it really alright to accept such a large amount of sum, for such a simple job? We could find ourselves in deep trouble if word of this gets out. Maya said as she looked at the big double-sized gold coin. She had never seen so much money at one place and so she made sure to hold it tightly in her hands and not to not misplace her share. She couldn't help but feel the excitement that she could now buy almost anything in her life she ever wished for in the city with it. Can't you listen this money talking to me? That it says it loves me. It wants to make both of us happy and... Cage went on blabbering staring at the golden ducat she had earned, occasionally rubbing it on her cheeks. As in her hand she beheld an amount she never hoped to earn even if she riled up her conniving brain to strategize a plan over an entire year. She seemed to be so self-absorbed in thinking of not wasting or spending that money around like Maya but rather investing it to make more and planning to save a specific number for future emergency usage at the same time. You are not listening to me. I am asking was it really alright to corner the merchant and involving the coachman at the same time? The Dalton gang might already be in conflict with us after this. Maya said making the reference to the bandits which the merchant kept on mentioning. There was a time when Cage and Maya used to work with the band, but not now when they had turned into real savages and murders. Cage had decided it was best to split from them and work independently. It was part of Cage's full safe plan of extorting money from travelers and allying with the coachman to lead astray the merchants and take them through the path which did not have the bandits because we were already aware of their hideouts. Cage always mentioned that what they took was a fair exchange for saving their life and nothing comes free when they needed 201 to put food on the table. So, was taking this money for nothing a right decision? Maya again asked to herself as she now confronted Cage from front to hear her personal thoughts about it. You already know that a person who can't accept money is a boring soul to me. Cage replied still drunk on money. Maya slapped Regis's face with a bunch of paper tickets which Cage had earned as commission for introducing a pair of rich customers in a specific hotel. Though she never lied of it being the best hotel in the place making sure her two customers were satisfied at the same time. What Maya actually liked about Cage was her trustworthiness and work ethic, and with these many tickets Maya was sure she could get dinner for everyone at the orphanage she lived in, and not just for today, but for years, including all debts paid with the amount they had earned, just with this single giant gold coin. Their fates were changed and opening new doors for them. Wouldn't it be suspicious if we paid all our debts at once? Maya raised a fair question. For some kids in slum to pay all their life debts at once would only bring trouble. Of course, it would. So, we will pay only little by little and use the rest of the money to open up a shop in the central plaza. What do you think of it? But before that we need to be ready for our two new arrivals and maybe by showing them around the city they would be willing to spend more on us. Maya seeing that cunning smile on Cage's face understood that she had already made plans for tomorrow, but Maya still felt this unsettling feeling that she could not sense the presence of the person in the mask, even being so close in the cart, it was just that this had never happened before, that her nose or ears betrayed her in her beast transformation. Usually living in the slums, she had met all kind of people, people who despised others who worshipped money and those like Cage who were obsessed with it. But in that humor girl case, Maya could not quite put a finger, as if she unlike anyone who was trying to make profit in that cart. That human girl, 202, was looking for something remote and was instead trying to buy us and not our votes to actually fall in her favor. Cage what do you think our customers really are? Maya asked as she pictured the listless face on the girl who handed out her money and it was unlike any other transaction she did previously, where merchants were usually thankful or either loathed them. Just ignorant masses, 
and for that we have hit our jackpot today. Cage announced as she jumped around in circle like a little girl which would have been otherwise considered normal for her age. Are you serious? Maya asked with a confused expression. Don't forget that others are just stairs for us to climb and become the richest person ever. Isn't that the dream we saw together and we can now finally pay our debts? We will make a fresh start as free people. You really never change. But it is the dream that we promised we'll see through the end. Mia laughed as she walked around Gage, there was still a lot of time before they could have reached the orphanage and they also needed to pick food with the tickets before all is sold, the town looked dead in the night, every house and shop closed with lights off, but Cage and Maya were well aware that this was just an upfront when all kinds of evil things were happening inside these hollow buildings, bandits, drug dealing, hoarding, prostitution, illegal slave trading silent murders which would have no trace by tomorrow. The lives of people and their hearts were hollow too, as they forced children like Cage and Maya to be tossed on the streets and used as mere slaves. From a very young age the two were abandoned and Cage lived alone while Maya was taken in by the orphanage. Suddenly Maya remembering something out of place asked Cage just in case. Remember Cage you offered everyone the double amount deal, except for that human Alicia. So, you noticed that, huh? Cage said as she blindly stared in the air, it's fine if you don't want to tell me, 203. There's no problem it's just that. I found her idea appealing, it was more than an inhuman outlook of society. She was not interested in money but just to see the voting end she abstained from voting herself, making the total number of votes odd. Otherwise, I think I could have pushed the game even further. Cage said adding a prediction to her assessment. So, you are saying she is stupid and is not driven by money? No. Cage's eyebrows arched up as her voice turned serious. She continued, I think she might be as greedy as me for money. To the extent that to get her way, she was ready to hand over to us this. It's scary, when we can see and control others by knowing what they want and fear, but for her. I could not tell her motivation as if she had already anticipated what I was going to do next. And still, you are going to go toe to toe against her in the morning. You bet I am, just think about how it is possible that she might have knowingly given us this huge sum because she wants us to pursue her, I can't let this golden chance go off, I am sure she has the dimensional storage skill, that means there's more, where this came from. Cage flipped her coin high in the sky as her heads landed in front of her upper knuckle with detailed calves which she never saw until now, I thought you hated humans, so why are you trying to get close to her? I am worried, haven't we already earned enough for now so why do you want to take the risk? Maya said with a bit of embarrassment as it was the first time she saw Cage taking an interest in a human for the second time. The first time she trusted a human she was betrayed and she did not want it to let that happen ever again. Is that jealousy I smell Maya? Cage asked with a wondrous smile on her face. Ah, don't make me follow up in your conversation too. Maya realized Cage intended to let her true feelings out from the start. She might not have been as quick-witted as her or to make strong decision on spot whether they were right or wrong, but she was learning her way to follow Cage's instruction and just through looking at each other's faces. It was the trust and confidence they had in themselves to get the message across. 204. Maya. Cage called out as she put her golden coin in her side pocket attached to her belt. Holding Maya's head in her hands catching her off guard, Cage pushed it against her own forehead and closed her eyes. It was something that Cage occasionally liked doing to Maya but she never understood why but it always made her realize that in this whole world if Cage ever trusted someone it was her and she ought to look after Cage and keep the trust and promise she had in her, don't worry, we are one and together and we will always will be, you and I have a dream now, Cage said as she puts her head together with Maya, Maya truly felt at peace with this and realized that how weak Cage could be sometimes when her promise was the only thing that kept her going or might have been the only thing that kept her alive, her sole motive to live. Now, let's pay all of our debts and free every child in the orphanage from becoming a slave, and also get food for everyone. The kids will really be happy. Cage said as she separated. Yeah. 
Maya replied cheerfully as she lovingly looked at Cage's smiling face which she wanted to cherish forever. The orphanage was as usual running low on funds and with huge debts that piled up to fill the tummies of little children, the collateral was tying a slave collar to every child in the orphanage. When they became adults that was around the same age as Maya, they would have to be sold off to slave traders as per the loan contract. If it remained due over the span of next years, this was a great way for slave traders to hog slaves for free, and at a less price by charging a huge rate of interests over the loaned money, making it almost impossible to pay the sum in the first place. The only reason Maya was free from these chains of slavery, was because her slave contract was bought and nullified by Cage and now it was Maya's dream to free everyone at the orphanage. While Cage wanted to become rich, she needed help of Maya. Together with Maya's strength and Cage's brilliant mind they knew they could raise mountains of gold with enough time and today they knew it was exactly one of those days. They really hit a mountain of gold. 205 as they were about to reach a late-night hotel that served dishes at for people at a discounted price with those tickets, Maya became nervous. She held on to Cage's hand tightly and stood as a shield in front of her. Cage in turn understood they were surrounded and was on guard. Maya who took the front grunted and sneered at the shadows in the dead of the night. Four people from the darkness came out from hidden spaces of the nearby neighborhood buildings. Oh, it's just you. Cage said frolicking as she got close to one of the people, the boss has called, he wants to talk. The man said with a broken speech showing lack of education. What are you talking about, haven't we already cut ties with you all? Cage said as she tried to went past one of the person dressed in a pair of old shirt and loose pants covered in dust, their savage faces showing clear lack of civility in them. Swish. A sword suddenly appeared in front of Cage as she stopped in her feet. Carefully but surely, she was understanding the implication of what was about to come, but she still needed to keep faces and her cool if she wanted to get through people. Why the sword? Don't forget we were once companions. Cage said without fretting over, but a hint of disgust clearly visible in her voice even then. The new boss rules are absolute. If he wants you there, you will be there. No questions asked. The man repeated like a robot, as the hoodlum completed his statement the other four closed in on Maya and Cage. Cage. Maya called out to her without transforming with a specific GRR sound in her voice. It was a signal that they were surrounded. Of course four men won't be a problem for Maya in her transformed state, and she could have easily slit their joints and escape while carrying Cage. 206 but only if there were people on land, because Maya could smell more than ten people already watching them intently with evil leaking out, they were all around them, some equipped with crossbows on top of the buildings and some prepared with magic spells ready to be launched from safe distance, it was clear to Cage that the person who sent them urgently wanting to meet them not only knew of their strength but also the way to tackle them. Cage exactly knew who she was up against and not wanting to mess around with him she surrendered unbeknownst. Fine. We are coming with you. You are no ordinary brats for the boss wanting to meet you so eagerly. It's good and bad because we were itching for a fight and get our hands on some fresh girls. The bandit retorted to Cage's approval and she stared at him with a disgusted look, but she also knew that until the so-called boss would have ordered them, they wouldn't even lay a hand on the two. As long as he was the same person Cage once knew. That is, the boss they were all talking about was none other than the Dalton brothers, just like Cage and the Myers pair up. The older brother was a fox but lacked strength, while the younger brother was a lion and fighter among fighters. Alone they were vagabonds who made a name for themselves after killing a large group of bandits and took over their territory. At first Cage and Maya came up with a plan to collude with these Dalton brothers, because at that time, this group of bandits aimed at stealing and pillaging from the rich and after taking their fill they distributed the rest in the slum. But soon the group started becoming big and a day came when they turned into a vicious group of killers and they made their name known as Savage Highway Murders. From their cage and Maya cut all ties with them, and since the Dalton brothers had profited a lot through Cage's clever mind they provided her with free movement in their territory. 
but now Cage could already see that trust crumbling and she needed to come up with something even if it meant offering the crown gold coin. She would happily do it in order to keep Maya safe. 207. Cage and Maya followed the men to their new hideout in the mountains. Cage was unaware of this place and found it suspicious that it was built around a permanent ancient stronghold. By what she knew about Dalton brothers, they liked to easily move around in forests and were nomadic people. Making a permanent hideout would make them easy to spot unless that would mean they needed to fortify their hiding spot to hide something inside it. Cage thought to herself as she saw everyone on guard with new heavy weapons and some even had magical weapons that would have been otherwise impossible for bandits in the boonies to get their hands on. Cage couldn't even fathom what kind of changes the bandit group went through after she left. Finally the boss showed up, the younger Dalton brother surrounded by several of his me walked in front. This was a new surprise for Cage and Maya. Cage's A's were more focused on searching for the bigger Dalton brother from whom she actually needed to beware of all people. The younger Dalton brother had a strong build, counted among the most fierce warrior as a short-range fire fist type magic user. A single blow from his punch could have knocked out a small battalion of knights from the ground. According to Cage's calculation if they had a chance against him, it would be only through Maya's superior agility as a demi-human, but even then, the young adult and brother had much combat experience and Cage would only serve as a deadweight. Fight in such a closed space would only have spelled their doom. Haven't we already decided to go our separate ways? So why call us here now? Cage said while making it look like she was throwing a kid's tantrum. Speak carefully in front of the boss. Or do you want me to thrash and toss you in the fire? One of the right-hand man of the younger boss threatened Cage as she casually spoke to the younger brother. The boss raised a hand and everyone murmuring about butchering Cage and Maya turned silent. 208. It doesn't matter whether you are on your own, but if you are in my territory, you will do what I say. Up till now my brother had always treated you too specially for your use and services. But recently we have seen you misusing that little liberty we offered you and you took it for granted. The younger brother spit on the firewood which burned as the only light source that lit the inside courtyard of the hideout. Magic enforced into it. The flames blazed and went berserk. Having the potential to burn the whole place if not kept under check. What do you mean? I would never think of trying to cheat you too. Cage said making a pleasing face as her eyes sparkled, making her look innocent regardless of all the things she was being held accountable for and guilty. Maya always remained close to Cage just in case there was a problem in negotiation. She exactly understood her role and also knew how important it was to have leverage during a discussion both in power and information. From behind the boss, a shadow appeared which Cage and Maya could have recognized anywhere by now. It was that new face which only gave them a hard time and now he was here to backstab them on the back. Cage for once would have never thought of a merchant colluding with a bandit. These are the girls who were trying to help merchants to guide them safely to the town in return for extorting money from them. The merchant said with a sly smile as he looked at the detestable and hateful expression on both Myers and Cage's face as they were alerted by now. Cage could see that the boss now already knew what she had been doing at his back. If it's about that, then I was in a way trying to help the Dalton brothers. Explain yourself. The boss's thick eyebrows arched as he asked, his canned had an air which would never tolerate defiance from anyone, here's the money which I was going to give you anyway, just think about it if all the merchants coming to this town were either looted or killed then they would stop coming. In an extreme case knights would march straight to this forest, but by ensuring the survival of small fly merchants and pruning 209, the wealthier ones, we can ensure that they keep coming. Cage sounded confident with her explanation, it didn't matter whether she made that stuff on spot or toyed with its credibility, as long as the other party was satisfied by her argument she wins. It was a tactic that would have always got her out of the most precarious situation. Hey filthy swine, how dare you call me a little fly, I will let you know I have been promised two crown golds for delivering this information. The merchant said erupting in joy. Cage understood the meaning of that delighted expression on his face and cursed him. The merchant had still more to say. It would seem that we have a wealthy pair in this town who can throw gold coins around. 
they might be aristocrats with the way they carry themselves. Wouldn't the boss of such a giant bandit group would be interested in this kind of information? The merchant rubbed his hands as if they were itching for more. That would be enough from you. The boss harshly looked at the merchant and his greediness. Don't make things up which you haven't seen. Cage tried forming a protective statement to protect her two guests. If you think you are the only smart one here, then you should think again. That would be for me to decide. You can go now. The boss looked at the merchant with a dreadful look and turned around, and my two crown gold coins. The merchant asked absent-mindedly, hand it over. The boss said to Cage and Maya. The merchant was happy to hear his deal was in progress, we have nothing like that. Cage replied with some reservations, I wouldn't be so placid or say otherwise, when you see this. The boss's eyes exuding a cold malice that caught Cage's attention. 210. The boss smirked and on a wooden cart that once used to be a fine ride now reduced to a wreckage was being pushed in by one of the bandits. The most notable part was the blood splattered all around the wooden planks and on top rested a person. He did not move, the body looked old and pale, except for few drops of blood that flowed from the wound in his chest and trickled from his palm. He was cold and dead, not because of the old age but a huge Sikh sword was pierced right through his chest. What have you done, you bastards? Maya cried out as she saw the same old man who so generously gave them a ride back to this village and was an honest member in the group with an equal profit share in the way they did things. She drew out her knives from her leg pockets in defense and transformed into her beast form. Maya let out a battle cry and charged ahead at full speed. Stop her now. The bandits yelled as they rushed to stop Maya getting close to the cart or the boss and like a shadow weaving in through the darkness of the grave walls of the building, Maya closed in on the wrecked carriage, the bandits collected in a round formation in hopes of attacking Maya at once, but to their surprise, Maya leapt so high and reached the backs of the bandit, Wow! everyone present was struck dumbfounded, the black shadow skillfully stepped from left to right, and moving at an unbelievable speed difficult for a normal eye to perceive, thrusting her knives, she dislodged the tip of her knives repeatedly into one of the bandits' hand and left him immobile. The nearby bandits went to attack in a fluster, but sure enough, they were nothing more than an annoying obstacle to Maya. The black shadow of Maya's small body continued to weave in and out through the bandits' defense and when she left like a gale several small cuts on the bandits' body dripped with a continuous stream of blood. They slumped to the ground as Maya so efficiently left small cleavages at the most important joints in their arms and legs. 211. W. What physical ability? The bandits in the area swallowed their breaths in fearful or as some of them started preparing magical attacks from far. Maya who could smell magic particles, circulation in her beast form, easily sidestepped and dodged the magical formation attacks that left devastating burn marks on the ground. There's no way the likes of an animal could overpower. What? The merchant who out of fear started screaming. His mouth fell open in shock as he witnessed what was unfolding before him. Maya without missing up even the slightest chance to reach the carriage kept on running towards it. In this charge of her she had easily rendered ten bandits to ground and dodged several of their attacks. Finally she reached the carriage with only one hope that the old man could have been still alive. It was his carriage and him sleeping in it should not be something new. Seeing the dead body cage went numb. Her face became expressionless as she remembered the old man's wishes of living a happy life with his granddaughter in the countryside far away from this kind of brutality and violence, but now he was a victim to it himself. Cage couldn't bring herself to move. Maya who by now had lost all control, defeating most of the bandits and knocking them down reached the old man in hopes of finding him alive but he was already dead and Maya broke down. Flashing her knives she went to attack the boss without thinking twice as the merchant tried to run away. Maya came closer to the boss and jabbed at him quickly, but in that moment the boss instinctively took out the Sikh's sword form the dead body without any reservation of the fountain of red that gushed out at the same time. The boss entangled the tip of Maya's knife thrust and parried it off cleanly with a single slash. Maya who hadn't given up yet maneuvering herself mid-air, kicking on the ground a second time turned to land another strike with her second knife, 
while the boss's sword was hanging back because of the recoil. 212. Move you ugly beast. Out of nowhere a strong kick caved in as it dissembled Myers in a structure and she groaned in pain flying and falling far away crashing into a tree. Wah! Maya barely able to stand fiercely looked at the merchant and the boss. A threatening voice called out to her. Think before what you do next, beast girl. A familiar voice rang through Maya's ears. She looked back and found the old adult and brother with a huge scar on his face continuing down to the chest which wasn't there before. But more importantly Maya noticed that Cage was in his custody as he held a short knife at her neck. Cage's arm might have been pinned to her back and so would be unable to move. You move and she dies. The person who had taken Cage's custody threatened Maya. On just listening that Maya put back her knives predictably. Cage run away. Maya called out as she looked around for escape routes. Alone she might have been able to, but with Cage in his custody, she wouldn't have left. Despite the chaos Cage remained silent, and when Maya looked at her face she had a heartbroken expression and she exactly knew why. It was because someone got killed because of their light half-heartedness and weakness. So, they really do have crown golds in cities. I would have never believed this merchant if I wouldn't had been seeing them now. The boss slashed through the air for the second time and the blood it was enwrapped in now completely littered the ground. His muscular features around his arm and muscles not to forget in a menacing way he kicked Maya out of his way easily despite her beast transformation. His strength reflecting his years of training and living under unfavorable condition and impulses of killing. Ha! Huh. Now you know who is the leader of this place. The Dalton brothers would smell out and kill every swines like you. And here I thought I could use you as a guard or sell you off to a slave trader when you had served your 213 purpose. Beasts like you are better living inside forest and not in civilized houses like ours. The merchant was highly prejudiced towards demi-humans and his statement brought hatred not only from Maya but also the demi-humans who were recruited in the group of bandits. He decided to stay shut, rather than torn to shreds. It was not difficult to find people like him around the city at the same time. G-E-R-R-R-R. Maya still slumped to the ground scrambled to stand at her place as she directed her bloodlust towards the merchant. You would like to know how the old man died. He kept on telling that he won't reveal anything until I had to torture and threaten to disclose his granddaughter's location in the previous town to these bandits where I booked his carriage. And now he couldn't keep his mouth shut and every time kept blaming himself and asking for forgiveness from you two. What a waste. But now I will make his wish fulfilled when you two will be killed and he could ask forgiveness directly from you two. You hound. Maya screamed at the merchant as he wryly smiled. So. Can I take my share now? The merchant said, extending a pompous hand to receive the golden coins he dirtied his hands for. As the boss was about to hand out the two coins, he took one from Cage and the cart driver. His hands paused in between. How about I keep this in exchange for sparing your life when we first met, and you can leave your item as to show your gratitude to us and leave with your life intact. The boss of the bandits laughed and now the joke was on him. What? You wouldn't. I will. Swish dot dot gag. Another sword movement and the Sikhs passed through the intestines of the merchant as he fell on his knees. Blood spilled from his mouth and the light in his green jaded eyes vanished. 214. I can't trust sly merchants like you who would betray us next by revealing our location to those honorable troublesome knights. The boss said holding the dead man's head in his strong huge hands that spanned through his entire skull. Pulling out the sword, it left another dirty pool of blood on the damp and ground. A second life was gone today and it still brought a heavy feeling to Maya and Cage's little hearts for watching such gruesome killing in front of them at such a young tender age. Cage eyes drooped lower as she slowly fainted and lost consciousness in the tight grip of the elder Dalton brother's grapple. Leave Cage. I have already put my weapons away. Everyone watching started laughing on seeing Maya's naivety for letting her guard down. Maya on the other hand it honestly demanded of her friends releasing. If you want her back, then bring either the two Richies here or a total of 20,000 crown gold coins by tomorrow and then take her with you. The boss said as he beckoned to his men to bury the two dead bodies like it was an everyday errand for them. 
the holes on the ground already prepared to be filled before actually having a dead body, that's an absurd amount, we would never be able to pay you for our entire life. That's the loss you have incurred on us and the debts you owe for the orphanage you belong, if you are not going to pay, I suppose I will just have to sell you off to a rich slave trader we recently made contact with who is in search of young specimen like you. The boss declared as he walked away, Maya looked and finding Cage strangled to a state of unconscious and being dragged away from her, she was now left alone there, her friend and truest companion was not by her side and she had no clue as to what to do. Initially a thought raced through her mind as she tried to wake up, the pain still dormant inside her body it made it difficult for her to move. She might have suffered from an internal bleeding in the worst possible case. But now she was most worried about Cage and the orphanage and her promise to Cage and their dream. 215 She ran back to the town in her beast form, irrespective whether she was able to catch a breath in between or not. She reached Cage's place, her lungs as if about to burst, she cared not. Usually she would spend days with her in the orphanage but Cage herself used to live in a small hut-like house which also served as their planning base. Opening the wooden door with a spare key she had on her and rolling over the half mat on the ground and when dug a bit deeper into the ground. With Maya's exceptional strength it was done within a gap of few minutes and a small safe was excavated from it. With a special combination performing over the lock she opened the safe and several gold and silver coins fell on the floor. It was the emergency money which the two had been collecting from when they formed a team and from their first job. For once it always seemed to be a dreamlike amount but with a new price on their names. This was just meager change as she threw away the box after emptying it in frustration. With all that money on the ground at most it would account to a one and half crown gold. Tears leaked out from the side of Maya's A's realizing how helpless she felt without Cage, but this was one of the times when she needed to keep the trust in her and do something for her like she once did by saving her from slavery. She remembered the plan that Cage concocted for the tomorrow's tour of the new pair they recently helped. If she was able to get hold of them, then she might be able to free Cage. She knew Cage would never approve of such a plan where using others solely for personal benefit and not for their dream was a taboo she shouldn't be breaking. But Maya had already made up her mind as she realized the sun was about to come out and the morning which might decide their fate could soon pass by, to save their lives and the children at the orphanage she was ready to do everything in that limited time frame. 216. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne after yesterday's nightly trip on the cart and being escorted to a nice hotel. Both I and Regis found ourselves relieved from the hassle of touring through the whole town to find a place for us to stay after we were too tired and that too in the middle of the night. Regis slept beside me like a baby through the night as we shared the same room and bed, like we did back in the Elven Palace. The only difference was that the bed and room was smaller in size to a princess's room though on the contrary Regis was excited after she took a bath and slept close to me. Fortunately the hotel had a bathtub which otherwise would have been difficult to find. We were glad that Cage so generously showed us the way to such a fine inn. The morning hit us early but we needed to make arrangement for our recurring to the port city from this plum town. It appeared to be an unusually peaceful place at night but something gloomy about it was extant in the air and the de facto of the people was never to speak about it. First, we needed to get to the place that provided traveling services and book ourselves a seat in one of the carts heading to our destination, and the next thing on our list was to get us some food. I and Regis headed out in search for the places and complete our two objectives for the day. Outside the hotel, we unexpectedly encountered a familiar face waiting outside leaning on the front wall of a dilapidated building. You both are early risers. I expected you two to take longer than this. It was Maya, the demi-human. Maya why are you here? Regis asked as Maya started approaching us and before she could give some time for her to explain herself for tailing us in the morning. Isn't it given? I am here to help. You want to find a traveling cart to the port, don't you? So. Why look anywhere else? Maya said with confidence as 217, she pointed at herself. In truth she was offering us to help and give us a tour of the town. I see. 
Regis said with hesitation but she let go of the suspicion inside her already. With yesterday's incidents anyone could have considered that Maya could be here to swindle us this time after targeting the merchant. I looked a bit around and couldn't help but ask, where is Cage? Aren't you two supposed to be together? From yesterday's events I could conclude one thing unchanging and that was the friendship or the deep bond of trust between Maya and Cage. I thought they would be always joined by Hip the way they acted and moved together. She is currently busy with some prior engagement. Otherwise she would have been here. Maya shifting her head to the right as if trying to hide her face under her small bangs and spoke in a dull voice. Is there a problem? I asked also making Regis worried at the same time for raising such a question out of nowhere. What? What? Are you talking about? Instead, this whole idea was of Cage and she is the one who planned all of this. Maya voiced herself strongly, so she thinks I cannot tell or just be fooled that easily. I might not be a mind reader or adept at such social skills, but with my mystic eyes and unique skill, I could see the unstable fluctuation in her magic, and these fluctuations are pretty strong in a demi-human's body especially when their beast powers were linked to their feelings. And right now, Maya appeared to be afraid unlike the strong fighting warrior we saw yesterday, who was now trying to suppress and submit herself in doing things which she did not want to. Absence of Cage further supported my point, but because it was their personal life. I saw it fit to not make her force into coming out with her problem or state. Because what if I could not really help and all I could be able to give them was unguarded sympathy. 218. Taking pity on someone instead of helping was always against my beliefs. It was one of the things I despised others for doing so in my previous life. So, Maya why don't you take us to the place you would recommend to anyone? Then follow me. Maya turned around and announced herself as our tour guide. We went through a great number of streets, which were mostly filled with people who looked exceedingly downhearted. Unlike the first time I visited a place the capital city of Elf Empire, this place lacked in all kinds of economic activities. The shops were mostly empty and even the groceries, fruits and vegetables store sold costly ingredients that too stale. It was a far cry from the happy picture I imagined the town to be. That would be 50 silver coins for two seats to the port town of Gilda from this town. The wagon leaves early tomorrow in the morning so be on time you two girls. No room for latecomers because a single minute could cost us our lives on the road. The man laughed who offered us place in his wagon for giving us a ride to the port city of Gilda, though he seemed awfully condescending about the plight of latecomers. Traveling through a cart was a much safer way as we could stay on road and not get distracted on the way as we got stranded from the previous route. Ahem. Possibly I'd avoid getting into the details on the matter, and Regis paid for our tickets because I had only the precious crown gold coins on me. So in monetary terms I was pretty much useless. I needed to learn a way to earn money fast. Where would you like to go next? Maya asked in a hurry as if every minute passing by was slowly chipping of a day from her life. I would really like to eat something. Regis requested for a proper breakfast. I know of a good place that serves pancakes here. Maya said wondering. Regis we must go, right now. I accepted Maya's first suggestion. 219. As far as I remember they make pancakes early if we don't hurry either they will be over or become soggy. Maya added. I don't know I have never eaten pancakes. Regis said to me a bit confused and unable to decide. Perhaps in a new place she might be susceptible to trying new kinds of dishes. You don't understand Regis but the power of pancakes is something not to be trifled with. I don't dare to say but I find Delvin food quite paltry. After all most of their dishes were simple boiled leaf and vegetables with little to no spices. Fine, if you say so I will try. Let's get going. Ah, you truly are my friend for understanding me. I held Regis' hands excitedly as we headed off to our breakfast table. Within few minutes we were sitting on the table waiting for our order. Maya, aren't you going to eat something? I asked seeing that she hasn't ordered anything. I will just take something from the nearby food stall. The food here is expensive but you two should be able to afford it. What if you can join us on pancakes as a thanks for helping us? I proposed. I want dot dot and then I refuse to eat. 
I just know that it's needlessly going to be an extravagant pancake, or, so Cage says, I totally want to try this. Words of Maya kept contradicting themselves as she could not deny the temptation of her powerful nose and she threw the towel in the end. Hehe. <laughs> I smirked, knowing that I just needed to give a little small push to her to have my way. No, that's wrong. I mean, I don't want to eat. I just know it is one of those delicious food that never actually makes you full. I can't fight this sudden urge, somebody help me, Cage. Maya reaffirmed her decision and fell into a self-constrained fight zone. At the same time having a clash of urges and fought the raging storm of desire in her belly. 220. I could more or less relate to her since I too was usually caught in such insecurities when I had way too less money to spend even on my daily necessities items. I actually felt bad for putting her in such a tight spot. So, what if you can order as many plates as you want? That would be fine Regis? Yeah. I think we can easily afford another person's meal easily. Regis too was thankful for Maya's help as we too were new in the town and wanted to do something for her in return. Regis was too under the spell of the irrefutable sweetness pancake. But, Maya still held some apprehension. What if she got addicted to this soft looking sweet dish and couldn't live without it? As I had said before the power of pancakes are not something to be trifled with. Maya if you want to brainstorm ideas to earn more you would need carbohydrates. I advised Maya. Ah, that makes sense. I also think that a part of a budget should go in food to ensure we have enough energy for the rest of the day. Regis backed me up though she seemed to be preaching one of Will's military guidance. That totally makes sense. Maya nodded. Gwa, how did this happen? This food is really delicious. I and Kate should next time try this too saying that Maya became overwhelmed as she took a larger bite from her ninth plate of pancake. Her eyes sparkled as she enjoyed every mouthful of it. Why do I feel like I have been tricked into spending more? Regis complained as she held her light money bag. Is this just another one of this human girl's schemes to best me which Cage was talking about? To get me addicted to this fancy food and get back at us for what we did yesterday. Am I really that gullible? But these pancakes are really tasty. I think I can go for 20 more plates. Maya thought to herself. 221. Don't worry I still have got my purse. I tried to add up our resources to make the journey comfortable. Don't even start talking about that. It can get us in a lot of trouble. Are you really thinking about this at all or you just don't have any sense at all? Are you trying to say something good about me Regis? I asked excitedly. Ah. As a friend I think it's my moral obligation to never admit that my friend is kind of useless when it comes to defining common sense. Regis chewed on her pancakes as she took a larger bite. Is that what you were trying to say? Somehow, I felt sad when Regis said this because I was trying my best to not let myself be scared or distant from people this time but face everything head on. No. Regis stared at my depressed face trying to change the topic at the same time, oh look at that adorable strawberry on my spoon and the last time I checked you liked them, here, Alicia take a bite, chomp, chomp, I think I can let it forego this time, you two are kind of weird, Maya said comparing her friendship with Cage with ours, listen I'm not weird she is, you get that, just listen closely if you get close to Alicia, she will work her wiles and trap you in some crazy situation. And the instant I let myself get sucked into her world, my own world is turned upside down. Regis exclaimed pointing her spoon at Maya. Maybe she did not like someone calling us weird. That really reminds me of someone I am so close to. Maya chuckled as she fell ghastly silent at the same time, remembering something on spot of how she needed to collect 25,000 crown gold to save Cage and all the kids at orphanage. Maya put down her spoon on the table and in a voice not of her usual cheerful self she asked, Do you want to look around the town more? 222. We finished our meal and so Maya took us for the second round around the town. However there were not many things to see here except for the town square that was a bit busy with transporting goods to different cities. In between I and Regis would try something new to eat but nothing special caught our attention. Buildings that needed renovations, and lack of civic amenities, 
There was no town hall for people to issue complaints, but rather the whole place was jam-packed with lot of dark small alleys that lead us all to what the grumpy merchant referred to as slums. Can you two just wait here for a moment? I will be back in a few minutes. Maya too brought us to one such alleyway where even under the brightest sun apparently no light reached the ground. Alicia should we really be waiting here? Maybe Maya just didn't want us to keep us standing under the sun or leave us alone in a foreign place. I did not doubt Maya's intention in the least as I saw her heading into the slums, if you say so and is just being considerate of us. Orphanage sister, I am back. Maya called out from the gates of orphanage just across the streets in the slum and at the end of the road. There was a huge plot of land that no one wanted because of its infertility, and so it was finally given to a group of church sisters who wanted to look after the children in this town and established a small orphanage. They might have been the very few who cared about homeless children in the town, who until then were previously kidnapped, sold to slave traders or put to forced labor in secret illegal mines. This town was unforgiving to anyone who had money and specially to those who did not. 223. Stealing from the rich and poor was considered the same thing. What separated the have and have nots here was not something tangible as money which could be as worthless as alloys and paper in face of superficiality like absolute power, but the difference was laid down on the basis of fear. The one who ruled on others' fears stood at the top while the rest fell to the bottom thinking as long as they were serving the strong their well-being would be guaranteed. Maya too was once a part of such a broken system, but then her fate changed when she met Cage. Cage was a fearless girl ready to put up a fight against anyone who tried to control her or snatch away anything she thought that should have belonged to her, including her own freedom. Her dream was something as simple and short whenever she said, I am going to make the world my own territory someday. And Maya like a fool followed her in that very dream and her footsteps doing everything we could to bring us one step closer to our dream. Maya, where have you been all the night? All the other sisters were worried for you. A woman came running outside, her hands trembling as she opened the gate for me which usually was left open. Where are the other kids in the orphanage? Maya asked, as she could not find anyone outside playing which they enjoyed doing the most at this hour. All the kids. They were taken away? Do you know something what could have happened? Some men in the morning showed up and snatched them all. The sister put her hands on Maya whose eyes widened in shock, her ears bent lower, as her breath became heavy, her throat parched. She could not believe what she was hearing but could not deny the facts at the same time. Because now she knew, that every kid in the orphanage was taken as hostage or for whatever reason by the Dalton gang. Was it because I was too late, in paying off the amount? but I have still got some time left until the sun is down. Did I hurry up with the plans and made wrong decision with Cage? No, Cage can never be wrong. It's all there. 224. Fault of those bandits. They lied to me about the children's safety. From the start they had already wanted to kidnap them. Maya concluded as eating the pancakes and having a hearty breakfast paid off. That's why they separated me and Cage. A final realization struck Maya, the Dalton brothers knew alone, Maya wouldn't be able to do anything. But for what reason they could kidnap the children of orphanage, Maya did not know. The only bargaining chip Maya had left was to offer them 25,000 crown gold coins. And the rest she still hadn't been able to figure out their true intentions. There's no choice. I have to absolutely do this, even if Cage would come to hate me for not following our rules. Maya said to herself as she checked the sharpness of her blades hidden under her legs tight clothing, Maya, you shouldn't be doing this on your own, stay here. I know we can't do much, but we sisters have been trying to raise money to keep you all safe. Just getting us through by a day is hard enough. If you try to do something dangerous now, I don't know what will I do without you kids being here. The sister caressed my cheeks and I felt homesick. I have been on so many travels with Cage. That I had forgotten about all of this. Maya was overpowered by her own conflicting emotions, but she had to decide for one. Maya was petrified, seeing her guardian heartbroken. Sisters at the orphanage had always worked themselves hard to the bone, taking all kinds of odd jobs they would to bring the most meager food. 
but even a small bite miraculously filled their bellies as long as the sisters fed it to them with their own hands. Maya and Cage never really wanted any one of them to get hurt, they were a family and no matter what I am going to save them. Maya held sister's hands tightly and gently brushing them off from my cheeks, she smiled and reassured her. 225, don't worry, the kids would return safe and I am going to bring them back before the sister could speak any further or resist Maya from pushing her away. Maya transformed into her beast form and escaping from her grasp. She vanished in thin air, jumping high in the sky and reaching the rooftop of the topmost building there. 226. Dark Alley Alicia should we be heading back to our room? I don't feel safe here. Isn't it mysterious we are alone here and yet it feels like we are being watched from everywhere continuously. Alicia promulgated her thoughts to Regis. She had always read in novels of such places being danger red spots, mafia drug dealings, the thrilling chase in which a detective catches a murderer or planning of a growing revolution and revolt of anarchists. All of them begins and originates from such dark alleyways. Glorious histories and so many possibilities stemming from just one singular place. Did you really need it to spell that out aloud? Regis said as she was set off by her words and took a few steps back in fear and trepidation. Even Alicia could feel the air becoming heavy and in the next movement something like a red lightning drowning in an aura of energetic magic particles dropped from the top of the building at the same spot where Regis stood, as the wind cleared the consequent dust smoke. Maya stood there in her frantic beast transformed body. To be exact it was something even more ferocious than her previous transformations which Alicia and Regis had seen. Her nails grew up like iron claws, her hairs perked up as if charged with electricity and her movements too would have been described nothing less than that, but most important of all the two were left wondering as to why Maya held a knife to Regis's throat, and made her immobile by stretching her hand at the back. What are you doing Maya? Is this some kind of a joke? Regis asked in an uncomfortable manner while Alicia stared at the incogitable scene unfolding in front of her. Alicia felt detached for all the times she had spent with Maya and her feelings for her were left empty, suddenly dropping to nothing. 227. This incomprehensible change was occurring inside Alicia for the first time, but seeing someone attack Regis like this even as a joke, and by the time Alicia thought she should ask Maya for an explanation, it did not matter to her anymore because what Maya had done was simply unforgivable in Alicia's eyes. Maya jumping from the rooftop to another had appeared above the shadows of the two persons she had left in waiting, she planned to attack Regis from back because she had a bow on her previously and according to Cage's information she could be dangerous with that, as for the human girl, despite Maya's beast transformation she could not sense any magic or deduce combative strength from her fragile looking body, hence the best way would be to first hold Regis capture and threaten Alicia into making her hand over the money as she also appeared to be the owner, Maya perfectly executed the plan, while the two had their guard down, I am sorry, but there's no time to explain, I want you to hand over all the money you have, to me right now, Maya shouted angrily, trying to cover her own hesitation and guilt which seeped in through her words. Because Maya's demands all sounded more of a request than an actual threat. Is that what you want? Then you should have just simply asked. An icy cold voice leaked from Alicia's mouth. Ha! Huh. Maya was left astounded as to how Alicia was calm despite her threat but listening to her unhuman voice. She was frightened herself. The grip on her knife tightened almost instinctively out of fear of those reverberating words in her ears, and just before the blade would have touched Regis's skin for real and draw out a drop of blood. It almost happened instantly. All wrapped up in a blink of an eye, Maya's senses dulled, and eyes blanked. The earth under her feet vanished at the same time. 228. The next moment she knew she was being crushed to the ground under an invisible force, her backbone left with a splitting pain and her legs and hands were heavy as if turned into stone. Regis had vanished from her grip, and Maya was spooked to smell the scent of the place, confirming she was not in the alleyway anymore. But how is this even possible? When exactly? Maya shuddered at the thought. Alicia where are we? Regis said in shock as she had already forgotten that a moment ago. She was attacked by Maya, 
who was but now pinned to the ground by Alicia's magic. Well, this is the place where I actually keep all my money. Alicia said felicitously. Huh, I might be just dreaming. Probably I will wake up back in the hotel. Regis giggled pretending to now sleepwalk around. Simply, because what she was seeing around herself was that unimaginable or out of the world. Gwa -gwa. A roar suddenly woke Regis from her dreamland as the person surrendered on ground tried to resist the heavy force, but it was all in vain against Alicia's advanced gravitational magic and Alicia was holding herself back by not crushing Maya's bones, she could not even move a limb, rather the gravity in Maya's vicinity was so strong that the blood in her veins stopped flowing and she was forced to return back to her normal state. Regis, who still could not believe her eyes walking around the huge dark room but the luminescence illuminating it at the same time was eye blinding. The yellow fiery blaze form all the shining large gold coins had riled her to the state of being called gold sick. Maya look up. 229. Maya heard the same chilling voice that set her adrift and panicked. No matter how much she tried she couldn't move, but Alicia's words were commanding enough that Maya was enforced to look up. No matter how much Maya stared at the human girl in the white figure, she could not feel any strength radiating from her which should have been otherwise easily possible for her to size up anyone's strength with her beast's senses. It was one of Maya's strength to know when to put up a fight and when to fight with an escape, but all her experiences had failed her right now and the domineering presence from Alicia had left her stumped and in a miserable state. She was slowly being crushed under the own heaviness of her body. A little more and either her blood vessels could have burst open or she would have fainted. Maya moved her head and she was shocked even further, to the extent that with the gravitation magic now lifted up from her, she was frozen at the spot. She was in a new black room, she never recognized as the denizen of Plum Town. There was not a place in existence in the town that she wouldn't have known, but this place was foreign to her and even more so was the characteristic shine of the dazzling large gold coins that filled the room. Even the greatest pirate's lost treasure on an island would pale in comparison to the infinite number of gold coins that showered here. At first one could define the place to be a perfect black square room with no doors. The point of entry was the first mystery to begin with, as Alicia and the royal demon family were the only one who had access to this particular space which was embedded inside the royal demon's family crest which Alicia had on the back of her palm hidden under the glove, she wore on top of it, but the purpose of the mystery and this huge space was clear at a glance, to store and keep safe the impossible amount of valuable gold coins of highest rank, 230. The amount of gold coins here was vast beyond imagining. The only word for the sight was Marvel. Regis and Maya both at first tried to evaluate how much gold coin would have been present in the place with their sharp and sensitive eyes, but in the next instant they despaired as they couldn't surmise the actual number. There was fear and weariness in Maya's eyes because she could have only ever dreamt of discovering an amphora filled of gold coins under her bed but never chanced upon such a mighty treasure trove of gold. You can take one thing from here that you think you really want. As Alicia spoke to Maya, she was smiling faintly, it was the continuation of what she'd really wanted to say, the talk that had failed just a while ago when Maya used Regis as a bargain, but instead, she was offered this wealth and everything in front of her for free, can I really take anything? Maya was astounded by Alicia's outrageous offer but she did not have time to fiddle around with motives and reasons. All she needed was a confirmation and she knew she could have bought back the freedom of Cage and the kids at the orphanage with this money. More so she could have lived the life of a king if she had this amount at her hand. Both her and Cage's dream would have finally come true if only she had this. Are you some kind of royalty to have this much money with you? Maya asked impertinently. Not me, but Regis is. Alicia directed her eyes at Regis who with her open eyes still walked like a blindfolded person in the room of gold. Really? Maya could not tell it was a lie or not by seeing Regis in a hypnotized state and gold sick. Then I will be taking 25,000 crown gold. Please. Maya wanted no less, no more. She really had no greed, or the luxury of dwelling in it when Cage's life was at stake and she didn't know how long it had been or how long will it take for her to reach the hideout. 231. Is that all you needed? Huh. 
Alicia seemed disappointed even with the things she offered for Maya to have, but she instead of questioning her intention twisted her fingers round and small pocket bag appeared in front of her which she had instantly made using her magic and, equivalent exchange, skill. Next using her telekinetic skill, Alicia formed a vortex of exact 25 gold coins and shoved it inside the bag which too came with an extra dimensional storage for making it easy for Maya to carry the money round. Wow! The bag flew in the air and reached and fell into Maya's hand who watched at the valuable item with a gasp. I promise I will pay you back all the money when I return. Maya said as she couldn't be more grateful. She didn't know how she would pay back this debt of her. Whether it meant that she would have to sell herself and force herself to labor all day she wanted to pay Alicia back for her generosity. Even if it meant she would have to give up on her dream and work under Alicia like a salve if she enforced it on her in exchange of the gold. There's no need to hurry, you can pay me back any time you want. Alicia said softly as the view of the black room vanished like it was some kind of hallucination but the bag still remained in Maya's hands. They found themselves back in that alleyway. Giving a final look at Alicia's expressionless face under the mask she really couldn't know what Alicia was thinking. She wondered whether Cage would have been able to tell about it or not, either. Maya took off at full speed without looking back, after a few seconds had passed. Alicia obscurely stared at the dusty air which blew around, when she unknowingly blurted out her thoughts, Regis do you think money can buy someone's freedom or friendship, if it was possible I would have done it a long time ago. Alicia still remembered of how she was always bullied at school for pocket money, and no matter how much money she was asked to bring by the three delinquents they would always end up asking for more, the cycle never, 232 ended as long as they wanted money, Saki was chained to do so. Her freedom snatched away. She had no other option, because she did not want it to make her own life difficult furthermore, but right now, she was free and could live her life in a way she saw fit, all thanks to people she had met. She has always learned more and more to express herself. Alicia I really did not understood why she had to do this. Regis, who had bubbled out from her mirage was now anxious about the whole event. Cage do you remember seeing the merchant in the town anywhere with his shop? Not at all. Even within the town you must have noticed how low was the number of young kids. That's true most of them were either adults, children were sparse almost none at all, but what are you getting at? Alicia put up a search magic around the whole town and made sure that her assertions were right, and so did Al confirmed them for her. There were no traces of the merchant in the town despite his yesterday's peevishness. Then Alicia also checked the demography of the town by comparing the age and strength of their sole cause and found the inference matching. Even the orphanage was empty in the direction in which Maya went. Alicia's inquisitive mind, could only pinpoint it to the bandits which Cage and Maya were helping the other merchants to avoid them. Regis I think I forgot to tell Maya the debt plan of how she can actually pay me back in installments. Is that really necessary? Didn't you say she can pay any time? Yes that was until a moment ago, but now her life is in danger. What are you saying? How can you know that and should we really be getting into this mess after we have helped her out a lot already? We do have. 233, to catch tomorrow's cut, don't forget this journey is for your sake. Regis stood against my decision, just think about it Regis if she was to die before she pays me back she would be in my eternal debt. So until I save her, I don't want her soul coming to scare me off. Alicia alleged, is that how it really works? Regis who didn't knew much about debts became shaky. At least that's what the granny at the confectionery in my neighborhood said to me. I am not sure but since you are with me, I think you are not safe either. Her ghost could even come to haunt you. Something still seems wrong about that, but I am scared now. Regis seemed to be really scared of ghosts and staying alone at nights. It was obvious with how she would snuck into Alicia's bedsheet in the middle of their sleep. So, do you want to get haunted by an indebted ghost? Alicia asked in an ominous manner. I don't want to get haunted by a ghost. Regis replied exhaustively exactly repeating after Alicia. Don't worry I will take care of everything and we can still catch up with her even now. So, let's do our best and see that it doesn't really happen. Alicia sounded enthusiastic. 
Thank you Alicia for saving me again, and I am sorry that you have to trouble yourself again because it was so easy for someone to get at my back. Regis, I am thankful to you for saving me. Otherwise, I think if I had been the one who was attacked, there wouldn't have been anyone left to trouble ourselves with. Alicia calm disposition for the first time was unnerving for Regis and her odd way of putting those words, she did not want it to interpret them whatsoever. 234 Regis could rarely understand what Alicia always tried to do, but no matter what she had already decided to believe in her and be together with her on her adventures forever. 235 Chapter 8 Gauged Two jangling chains hanging from the suspended top wall metallic rings gleaming dully on either of the chains, and in between those circular rings was hauled up from the ground two thin arms and an unconscious small delicate body of a young girl, the tip of her toes barely touching the ground bare and only left with enough clothing to keep her private parts under cover. A crude whistle played by a burly man in the background as he fiddled through the belongings of the girl. Holding a small knife and checking on its sharpness, which he found inside a hidden pocket, he held out the tip of his finger and set the blade spinning on it, perfectly horizontal. A dot dot a. A faint voice slipped from the lips of the young girl hanging mercilessly from the chains. Her eyes flickered in the scant light from a fire lantern. She felt cold because of her missing outfit and at the same time her throat was parched. Breathing dry air in, it only brought more pain for her tired body. So, you finally decided to wake up. Your weak human body couldn't even hold for a second, did you really think this knife would have been enough for you to kill me? The man's voice broke the silence of the room, Cage, the identity of the captured girl who could barely do her eyelids apart saw the man approaching her with a blunt knife in his hand. Just his assertive voice was enough to make Cage remember what had happened just before she fell unconscious and recognized the man as the previous chief of the Dalton gang, or rather the elder of the Dalton brothers, 236. After all, you are also a human. I am sure if I put that knife through your neck, you too will bleed out and die. There's no doubt in my mind that weapon will be more than enough for me to kill you. A weak laughter left Cage's pained face as she followed up by putting up a fake smile. Cage's words were hollow and lacking strength. But in no way, it seemed like she was simply joking or playing around with words. So. You hate me that much after what I did. You haven't really changed after these many months have gone by. The elder Dalton brother for a moment sounded as if he had been instead reminiscing, but it was just for a brief moment when that expressionless cold look on his face came back. One could have easily felt their conversation a bit disoriented, but in all truth the two hated every human being from the bottom of their heart. I despise you with every fiber of my being. But you seem to have changed a lot past these months and even got a fresh new tattoo. Those new marks are revolting. Unless, that is when people turn into real savages. They just become simple fashion and a part of them. Cage muttered as her energy was slowly returning to her quickly becoming aware of her surroundings and realizing that she could not really escape without breaking those chains. She felt powerless, not knowing what was going to happen from there on, and the scarier of them all was being alone with the person she was betrayed by and afraid of the most. This facial scar is not simply the fashion those barbarians like to keep but a memento, a genuine part of me. The elder Dalton brother without any reservation accepted Cage's remark. He traces his fingers across the cut mark through his face which went past his back neck and down till the tailbone of his spine, it was deep and the moment he touched them it brought pain. Painful memories. Things that were snatched away from him and lives that were sacrificed for the people who later turned enemies on him. So you say those are your prizes? Cage was confused. She could not really understand what he meant by calling them as such. 237 Not prizes but you can call them a mark of my wicked deeds that I committed. And am about to commit. The voice of his became twisted. His intense gazes steered his eyebrows to center of his forehead. An uncontrolled glee left toppled his sad expression as he let Cage in on his secret that he had been planning past these months. The reason he went to the trouble of obtaining such a huge hideout hidden so deep in the forest. What are you planning to do, tell me? 
Cade shouted impatient as she began to feel helpless without Maya by her side. There rarely was a chance she was ever left lonely, and the days when Maya would spend her night at the orphanage instead of their hideout. Cade would have to sleep alone, or rather she passed those nights emptily staring at the sky. The scant light of the stars in the sky was always far out of her reach so she never bothered with them. Her life was filled with darkness, so she found her own star on the ground, keeping it always close to her heart. You didn't think I created this entire place for kicks, did you? The elder Dalton brother could only crack a maniacal smile seeing Cage so impatient and go wild. He might have been the only one who had ever seen Cage in such a miserable state and breaking that rigid soul filled him with extreme pleasure. Cage's mind on the other hand raced trying to connect all the dots and things she had observed in these few months carefully and not miss out on any specific detail. The one of the few reasons Cage and Maya could operate freely on their own was because the Dalton gang had for some time gone underground, but what if that really was not the case, or, they were simply just too busy doing something even important than being highway robbers. This thought had always kept Cage bugging, or, why would such a huge bandit group hold themselves up in a stronghold, unless they weren't protecting themselves but were trying to keep something safe within these walls? 238. Cage's eyes widened, her face went pale as to remembering how over these past few months the number of kidnappings in the Plum Town and other nearby towns and cities had drastically increased, and no one could really tell who was behind them unless the mastermind of those kidnappings was the person standing right in front of her and the one behind all of this, only he could have the brains, power and resources to run such a huge racket without anyone else finding out about it. From there it was easy for anyone to surmise that he had kidnapped every one of them and is keeping them somewhere locked up in this hideout. But for what purpose, Cage really needed to know. Because, simply put even her own life, that of Myers and the children of the orphanage were at stake, there would have been no place they could have ran to, left after this. What are you planning to do with them? Am I also one of your victims or did you lose your manhood that you have fallen so low so as to kidnap children now? Did the blood of the innocent people you slew turned you into a real coward now? Cage could not help but slowly her contained feelings over these past few minutes had slowly turned into derogatory comments for the person for whom she once used to work or more so they were old trustworthy partners. So, you figured it out that soon. But you have been cunning like a fox from day one, misleading people, making them fall into your tricks and finally bringing them to us only to meet their ends. You lied to me, you murderer. Cage cut in between. Not able to control her emotions and overpowered by her past mistakes of how she was abused could no longer keep her quiet you don't need to be on guard. Either way I was going to reveal my plan to you because you have only figured out half of it. The corners of his mouth upturned in a poisonous grin, swinging Cage's sword he threw it at a wooden pole a little further from her. 239. The blade of a knife made a bull's eye hit on a small local map. The tip strictly stuck on the labeled land the port city of Gilda. What else is there to figure out if the money you are going to sell them to slave traders? Cage turned her head away in disgust, as the man to whom she once considered in high esteem. City of Gilda being a port town directly connected the human continent and the demon continent via sea routes. Trade flourished and it brought riches from round the world, but there were those who wanted to exploit these routes and keep it all for themselves. Bandits occupied the land. Sea pirates took over the oceans and slave traders and dons banded together to run the show in each of their territories, but the Dalton brothers were different, they had no background, they did not come from powerful places like others, but they followed their own set of principles and came at the top, despite being a human not able to use magic just like Cage, he rise to the top of all the big shots in this free region of demon continent conquering this vast plains, mines and finally claim this important highway to the port city for himself. Bang! The elder Dalton brother threw his hand like a hammer on a nearby table and it cracked on the center. Don't belittle my aspirations with something as lowly as money. Then what is that you are actually after? Cage followed his outburst with a straightforward question. Control. Control over everything, and that can only be done by acquiring unsurmountable power. 
then no one will be able to defy me or snatch away anything from me ever again. Uncontrollable anger surged through him and at the same time it was quelled by his own rationality. 240. A pin drop silence fell in the room. Cage still couldn't comprehend the man's sudden thirst for control or power. Surely, there was a part of his life that she was still not aware of, but it did not matter to Cage, if at the end it was all going to end with their deaths. No one can give a life taken and people easily chew out others when they see that they are just as weak. Easy to manipulate. They strike at them where it hurts the most and finally take control over their lives. People like me and you who can't use magic are always looked down upon. But we have our brains working to build up plans and catch our preys. Acting to deceive others. And finally when I acquire the power to control others. I will turn this whole place of how it should exist. The elder Dalton brother played round with his head like a kid as if he was going to snap his own neck. What would you mean by that? Cage had a sickened look on her face. Despite his talk of powers, it was meaningless for humans like them to use magic. If they were born without magical nerves in their body and there was no alternative to it, don't you think it would have been better if you had that demi human girl's power for yourselves? What else reason could you have for keeping her by your side as a pet? The elder Dalton brother said with a sly twist in his tongue. Cage fell silent. She wanted to deny it, but a really small part of her always thought of having the luxury to enjoy the same power that Maya had. Cage was weak in front of anyone who could use magic or was trained in combat. She could not enhance her body to move quickly or throw fire from her palms to decimate her enemies but had to resort to throwing stones putting her life in danger. But there was even a greater reason she needed my because, don't tell me you are still going on and on about your childish dream of claiming this world as your territory, did she too make that promise to you, or, to the person you were pretending to be, if at the end you are going to be 241, used and thrown away by her too. The elder Dalton brother leered close to Cage as he spoke those dreadful words into her ears. He was the only other person with whom Cage had shared the secret of the promise she had made with Maya. It's because she considered him as an equal who was in a similar position with his brother who excelled both in fire magic and close combat. No dot no, no, Maya and I. We made a promise together. I will never break it and betray her. Cage's life was over the day when her parents threw her away tried to kill her, sold off to slavery until she finally ran away. Lost in streets, beaten, always on the run, she was in a worse state than an animal. Cheating others, snatching things, food and money, learning thievery skills and to swindle others just to earn a single coarse bread for the day and a piece of a meat sometime in a month if she happened to chance upon a gold laying hen. She was slowly drowning in a swamp no one to pull her out, falling into its deeper darkness and greater depths, until the day she met Maya and realized her own worth, and that day she made a promise to her that together they would claim everything in this world for themselves, every richness in this entire world would have their name etched on it, or, is it because you want to keep her clean that you haven't told her what you have done or about your past, after all that plotting we had done together, keeping her attached to your side, so she is just a tool for you in your bigger plans. SHRR.RRRRR. The chains kept on rattling as every word said by the elder Dalton brother weighed heavy on her, but Cage was unable to break them no matter how much strength she put into. Don't tell me you think you can keep yourself clean, strong and innocent by staying by her side. Don't tell me the fearless you is starting to grow up to be needy. The elder Dalton brother held the dangling chains tight restricting its metallic voice that spoke of Cage's rejection. 242, he just couldn't keep his questions to minimum. In truth he was infatuated with Cage's smarts. Another of the reason he despised Cage was because of her unbreakable spirit. Of how she continues to fight even from the depths of that swamp which had already swallowed him wholly. There was no part left of him that he could call his own and once again in search of power he had now sunk to its bottom until the day it would become his grave too. Seeing her give up and fall in despair was now the thing he wanted to see the most. Don't tell me you have tied me here only to make me listen to your nonsense, or, is there any end to your madness after this? Cage managed a brave, 
trembling face. She needed to get herself out of there as quick as possible, find everyone and then escape the town. For some reason she couldn't help but think of that human girl who would be leaving tomorrow too. Cage was glad that someone like her wasn't dragged into this mess because of her. Maybe it was because of how she appeared different from the rest of the crowd to Cage, that she worried. To her Alicia appeared free, unlike her who was chained with poverty hunger and greed. Someone so pure that they would have purified that same black swamp by a single touch should have never come close to her. Maybe I have sidestepped from my main motive, Cage. I want you to join me, then you two can have all the power for yourselves that you have ever dreamt of. So, strong that not even an army could stand against us. We can claim kingdoms and no one would be able to again take away anything from us. This cruel world won't let us go back to who we were and no matter to whom you associate with you cannot keep acting innocent. If seeing someone like me makes your head boil, and if you want to kill me right now not for those chains, then we are no different. The elder Dalton brother spoke with zeal, his eyes fiery red with anger, as he indomitably stared at Cage, his hands reaching out to her. 243. All Cage could do was return those avaricious gazes of his with her own fearless attitude. The elder Dalton brother continued, but you can't kill me, simply because you lack power. But if you think kids are allowed to fool themselves as much as they want, these inhuman human out there won't halt their hunt until you grow up. The outside world is full of monsters that kill and feed upon their own kind, humans. In no way we two are same, and I swear I am going to make you pay for all of this. Your name, your people, your wealth, your reign and even all of your desires. I will destroy all of it and this is not a threat. I will take away everything from you and make it my own. Cage could only scream at him as her hands were still tied. Either way if it had been the young adult and brother or anyone for that matter, they would have not expected much, that Cage could have done even with her hands open. And despite that something always kept the elder adult and brother at his guard around this girl. He knew all he had done was scrapped to the surface and Cage's resolve would not topple so easily. Unfortunately you can't take away something from nothing. The younger Dalton brother turned his head away and walking back to Cage. How about I set you free from that beast girl? I am sure the doctor won't mind if the specimen is in bad condition as long as they all are alive. Don't you dare do anything to her? And who is this doctor you are talking to about? Blinding white rage strained Cage's forehead. Her body stiffened only to left crying in pain as the chains held her back. The moment her freedom was snatched away from her, she might had lost but she still hadn't given in. Cage, have you ever met a devil? Seeing her desperate and try so hard, the elder Dalton brother couldn't help but wonder. No. But I think if there are any devils, they would look just like you. And me. 244. The Doctor. He is a genius mad scientist. The man who is going to grant me superpowers which no one has ever seen and even an eternal life. Are you sure you are not being swindled by a newbie who wants to make big on his first try? Cage laughed at the absurdity of the claims he subsequently made. He must have been an incarnate of devil now in human flesh. I have already witnessed what the doctor can do with his research. That place is no less than a hell surrounded with monsters so powerful the world is not yet ready to handle them. If unleashed it would only spread destruction and chaos. And once I too have grabbed that power, I am going to rip this city, this country and everyone living in it which took away everything from me. If I want something I will find my own devil. I am not like you. I won't hurt anyone for my own benefit, not ever again. Cage smirked. She still couldn't believe what the elder Dalton brother spoke or rather she refused to accept something like that could be even done. Are you trying to buy time, or waiting for help to show up? If you look outside, Cage did as he said and looking through a closed semi-translucent window pane, it was dark already. If you are waiting for your friend to show up and rescue you, the time allotted to her is about to end. You keep on calling other humans a fool but in truth it is to hide your own weakness and fear of them. You are too brittle that it would take just one turn for you to beak. Cage didn't knew what kind of deal Maya and he made. 
But all she wished for was her safety. She would have preferred if Maya had betrayed her and ran away with all children at the orphanage before it was too late for them. She didn't really knew this time whether she would have been able to protect them. Her own life wasn't guaranteed, unless she took his offer. But why would he go this far? Am I really that pitiful and weak? Does Maya see me the same way and so she stays with me? Cage teared up. She didn't realize until now that she even had the luxury to cry. 245. What if that beast girl never returned and ran with all the hard-earned money you made? Cage had all her expression blown away. Finally, it was the look on her face that he was so looking forward to. Tears rolled down her eyes, as they trickled over the wooden floor. Nothing would have made me happier. Cage's response was in contrast to her hopeless expression as she let those tears wash off all her useless worries. The elder Dalton brother couldn't believe to what he listened and saw. His eyes balked in disbelief. Thack dot dot thack dot thack. From outside strange noises of a continuous metal knocking could be heard. It seems that your friend hasn't disappointed you. What? Maya is here. Cage remembered looking through the window and how it was already night. Maya shouldn't be here, it's dangerous. Cage thought as she saw him making some preparation. What are you planning to do to her? Maya, Maya. Run away, it's dangerous, Maya. Cage screamed out her name, hoping she would listen but considering how her voice did not resonate, a simple sound barrier must have been put over the place. The man was just that careful letting all the noises in but no information to leak outside. If you cut an animal on an ordinary day it's meat, but if you feed it every day for it to grow strong and healthy, when the day you chop off its head, you call it a sacrifice. Nevertheless, some sacrifices are always needed in form of specimen. Young children with powers especially those like your pet here. Damn you dot I'll kill you, I swear it. You'll die by my hand. But Cage's screams were only drowned out by his mad laughter. 246. One of them wanted to see the other cry and in despair, while the other wanted to see him die an agonizing death. 247. Dalton Gang's hideout here's all the money I promised. Maya threw the bag which she received from the Alicia at one of the bandits who was standing there. Maya took a final glance at the setting sun and was relieved that she was able to pay off all her debts on time, even if it meant that she was herself in a much bigger debt now. As long as Cage and everyone in the orphanage was fine, Maya never worried further. The bandit handed the bag to the boss, the younger Dalton brother. Does this small bag really contain all the money? Of course. It's an enchanted bag. I cannot carry around 25,000 crown gold coins openly in public. Maya hurriedly answered, I would have been surprised if you would have even managed to collect one. Maybe that's the reason my brother always said to keep an eye on you too. Saying that, still in doubt, the young adult and brother emptied the whole bag on the floor. The rumbling of thousands of crown gold coins caught everyone's attention, as a hushed silence fell over the entire place, every bandit's brain and eyes ogling over their dreams they could fulfill with those coins now scattered on the floor, there was no doubt that with these many coins one could become a governor of an estate and lead a luxurious life for several of their generations without work, but none of them let their greed slip outside their boundary, because the moment they did their heads would be sent flying. There was no room for betrayal in the Dalton gang. Now release Gage as you promised. Maya with a relieved face tried to remind them. Thack dot dot thack dot thack. 248. Suddenly all the bandits in her vicinity started to knock their swords hilt on the ground producing a menacing metallic sound. Maya didn't know why they were doing this. But it could have been some sort of signal. Maya thought to herself. Everyone around Maya was laughing as they slyly looked at her, put her in the locker with the rest of them. The young adult and brother announced, this is not what you actually promised. Maya sneered at him in protest, you have only to blame your friend for trying to bring you into this, there's no right or wrong, and promises are not absolute justice here. Everyone with swords started approaching Maya, they had wild lustful expression on their faces as they leered like scums on her feminine body. Magic arrows already aimed at her from far above trees. Maya could easily sense them. Her escape route cut off from the back by another group of bandits which appeared out of nowhere. 
Maya was a stranger to the layout of the hideout, so she knew there would be hidden traps everywhere. If she used her power, she would be shot down with magic before the transformation would be complete. She was now completely trapped. She didn't knew she should take the chance, but if she gave up even before trying, she would never be able to be together with Cage again. If Maya had learned one thing from Cage then it was that they would never be the one to back down. Never had they before. And not even now. 249. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne are you sure there won't be any more accidents? Regis looked uncertain. She did not seem much happy about the whole event. Well we were going to go against the strongest banded group here. I have asked Hal to locate Maya's whereabouts. And Regis rode the bike in that direction. Yeah, I made all the adjustments and changes after our first crash. Regis, we need this to get to Maya quick. I held Regis from back tightly as usual. Somehow, I was able to coax her into the driver's position again. The bike vroomed and hit the road as fast as it could as we headed deeper into the forest, while the sun was about to set. Visibility reduced inside the dense mountain forest. We still decided to speed up our bike to get to Maya as quick as possible before it was going to be too late. Neither of us wanted to be haunted by a ghost of someone who was in debt. At least it was a reason motivating enough for Regis to get moving and not slow down even in the dark. Regis used all her elf's instincts to still drive smoothly. She was enjoying the bike ride this time with a much better user enhanced experience with manual brakes installed for her. There was absolutely no chance of an accident this time. She too was worried about Cage and Maya. Alicia, I have been thinking for a long time. Is this one of your jobs where you grant the others their wishes? Regis remembered how I had told her that I grant wishes. Not to forget I granted one of Regis's wishes too. But in case of Maya and Cage the same could not be said. Unfortunately, Maya and Cage's wishes do not meet the conditions and so they do not qualify for me to grant their wishes. Instead, I have decided to make a deal with them. 250. A deal? Regis was perplexed. Maybe we can get into the details when we reach there. I told Regis. There was no guarantee that it would all work out. It all depended on Cage and Maya to decide. And we wouldn't know unless we reach there. Alicia could it be that Cage is even in a bigger problem, than Maya? She is nowhere to be found. Shouldn't we be searching for her first? Regis necessarily tried to guess out the situation. And I too might have jumped to the same conclusion. If it's about her, I don't think we need to worry that much. She can handle herself all right. I said wondering, if only it was possible for her to use that, without having any magic circuit inside her body. 251. A dark room I thought I could do anything with my intelligence and with Maya at my side. I was her hero and for all the children at the orphanage. No wonder I'd assumed that these things would remain with me forever. They would never be snatched away from me. Just like my family abandoned me after they found out I could not use the inherent family skill because I did not possess magic. Cage remembered, her head hurt as the veins on her forehead puffed up but a thought came back to her, the one she had buried deep inside of her. Cage had seen a lot more deaths from the day she was born. Everyone dies someday eventually whether they have power or not. She was told that time and time again. That's why she had to accomplish whatever she could while she was still living, and to oppose that exact unfairness of this world, she herself had to use that unfair power. No matter where Cage would have ran these vile bandits would have found and killed her after that. She was well aware of this and exactly knew that the only way to survive was to eradicate the source of it. Even if it meant putting her own life in danger, a grim hideous smile emerged on Cage's face, still hidden under the darkness of her bent head. Without actual power your existence is meaningless. Now quit acting like a spoiled child and accept your fate and join me. Even if you don't, I will make sure everyone whom you have ever cared about will be your stepping stone to gaining power as you trample on their lives. The elder Dalton brother was adamant this time with his demand. There wouldn't be a word from there. No talks, no agreements, just settlements and the payment her death. That was one of the laws of the Daltons. The elder Dalton brother looked at Cage. Finally she has learned. The terror of getting their most precious thing snatched away means there can be 252, no replacements, that's why she can't give up, beg for your life, 
for your own safety, for the sake of living free and strong, and then maybe. The elder Dalton brother's thought was suddenly halted by an explosion from the outside. Boom, has some kind of problem developed outside? Did someone interfere? He was plenty sure of his plan and there was no way of it going wrong unless there was a third party interference. The cries from the outside intensified. The two people in the room had no idea what brought that kind of development. But Cage was untouched by the cries of those bandits, while the elder Dalton brother was at guard. And seeing that despairing succumb to his face, Cage couldn't help but laugh. No devil ever fulfills someone's need without wanting something in return. If you have offered your sanity that would explain it. Cage chortled. Her eyes looked menacing under her bangs. All the tension made her sweat profusely. But her body grew colder and colder, until she stopped thinking and decided to take action. You are level-headed and are more than capable for your rage. But you ought to know the difference between being vigilant and extremely foolish. If that's going to be your reply, then I will make sure that everyone you care about remembers that the one they would be suffering of because will be you. He said in a worrisome state. Something happening on the outside made him to reconsider his devices, while here in front. Cage suddenly started behaving unlike herself. It was like a bolt of lightning tearing through his wits. Cage's distinct voice and the resulting change in the surrounding, as if he was just now realizing the incognizant fear, he had from Cage was not just an illusion. If you ever try to lay a hand on Maya, I promise I will hunt you down with my own hands. If she cries, I promise I will snatch your eyeballs and... 253. Even if there is a little scratch on her, I promise this land will bathe in your blood. Cage screamed and laughed at the same time. The loud cries of the bandit from the outside intensified as if a fight had broken out, but the elder Dalton brother really knew how important that term promise really meant to Cage. Helplessly tied, mentally broken down and tired and yet she could keep a daring smile on her face and look directly into his eye the elder dalton brother shuddered as if he could finally see the true cage hidden behind all those guises and facades he witnessed over the years they worked together he gulped but could only engage himself in a glare even if i have to put my hands in the same filth as you i won't let her suffer even if that means i will end up suffering alone if she was ever hurt I promise I will kill you. Cage gave off her final cry as a giant explosion made the whole ground rumble. A fire spread out around the building and the room was now in flames from the side walls. Dense smoke walls started filing in the room. It was from the outside. The elder Dalton brother turned around, waiting for anyone to come and notify him of the outside situation and put out the fire. But there were no emergency message or alarm. In the meantime he was distracted, all of Cage's wandering senses became connected in a single moment. Her eyes shot open as if her body was prepared to bear the brunt. Uck dot r. She couldn't produce anything but dry grunts. Uck dot r r g h. No matter what you do you have lost. Even if you look smug or act like you have all figured yourself out, you cannot do anything when you are under my grasp. He retorted to Cage's desperate attempt. 254. The only thing was that he himself wasn't sure of it. The surrounding against Cage looked lambent. He had no sense to feel magic but his analytic senses were in no way inferior. He looked around for clues, and the strange noise of something moving inexplicably caught his attention. The blade he had thrown in the map wiggled like jelly, and the next instant before he realized what Cage was trying to do, a sharp voice shot through, swoosh, the knife flew out through the hole with force and ran across Cage's chain severing them in one stroke. Cage fell to the ground while the knife dropped down at the same time, clattering beside her. With the rattling of the falling chains, the elder Dalton brother came out of his shock. Gr. He howled briefly, as he ran towards Cage to stop her. It shouldn't have been possible for Cage to use magic unless out of all dumb possibilities, for all this time she had been hiding a skill. You ag. Cage using every ounce of her strength and willpower to push herself up, she grabbed the knife and her small body sprung like a spring, putting all her leftover power she had saved into her feet. He watched Cage's unsteady rise to her feet with his mouth agape. 
Having no choice he brought his hands to the hilt of the sword tucked to his side belt, a bit indecisive in his action. I won't let you. He babbled, his voice so high-pitched it sounded like it was playing at double speed. Then suddenly his expression froze in place as a dagger pierced his neck. Hwa! An inhuman noise leaked from his lips. Trails of blood splattered out and messed up with the dagger holder's face. While a stream of perfect red line gushed out from the cut. 255. But there was a small miss when Cage noticed her attack ended up in the column between his neck and shoulder. Not minding the blood on her face. And as if she had done this quite a number of times. Waha! Cage screamed again and drilled her knife deeper into the his neck. It all ended in a flash as the dagger shearing through all the arteries severed the connection between his head and heart. Life drained away from his wound. It was a miracle. He didn't die instantly. The sword in his hand left his grip and fell next to him. Clang! His lips moved. Muffled with blood, but Cage was still able to make it out. Dot! and with that he saw one last sight of Cage before he crumpled to the floor. The monstrous look on Cage's face. On the other hand, he did not have an agonized bearing, nor he looked angry, rather his expression was a condescending satisfaction of sort. Everything suddenly grew quiet as if nothing had happened at all. The room was still surrounded in fire. I told you my promise is everything to me, and that's what you get for underestimating this knife. I don't need special powers to prove my worth unlike you who hate those who have it, and I will give my other best possible life with my own hands. No, the two of us would complete our own dream together. Cage talked no further to the dead body. She thought it was a complete waste of time to reply to his last words. She puts her hand to the floor and lift herself up again. Red girdles formed around her wrists due to the metallic chains made it difficult for her to put force. Her body was burning. 256. What she had used was an inherent family magic, or rather a very basic and small portion of that ultimate skill. A secret she even hid from Maya. But even this basic portion giving her the ability to control the movements of objects in short range. She had to forcibly burn through a large amount of her life force. It was done all on emotion. She was not trained in oral arts and had no magic veins in her body to conduct such powerful energy stream. Nevertheless the power surged in her body forming strains all around her forehead and arms which now resigned to decisive pain. Her brain suffered from a splitting pain while her arms dangled like they were about to fall off. The knife was stuck between the tight grip of her folded fist. Blood still trickled from its tips. Cod.coch. Cage wheezed, breaking into a series of hacking coughs. Blood splattered out from her mouth, clenching her chest tight. Her lungs were heavy with stagnant air. Breathing further became difficult because of the smoke. When Cage was a kid, she was told that she would never be able to use magic and if she decided to use her skill forcibly it would shorten her lifespan and worsen her health condition every time she used it. That's why Cage forbid herself for ever using it, and she kept it reserved for moments like this without anybody knowing about it. Her own trump card. She tried walking to the door, and every time her legs gave up, she fell on her knees. Light slowly fading from her eyes. Figures of her pasts flashed before her. Maya. Her lips curled up thinking she was finally able to get to her on time. Their dream was still alive and breathing. 257. Interlude the best duo in the world. A 12-year-old girl of average height wandered in the streets of the plum town. Her brown hairs hung freely over her face and a pair of Doberman's ears stuck out of her head. Attentive to every little talk and details of her surroundings, she walked carefully down the main road. The main road crossing could have been unofficially designated as the boundary that separated the town working area and her home, or, rather it was the perfect demarcation in the town where the other side of this road was opprobriously referred to as the slums. While walking down the streets, some of the disdainful eyes would follow her and then blankly leave afterwards. These were the people who despised the demi-humans. But Maya did not care for their prejudiced and hateful stares neither she was afraid to walk down the lane alone and in the most notorious and criminalized part of the town. After all, her home, the orphanage in which she lived in was situated there. Recently in the town square she had found herself a job for cleaning a huge warehouse. The master at the warehouse had promised her 20 copper coins per week. It was not much 
and being a kid no one wanted to give her a job for her inexperience and lacking maturity. Maya now held out eight copper coins in her hand and sighed deeply. That's what I get for believing in their sweet words. Maya closed her fist and disappointedly walked alone. She had to continuously work hard these seven days and when the time came for her wages to be paid the master of the warehouse started finding faults with her. Undeniably, there was no fault in her work itself. But out of nowhere they claimed that she was a worthless orphan kid and did not deserve more than this. Despite Maya's protests, her employer shouted. 258 on her and talked about passing bad words and false rumors about her in the town. Even threatening a little girl like her, did not burn at their soul, and the town was meticulously filled with such people. The rising poverty in town and lack of earning opportunities had hit everyone hard, and finally when people had to resort to crimes to make the ends meet, the situation worsened. Resorting to knives and masks forever forgotten into the darkness of the town's dark side. People, families, shops vanishing without any sign or telltale was a common occurrence and no one would remember their names by the next day. Since, Maya did not want to create a scene and lose her future earning opportunities elsewhere too. She left unwillingly. She too was a part of this town now. Whether she was born here or not she did not know. How she ended up in the orphanage was still a mystery and had been there ever since she was a kid. Even with this I can buy only a little meat for half the children at the orphanage. Maya let out another sigh. Tired from all that vigorous lifting and cleaning every corner of the warehouse was not as simple as going for a walk in the garden. When Maya was about to take a final turn before entering the slums, in the next moment she found her nose beguiled by the wafting tender smell of the barbecue skewers being cooked. Hot and crisp over a burning coal grill in a nearby shop, the thick smoke and the flickers of the bright burning embers had Maya's attention for a couple of seconds. But as Maya had alleged before, the money in her possession was inadequate for such indulgences. Being the elder of all the children at the orphanage, it was unthinkable that she wouldn't share. But all they could afford there was a hard loaf of bread and meager soup in the day. There was no appetizing food and a day did not go by when they did not sleep hungry. A hey, young girl, it looks to me like you are in need of help. I have a quick advice for you. Would you not want to earn a lot of cash by trying your good? 259. Luck at this bet by playing just a simple game. A man in red robes with a red clownish outfit called out to Maya from the crowd. Whether he got that as a hint from Maya's dazed expression or she was just randomly picked out, but what the question entailed was not that off the mark. Maya at once recognized him as the infamous new trickster in town, who would make people bet money on a game and had never lost even for once. No, there's no need. I was just passing through. Maya denied the request without a second thought. She was least interested in gambling her hard-earned money. The best was to save it and wait until there was enough to buy everyone a hearty meal. Oh, don't be like that. I can just look and tell. Here's what I think. I will offer double the amount if you win. Such a golden and high return offer doesn't show up every time in your life. The peddler said in a friendly gesture, putting a table in the center of market with a huge billboard of doubling people's money he attracted huge attention in the heart of the town. And the same felicitously optimized promising words froze Maya's brain cells. Her whole week's income could have been reproduced in a single game. In addition, she would no longer be subjected to the complaints and babbling of the master at the warehouse and could possibly buy meat for everyone at the orphanage. Just the imagery of everyone at the orphanage all sitting together on the table and enjoying their full bowls while complimenting Maya for her hard work. It was only a profitable proposition for her, but Maya was aware of the stakes that she would have to forfeit the money on the off chance she happened to lose. A big crowd had already collected in response to the ringing chime bell of the peddler who offered her the deal. By forcing the people of the town's attention on Maya he wanted to next force her into a position of accepting the deal. Making herself self-aware, and by creating an environment she could become center of attention for, consequently he was succeeding. 260. And that's where the peddler played his next move. Maya was aware of the game. After all, it was the talk of town. Despite the simple rules of the game, 
he had remained undefeatable. Many lost their stack of coins from day one and everyone wanted to see the peddler lose for once. People nearby cheered for Maya, for thinking of trying to challenge him and now she could not possibly see a way out of it. In its place Maya had actually started thinking of abiding by the proceedings of the event and play the game. To me human girl, are you daring enough to accept the gamble and entertain this ignoble wanderer like me? The peddler this time announced with a cynical smile, All right, I will stake eight copper coins, bring it on. Maya propitiously answered to the challenge. Even though she had been a hard-working girl, she did not disapprove these unfair ideas given that they were done under fair and equal rules, but all of that optimism would amount to nothing if she followed the fishing line and bait blindfolded which the peddler had cunningly left for her to pick up. Accepting the challenge was a symbol of her innocence, to be not able to look beyond winning at the game and only seeing the prize, but people of this town were neither of noble pedigree, or academicians and laureates, they themselves had been brought up in a wretched society, that they would abstain themselves from such a golden chance slip by. If you are able to locate this ball hidden under from among these five cups, then you are the winner, otherwise you lose. You get one chance to choose per bet you make, is that clear? The peddler explained the basic rules as a formality. I won't lose, Maya said confidently, showing her eagerness to quickly move to the game. She couldn't wait to go home with her hands full with delicious food. 261. You can try as long as you like, that is if you have money and not go under debt in my tab. The peddler replied unflinching to Maya's declaration which was met with the subsequent cheers of the crowd for Maya. The sole reason Maya agreed to the challenge was because recently she had discovered a new power in herself. One day it had manifested in herself out of nowhere and she was in control of it. Whenever Maya was motivated to do something or on the contrary found herself weak, a power instinct would build up inside her, magical energy would fill her body, increasing her strength stamina and speed. Even sometimes her body features would start reforming if she overdid it. According to the nuns at the orphanage it might have been a special trait of demi humans but they were themselves not sure about it, but for some reason the oldest sister had told Maya to not use this power in public. So, she at least thought it was fine to use as long as others wouldn't know of it, and this power even gave her the boost to see things moving slowly. So, finding the ball. No matter under which cup it was hidden under shouldn't have been that difficult, are you ready? The peddler asked as he showed a red ball to Maya and put it on display to the huge multitude of crowd for verification and validity. He then placed it in the extreme left cup. Ready? Maya replied in a hush. A strange sensation manifested in her and suddenly every visual information turned into a slow moving clip. Her eyes focused on the cup which had the ball. 3.2, 1. The peddler and the audience shouted in unison. He sure knew how to catch the audience's attention and bring maximum of future potential customers to his store by putting on a big show. Without wasting a second the man's hand moved in perfect tandem on the board, each of his hand randomly picking on a cup and moving them elsewhere. The audience was silent and the most of them had already lost sight of the cup with the ball as they watched with their mouth agape. The man was ingenious. 262. With his hand movements as people pointed out several of the feints he used to trick others and in doing so they lost their count too. Some blinked and the next second they knew the cup of their choice had vanished from the mark. The swapping of cups went on for two minutes without a single momentary pause. Surprisingly even the sliding of the cups did not so much as produce a screech while moving to give the hint of the ball. Everything became only likelihood and outstretched guesses as time passed and so did the arrangement of cups and more than hundreds of times they might have been shifted and manipulated, but during this entire time Maya had been carefully watching. She thought it would be easy for her to guess the right cup, but that was not the case, because the man was experienced and he might have known of Demir Human's characteristic physical abilities, especially when the red ball lacked scent. Maya could no longer depend on her nose but only on what she was seeing in front of her eyes. Her adolescent untrained eyes shed a small trail of salt water, slowly evaporating on her cheeks, but for these two minutes she had not blinked for once, her life earning and the appetite of the entire orphanage was on the line. Losing was not just a price to pay, but it was something Maya just couldn't afford. Choose your pick.
The peddler said at the same time his hand stopped, the second from the right. Maya whispered without a doubt in her mind. Other people in her vicinity were bewildered to see her confidence, which they did not expect it from a young girl. Maya had not a single indication of uncertainty as her eyebrows furrowed to the center. She had perfectly traced back the cup with the ball during the entire play. There was no way she could miss it. The man dropped a widening smile as it curved from his one earlobe to other. His dimples bulged outwardly. 263. His hands moved to lift the cup which Maya chose as he kept staring at her without looking on the table. The tension was palpable. Unfortunately for you, that's incorrect. The peddler had a hearty loud laugh as he looked at the dismayed faces of the observers, but his condescending smile contained a form of achievement against Maya. That's impossible. I am sure of it. There must have been a mistake. Maya protested as she stepped back a leg in fright, but the results are in front of you. You cannot deny what has happened after making bets. If you are trying to run away, then beware. The man gave a sharp look at Maya and then moved his head round the huge gathered mob. Maya realized how everyone was now looking at her and their horrible comments pinched at her heart. Brats can't be honest these days. Toss them in the junk if she doesn't pay. We had honestly lost our money too. A jealous man crowed. Is she one of those abandoned kids pickpocketing people? She is not well dressed and she is of the beast clan too. Violent savages. These days are pretty bad where small children like her in the slums try to con and become thieves. They should be thrown out of cities right now. I am saying this for the good of city. A city guard from among the crowd walked forward to intimidate Maya. These were the same people who mere moments ago were cheering for her, but as soon as she had been declared lost, they had turned on her now. She knew there was no way of leaving without handing over her money. She puts her hands in her pocket and counting till eight she takes out all the coins in her possession. The peddler gleamed at those copper coins as his hands extend to snatch them away from Maya. In turn Maya's little fingers trembled while handing it over. 264. Hey you. You should better know someone before you hand out your money to them so casually. Because there is a possibility that they could be dirty cheaters and bad liars. A voice cut in, shearing through the scornful murmur of the mob and making them go silent. Who dares to? The peddler sneered. A human girl from far in the right, in old clothes and just about the same age group as Maya waved her hand up without any worry. You should be careful with your customers and how you treat them when you know they have actually picked the right one. The girl said with a strong disposition that the peddler had to respond. You should better keep your mouth shut when you point finger at your elder little girl. It's bad manners to call them liars or cheaters, or have your parents not taught you manners. The man said contemptuously, I never called you one, unless it bells a ring for you. The girl scoffed and looked straight into the peddler's eyes. I have set up this game with all honesty. Everyone saw it with their eyes that the cup does not have the ball inside. The man beckoned to the crowd. Then would you do me a small favor and show us the correct cup right now? Another argument followed up by the girl, indirectly addressing the crowd just like the peddler. Don't let me think about it. The peddler gulped and started looking here and there as he felt the pressure of the crowd who started demanding the same. I think we should grace the public with your mastery in the game and where your real interests and honesty lies. The girl then manipulating the ideas of the public from the losing cup and directing it to the winning cup won everyone's attention. I cannot do that. That's against the rules. The peddler screamed at the people who jumped forward to look. These were the same men who betted for the maximum times in hopes of winning and still lost every time. Then I will just make sure that it happens and people discover how you have so gracefully cheated them all this time. The girl's words ended up 265, followed by a gentle breeze and suddenly all the cups from the table went flying back in a disorderly manner. Though Maya in all this debate found the wind to be pretty weak in actual to make all those heavy cups simply fly away in the most illogical way, but all said and done, the truth was laid bare as there was no ball in any of the cups, the man fell back and a red ball curved and fell out from one of his lengthy sleeves. Realizing he had been caught and how the crowd madly reacted to the discovery of his crime, he knew he would be hanged in the town square, even if he survives the beating that is. 
he had angered many and no one spoke in his favor, damn you brat, I promise I will kill you by my own hands. The peddler screamed at the human girl who was straight running towards him now, he then snatched Maya's money from her hands and took a running stance, in response the human girl jumped across the table and kicked him in the gut, knocking him over she picked the money from his hands with a snitch, my name is Cage, you are more than welcome to come find me for taking your revenge for ratting you out, but first I would worry more about myself if I were in your position. Cage who just now introduced herself freely handed over her identity and what more looked like a threat as people now surround the peddler's shop and started thrashing the place. Chaos was perfectly executed as the perfect reaction of her own move. You thief, give back our money. The angry cries of the mob took the charge and rushed to beat the peddler, some even armed with wooden logs. Cage in truth couldn't sympathize with the peddler and left him to suffer alone at the hands of the angry men. Maya who still watched in awe, didn't even realize her money being snatched. This was the first time she was being cheated for and she didn't knew why the peddler would do this. Maya's mind was too innocent to look for a proper reason for the peddler's malice. Why would he try to cheat her? 266, but she couldn't at once decide or condemn that the man was simply evil. It was not just her, but he would have done this with anyone who would have fallen for his trick. A town with uneducated, untalented, reckless and criminals. The peddler had been secretly using a low-level short teleportation magic to shift the ball in a secret pouch of his sleeve during the moving of cups. Two minutes were more than enough to cast the magic. Under the crowd's high cheers, he would guise his chant. And when he couldn't there were magic circle drawn inside that of the cups and he could simply channel magic in them for the transfer to complete. Don't just stand there, follow me. At least that's what the human girl Cage said, but she took Maya by her hand and rushed forward before the crowd could stop them from leaving too. The peddler left on his own at the mercy of the people he once cheated so brazenly. Cage then took a sharp turn at the next corner. From there she took another short route to left leading to a small alleyway. The whole town was filled with them and no good news or outcome ever came out from visiting one. Pickpocketers thieves, runaway criminals and people of all criminal background assembled in these places, Maya did not know what she was brought here for, but she could see the girl beckoning with her palm, the eight gold coins perfectly safe in her hands, Maya taking the hint, picked up the money from Cage which initially belonged to her, Cage looked around with watchful eyes and when she found no one, a serious expression had taken hold of her, rotten humans, at one second they like to be on the side who are most exposed and support them, but they change sides as soon as they know who is winning. Cage exclaimed, while Maya found it surprising as she was for the first time being called vulnerable and at risks. 267. At the orphanage she was always the best and strongest girl for listening to everything the sisters taught. At least that's what Maya wanted to say. But this time she had failed herself and was almost robbed of her money. And for now she wanted to thank the only person who helped her. Maya noted down the human girl's appearance. Cage was good looking and even with her poor clothes, she could be passed off as refined and elegant. Something that Maya lacked. My name is Cage. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am Maya. Maya introduced herself hesitantly. She was still shocked by what had happened few moments ago. Cage smiled. So, why don't we talk about my share for helping you out? Cage said pointing out four fingers at Maya. Thank you for helping me out. Maya unable to understand what Cage actually meant. She still went and thanked her. Ah. Cage frowned pushing her finger against Maya's forehead. This is not how it works. Don't you know you are supposed to offer me a prize? Nothing comes free here. Not even help. Unless you want to get robbed again. Wah, really, isn't a thanks enough, at the orphanage the sisters would always say that those who help others are always rewarded by the gods. Maya was a bit surprised there herself but proudly preached the orphanage's teachings. Are you that dense? Cage angrily pushes her finger and drilling it through Maya's forehead. If prayers can really fill your tummy or make me rich, then we wouldn't be doing this here. Now hurry up. H -h 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 -h
Maya's eyes squinted as she pulled back her hand. She did not want it to lose her money again after she got it miraculously back. Putting up a weak resistance she held her hands with the coins tightly enclosed in her fingers close to her heart. Cage stared for a while, and it looked as if Maya was about to cry. She already had enough for the day. 268. With a final strong flick of finger on the forehead which made Maya groan, Cage turned around and said, I see. It cannot be helped then. Are you really okay with this? Maya still rubbing her forehead asked. Cage looked back and this time with a wondrous smile and filled with high spirit she clapped her hands together. Just buy me some sweet buns and we will be good. I know a really good place that sells it at a good price. If you want you can come together with me. All right. The two were now on their way to the shop but neither of them spoke to each other. That will be two copper coins for four sweet buns. The shopkeeper said. Maya gave them two coins and received a small packet with the buns. Maya who had only ever eaten bread found this meal too extravagant but she had to keep her word nonetheless. Here. Maya held the packet in front. Cage grabbed it from Maya's hand as if she had been waiting hungry for this since forever. Unsealing the packet at the spot she took out a bread, her eyes shone. Chomp, chomp. I am glad I could get the fresh batch they make on time. They are still hot and the cream has not dried up. Cage kept on nibbing until she finished one. Her hands moved to pick another, but a stare closed in on her face. What's it this time? Cage said trying to hide the packet on her side. I have only ever eaten simple bread at the orphanage which the baker leaves for us sometimes. Maya said as she beheld her fascination to this unknown sweet Roma coming from the sweet buns. 269. Is that so? Cage couldn't help but realize those were most probably the stale one which no one would buy. And everyone already knew in the town that the orphanage was in the red. Since this part of the demon continent was a free region, they did not receive any state help. And donations were a far cry in a backward town. Maya's eyes ravaged the sweet bun in her imagination and Cage did not want that to traumatize her or leave her having a bad taste in her mouth. I will share just half. Sinful eyes still staring. Fine just take one. Thank you. Maya cried as she took her first crunch from the bed. Isn't it good? Cage praised her own recommendation. It is. It really is sweet and I never knew the bread could be this soft. I will work hard so that everyone can eat this at the orphanage. Maya said with a renewed spirit after she had been so down with the previous incident. It made Cage happy too that she had still not lost her will. I am glad. Next time just don't get stupid ideas and fall for those two-faced deceiving schemes. Maya pouted but Cage kept on laughing as they together walked out of the shop. The two learned of how each lived in the slums and Cage's house was not that far from the orphanage. Maya, I will be leaving. I still have work to do. Okay goodbye. Maya waved hands back at her as she decided to go back to the orphanage to help her around. Cage saw Maya walk away and as usual she was left alone. She had been living alone in this town ever since she had come here. She would move around town helping people with all kinds of odd job whether good or bad and charging up money for her services. Sometimes she would earn a lot and sometimes she would catch nothing. Every day was a battle she fought alone. Never getting close to anyone. 270. But today for the first time she had asked someone to be together and at least tag along to the shop. She did not know why she proposed to take Maya with her when she could have gone there by herself. Was it because Cage felt pity for her, or, was it because she found her so pure and innocent, unlike herself that she could not resist the temptation of staying with her, or push her away from having over to get Maya hurt again by this ruthless world, Cage exposed to all cruelties, threats and malice. Just couldn't watch Maya to suffer from something like this again and felt responsible to keep her safe. I might be thinking too much, and this pain. Cage cried inside herself as the torturous aching returned back. She had used a small portion of her skill on the cups and to push back the peddler from escaping. But activating a skill without having magic, it used her life energy. And it would end up only slowly eat away her life. Just using a little magic weighs so much on me. 
Cage decided to take the day off from hunting on the streets and returned to her home. Or at least she called it one when it was just a bunch of logs she brought from the nearby forest and using a rusted steel plate picked up from the scraps as roof. A small room big enough to lie down on a matting over a trunk in which she kept her belongings. Little did she knew that using that one simple word together would have changed the course of her life forever. The next day Cage learned that the con man was half beaten to death and thrown out of the town. His name and sketch was shared everywhere for his crimes and he no longer could gain people's trust again. Simply put his life was finished. Now Cage was back on work looking for places where she could put her brains to use. All the knowledge that she had gained was from the huge library she had back at her family place before being abandoned. 271 But on her way she crossed paths with Maya again who in turn was also looking for work. After a few seconds of talk. They were now job hunting together. How did this happen? Who was the one to first propose this idea? Neither of them knew. But they walked around the whole town now, telling each other what they knew about this place. Most of the time it was Maya who loved talking about the kids at the orphanage and playing with them. And sooner than later the next day they were working together in a hotel helping around the kitchen. Cage sat on the floor chopping down a lot of vegetables which their employer just threw at them. Cage wondering how she could be doing this. She wanted to live free, and for that she needed a lot of money, which this work would have never fetched even if she worked for hundreds of years continuously. At least that's what she had learned the moment she had stepped out in this world. But here she was sitting and chopping down vegetables. It was not that she considered this job beneath her. What Cage wanted was freedom of life. She didn't need money to buy things. She wanted money to be free. And such freedom is expensive. When every day she had to live in fear of getting her life stolen, if she does not steal herself. But on the other hand no matter what occurred, Maya was honest with her work. Even if the employer had pushed a lot of bulk load on her, she worked perfectly quiet cleaning the dishes, the kitchen chopping down all the vegetables and now was helping Cage with her share. She was kind, pure and strong. So much that Cage couldn't help but be mesmerized into thinking that Maya deserved more than this. That one day the two would go around the world, live a happy life and do every fun things that friends did together. Cage had now started seeing a friend in Maya, something she couldn't believe she would do herself. Every day deciding to quit feeling that, on their 272. Other day the two were together eating sweet buns, collecting herbs in the forest on a request. And on the third day Cage was playing together in the orphanage with Maya and the other kids. After all Cage was no different than them. An abandoned child. On the fourth day Maya wanted to look around Cage's house and was invited after a bit of push on her account by Cage. Cage where are your parents? Maya asked. She was usually the only one who talked so much about herself that she never noticed Cage spoke too little of her past. I don't have them. Cage showed no emotion. And you live here alone in this place. It could get blown away in a storm. Maya pointed out looking at the shabby roof Cage had built using big leaves and tied them together to the poles. You are right. A month ago I had to put back the left wall after it crashed in the storm and the roof does leak in rains and I live alone. It weighed little on Cage for explaining this and Maya being just a kid at heart couldn't see that Cage never saw this place as her home, it only existed as her refuge. Either she would abandon it one day and shift to a better location or one day she would never be able to make it back here. After all kids cannot survive in the outside world alone when they could have been someday kidnapped only to be sold to slave traders or lost her life on a risky job. It's just that her name wouldn't be the first one on such a list. Cage, I know. Why don't you come and live in the orphanage? I am sure the sister would allow if we explain and the kids would love having another big sister like you. Maya held Cage's hand and she smiled awaiting her response. Until then, Cage had never let her guard down or let her emotions take control of her to what she said. But now she had to make a choice. The fear of making that choice haunted her from day one when she just wanted to be friends. The choice of 273 either becoming Maya's friend, and lose her dream, or, lose Maya's friendship and keep chasing after her dream. Cage who had always been a rational thinker, 
the kind who always think from her mind and not from her heart. She made an irrational choice. She did not need her mind or feeling to partake in such an arduous decision. Because when it came to becoming free Cage's body moved on its own. I am sorry Maya but I can't. Rejecting the only place where she could assure her safety in a secure location like an orphanage. And from that little conversation sparked a series of arguments between Maya and Cage. Maya kept on insisting like a little girl for Cage to come along with her and Cage always gave the same answer with little to no reason. For the first time she made a rather less profitable decision losing the safety and happiness of being with Maya she chose the treacherous path of following her dream, whether she would achieve it or not, not even those far-sighted astrologers and fortune tellers could be able to guess and when people make such a disjointed situation, they are devastated on what they are about to lose, it becomes difficult to breath due to anxiety, and at the end there is always an explosion, Maya can't you understand, I can't stay with you there, but why, we are friends and I want to help you, you think you can really help me, can't you see, I cannot continue like this, Cage wanted to keep herself quiet but her heart reacted at the worst moment, because now it throbbed and pained even more after being locked and kept away for this long. What are you talking about? Maya asked worriedly. 274. Can't you see I have always been more intelligent and sharper than you, and what we are doing is not enough for me to achieve what I want. I am sorry I cannot come with you. So, please leave. Cage shouted at the top of her voice. And when Cage looked up, she knew she had broken the last of her bonds with her own hands. The tears in Maya's eyes were evidence that this time it was Cage herself who had betrayed her own friend's expectation. Maya did not say a word and left. Maya, wait, I did not want it to. Cage pulled back her hand because she was now in tears herself, not because she could not hold back her words or keep her mouth shut, but because what she said was what she actually believed and it made her hate herself even more. Disgusted by what she was becoming or the world was trying to force her into becoming one. The next day, as usual Maya left for work to the restaurant, she had been eagerly waiting for Cage to show up. She had always been on time but today she was nowhere to be found on the street or the meeting spot. She might have already gone to work. I will say her sorry there. After all I might have been too forceful with her. Even I would get mad if someone asked me to leave the orphanage. Cage should have her own choice where she lives. She is smarter than me and would know the best. At least that's what Maya had been saying to herself since she had left Cage's house. But the saddened expression on her face had made everyone panicked in the orphanage. Because Maya had always been the source of sunshine and happiness there. Seeing her sad in turn made everyone at the orphanage worry. Unfortunately, Cage did not show up at the workplace and so Maya had to work alone. Did your friend not come? There are no holidays here. Should I kick her out? Their employer complained and shouted at Maya. 275. Sir please don't. She might not be well and she has nowhere else to work and earn money. Maya apologized. So, do I need to be her nurse now? Who would do her share of work? The employed babbled. I will do it, but please don't kick her out. Maya begged. The employer glared at the beast girl. Maya, good with me, but just so you two brats know I will have to pull down your wages. So, hurry up and get back to work. The employer laughed and left. Dot. On the other hand Cage that day had decided to not go to work. She was still unsure of how to face Maya. I have said so many mean things to her, but I don't want to end things like this. I would be no better than the people who betrayed me. Cage kept on ransacking her brain to think of the best way to at least make up with Maya even if she decides to leave her after her outburst. She aimlessly walked in the alleyways of the town where only the walls whispered too peaceful, more than necessary. Ha ha ha, I finally found you, bitch. A figure from the shadows jumped in front of her. A battered face with red bruises a broken leg and a missing arm did not remind Cage of anyone matching this messed up appearance, but she exactly knew what they could have been here for. Had it not been for your voice I wouldn't have recognized you. Cage said with a bold face. And when she looked around she was surrounded from everywhere by men with weapons. It's thanks to you that I have to suffer through so much pain. The man let out a rasping shout, 
the people really took it out on you. A leg lost just for your cheap magic tricks. I would have liked to play a game with you right now, but no, thanks. 276 for nothing. Not because I pity you for your broken hand but I have more important things to worry about. Do not blame me, because you deserved it. Cage's awful speech riled up the man while she herself started walking away. A tall looking man with fierce looks and a strong build blocked her path. That saves me a lot of trouble to remind you for what I am here for, and you won't be leaving from here, not until I want. I said I will kill you, remember, but that would be too easy a death for you. The man sneered, his sunken, beady eyes were glinting with a familiar look of madness. So you think you would bring men and try to scare a little girl? Cage said to the peddler whom she exposed and also the place where she met Maya for the first time, you are no kid, when you completely destroyed and toyed with my life, I will make you crippled and keep you beating every day, put you on display everywhere in public, in circus or even better make you to beg on streets, that prideful face would then not ask me for my forgiveness, but you will be only begging kill me, kill me, kill me, the peddler signaled towards the men he hired to capture Cage, and just when the person behind her tried to grapple her, Cage was forced into using her skill once again, pretending to push away the man. Her skill activated for a second and then primarily shut down due to absence of magic, but that was enough to push the man away against the wall. Don't let her escape, chase after her. The peddler yelled at his hired men. That was her only chance to run and so did Cage ran at full speed. She never expected a revenge plotted against her, especially now when the pain of using her skill came back to her. She had to slow down and also because she was not the athletic type. The only advantage of her there being that she knew the alleyways too well, but that was only enough to buy her a little time. The central streets were still far out of reach. If she could only make it there, then the peddler won't be even able to touch her. 277 but then a metal rod came flying from the back and hit at the joints of her legs. Gah! My uh! Cage screamed in pain as she fell to the ground. Her last of words unbeknownst to dress to the only name she could remember in her time of need, or was it the guilt that she would never get the chance to apologize? Her head had hit the ground hard, and a trail of blood sullied her eyes. Everything pulsated into slow motion as her vision was growing weaker while her heart pumped blood even faster. She turned her head in her fallen state and could see the man draw his sword, approaching slowly, wincingly scraping the tip of his sword along the ground. He then swiveled his head at Cage's neck to stare at her like some kind of grotesque creature. Ay, ay, that's what brats like you get for going against me. The peddler doubled in laughter his appalling looking face a mask of pure bliss. The sound sent involuntary chills throughout Cage's body as she shuddered and crawled on the ground to move. Cage thought to keep him busy by talking, but seeing that she could be killed any moment, she would have to die alone, without letting Maya know what had happened to her, you filthy rat. How long I have waited for this, wanting to see you beg for mercy. Beg and I might just kill you without doing anything to your body. Maybe the people will take pity and bury you after I throw you on street murdered in cold blood. Cage's thoughts raced, trying to find a way out of this desperate situation. She gritted her teeth, almost with a sense of hope that everything would end soon and she would no more have to keep running. But dot suddenly, an unbearable fear seized her heart. She had gotten attached to Maya so much that the thought of leaving her behind in this twisted and insane world scared her for her life. 278, and just when he tilted his thin body backward and about to take a huge swing, Cage flicked a small knife which she always hid under her garb. She could only use her hand and although she was aiming for her neck, her blurred vision reduced her accuracy and the knife flew offline, sinking into the peddler's left arm. That dot hurts dot I am really going to kill you now. He hollered in pain as he pulled out the knife and blood encroached his arm. A heavy, thick layer of fog enveloped Cage's mind after her last resistance. She was still losing blood from her wound in the head. Seeing the man brandish his sword again as it glimmered in the sunlight. Now die. D-E-E. -E. The man shrieked. A burst of wind shot through the air. A wind colored in a red zapping light. Wah, huh? The peddler looked up with a scream of surprise, then went flying through the air with his sword, 
Cage stared silently at the figure that had descended in his place and punched through the attacker's abdomen with a single blow. I found you, Cage. I am here. You called for me. Maya's voice trembled as she crumpled over the wounded Cage, her lips quivering. She squeezed her hands tight, but her eyes wide and red with anger, an expression which she never though Maya would have been capable of. Cage was surprised to see Maya out of nowhere. But then she remembered how she had yelled out her name when she was hit for the first time. I am sorry, I am sorry, for what I said to yesterday. Cage's voice was weak and fade. Dot three minutes ago. Dot. 279. Maya was dumping the garbage in the back of the shop when her keen ears picked up a familiar voice. She could have simply overlooked it as an illusion but ignoring that voice which in few days had meant so much for her. Was unacceptable. Maya's instincts screamed at her that something was wrong, that she needed to move no matter what and quick. It was the first time this sort of urgency pushed Maya past her limits. Her beast transformation took complete control and she was giving off an electric red aura from her body. Her limbs filled with magical energy she jumped to the rooftop and dashed through the place. Her ears exactly knew the direction from where the noise came and she was drawn to it like a tiger following its prey. This also meant that in barely two minutes, she had covered half the distance of the town. It was an impossible feat, faster than a flying magical beast could ever achieve. But here Maya was by Cage's side, her hair seemed longer than usual and her bone muscles grew tight and broad. Even her nails had hardened and become sharper. I will not let anyone harm you. Maya nodded at Cage. Kill that girl too. She is also to blame for this. I would have gone after her when I would have been done with this girl, but finding you two together, makes my blood boil. The peddler jumped up from his cramped state, the men following his orders ran at Maya with their weapons, hoping that she only got past her because they were taken by surprise, but they were moving too slow. At least in Maya's eyes they could have been depicted to be in a frozen state. Another dash of red lightning and Maya disappeared from everyone's eyes. Only a trail of quick red light drew a line along each men. A simple punch from Maya and they were on their knees. 280. Bwah. The four men who the peddler had hired were now unconscious and the weapons in their hand fell to the ground. Useless punch and they call themselves bandits. I will kill you two with my own hands. The peddler picked his sword back as he ran towards Maya. Maya did not move from her place. She waited and focused all her energy into her palm. Die dot dot d e e e. The man jumped in madness as he swung down his sword on her. Maya raised another swift horizontal punch and the sword crumbled into metal chunk pieces, shattering like glass. H r r g dot r. The peddler next faced a full turnaround kick for Maya straight at his chest, bashed against the wall and knocked out most probably ending up with several bone fractures and rib cage damage from the crackling sound of his brittle bones. Cage are you alright? Maya turned around with a thumbs up and a wide smile on her face, her body features returning to normal. Cage now had a newfound realization. She did not need to protect Maya, what she needed in actual was a companion. Someone with whom she could share her heart and her dream. Cage knew Maya could have been the only one but she had lost even that little chance she had with her cage. Maya called out again as she saw her hiding her face. I'm sorry. I dot I don't have the right dot to even dot see you anim. But you still saved me putting your life in danger. Cage hid her face behind her arms. You are bleeding. Maya tore a part of her dress and quickly tied it around her head. Cage desperately raised herself from the ground finally in control of her body again. The damage she had suffered still left an unpleasant numbness. And then came the warm feeling as Maya casually hugged her. 281! Exclamation mark. The sisters at the orphanage always do this whenever we got hurt. Maya said in a calming motherly tone. Cage stiffened and tried to use her hands to push Maya away for a second. But seeing how tightly Maya held to her slender body, she stopped resisting. Cage let out a trembling breath and then whispered, I am truly pathetic for saying such mean things to you when in truth I am the one who got beaten up so badly. You don't need to say any more. I know I cannot be you, but I always wanted to be your friend from the day I met you. Maya held Cage tightly, 
listening to her breathing as they calmed down. After that Maya tied the four men and the peddler with a tight rope and dumped them in a dustbin along with the garbage which Maya had to take care of otherwise. The two were now on top of a roof because Maya wanted for Cage to have some fresh air to make her feel better. A chilling wind touched their faces that suggested the coming of winter. Cage turned straight to Maya smiling unconsciously. She just didn't want to be apart from her. Maya I really want you to understand how I feel. Cage looked intensely resolute. Yeah. Maya responded affirmative. It's not our fault that we were born under unlucky stars. If we are poor then we just have to accept it. People are like that way too where they butter the strong while sneer at the weak. But it doesn't have to always be the same. We will together change our fate. With my knowledge and genius, and your strength. Together we can do wonders. Maya. Yeah. Another militaristic affirmative as if Maya could hear those parading pompous drill song in her ears. 282. Together we will scam this whole world and claim all of its richness as ours. Cage grabbed her fist tightened. Maya could feel the bright warm light that shone straight from Cage's powerful soul, meant to guide them. Which now they had to walk together holding hands to achieve their dream. Alone it was almost impossible, but together, they were invincible. Maya was speechless, she had never seen Cage so resolved and she wanted to be part of her dream and there with her, whether a day would come when they had achieved their day or they crumble and fall apart. I promise even in your happiness and sadness, I will be always there to keep you safe and there for you until the final moment. And I promise I'll protect you, too. I'll be here for you forever, just don't leave me. 283 Chapter 9 For Bearer of Chaos Cage was detached from her emotions and was operating like a machine. But her lack of power was slowly failing her. She wanted to destroy the man's everything and make him pay hundred times over. But after killing him she no longer felt pain. All she could think of was her next move. To find Maya and get out of this town as fast as possible. Somewhere safe, somewhere far. A place where no one could find them. No one could recognize who they were or their crimes either. A place where they could have a fresh start, with no mistakes. But is there really a place like that, as if such a convenient thing could really exist? Cage always reached the same conclusion. It starts with resigning herself to the truth. What the elder Dalton brother said about Cage might not have been far from the truth but rather those thoughts always haunted her deep within her core. Every day in horror she waited for Maya to betray her too. Just like her family, the person she looked up to and until now whoever she had ever come to trust. Hence such a place could only exist beyond the planes of reality. Otherwise she would have been there and not just fantasizing about it. Initially getting out of the bandit's stronghold on her own almost seemed impossible to her. But wanting to keep her word, the promise that she had made. She could not let things and the friendship she had formed fall apart so easily and without trying. Also after the life she had taken in cold blood she could not stand on her feet without shaking. The knife was lying somewhere stained in cold blood, while she fainted on the ground. The building on fire and the dense smoke clouded her vision. 284. Whether she would wake up again or not, the fact haunted her. But if she wanted to tell the truth to find that Amity, she needed to speak to Maya first. After all there were things that she herself didn't knew about Maya. Disorder was spread everywhere outside the building where Cage was trapped. Maya was surrounded by the group of bandits and she had already got the leader of the group, the young adult and brother on guard. Winning against him was an impossible feat even for Maya in her beast transformed state. She knew if she fought, this would be a losing war. Cage had always told her that if she could not win a fight, then escaping from there without actually getting hurt is scoring the real win. But her feelings for Cage kept on preventing Maya from the very thought of fleeing away without her. Maya's trembling fingers over her blades became stable at the very thought of saving her. Maya would not surrender or leave without getting what she came here for. After all she wanted to let Cage know that the promise she made was as much important to her so much as to Cage. Maya even though being the comforting type was now ready to rip apart anything that tried to hurt Cage. Things were becoming static. As time crossed, the future itself seemed bleak and hopeless despite the fight they had put up through their entire life and will this be also the way if how it would all come to an end. 
the bandits slowly approaching Maya to capture her. Cage who was desperately fighting for her life in that fire, but silence was one thing that was common to the two now and those who know of its true forbearing always fear it. Because it is that they know that real chaos makes no noise. Silence always ensure no one sees that kind of calamity coming. Fate cannot be changed in haste nor its straightforward flow can be turned just by willpower or by some forced mastermind scheme. What could really bend it is a spark. 285, an agent of chaos. That's what always needed to break that tranquility or the stalemate to part of this hanging world. And when Alicia had decided to respond to Myers and Cage's tacit calling, she would show up by becoming the chaos herself and that day her presence was more than enough to set the entire forest ablaze. A pulsating sound ripping across the forest line in the boundary of the stronghold turned everyone's gazes. The noise kept on growing, it was an unfamiliar sound, so it unknowingly succeeded in keeping everyone's attention, and when the harsh noise of the changing valves and the rough turning of wheels grew louder and louder by every second for the bandits to identify where the clamor was actually coming from. Crash. Old bricks went flying across the place as a huge slender piece of metal broke in through the walls. The bandits, the young adult and brother and including Maya was stunned to see two girls sitting over a deviant complicated machinery put together by some bizarre mage craft. But Maya quickly identified the two riders as the one in front was the disbelieving self-claiming elf princess, Regis and the one sitting at the back the enigmatic human girl, Alicia. In that moment of breaking through the wall, they had taken out one side of the bandits that blocked Maya's path. The impact of the blast threw everyone far out of sight and the sound of breaking bones and their anguished screams were heard simultaneously. And when everyone made recheck on reality with what had actually happened and the origin of such disaster, the two girls unfamiliar to the majority there, remained arguing, as if unaware of their own deeds. Alicia what were you thinking trying to lean on me and disturb me while driving? It could have been a much worse accident. Regis mulled as her hands were tightly clutched to the brakes. 286 but you were going to run over a squirrel had I not taken the control of handles from the back. Alicia briefly explained for her actions. Wait there was a squirrel? Thank you. Next time I will be more careful while driving. Regis apologized understanding her own mistake. The two girl casually talked, caring about a squirrel more than the well-being of the people that were knocked away by the accident they had caused. Even for bandits it was the worst hand they could have met crushed before committing the crime. Maya we finally caught up to you. Alicia exclaimed as she flung out of the bike. What are you two doing here? Maya asked straight away, her expression tensed and surprised at the same time. With how things were proceeding she had little to no idea how to rescue Cage now as the confusion grew even more with their presence. Preventing the birth of a ghost in debt. That's what we are here for. Regis stuttered realizing she was straight away walking into a den of bandits while at the same time trying to copy of how Alicia kept it so well together. Rather it was that Alicia did not care at all. How dire and dangerous the situation they were in. Disregarding her surroundings as usual she cared more for the reasons she was there for. I was worried about Cage too, and yes, what Regis said. Alicia seconded Regis's opinion. I don't understand what you mean but it can be really dangerous here. These men will be after you too. Run while I still have their attention. Maya tried to persuade Alicia, but she might have been tired too late in doing so. Alicia have you thought of anything what to do from here? Shouldn't you have located Cage by now? I don't think we should stand idle like this here any longer. Regis apprehensive to the angry murmurs of the bandits and their frowned looks that could give sleepless nights to any normal kid and forever traumatized. 287. No, Regis things have changed with this. With what is going around here, you wouldn't like yourself neglecting them for later. So, you should go with Maya and rescue everyone. This should help you. Alicia said in a calm voice. She seemed to be focused on like her jolly self as she beckoned her hand. A small orb with a flash of light floated at eye level appeared. Al, guide them to where Cage and others are. Alicia ordered Al, that was her other half of her consciousness that she awakened through one of her unique skills. Alicia what are you going to do? You shouldn't stay here alone. Regis said worriedly. 
but this time she was not forceful as she had been from the beginning. Don't worry about me. I already have a plan to deal with them. Alicia said almost confidently that Regis's nervousness transformed into wishing Alicia best of luck. All right, if you say so, but still be careful. But how are we going to get out of here? Maya was ready to take the slimmest of chance to save Cage even if it came from nowhere, and Alicia had already earned Maya's trust with the financial help and owed her a lot already. She was unaware of her motivation of doing so, but no matter what she had already planned to pay her later, the orb of light that looked peaceful until now, burst into flames and floated high above, moving in the right direction at rapid speed it zapped through the air. There's no time, can you jump through trees? Regis asked looking at Maya. Before Maya could form an actual reply, Regis held her by the shoulder. She then took a deep breath and controlling her wind magic by keeping herself focused Regis took a long jump but then appeared to fly as she rapidly moved from one top of the tree to another. Instantly catching up to the light ball, she was now in proper control of her magic. 288 Maya apprehensively screamed but it was not like she could not get accustomed to the speed as they followed the orb of light in the darkness of the forest. The shining moon cast a faint shadow of their silhouette over the trees until Alicia saw then fading away to 289. Regis Escalon Will she be fine by herself alone there? Maya asked, her head turning back trying to get a small peek, even if it was actually impossible to see what was going on with Alicia and the bandits. Rather it was horrifying to think that they could not at all hear any sounds coming from there. It was a bit more peaceful there than the yells they would have expected to hear from those agitated bandits after infiltrating their base. If I were you, I would be worried more about the bandits than about her. Regis said proudly until then she suddenly remembered what she had to go through on the Dragon Island keeping up with Alicia's quirky antics. She continued saying in a battered voice, as long as she does not think of trying to impress them with her genius ideas, everything should turn out to be just fine. Are you really sure with that face you are making? Maya again couldn't bring herself to believe Regis with her strained eyebrows and her elven ears perked up. Everything's going to be just fine. Regis asserted Maya who still looked at her in disbelief, but right now it was Regis who felt most conflicted of all. From the time she had set off with Alicia she had been complaining a lot for keeping Alicia away from troubles and about different things. Her own dilemmas of hurting Alicia if she again lose control over her magic or hurting someone else on their journey unintentionally. It was only for Alicia's promise that kept her mind stable and away from these fears. But now unexpectedly, Alicia had sent I away. Did Regis's behavior somehow prove to be annoying for her or in a way tired her out? But she was slowly realizing that it was only her anxiety trying to lead her astray. Regis still believed that there was a special reason Alicia wanted for her to go and look for Cage. She would have never left her side, otherwise. 290 Even if Alicia was the one to begin this journey, Regis had finally decided that she would enjoy this journey with her all the way through. Just as much as Alicia and make sure that nothing bad happens to her without getting in her way. Just then the flying light ball stopped and circled over a small building, a singular room surrounded by concrete wall. Is that it? Regis muttered and coughed as the black smoke radiating from the place blocked her nose. The fire was fierce and the front door was complete fenced with fire. Regis thought of using her wind magic by force, but if the fire was this spread out and with all the windows blocked to let the wind escape, the building will collapse and someone trapped in would surely die. Regis bit her finger as she was drawing to an end. Cage is there. She is really there. I can smell her. Maya's murmur caught Regis's attention. As she saw her eyes widened, eyes that were determined and in pain too. Just then Maya leapt from the branch, her form engulfed in red lightning. Her body hairs grew longer and stand out, her nails transformed into something akin to monsters and like a flash of light, she dropped over the rooftop and with a thunder broke through the ceiling just with the sheer force of her foot. Now there was a gaping hole over the roof, but the escaping black fumes blocked the view. Maya! Regis cried. I am in and fine. I will be now searching for Cage. Her voice came from inside, 
bringing relief to Regis. She had decided to wait for a minute and keep a watch and go in herself if there is no movement. Cage. Cage. Maya shouted as she waved her hand across her face to shift the smoke. Through that haziness her view was not clear but her smell still worked wonder even inside. She could smell too. Someone alive and a. Dead. 291. Her mind blanked but her body still moved. Energy bursting inside her she strengthened her heart. Her feet did not hesitate, because she knew Cage was a survivor and she would pull her out from the clutches of death if she had to. Because that's what she had always promised to do. Her legs briskly moved when she found a pair of dangling chains cut in half, sidestepping a bloody knife. Her lungs felt heavy and a nerve-wracking headache took hold of her. She prayed and prayed, her heart throbbed when next she found an unshaking body covered in fresh blood. And closing her eyes she looked in front. She caught onto a nostalgic scent trail. She zapped through the air, and the throttle pushed aside all the fire lashing out at her for a moment, looking down at a fragile body, unconscious on the floor. Cage's body was upbeat. Her hands were still warm and her chest still breathed life. I found you, Cage. I am here. I will not let you get hurt. A voice whispered in Cage's ear, and she recognized those words as they were not the first time that spoke to her her eyes barely able to open only to see tears in Maya's eyes, I made you cry again. Cage spoke as she coughed black smoke at the same time. Not at all, everything's alright. Maya was just that glad that Cage was alive, Maya will you take me away from here? I cannot, I want to go somewhere far far away with you. I finally saw a place in my dream. Cage looked at Maya, her lips pursed and dry. Maya could also see her hands with scars around the wrist, the one tied to the chains was none other than her, that is really a dreamlike place, I will always follow you wherever you want to go. So, let's go there for real, Maya said wiping off the dampness from her eyes, 292, yeah, I will find a way. Ah, my head hurts, maybe I will relax for a bit for a while. Cage started to faint again. First let me get you out of here. Then we will have our first holiday ever. You were never really fond of taking breaks now were you? Saying that Maya put around Cage's hands around her shoulder. She stiffened her legs on the ground and held Cage's slender body tight horizontally. And the next moment she knew they were jumping high in the air. Cage had brilliantly flung out through the same hole she made in the roof. Quickly. Regis called out to Maya who climbed back with Cage on the same tree, is she alright? I think she is, some rest and she would be back in action again, Maya said with a forced smile, don't worry, Alicia can fix any injury with her healing magic, as long as she is alive, Regis offered, really, so, she is a healer, Maya wanted to know more about both Alicia and Regis, who came out of nowhere lending her help, don't just go off declaring me dead without my permission, Cage woke up holding her hurting head, embarrassingly freeing herself from Maya's clutches and tight hug. Cage you are alright, are you really alright, does it hurt somewhere? Maya was so overwhelmed that she could not express herself properly and flipped with each dialogue, of course, I would be. Cage took a quick look at Regis and recognizing her made a quick guess of what would have actually happened, she could have gone into details later. But the topmost priority was to get the children to safety. Maya, the kids are prisoners here. We need to get them out as fast as possible. We can expect the Dalton gang anytime here soon. Why would kids be held hostage here? Regis asked confused. 293. They are planning them to sell to slave traders, more specifically to a doctor. Well in any case their life is in danger. If they learn I have escaped their knee that they will transfer them to a new place or straight deliver them to the client. Cage shed some light on their motives. Sold to slave traders. Children as slaves. Regis felt lost. What? Are you some princess from Farland? That's where everyone ends up in towns like these where there is no to look after or support you. Regis sculpted, but soldiered on with a nod and took everything with a pinch of salt, but where do we find them, I can trace no smell even in my beast form, Maya said agitated, sniffing her nose around in the air trying her best, 
most probably they are being kept guarded in this fort. Maybe in an underground cellar or secret room. And we should also be expecting a barrier too. Cage scratched her brain hard. If that's the case then. Regis's attention and the other two was now drawn to the orb of light circling overhead them. The orb of light jingled as if hysterically nodding, only remembering right now that it had an incomplete job to do. It again swiftly moved through the air and vanished into darkness. After it, Regis said as she jumped to the next neighboring tree. There's no time, can you jump through trees? Maya asked looking at Cage who pondered over that orb and whom it could belong to. Dot before Cage could form an actual reply, Maya held her by the shoulder, as if following in someone's footsteps she kept on leaping from one tree to the next one, quickly catching up to both Regis and the orb while Cage who kept on screaming at being carried and moved around so roughly she had to keep her mouth shut with her own hands and suppress her screams for not wanting to alert the bandits giving guard to the place they were going. 294 this time the three were watching over an underground basement and the orb of light kept on circling over it, though the orb actually went unnoticed by the eight bandits giving guard to the place. The three took shelter a bit farther from the old prison cells of the fort. The bandits walked over a metal grill and beneath that there was a huge hollow space in the ground and the children were inside them. Even though Maya and Cage gave several signs, but it seems that a perception blocking barrier was at place, and the children in the inside could not see what was happening on the outside. This is bad. All of those eight are good close combat fighter and some of them even have martial arts skill and fatal sword skills. Cage, who had worked in close association with the Dalton group, recognized them easily. If only I could be more strong and at a higher level. Maya frowned her whiskers growing around her nose and beast form shook heavily. Let me think, if we could isolate and break them somehow. But we have very less time for doing that. We don't know for how long your friend will be able to hold back there. We need to decide quick. Cage was still suffering from headaches and breathing issues but she won't rest unless she had made sure that everyone was safe. Cage also had successfully surmised the situation that somehow Alicia was keeping the others at bay, maybe by offering them a deal, but Cage also knew that Dalton brothers were never that fond of money. What they always seek was power and control, money was just a means to achieve that goal. Snatching that money would be more of their style and when that happens they would be upon them next. Following them like dogs. The rescue mission and everyone's hard work would fail miserably. If only I could use magic. Cage repeated after Maya. Cage had already used her skill for the day. Doing it once again would most probably make her suffer from completely paralysis. She could already feel her legs and hands going numb. 295. If in that place anyone was familiar to those words and sentiments of Maya and Cage. Then it was none other than Regis herself. Before meeting Alicia. She was always trying to prove herself out of fear of being weak and useless in her own eyes. Unable to use her own magic because of its destructive nature and handling it properly, but not anymore. Regis didn't want to make any more compromises with her life. She had grown out of that weak self and was now out of it to learn more about this wonderful world that had brought her and Alicia together as friends. Regis never wanted to let Alicia down because it was now that she realized that she was sent away for this very job. While saving Cage was the agenda, Maya was going to be the one to do that. Alicia had planned for Regis to rescue the other kidnapped kids while she took care of the bandits and its leader. And the thing she would have come to regret later had she not seen it with her own eyes. Even elf kids are trapped there and so many. Regis murmured. From what I have learned there are kids of our orphanage, of our plum town and nearby towns too. There is no surprise that elves are the best selling materials as slaves and fetch higher price in the black market. No slave trader or bandit would spare an effort to get their hands on them. By my count more than 50 kids are trapped there. Cage explained still wondering how Regis was unaware of all this. Regis gritted her teeth. I am going to get everyone out of there. Now. That's what I am here for. Are you mad? How do you plan to take on eight people at the same time? Even if one of them escape they could take a kid hostage and threaten us. That would be the worst possibility and that is when we screw this all up. Cage held Regis by her arm seeing her impulsive declaration. I will finish them all at once. 
Just watch me, because that's my duty. Regis stood up from hiding in the tree's branches. Cage instinctively took her off her hand. 296 Regis untied her red hairs as they flew in a particular direction. Her ears twitched as if she was taking a feel of the whole place and her surroundings. Brandishing her hand, magically a beautiful bow formed in her hand which she had pulled out from a dimensional storage of her ring. Both Cage and Maya were surprised to see a bow appear out of nowhere. Cage was at least right of Regis being an archer, but both were still unable to see any arrows with her. Regis then jumped to the next tree in close proximation to the bandits. Her duty. Just who is she? Cage asked quizzically. She is the princess of the Elf Kingdom, Maya said, this time not in disbelief, but rather she acknowledged the fact and so did Cage, as the two could not deny that determined look on Regis's face and the weight of responsibility she held on her shoulder was as if for a moment visible to them. The sympathy she expressed for the first time for the kidnapped children after she was pushed out of her oblivion and the urgency to rescue them right away was real and undeniable. Regis, who was watching the movements of the bandits on the ground. She held the same bow that her mother gifted to her. And the most special ability of this bow was that magical arrows would form itself over its string when magic power is supplied to its ends, and with Regis's vast magic reserves and its destructive nature. Just a graze of her fingers were enough to form three strong magical pointed arrows at once. Aiming them at the three bandits on the right flank, she shot at them at their heart. Regis with no show of mercy, had killed the first three bandits as they let out their last cry of anguish and alarm the others simultaneously. Regis had no intention of leaving a single of them alive. She was no stranger to the fact of how her father, mother and big sister Edith had always worked hard and put their life in danger fighting against slave traders and bandits and other countless elf warriors who secretly work away from their home country rescuing slave elves from all over the world. 297. And for such inhumane act, there could have been only one judgment death. That's the declaration the second princess of Kingdom of Escalon, of the Elf Empire, Regis made on that day. Now jumping down from the tree she had to face five more bandits. Since the bandits had no long-range weapon, Regis could operate from far with the advantage of a surprise attack. There was no way she could have lost. Also, that would have been the deciding point, since Regis cannot take five of them down at once. But she had already decided to put her life in danger. She was not afraid of receiving a slash or two in return but her worries were unfounded. Just as she had descended, unimaginably the flare of light that Alicia had offered to show them the way, burst into a wondrous light show, sparkling with crackling sound in the sky, skillfully drawing the attention of other bandits. Attack. There is an attack on us. One of the bandits cried, did it came from above. Everyone stared up searching for the intruder that claimed the life of three of theirs, and that was going to be Regis's signal. Now she knew more than anything that Alicia was still watching and was there ready to help in any way she could. Regis without wasting any time prepared a magic attack. She learned from Willor was actually a modification of his sound magic to suit her wind magic nature. Her entire body seemed to emit a predatory intensity as she completed the chant. Howl through the wind and shred all creation. Howling wind. A cacophony of disastrous small wind tornadoes headed in the direction of bandits ripping of their bodies with its destructive aspect. Putting another three out of commission, and by the time the remaining two standing noticed the change in their numbers, Regis had quickly moved to their backs, kicked them on their legs which made them to fall on their knees. 298 Finally shooting an arrow each through their heart form the back. Maya warn me before I try to scam any other elf next time. I don't want to get shot by an arrow in the back so ruthlessly, I don't. Cage and Maya whispered to each other watching from far holding themselves tightly, thinking they could have been the next sooner or later. They realized that Regis was not someone to mess around with her feelings and clearly not a gentle girl as she appeared to be of royal pedigree, more like she was an executioner princess. Maya and Cage climbed down too as they stepped over the corpses and ran to the place where the kids were locked. There was no keyhole lock that Cage could have tried to pick up, 
and when Maya tried to pull apart the metal bars she was repulsed back. There's no use, it's blocked by a physical barrier, and only the Dalton brothers would know a way of putting it away. Cade looked for a magical artifact or some wizard around who might have put the barrier, the eight were dead and the barrier was still around, but the kids, they are still in there. Maya complained glowering, move aside, Regis said, her blood still boiling as she just now was in the heat of the fight. Though it was nothing compared to the exhaustive feeling she had to go through in the fight with Alicia, Maya and Cage moved aside on hearing Regis's domineering voice, they saw her removing her glove and unable to understand what she was going to do if not trying to attack it again and again with her magic arrows. Regis simply put forward her hand and when it came in contact with the invisible shield, a blue screen surfaced. That was the top layer of the magical barrier. Regis felt the reflecting force that pushed her back, brushing her feet against the ground. She held her stance without flinching. Letting out a war cry she channeled all her magic power through her hand and clashed it against the barrier. The barrier was huge and covered the entire prison cells. 299 Regis could instinctively hear the cries and sobs of children from the inside who were scared of the noises and of the barrier breaking from the outside. She did not know for how many days they were trapped there, but she was well familiar to the painful feeling of being separate from their parents and being alone and helpless. Regis could never use her magic for something constructive. Her magic proved to be useless while rescuing Cage in hopes of putting out the flames, but on this journey she had learned her own way. If she had to help anyone, then she would just have to destroy everything in her way. There was a heavy, percussive thud. A clash of strong wind waves and the light racing through the magic barrier brought a fierce pressure on the land. The dress swayed in all direction while Maya stiffened her legs. Cage held onto a fixed boulder just in case. Regis throttled her palm as it succeeded in crossing the barrier, several cracks forming on the surface. A destructive wind magic was slowly corrupting the formation of the magic barrier at its core and when Regis closed her fingers making a fist, the barrier crumbled down like glass falling to the floor, exploded into glittering light shards and disappearing next to her. Maya quickly went to the place and with her strength and the barrier gone it was now pretty much easy for her to just scratch away the cage and throw it away. Big sister, Maya. Several cries of Maya's names filled the place and to Regis's surprise she appeared to be pretty good at handling them when all of them listened to her and stopped crying. Seeing that even the other children who was unfamiliar to her, listened to what Maya had to say. While Cage was more than familiar with this miraculous scene and called it one of Maya's charms. I will be now heading back to where Alicia is. Regis said to Cage. 300. I will be coming with you. I too want to help. It was Maya who volunteered, but what about the kids? Regis asked of their safety since it was better someone should stay with them here for their safety or best guide them back to the village. Don't worry the kids of the orphanage can easily head down the mountain and get to the city. The sisters at the orphanage would do everything to get the children back to their homes. Cage butted in as she too volunteered to come with Maya. After all she too had a score to settle. So, everyone made sure that the kids were on the right path back to the town. Some of the elf children even came and thanked Regis which made her effort more the worthwhile and also to her on decide what goals she had to achieve on this journey next beside helping out Alicia as the three hurriedly headed back to the place where they parted. 301 Chapter 10 El Dorado A sword making a sharp snapping sound as it slices through the air. The swiftness and precision of the movement of the blade made it evident that they were not just for show or practice. Though I was far from being defenseless myself, I wasn't sure how long I could have held against such destructive attacks aiming straight for places where my opponent knew I would be open. With a fair bit of uncertainty, I lifted my sword to block the first few strikes and glided back. And before I had the chance to ask the question of why I am being attacked by my own mother, she launched herself at me again this time with more fervor. I am the master here, not you. Now fight. As if reading my mind my mother the true hero of this world, Caroline S. Callon flashed a gentle smile at me. This is going to be terrifying. I thought to myself, a contrary reaction to a charming smile. I had to be daring to take on the challenge, 
My mother becomes a fearsome figure whenever I am facing off against her. I truly never felt this terrified even fighting against the labyrinth's strongest monsters. The sweat I felt running down my body could be imaginary. However, if I intended to survive to see the next day with all my body parts there, I had to survive every attack or at least dodge them at best. Learning from the world's most skilled swordswoman Carolyn, could have been an incredible opportunity as long as it does not mean I had to risk my life in every training bout. But even if I complained that I preferred magic for defeating monsters. 302 Mother always said that it's something she owed to someone for teaching it to me and simply because she wanted me to because I am her daughter, passing her skills down to me and my little sister, but deep within now I knew, my mother just wanted to clash swords. Maybe it was the sentiment, those who stand at the top of the skill possess, saying that they did not want to lose their edge. A beam of light emits from mother's sword slash, as I parried them and sent it flying into the forest. Suddenly. A handful of trees slowly fall within the forest surrounding the training grounds, the leaves of other trees rustle, and some mystical birds of neighboring trees all fly into the sky. A slightly dull sound echoes through the area as the trees hit the ground, that would have surely torn through half of my body. I rub the truth on myself, realizing it was a dire situation that called for serious action. Pay attention, I'm not going to let you up that easily. My mother warned, as she approached me, I felt a cold chill ripple up my spine. With my mystic eyes, it was easy to analyze her movements and predict her attacks so I sidestepped and easily dodged her opening strike. Without missing a beat, mother glided forward and closed the distance between us, striking the inside of my leg and there named for my side. I lifted my black sword and locked eyes with my sparring partner. With my white sword holding on defense, I successfully blocked her strikes. I thrust my other hand forward, fully determined to take my victory today. But both mother and I were dual wielders possessing two complementary swords. So, things always got complicated, especially when I was forbidden to use attack magic during training for learning purposes. Mother's left hand suddenly left the grip of the sword while she now only hold it with her right hand. Her left hand moves back and forth, fast enough to draw her second sword from the sheath. 303. Just unsheathing her sword, drifting it against the air, a pressure developed so high to raise a tempest of dust and obscure my view. Wind slashes gliding and when we saw where our blades stopped. Wah! As I stood there, frozen in place, mother's eyes crinkled in a warm smile. I guess we now know who is today's winner again. While my black sword was directly hovering a millimeter above my opponent's shoulder, mother's tip of the sword was drawn up to my throat. We drew back our swords and mother declared it to be the end of our today's training. I and mother sat back while she had already opened the lunchbox. I had prepared sandwiches for myself to eat while I was going to read some books on magecraft and alchemy in the afternoon. I really like the stuff you put inside. Every flavor adds up so perfectly in the mouth. It's so delicious. Mother couldn't help herself but garner some compliments for her daughters which made it worth it for me. I will make sure to prepare more so that we can enjoy it together. I was having ideas of a picnic in the dungeon itself. But it didn't make less of a home for us. After mother was done with the food, she suddenly looked at me in wonderment. Is something bothering you Alicia? Nothing at all? I denied of all possibilities. But with mother's virtues she stared at me tilting her head down meeting me at my eyesight, she had already caught the wind of it and won't leave me until I come clean, I was just wondering is it really necessary for me to train so hard if I can be self-sufficient by using magic in this new world, no monster stand chance against my spells and even you have acknowledged that, 304, listen dear, monsters are not all about claws and teeth, they are about deeds done, unforgivable ones, and even among our own kind, there are people out there whom you could identify as monsters, some even worse than them. Mother gently patted my head. She continued, you and I are just girls in a wide world which is biased towards keeping all responsible jobs reserved for men from birth and look down on us. Then there are those greedy men who take advantage of women and they do not care for their age, strength or lives. Out there you will be alone and it makes me worry, that's why I want you to take more care of yourself. 
For a moment I couldn't bring myself able to speak anything. Mother placed her hands on my palms, which were clutching my two black and white swords at the time. These swords can take you anywhere in this world, wherever you want and can get you whatever you desire. Knowing that you will be safe if I am able to do at least this much, I am relieved. I gazed at the huge forest in front of us and great many trees that we had felled but astoundingly grew back the next day. The rays of sunshine from the artifact full sunfall on my body and the coldness that I usually felt in the labyrinth while being lost was no more and long gone. The things I had been always wanting in my previous life were all here, and yet I had to leave it all some day. The air started to feel suddenly so dull. Not because what mother told me was something serious or I was not aware of. Rather it did invoke a strange memory from my past. I am sorry Alicia, if you are not prepared to hear this or learn that this world is no different and people can still be malicious. No, it's not that all. I nodded my head. It's just that it is not something I am hearing for the first time. In my previous world, in the shop in which I was a regular from where I bought snacks, the shopkeeper was an old lady. We were not that close, but on occasions she would talk to me and she would tell me the same thing. To take care of myself. I said to mother, my eyes a bit flushed. 305. Remembering back, I was not that well acquainted with her, but maybe I visited her old-fashioned confectionery shop only because she would sometimes engage some talk with me. And in between she would prompt me to look after my safety. I don't know whether she was able to guess about my situation from my desperation. But I too liked to have small chats with her, then I don't think I need to worry so much. Then suddenly mother's expression turned from relaxed to grim, Alicia someday you would feel like burning the world, I know you would never mean to, but this world is not meant for just one person. We can't turn away from the ugly part of this world, but if you try to cut off those ugly parts by yourself the dirtier your hands will be. The only thing you can do is keep your swords close and keep moving. Does even father underestimates us? I asked my cheeks puffed, considering how last time he didn't let me try several of magic spells from the forbidden arcana in the library saying that it was dangerous if I was the one trying it. I felt for some payback. Oh, the last time he did underestimate me, he had to pay dearly for it. When I left him tied to a flying berserk dragon's back for a week. Mother said putting a finger to her lips thinking how long it might have been since she had done something adventurous. I want to hear more of that story and can I try those magic spells? I thought I could get permission from mother if not from father, a simple tactic employed by every kid. I will tell you that story later, but why don't you go freshen up first after the training? Amu. I was happy thinking that my mother might have approved of me practicing spells as I walked out. Alicia as for trying out the new spells you can only do it as long as you promise you won't bury us on this floor like the last time or leave the barrier with dimensional holes in it. A blunt voice called for me from behind and I knew I wouldn't hear the end of it if I didn't control my powers this time around. 306. Mother wouldn't think of tying me to a dragon as a punishment. Now would she? Ah. Maybe she would. I dare not turn my back and look at her now. I ran back to the mansion thinking of making something special for mother for dinner tonight. But during this whole conversation, I understood what mother wanted to warn me about and I was no stranger to the atrocities and potential abuse. As a girl I had to look after myself from a very young age. I knew I had no backing of my guardians and I don't have my parents to protect me. That's why I always hid. Careful. Cautious of dangerous people capable of hurting other people, but now things were different, I was stronger and this time I knew what I wanted to do, and I was never planning to let anyone get in my way. 307. Alicia was Scalon Ashbourne you just can't have a reincarnated person in a fantasy world without them facing bandits in their journey. Even if it's a bit tad late for me from when I reincarnated. But bandit hunting is always a fun part of any adventure game. I thought to myself excited with the painted on grin that only Regis could have identified hidden under my mask. Because when I looked around and noting the number of bandits and their appearance, it reminded me of the good old adventure quest games I played back at home. But still, 
My objective was to rescue Cage and Maya which was currently being carried out by Regis and because I wanted for her to decide for rescuing the lot of kids I had sensed being trapped in this bandit space. All the men were equipped with leather armor and thick long sleeve tunics, wielding various weapons. Some carried a sword with daggers at their waist, while others carried bows. They sneered at me, realizing I had entered through the wrong door and demolished the wall. I acknowledged my mistake and was ready to take responsibility for the property loss. Surrounded by more than fifty bandits, I sighed as I found more appearing from behind the cover of trees and bushes. Knowing the effectiveness of this strategy it was ludicrous that it would ever work, but because I promised Regis that I would go with the plan, I thought to give it a try even by a long shot. I bring an offer for you all. I would like to purchase the freedom of Cage and Maya and a promise that you all won't interfere again with their lives. In return I offer you twice dot even thrice the sum of the original amount, or I can even increase the amount if you are ready to talk and settle this thing peacefully. I declared in a loud voice making sure their leader would have heard me. Ha dot dot ga ha ha dot ga Every standing man laughed as they started banging their weapons on the floor. This made them appear to be more like a signature move of a trained tribe preparing for a ritual. 308 If you have really that much money, wouldn't it be much easier for us to snatch it all from you? A bandit brandished his sword in front of himself, shining the sharpness of the blade in his eyes. We know you are the rich girl, thinking of helping some poor orphaned girls will brighten your heart. Such big hearts always crumbles here easily, until they start begging for their lives. Another bandit leered at my intricately designed robe covering up my figure that drew the men's gazes. The bandits all had vulgar smiles on their faces, but they approached me without any carelessness, indicating some level of skill. My absolutely perfect plan had unbelievably failed, not that I was desperate, but looking at how everyone just saw me as a plaything with all my company and friends gone, they thought I would be fearful and scared. Since Cage's safety was not yet ascertained, I wanted to buy time for them in case they sent some of their men after Regis. So, I had to do this even if it meant employing such a cheap means of pretending to buy people's freedom, but as long as it could make me avoid, my thoughts were cut short on hearing an announcement of the Dalton gang in response to my proposal. Attach a collar to her neck and you can put the girl into the cellar along with other children. A man at the rear with the strongest built and exuding the maximum amount of magic. A broad freshly bloodied sword attached to his waist. No doubt he was their leader that he could order his men around. Also, confirming my suspicion of children being kidnapped and kept here. One of the men approached me from behind with a metal black collar and a gag. Before that, why don't we see what face is under the mask? Keeping your face hidden. Surely there must be something special. We are going to take good care of you. I've got plenty of handy items just for that purpose. A bandit snootily said, licking his lips with a pointed tongue. 309. We can have our fun with her first and then with her companions when we have captured them too. All of them are a beauty even that elf would be the best treat for tonight. Another bandit said laughing vulgarly. But I guess this one would break on her first turn. Just her sight is so weak and her voice is so innocent. As long as we don't destroy the goods, a few of them broken won't bother the slave traders. Every bandit there was having their own opinions about me and what they wanted to do with us girls. Suddenly, a man with a giant physique comparable to that of an ogre walked in front. Long messy beard, a fat belly pot shaped. He tried to rudely approach in my direction. When the man laughed. A wave of rancid air filled the place revealing his yellow teeth. The man did not pause as his hands headed to inappropriately touch my body. For a moment I felt dazed. My body first grew cold and my pupils shook as I envisioned what was about to follow, and the next moment I knew, my entire body burned. I was fortunate enough in my life that I had never ever had to go through such a haunting experience in my previous life. But not everyone is that strong or lucky. Because now I remember why I always felt so sad whenever I thought of that old lady from the shop. Why she always looked after me. Why she asked me to be careful. That's because her own daughter was a victim of such harassment and when she couldn't turn to anyone for help, she took her own life by jumping from the roof of the office building in which she worked. 
Whenever I thought of her misfortunate situation it made me shiver and I would close myself inside my room. What if I were pushed in the same situation? Whether she felt helpless, whether she thought she wouldn't find anyone for help, or whether she thought it was too late for things to change for her. 310. Unconsciously I had developed a mental attitude to stay away from men whenever I sensed even a little malice or danger from them. In actuality, I never tried facing them. Whether I hated them, loathed or detested them I was not sure. But for once I wanted them all to burn with my eyes glowing red as I gazed at them from under the mask. Looking around and finding a familiar cart broken and thrashed in the corner, covered in blood, a marred dead body lying over it, I had found my answer. Listen girl this place is not safe if you are alone. The giant bandit growled at me. His loud raucous voice had even intimidated his own comrades. He giggled as he was about to put his repulsive hands on me. I was fortunate enough to meet good people in this world, who looked after my well-being, and I who had been keeping my head lowered disgusted by their comments and intention. For the first time met a night to eye with the people who wanted to hurt me then it's like every other place for me. I offered you a chance and you neglected it. HMPH. The bandit's voice faded without any mark, and after that, there was just one movement. No one saw it happening. No one heard it, but they felt it and everything along with it became silent. Thump. A thing fell and rolled like a ball on the ground as it hit the leg of another bandit who brazenly looked at it scratching at his back. Rather interested in the unveiling he hoped to see in front of him. Others stared until the bandit let out a scream. Whoa dot dot it's a head. A dead head. Thump. This time the voice decimated the ground beneath as it sent chills to the bandits who saw everything happening from the front seat. 311. The noise of the headless bandit falling to the ground was an unbelievable sight. Before the vile man could have touched me, snapping my right leg outward I turned around gaining momentum landing the pointed end of my boots on the man's neck. My kick traced a perfect circle as it perfectly stopped back in the same place I stood. It ripped apart the bandit's head, the kick was so fast not a single drop of blood stained my attire, until the body succumbed to the ground and let a puddle of blood form on the ground, had it not been night they could have seen a much clearer cut which couldn't have been possible even with the sharpest swords available. The bandits haven't realized it until they saw their husky man lying headless on the ground, and the surprisingly tranquil disposition of the girl, the glowing redness in the girl's eyes. It warned them, they couldn't see Alicia's face behind the mask, but the rage radiating from her was so palpable that the bandits could feel it on their skin, as if she was not the one being hunted, but they were the ones being preyed upon by her from the start. Several men whose fingers had been itching for a fight ran in front with cries, the swords, machetes, knives pointed toward me. Kill her. Kill. Kill. That was the possibly only thing in their mind. I snapped my fingers and activated my dismantle skill. What followed were the horrid cries of bloodied bodies that painted the forest ground red. Small bubbles of red seemed to have filled the air and dulled the view. The bodies of whichever person caught in my spell burst from within their life the over in the next instant their brain matter and organs littered the ground. 312 Seeing blood splattered everywhere. The remaining few took a step back but they were not the ones to back down. Seeing their comrades fell down in a single second, their numbers reduced to one by fourth. The remaining were the strong ones which was evident from them surviving against my skill. What sorcery was that? Can magic even do this? Fear not comrades. Kill her. No child has this power. It must have been a hidden magic tool. But they should not be able to use it continuously. Yeah kill her before she can use any other kind. Supported another of the bandit, the two ran forward with their weapons resembling a scimitar at me. At least they were thinking but they still tried to underestimate me. My hands moved forward while the charging men let out war cries thinking I was going to surrender, but they fastened their pace. They tightened the grip over their blades ready to slash me down, but with the same calmness. I made a movement of twitching my two fingers in front striking a string as it vibrated in loops, 
A cacophonous sound reverberated and hit the place. Triple underscore A R H H A triple A. Another fading cry of all the bandits restored the silence to the nightly forest. My fingers had just grabbed onto my web strings, which had been successfully tapped, wired in the whole place and tightening around the bandits to the extent until they would shear through its body and cut them in half. At least I made sure their deaths were instant and none had to die in agony. I should have been able to deal with all of them. I exhaled, as I saw my gluttonous skill consume all the dead bodies in black threads and vanishing. The entire bandit group was wiped out by my hands in an instant. Warning. Report. 1 Alive. 313. On listening to Al's warning, I felt the rumbling movement on the ground, and a small pointed object projected at me. I tilt my neck and an axe flying just passed through my side and pierced through the trunk of the tree. Straightening my head and looking in front, it was the same man giving orders that stood facing me, the leader of the Dalton band. He was still alive wearing a sour solemn expression on his face. I was left wondering of how he survived against my world-severing webs, which should have been impossible given his status, excelling in fire magic alone, the leader of the Dalton band. The younger Dalton brother had squarish features that were complemented by his tied up long hair behind his back. With a messy beard that covered his jawline making it impossible to see his thick neck, he carried a single-edged sword with an arm that was covered in old scars and freshly drawn blood. The blade of the sword so huge that only someone with a defined build like him should have been able to swing it freely, he looked around with dissatisfied looks and grumbled to himself, it's too soon for this. We weren't prepared. Even if we knew this was going to happen, if only brother was here. He again looked at the bodies of his comrades but it did not move him for a second. Corpses that were now just shredded and blasted flesh and bones, they were of now no use to him in that grotesque form or so he thought, but seeing them disappear and swirling black threads vanishing before him in a blink of an eye made his feet shiver for a moment that he took a step back. Baffled of witnessing something impossible and out of his hand. You took out all my men. Overwhelming you with numbers would be a waste. The leader of the bandits merely laughed and shrugged. It appears that he had little to no attachment to his companions. 314. I really would have preferred to have tea with a friendly chat but your men were acting far more than friendly and rough, so I was compelled to point them in the right path. I responded candidly, hoping he might do the same, but seeing that he already made his surprise attack and a failed attempt, he was not the passive type and let things go. They knew what was coming for them. Those who can't take responsibility are not real men. Blustered the huge man with blustering muscles, in the next instant he plunged, charging straight at me, but consequently he did not seem like he was just acting on provocation or payback for his mates, it would only mean one thing that he has an ace up his sleeve. I wondered, remembering half a beat later that I can see people's status, and activated my analyze skill. Let's see what kind of abomination magic you used on these goons to kill them all in a blink of an eye. The man roared as he threaded his way towards me in the dark raising his massive sword as high as he could, the moment he saw I was in his strike range, he brought it down with all his might, his bicep muscles flexed with a crackling sound, as the sword's sharp side came shaving through the air just above my head, I could have blocked it easily using my wind fan. But in the middle of the strike, Sparks rise and the wind brushing against the edge of the sword gave birth to blazing flames that ultimately enveloped his sword. Having no choice, I used teleportation magic to get a little farther. Sensing my absence without delay, the man stops his sword midair before it would hit the empty ground and break the metal. He straightened the blade and swing the sword to his right horizontally straight where I was standing at the present this time keeping the flames that outlined his blade in order, I kept a mindful distance from it. Only feeling the hotness of the flames, all his strikes were amiss as I elegantly dodged them with the least movement. I am going to crack your skull with this sword. Show your real face girl. The man thoroughly flustered as I dodged or vanished at each of his attack the moment he thought he got me. 315. And when his hands trembled after getting tired for the first time, holding the torrid of flame like it was a simple torch, not letting slip that opportunity for gaining some space. I opened my wind fan in a serious jolt, a gust of wind ushered, 
not only diminishing the increasing size of the flames but also pushing the man back a several meters away. My webs failed to take him out in the first dry. Even if he saw it coming it should have been almost impossible to escape being caught in them. The only visible thing that appears on his status is that he is highly proficient with using fire magic, but that mean the only other method he countered my attack was. Still that's not enough to survive my attack, I thought, while the man was breathing heavily. He did not hold himself back or doubt for a second before swinging his sword. He was burning magic continuously, and unlike me not everyone has magic in limitless quantity, if not for his endurance and senses refined in several mercenary battles for survival, he wouldn't have outlasted this long. If you try to strike a girl so seriously, I will have to treat you the same. I made a humble request, you are no ordinary girl. Did that freakish doctor sent you here? Only he can create such abominations out of small children. The man retorted, Dot Doctor, who would that be? I was hearing the mention for the first time. I don't know. How about you tell me? Were you kidnapping the children on his command? Clearly there was more than simple kidnapping and human trafficking going on in these rural villages. What use a doctor would have for them? I did hear from father that young children are the best magecraft material in illegal magic experimentation. But after the Great War all such researches were banned and funneled out. So, a bandit group can easily be told in by money in doing the wrong man's bidding and no one would know. 316. I would have still thought a little more on, for him doubting me to be sent for such an abysmal reason. It doesn't matter either way. You destroyed everything we have been planning for months. Shaking his head the leader of the Dalton band looking like something had finally fallen into place from the position that he had fallen back to. He charged again with a battle cry, the same as before his sword fiercely burned so as his rage. No, you don't. I yelped without wasting any time this time preparing two fusion balls and launching it directly at him, and that's when I also discovered the secret to his escaping my attack, just as the fusion balls were about to hit the man. He waves his sword holding it with both of his hands and just like cutting through butter his sword scrays the two masses of magical energy and send them flying off. Something too convenient happening here against my spells, he neither blocked them, nor cut through them, they just slid through the edge of his sword just as it was about to come contact with his body or the flames emanating from his sword. Unless it was a self-developed magic of his own that he had mastered, that is, I see. Your flame magic slows down magic spells whenever they come in contact with you. I teased him while jumping on the inside at the joy of finding another person's secret behind his magic, hoping that he would bite his teeth this time. So, does that make him a magic swordsman? At first the man sneered and grumbled looking away, but then realizing as if it wouldn't make a difference he agreed. That's correct little girl. I applaud you for finding this out. You are the second person who was able to know this just by watching me. My own original fire magic spell. I wield it such that whenever someone's else magic even if it is about to come in contact with my body heat, the magic particles 317 around me slows down momentarily. But in your case, the pressure is so heavy that I have to rely on all my senses and all my strength as well. The leader said as he brandished his sword at me again, I'm a magical genius you see. I complimented myself. You are likely a skilled magic user. There weren't such skilled adventurers in the town before. I highly doubt the knights would prefer someone out of their own circle and if not for the doctor, then that would mean you are acting on your own. But it is unforgivable someone would get in my brother's plan, and for that I have to dispose of you. The man exhaled heavily as if releasing all the heat inside his body along with his worries he concentrates his mind and the magical energy flowing through him. Now even his hands and muscles around his body started releasing steam as they were likely on fire inside him. I guess the greater the heat, the more pronounced will be the effects of his magic spell. Most probably it is a kind of body augmentation magic and is perfect for counter-attacks. Unfortunately I am not that easy to dispose of, but I assure you now that I have discovered how your magic works, I will make it quick. I have to catch a cart early in the morning. I watched with bated breath, the man again lifted his sword in his place ready to face me. He chants his magic I am fire. 
lock me in a cage and I melt all the bars and chains that binds me. His sword burns brightly in the night sky like sun flares leaking from its sides and then bringing it down in my direction he spilled all those flames like a tornado of fire. The ground where he had been standing only a moment before, all the grass and ground vegetation caught on fire and charred the next moment. Fire comes as a golden rush, igniting the night, outshining the stars. Before the tornado could actually hit me, a small flip from my wind fan and the firestorm dispersed like a candle flame being blown out of proportion. As the front cleared, I thought having overextended himself with the counterattack, he would be finally left defenseless. But that was imprudent of 318 me as he dauntlessly stood there without worrying either of my warning or the consequence. I conjured two fusion balls as they emerged of blue and red swirling magic, representing water and fire respectively. The man did not hesitate for a second seeing those round objects again, given that he had already evaded two at the same time previously. But when each fusion ball replicated in numbers from 2 to 4 to 16 and growing until he slid his leg back in frustration of the number of balls he had to deal with now. Steadying his footing, the steam blistered out from his form. I projected all of the fusion balls at him. I had resorted to use fusion balls, given that I had a singular enemy and since the mask and wind fan restrain my magic, it was wise to not go overboard and break my gifts. The leader of the Dalton band hoping that he would just evade all the attacks with his magic went with his usual plan. Either way he did not knew of any other countermeasure against the monstrosity of spells of the girl standing in front of him. He had to rely on the experience as he had always waded his ways through several battlefields. The moment his sword was about to come in contact with a fusion ball, another fusion ball rushed in and conjoined with another sphere. A simple fusion occurs and then a sudden blast took hold of his body. He tried to evade another and the same happened as it ripped apart and burned his skin, his footing thrown off by the impact, falling a few meters away on the ground. You think I would do the same mistake? You can't evade them if they explode in front of you. I warned him. Once dot twice dot thrice, explosion dot dot boom, 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 without paying any heed to my voice. He kept on defending himself with his sword sometimes using it as a shield to absorb the impact of explosion but most of the times he was thrown around by it. He grunted seeing another volley of these fusion balls ready to be launched at him hovering at my back. Blood spilled and now he was down to his knees. Bones shattered in his lungs region, his arms split open and burned. 319. I felt it was a crude method to exterminate him. So. The moment he would empty his magic reserves, I would use my webs to finish him off. Elisha. A familiar voice sounded at my back, and I stopped the explosions, giving the environment some rest. It was Regis and from behind her followed Maya and Gage. Alicia we are back. And all the kids are safe, we can leave now. Regis beamed, and I knew something in this short time had really changed about her. I looked at Maya and she appeared to be just fine. On the other hand, Cage might be short on clothes. I used my unique skill, equivalent exchange, and remembering her attire I produced the same clothes around Cage's body. Cage and Maya were taken aback, while Regis blinked her eye registering in her mind that I could do this too. Where are all the bandits? Maya looked around everywhere, her nose sniffed, as if trying to pick up the smells but they were all gone. She was confused while Cage scanned through the place, only to find the leader of the band wounded on the ground. She nodded at me. Miss Alicia thank you very much for saving me and the all the kids here, but I ask you of one more favor, can you let me talk to him? Cage looked determined. By the looks of it, she was suffering from inside after using her skill, and I knew she had forced herself to surpass her limits. So secretly I casted a simple heal spell on her to ease her pain, but by her smile, I guess she had guessed it was me, I moved from her way, but just in case I hadn't drawn back the fusion balls hovering at my side. You know me, I am Cage. Please stop this madness, I have known you two brothers for years and I know you would never do such a terrible thing as kidnapping children for selling them. If you are here, then does that mean my brother is dead? The man scrambled on the ground, 
putting his weight on the sword he stood up again. 320. Yes, and I was the one who killed him. Cage looked away while reporting the news to him. Her voice strained and panicked as she addressed the wounded man. I see. Then there was really nothing I could do to help him ease his pain. The man stared at the ground for a while, his hands reaching to the back of his trousers to a secret pocket. Please tell me the real reason, I need to know, why did he all do this, to what end? Cage seemed to be out of her element. Both Maya and Regis felt the same seeing her so desolate. Don't feel sorry for my brother. Everything that went here today was according to his plan. We'd seen the sparks and together felt the warmth of the glow our dreams long before sunrise Cage and everyone were baffled at his declaration, as each of us looked in the eye for lost answers. The younger Dalton brother raised his voice in fury. His hands moved knottily. I am not my brother and even if you won't forgive me for doing this, my brother did not lose. And neither will I. With a small pause, a painful cry followed. Ah uh -huh. I noticed an injection with a golden liquid inside it as the young adult and brother injected directly into the blood vessel of his neck. The moment the injection was complete and all that suspicious fluid was inside his body. The injection fell to the ground and detonated on its own with a small magical explosion set to go off the moment it turned empty. So, they wanted to get rid of all evidence. All of us on alert watched anxiously, as he screamed in agony. His eyelids shut for a moment and when they opened the eyeballs turned golden. The next moment his skin suddenly sloughed off and all the blood vessels around his bodies enlarged and blistering with golden light. He clearly had no idea what was happening, as the outer layer of his body caught on flames, and all he could do was look blankly at the newly exposed pink of his body. Screaming, his eyes were full of pure rage and confusion, and regret. 321. As we watched the man burn in his own flames, a ghastly and terrible face of a shapeless nature shows up, the unnatural fluid surging within him tore his muscle fiber, bent his bones in twisted directions and sent his limbs flailing all over. His human form was able to hold out for only a few short seconds. Then a ghastly noise filled the place. I asked Al to analyze this new being, as I could no longer sense the man inside of him. He was gone and now this creature had taken his place, the burning skin still shedding. The figure grew several times in size and no longer appeared to be human with that crooked back and bent spine, more than four limbs. He had surpassed all descriptions, the writhing mass of liquid slowly rose and stripped away any unnecessary components inside of his body as some flesh slowly spilled out, it was disposing of anything that wasn't required or weak and unhealthy components of a human body, and finally his body, which now appeared to be a hollow exoskeleton surrounded by molten magma. Wherever the golden fluid leaking from his body fell, the ground melted until the fluid dissolved. Excess soul power leakage detected, uncontrolled cell multiplication, soul realm collapse, soul core disintegrated, solely, T, T, A, question mark C, G, breached, authority level insufficient, what, Al? Simply put I was much more surprised by Al's disrupted voice and with the final output and conclusion. So, something happened to his soul realm after taking that syringe and my level is not sufficient to obtain that knowledge from the divine system now. The temperature of our surrounding rose uncontrollably. And when I noticed the creature in front of us and how Cage had flopped to the ground in front of him. Maya and Regis were standing beside me with horrified looks. Even for me who was accustomed to seeing monsters daily from the labyrinth of all kinds, shapes and sizes. Such a transformation for my human was new. 322. The creature without any warning, gave a shrill cry from whatever new hole there might be in its molten body. Jiriwag. A flash of light surged from the creature's hollow face. There was no crash no telltale sound of destruction. In fact, after the groaning sound from it stopped coming it was so quiet that one might think nothing had happened at all. Just as when Cage tried standing up, I felt a gentle breeze, and next came the afternoon sunlight on my skin. Even though it was the night, the light radiating from the creature's body like an orange beam grew in ratio. And before it could have actually done what it was meant for, I raised my blue barrier in front of everyone. 
A pale orange light burned everything in the forest. Except for the patch of land where each of us stood was still intact because of my magic barrier. Surrounding trees cut in half and then they were engulfed in flames. The walls of the stronghold turned to a crisp. After the orange flare beam vanished, Maya quickly leapt forward and pulled Cage back. While I decided to put an end to this, I used all my fusion balls and conjoining them projected all of them at the molten creature. Boom dot dot boom dot dot boom. Several explosions happened at all the parts of the monster, but instead of harming him, it absorbed the magic explosion and grew up in size as if eating the flames and magic from them. Even Regis this time did not hesitate, or looking for what to do, but she took action on her own accord and launched several of her magic arrows at the monster almost instantly. We succeeded in disfiguring its structure, but like flowing water it restored to the vessel size immediately. 323 I noticed from my mystic eyes, that the surrounding was losing in magic particles and was continuously being absorbed by the creature. If not put to stop this place will lose all its magic powers. I want you all to take cover behind this blue barrier. It's time I put an end to this. There's no point of keeping it a secret any longer, because I have already decided to. I looked at Regis and she made sure that Cage and Maya followed. Cage what's happening? This was not how it should be. First he and now the younger brother too. Just who is this doctor behind orchestrating all of this? I thought as I despaired to see the younger Dalton brother, leader of the Dalton band, the one who leads the greatest group of bandits in all the independent regions of the demon continent, turning into something inhumane. That injection must have been a magecraft alchemic tool, to have been able to do this. The only thing between the tornado of flames from the creature and us was a blue barrier. Everyone we need to get out of here. Is it possible to fight this thing if Alicia's magic gets absorbed and Regis's arrows would not reach him? Nothing would work. We should fall back and plan. Or inform the adventurer guild or the knights. I was trying to think of protecting everyone and getting out of this place. That is the only thing I could do. That's the only thing I have ever done. Will that be the only thing I ever do? I cannot wield a sword or whisper a magic chant to protect myself. Everywhere I squandered on the streets I looked for opportunities proving myself I was not the useless kid that was denied her home, her family and her place in this world. I always run away when I realize things are beyond me. Even though I know it means I am not stupid. It doesn't make me more capable. What if this blue barrier could not hold any longer? What if we get caught in the flames? 324. I was born magicless and so I did not know the measure or scale power levels of a person. I was always scared of this disability, or, rather I distrust myself for never being able to find out others' strength. Only looking for their weaknesses before mine is discovered. That's how I played at my life and that's how I have always won at it, but it never left me fulfilled. I was failing myself to even come to trust the two who saved me from this crisis. I was not sitting there waiting for a miracle or my wishes to come true. They simply don't. They are fairy tales for the coward who cannot put in their own best efforts. I had a purpose in life and yet I find myself insufficient even after working tirelessly for several years. A devil's offer. I remembered that by Dalton brother's words, today seemed to me more like a nightmare, than reality, and yet here I was dot dot and her too. I did not know when it became so silent. All I could hear was the steps of the person a girl a bit younger than me coming for me. I said to Maya that I will save you, and I don't intend to leave things halfway. The girl named Alicia spoke her words to me. She removes her mask. A thing which seemed a bit unfair to reveal out of nowhere and without warning. The scorching heat I felt on my unprotected skin vanished, and a calm cold settled over my body. Until then the wind was scarce due the stronghold walls, but now they were blowing all around. I had trouble keeping my eyes open against the tears that poured continuously down my face. I stood silent, rubbing my eyes as I fought to keep from breaking down. The glow faded around her a beautiful face glowing brighter than any freshly minted gold coin I had ever seen. Her previously black hairs evolved into much longer white hairs that cascaded down to her waist, fluttering in the breeze to blanket the full night sky. Her hairs and glowing red eyes made her look otherworldly. 325. I knew something was not normal about this girl. 
but what I was about to see was now going to surpass all my reasoning and understanding of this world. While Maya, Regis and I lay protected behind a translucent blue barrier, the creature in front of us continuously spat fire burning down everything, but the barrier held without any dent in it. I felt safe for long with Maya here. Alicia brandished her hands. Weaponless, no chance, no defensive barriers. The creature in front of us appeared to be preparing another death ray, its body size grown twice its original. Black flare, a small wave of black fluid that flickered like flames left her arms. The moment the fat ray of orange flames comes in contact with the black flames, for the first time I find myself concerned for a stranger's life. Maya too prayed with her hymns taught in the orphanage, but Regis, she stood there with a beaming face as if she already knew the result. Because it is known that it is in the nature of the spark to ignite the moment. When I and Maya looked carefully, the black flames suddenly unfurled slowly into an inferno of much bigger flames, until it rivaled that of the creature. It was then like a miracle of gods. Her whole body began glowing with the same indescribable color as her eyes, and I could see the glow spreading to me as well. Taking a deep breath, I gathered my thoughts and concentrated. As we watch all creation burning in a sea of black flames, the walls of the stronghold slowly crumpled and vanished into nothing. 326. Alicia was dot awesome and flawless. Even seeing her destroy everything in her path she was unaffected and unbind by any law or from any grievances of society. Untouched and pure. As every evil of society would all burn up and vanish in those purgatory flames. But ultimately this girl Alicia, truly did not care for anything else except what she wanted. She was everything I, Cage hoped to be and I still could be not. The black flames slowly began to take shape, shifting from chaos into an unbelievably precise design. It then surround the orange light and slowly starts devouring it. From that black flames the darkness eats away and releases the gayest of honeyed lights. Until Alicia closes her palm and all that is left is a raven patch of land with nothing left inside of it. The creature was gone, dissolved and melted in the flames almost immediately. It did not stand a chance from the very beginning. The blue barrier vanishes in front of us, and under the starry night sky. In a single night or rather a matter of few minutes the demon continent's most feared bandit group was wiped out of existence. I and Maya held hands together as if we were no longer in the same forest. But a foreign patch of land with nothing in it. The entire hillside was actually now stripped of that greenery. It was a sight so absurd that it had to be a dream or a hallucination. However, while we were only vaguely aware of our surroundings, there was something far more unusual before my eyes. A lone girl stood in front of us, with her new physical appearance so mesmerizing that it made everything else seem like a pale imitation of reality. Ah! Her voice faded into a soft sigh as she relaxed her hands. Is such power really allowed to be possessed by just a single girl? I thought to myself. 327. For a second our eyes met and without a fault I found myself captured in an instant. I did not know what to speak. Just then Regis came from the back and while jumping she hugged Alicia tightly. I was shocked to see this bizarre nature of Regis who minutes ago was so ruthless while crushing those bandits near the prison cell. Alicia thank you so much. I am really grateful we were able to save all those kids. Regis had the most prettiest smile I had seen in a while. While Alicia smiles with more than her mouth, hearing it in her voice, in the choice of her words and the way she relaxed, it was beautiful. I have again killed someone to protect myself alone. But watching her use her power I realize now why she was the one to wield it because she used it to keep others safe. Here Alicia take back your money. The bandits did not accept it and were already planning to imprison me. I still owe you a debt and I intend to pay it back. Maya walked with a small packed bag in her hand, Alicia and Regis separate from their hug, while she gazes at Maya. Her eyes had stopped glowing and they become gentle again. Maya can you give it to the orphanage to help the children there and the others to get back to their homes. I am sure that would be enough. Alicia said reflecting the same positive energy as Regis, as if nothing from a while ago that happened bothered them. It's 25,000 crown gold coins. All the sisters would faint seeing such an absurd amount. Are you really sure? Maya said with guarded eyes directed towards me. 
Don't worry about the dead ghost. Just now I realized that it was a childhood scare that Alicia played me into. Regis chided Alicia. No it's not. Alicia denied Regis's claim. My wait. Before accepting the money I have to know. Why? Why are you so willingly trying to help us? It's not right. I stood in front of Alicia face to face. I thought I was braver but my trembling hands would deny me that. 328. Cage. Maya called out to her. No, I need to know. What's your angle for helping us all? What are you plotting? Why would anyone help us for nothing at all? My neck was overwhelmed with her emotion and I felt a bit painful inside. You have got it wrong. It would be much easier if I show you this. Alicia snapped her fingers in the air and a glitter of blackness clouded my vision. Next all of us find ourselves in a closed black room. Gold light came from everywhere, but it was not the stars or the sunshine, but the light reflecting from the large gold coins spread all across the room. As a matter of fact, the room was completely filled with it and there was only a little space where we were left standing. Everywhere we looked around there were the bright gold coins. The envy of every living rational being in abundance littered the place. But there was only one claim to the rightful owner of such unbelievable treasure the girl in white, Alicia. Consider it an investment, I need you two to work for me. But if you do not want it, you are free to go and still keep the money. Alicia announced, her eyes looking down on us. Unlike ours whose gazes were fixated on the gold, she was looking at us. Maya kept quiet listening to everything Alicia ordered as if some unknown force made her to act that way. So, you are going to force us in helping you, what do you even know about our lives? I said haughtily, of course, I cannot, and that's why I cannot fulfill your dreams but I can free you from the chains preventing you to do so yourself. What I am offering in return to you is your freedom and means to do what you have always wanted to. Despite Alicia's soft voice, everyone froze up. Regis, who had been aware of Alicia's plan still did not understood the reason of bringing them back to this mystical room. 329. And I who had actually seen this offer coming could not still find it in my heart to label this place real. But now I knew exactly what she wanted. From the very beginning when we first met and she made that deal on the cart, I was the one who was scammed and outwitted. If it is all right to assume that this gold place is genuine, then it is just as I thought it would be. So what do you want us to have to? I grinned for the first time in the day. That was easy, then make a deal with me. Alicia beamed at me and Maya. A deal? Maya did not understood the intent behind the statement, but it reminded me of the talk I had with the big Dalton brother about the pact of the devils and in the present moment, she appeared no less from it and yet far from its treacherous visages. But there was a price to pay. Because nothing ever comes free. You are free to choose anything in this room and then you will forever be mine and work for me. Alicia announced. A choice. At those words I noticed something as Maya looked around the room. She did not seem to be much bothered by the offer or unfamiliar with this place. As if she had already been proposed and promised the same and yet she was naively and innocent to do the same mistake, only seeing the things in front of her. The gold, thinking how they could get more in a single catch, I took Maya's face between my hands and her eyes gestured me a nod which I returned with a similar smile. Our gazes were more than enough to reach a life happening and changing consensus, a decision we made that would change our lives forever. Both Maya and I leapt to hold Alicia's hand as we recited together. We chose you. 330. All this time and out of all wonders of the world, the most precious possession, Cage and Maya had ever known and will ever know in this whole place was the one making us this offer, the devil herself. Smiling faintly. Well, I am happy to have you. Alicia shook her hands with us. After that we had a long talk about what Alicia wanted us to do for her and I couldn't help but think that we shared such similar passion and ambition. I take a look around the room inching every corner now trying to guess exactly what wealth this place withhold. With this much money you can even buy a kingdom and yet you say you want to start from scratch? I suggested standing in front of a mountain of gold, just give me your best, and don't worry there are ten other rooms like these. Alicia tilted her head and her charm sparkled all over me. Wow. An excited scream from me and I fainted on the pile of gold itself. 
cage. The other three kept on shaking me as I dreamt completing all of my fantasies with this gold. I always wanted and dreamt of doing this. I think everyone does, and I was just fortunate enough to live in it, until again someday I would have one of my own. Have you ever met a devil? A familiar question posted to me a while back from someone who is now long dead by my own hands. His words resonated in my mind. At that time my answer was a no. 331. And even now I would say exactly. But I think I finally met a devil. Someone close and now very dear to me. And I struck a deal with her in a heartbeat. She did not appear in front of us like a white angel of fortune. But offering all this money was akin to making a deal with a devil. It's sketchy, I know, but I think I would for once not mind being conned by someone, and like hell I would always love to drown in so much money. 332 The morning it was about time for the sunrise and the four had now returned to the back of the hill from the gold room. By now Cage and Maya had erected three graves, while Alicia and Regis helped them. Alicia was busy carving the names on the stone and shaping them while Regis used her magic to make the soil airy and easily tillable. Cage and Maya together dug the holes quickly. The Dalton brothers and their belongings lay side by side buried in their graves, and a third one was erected for the cart driver who was unwillingly caught in this madness. Even though he knew the risk and had a family, he mostly helped Cage and Maya out of kindness and without any ulterior motive. Alicia I think we need to leave soon to catch the cart. Regis asserted as she remembered what the owner of the caravan who promised to take them said, looking at the dawning sun. So, what do you two plan on doing from here? Continue on your journey to the human continent and find that person you have been looking for? Maya and I want to help too. Cage pleaded and she had already vested her mind in planning a way to help Alicia. Things are not just over yet. I don't like to leave things incomplete. The real culprit behind the kidnappings has not been discovered and knowing that he freely roams who hurt my friends I will not stop until then, I will end what I have started, and I think Cage you know where I might find this person they call the doctor. Alicia looked at Cage and she could no longer pretend that she didn't knew anything about City of Gilda, it's the same place you are heading for. Cage confessed and shared the information which the elder Dalton brother had hinted to her by throwing the knife on the map. 333. Maya and Cage, I am really glad I got to know you. Let's meet together at the port town and when you will arrive I would have already taken care of whoever tried to bring pain to you both. Regis let's leave. When we reach the port town I will help you too. Cage said goodbye, after we have seen to the orphanage and the kids. We will be there too, to join you. Maya waved her hands at the two vanishing figures who teleported back to the plum town. Now Maya notices that Cage for a long while had been silently gazing at the gravestones of the Dalton brothers. Maya as usual couldn't tell what was going through Cage's mind, but she knew Cage was confused with her decision and the reason was Maya herself. Maya never wanted Cage to blame herself for any decision she made for both of them because she always wanted to be a part of the success and failure of her plans. Until Cage spoke her heart which she rarely did, can I really live a different life after what I have done? All I have ever known is cheating people and only looked out for my own benefits. Someone so selfish like me. Cage that's not all of you, believe me. You never meant harming anyone and we were in this together from the very start. Remember, so you don't have to take the blame all on yourself. Let me bear half of your burned for you. Maya urged directly looking into Cage's eyes. Scared they both were. They agreed to belong to Alicia and work for her. But trusting someone so deeply always comes with its own dangers. Do you think it will be an easy life for us out there? There was a time when I wanted to run away from everything and now I am stepping back in. I don't know whether I am fearful or fit to take on the responsibilities I have on me now. Cage was really acting weak unlike the courageous front she always put on herself. This frail side of her brought her own feminine charms. Maya pushed her head against Cage gently. Maya knew this always comforted Cage. 334. I can and I will make sure I am brave enough for both of us to protect you from any danger. I will just have to become super strong. All my life I have ever known this town and the orphanage. And out there it will be a different life for us. No doubt. But it will still be our life to live in the way we want to. 
Thank you Maya for always being for me there. Let's go back to the orphanage. I think the kids and everyone else would be worried sick about you by now. After all you are there darling. Cage smirked. Don't even begin with that. I need to spend time with everyone properly before we leave for the port town. Maya blushed thinking that her dream of visiting different places was finally going to come true. And we also need to make a stop at the nearby town too. Cage and Maya for a finale caught a glimpse of the third gravestone and started walking back to their hometown. 335. The cart Alicia and Regis were able to get to the cart on time. There were a great many other passengers too and it was a long caravan with some adventurers on the forefront to protect them from any surprise bandit attack on the way. They were safely going to reach the port town of Gilda by afternoon and the pleasant cool wind rode with them. As the slow traveling made the two girls fall asleep on the passenger cart. While the previous night they spent awake being the savior of the town and exterminator for the bandit gang. In between Regis woke up from a sudden jolt and found Alicia still asleep like a baby. She decided to share a cloth just in case to cover them and not catch a cold. The cart driver had informed that he would wake everyone up when they had reached the destination. Regis I am sorry I forgot to install the brakes in the bike. Please forgive me, don't burn the bike or rack it. Alicia murmured in her sleep. Just what did you say? I will just pretend I didn't hear that. Regis said with a strained smile on her face. Regis saw that Alicia was still wearing the mask and underneath she knew her best friend whom she had promised to have an adventure around the world must be having pleasant weird dreams of her own. Thank you Alicia for helping me to save those elf kids and other children. I was finally able to do something good for my kingdom because of you. Regis whispered in Alicia's ears hoping that she was still asleep. She took Alicia's head and rested it on her shoulder and in turn put her own head on Alicia's shoulder. As the two cuddled in closer together sharing a single blanket and fell back to pleasant dreams, I think I was finally able to find what I have to do in this world and what will make me happy. And that's what I am going to do from here on. Regis promised to herself in her heart vowing to protect Alicia too at the same time. 336. Epilogue. The ocean was to the east of the demon continent. A great expanse of water that separated the landmass of the demon continent from the mainland human continent. During the Great Wars it was said that the two lands were joined together at several places. But when the gods laid siege on the devils, their altruistic ultimate powers were so immense that the world could not hold it until the lands were decimated and demolished. Fissures occurred in the wide land and the wrath of gods brought upon the great earthquakes and the rest of what was remaining was washed away by the great tsunamis. And thus a wide expanse of water bodies were formed between the human continent and demon continent. A favorable consequence that stopped further campaigns of war because of the distance it wedged between the people of the world, making them entirely two separate lands. Currently a huge ship sailed on these oceans. The surface of the water was clean and a multitude of crowd was on the deck to enjoy the current pleasant sea weather. In that crowd unlike the others a young face, for a moment skims over the gurgling surface of the sea as the ship bears to the west of the human continent. A beautiful and cute young girl with waist-length blue hair that has bangs hanging over her forehead with chest-length hair strands hanging in the front, blue-green eyes. She wore common clothes but her looks and grace were no less than that of a lady. And then she intently looks at the small patch of land that appeared in front of her. Her view widening with every second as the ship gets closer and closer to the other end of the land. 337. The water sped against the gush of wind and looked more like white foam spreading and acting like the endless barrier between the two biggest land masses that covered the world. This trade ship had sailed from the world's most prosperous trading kingdom the Stark Kingdom, located directly on the Midwestern coast of the human continent. After an hour the ship docked into the port. It was the port town of Gilda, another trading city on the demon continent where trade ships gathered from round the world. The sails were lowered and the stairs raised from the deck to the land. People started getting off the ship with their luggage. Huge barrels of rich spices, oil, extravagant gems, precious jewelry and other rare material which couldn't have been procured elsewhere in the world. But here in the port city of Gilda, or, so it is known. While some could have also seen strange animals in cages, there were other large cages covered in clothes, 
Those belong to the rich unnamed traders of the city and no one would ever talk about what's inside of them. Because the walls had ears, and it was known throughout the city about the horrors of what happened to those who questioned about it, the young lady blended in the crowd almost too perfectly with little presents. Her silky blue hair fluttered in the cool sea breeze as she looked around all kinds of people wearing rich ornaments and silky clothes to those in almost ragged clothes carrying heavy luggage for them. From behind an old man followed the girl, trying to get close to her, but apparently they never talked or behaved like they knew each other on the ship until then. Are you sure of this my lady? Can we really find it here? The old man whispered to the girl, keeping his voice hushed. He did not want it to be discovered that the two were working together. There's no doubt. My sources tell me that they have traced back the origin of the unknown poison to this place. The girl asserted to the old man. 338. They continued walking out of the docks and to the city where they could find lodgings for themselves. They had little to no load except for a small suitcase which the old man held firmly in his hands. No one could have known that it was filled with precious gold coins gemstones and other valuable materials, the girl had put every of her belonging to get her hands on the item for which she staked her life and position to come to this foreign land. Yes my lady, forgive me to question you but was it the right decision to leave your home without telling anyone? I think the kingdom demands your presence in these troubled times. The old man leaned making sure no one take note of their dialogue. My kingdom is no longer safe when everyone is busy plotting and playing their own politics and agenda. You are now my only close confidant that I can trust. It has been almost half a month that my mother and father were poisoned and since then they have been in a deep coma. If we delay any longer hiding the news of the bad health of the king and queen, it will surely spell the doom of the Stark Kingdom. Do you understand that now? The girl steadied her footsteps and the old man tried to match her with his own. He was astounded to see the responsibilities the young girl shouldered despite her age. As a matter of fact, from the day she had been born it was his duty to look after the girl and educate her. And today was the day he proved his loyalty and allegiance to her in these troubled times. I am highly honored my lady and I will not fail you, Princess of Stark Kingdom. Arya Stark, I am yours to command. As the only princess and heiress of the Stark Kingdom I can no longer sit there and watch my parents suffer until death takes them away from me. Search every market, trader, black market and in auctions. I need the antidote no matter the price. I will pay for it. Listening to the commands the old man butler marches forward, acting on the order of his princess, who in turn puts on a back hood and decided to head. 339 to the place to meet her informants in search of a cure determined to save her parents and her homeland. 340. Note to readers. Everyone who is reading my novel and loves Alicia on her exciting adventures in this new fantasy world, thanks a lot for all your support. It really means a lot to me. I am a self-published author and still a novice to writing. My previous volumes I know sometimes might not measure up to your expectations with several issues like grammatical errors, writing, formatting, lack of editing, illustrations, and so I want to make a great effort to fix them all and provide you with the best of content, and for this I might need your help to raise funding for this book and your necessary support. It has really been an exciting work for me to narrate you the story of our main character who fights her way to the bottom of the abyss with her magic and skills and then eventually storms into the outside world. Keeping the text error free takes a lot of revisions and consumes time, but no work is ever perfect. With your support and reviews I know that I have improved a lot in my writing. You can support my writing by reviewing my book on the platform you are reading or especially rate my book on Amazon Kindle. And even now I'm asking for a bit more that if you voluntarily support my writing then you can do it now by donating to me. PayPal, click here. 341. Become a patron. HTTPS colon slash slash www.patreon.com slash noelalisha. Even a little amount helps. I hope that you keep enjoying my work and in knowing the interesting characters which will be constantly introduced to you in the novel. I hope that the next volume too proves to be to your liking. And a fan letter is most welcome from you on my mail noelalisha14 at gmail.com. 342. Afterward. Hello there. This is Noel Alicia.
It's been two and more than a half months since the fifth volume release and here you have the sixth one already, isn't that amazing? I still consider myself new at this and trying my best that you enjoy the journey which our characters have set on. This time I tried casting a complete set of new side major characters. Edith, Leah, Will, Cage, Maya and the Dalton brothers. I know I have taken a big gamble by slowing down the main storyline by introducing such characters which was actually self-serving of me because I couldn't help but narrate their story for you. I'm not sure if this volume betrayed your expectations or fulfilled them, but I'll be glad so long as you derived some amount of enjoyment from it. In my mind, this work of mine is meant to be a simple, fun read with a slant towards comedy and a romantic approach towards magical fights. The atmosphere of this book's pretty different from other volumes, and as I'm sure many of you have noticed, getting to know other characters and how they feel and react to our main character is something that might have not been a part of the initial volumes. With our new crew of characters, an unnamed doctor in the shadows, a princess with a covert mission and Alicia and Regis together setting off, how their tails would intertwine with sea pirates ready to block Alicia's way from crossing the sea to get to the human continent in search of Athena, still a mystery even to me. 343 I'm not sure if you guys liked the new characters with different mindsets, personalities and their own dreams more or less, but as long as you enjoyed it, I'm happy. I have also started preparing grounds for other school reincarnates, Athena. Adventurers Guild as their actions to drive the storyline further and makes the plot even more interesting. An appearance of a new person in your life, their decisions and behavior draws you in to learn more about them, and as that happens you could not help yourself but compare and how you can be helpful to each other in times of your needs. As I'm sure those of you can already tell that I am a huge fan of Aizkai genre. Potent enough that after writing the sixth volume I am aiming for. Volume 6 Synopsis Alicia and Regis reach the port town of Gilded to drag out the unnamed evil doctor, but it would seem that the doctor has also completed his research work, making an entirely new magical species of living being that cannot be killed. What was the serum that turned the Dalton brother into a monster? For what purpose was it made? And how Alicia is to overcome the immortal danger lurking in the laboratory of the Doctor? Is Alicia's magic still almighty enough to grant wishes and as to how she would find the next clue to Athena's whereabouts? Don't forget to get your umbrellas because it is time to sail a ship and a siege by Ho-Ho Pirates. 344. The seventh now. Feels almost unbelievable thinking back when we started on this journey. The next volume featuring a new major character who is permanently going to become a part of her life for eternity, and to prove her trust, she is going to risk her life by unraveling her soul. What lies beyond and next we will surely find in the next volume. Once again, I'd like to thank my readers for letting me enjoy myself all the way through. May we meet again in the next volume of When I Got Reincarnated as a Spider with My Goddess, Noel Alicia. Contact me, noelalisha14 at gmail.com 345 346